voyage round the world, but more particularly to the northwest coast of America, performed in 1785, 1786, 1787 and 1788 in the King George and Queen Charlotte, Captains Portlock and Dixon, by Captain Nathaniel Portlock, 1789. To the King. Sir, it has been the invariable object of Your Majesty's reign is to enrich your people by inciting their industry, to refine them by encouraging the arts, to enlighten them by the cultivation of science, and to secure their enjoyments by strengthening the Constitution. But to a people whose renown and whose safety are derived from their shipping and navigators, the voyages of discovery, which Your Majesty successively projected and achieved, may be regarded as still more useful to your subjects and beneficial to mankind. English seamen have always been celebrated for their bravery. Your Majesty has, by those voyages, made them more skilled. They have ever been adventurous, but Your Majesty has, by this wise policy, made them safer. English sailors would at all times undertake and perform, on every sea, what mortals could execute. Your Majesty has taught them by those salutary trials how to preserve their health in every climate. Yet, whatever glory and benefit have been thus derived to Great Britain, Your Majesty's disinterestedness has imparted, with a generous philanthropy, to every nation. It was to those voyages, may I be permitted to add, that I owe the perfect health, the perseverance and the skill, however inconsiderable, which enabled me to conduct the adventure that is recounted in the following sheets. But it was Your Majesty's beneficence, which at all times has studiously noticed the humblest merit, that allowed me the honour of dedicating this narrative to Your Majesty as a tribute of the unalterable gratitude and profound submission with which I shall continue through life. Your Majesty's most faithful subject and most dutiful servant, Nathaniel Portlock. London, April 19th, 1789. A Voyage Round the World, but more particularly to the northwest coast of America, by Captain Nathaniel Portlock. Chapter 1 Account of the different persons who first carried on the fur trade, the King George's Sound Company established, two vessels purchased, the complements of their crews and names of the officers, passage from Gravesend to Portsmouth, employments there, departure from Portsmouth, in danger near the Gaskets, Arrival and Guernsey. Though that illustrious navigator, Captain Cook, did not, with all his skill and all his perseverance, obtain the great object of his voyage to the western coast of America, the discovery of a practicable passage from the North Pacific to the North Atlantic Ocean, he furnished philosophy with many additional facts, and he opened it to commerce several extensive prospects. The Voyages of the Present Reign as they were prosecuted with views the most disinterested, were exposed to the world without reserve, and every nation and every individual thus had an opportunity of forming new designs, either for the cultivation of science or for the advantage of traffic. If Great Britain owes something to France for her discoveries in former times, the French are much indebted in the present to the British mariners for laying open the whole globe to human eyes and to human industry. The French king, with noble emulation, seems to have sent out several officers with suitable accommodations to follow the tracks of the successive voyages which had been so happily achieved under His Majesty's auspices, though an English seaman may be allowed to say that the French navigators trailed in their wake at a great distance afterward. No sooner were the voyages of Cook, of Clark, of Gore, and of King accomplished and their narratives published, then a new expedition was dispatched from France in 1785 under the conduct of Messrs. Perus and de Langle, in order to glean on this ample field what the misfortune of Cook had left unattained. As early indeed as 1782, a well-known individual, Mr. Boltz, attempted an adventure to the North Pacific Ocean from the bottom of the Adriatic under the Emperor's flag. But this feeble effort of an imprudent man failed prematurely, owing to causes which have not yet been sufficiently explained. The project of Bolts appears to have been early adopted by the British subjects who are settled in Asia and who stand high in an active age for knowledge and for enterprise. They were naturally struck with the suggestion of Captain Cook 
what a gainful trade might be carried on from America to China for furs, and a brig of 60 tons with 20 men under the command of James Hanna was, in pursuit of this flattering object, dispatched from the river of Canton in April 1785, and after coasting northward and traversing the southern extremity of Japan, this brig arrived in the subsequent August at Nootka Sound, the American mart for peltry. Whatever may have been the success of Hanna in 1785, he performed, in a larger vessel, a similar voyage in 1786. In this year, the merchants of Bombay sent two vessels under the direction of James Strange, while the traders of Bengal dispatched two ships, which were commanded by the lieutenants Mears and Tipping, to the American coast for furs, in the hope of Indian profits. These several adventures, the gains of which were no doubt greatly amplified, incited to similar pursuits the torpid spirit of the Portuguese at Macau, whose fathers had been the discoverers, the conquerors and monopolists of the East. These enterprises have proved extremely important to the world, though their profits, considering the capital and the risks, were not enviably great. These enterprises, however, by enlarging the limits of discovery, made navigation safer in the North Pacific Ocean. They familiarised the South Sea Islanders to European persons and manners and traffic. They taught the American savages that strength must always be subordinate to discipline. And having discovered the Ahua Indians on the borders of Nootka Sound, who had so far advanced from their savage state as to refuse to sell to Mr. Strange for any price, the peltry which they had already engaged to Mr. Hanna, these enterprises have ascertained this exhilarating truth to mankind, that civilization and morals must forever accompany each other. In the affliction of ages, periods often arise when mankind, by a consentaneous spirit, pursue with ardour analogous enterprises. At the same epoch, Columbus and Gamma were employed, the one in discovering the lands in the West, the other in exploring the regions of the East. In the present times, the British, the French and the Spaniards have, at the same moment, busied themselves in searching every coast and every creek with the glorious purpose of benefiting the human race by adding to their happiness. While those adventures were thus performed from the eastern extremities of Asia to the western shores of America, private persons undertook a more arduous voyage of a like kind from England. It was in May 1785 that Richard Cadman, Etches and other traders entered into a commercial partnership, under the title of the King George's Sound Company, for carrying on a fur trade from the western coast of America to China. For this purpose they obtained a license from the South Sea Company, who, without carrying on any traffic themselves, stand in the mercantile way of more adventurous merchants. They procured also a similar license from the East India Company, who at the same time engaged to give them a freight of teas from Canton. This enterprise of the King George's Sound Company alone evinces what English co-partnerships and English capitals could undertake and execute, were they less opposed by prejudice and restrained by monopolies. In order to execute this design, the King George's Sound Company purchased a ship of 320 tons and a snow of 200 tons. Having thus a size and burden which Captain Cook, after adequate trials, recommended as the fittest for distant employments, and which, owing to the merchant's experience, England happily enjoys in the greatest numbers. These vessels were immediately put into dock in order that they might be completely fitted for so long a voyage. With all the skill and diligence of the shipwrights of the Thames, it was not, however, till the 8th of July that these vessels were moored at Deptford for the convenience of fitting their rigging, engaging seamen, and taking on board such stores and other necessaries as were judged needful for a voyage of such length and variety. The best provisions were purchased, as being the cheapest in the end, and great attention was used in providing those articles, which were thought most likely to preserve the health of the crews by adding to their comforts. In the meantime, the owners appointed me commander of the larger vessel and of the expedition, and George Dixon of the smaller, both of us having accompanied Captain Cook on his last voyage into the Pacific Ocean, were deemed most proper for an adventure which required no common knowledge and experience. Other officers of competent talents were at the same time appointed, in order that they might know each other and facilitate the novelty of this enterprise attracted the notice of several persons who were eminent either for talents or station, and who promoted this voyage by their countenance, or strengthened the company by their approbation. 
When Sir Joseph Banks and Lord Mulgrave, Mr Rose and Sir John Dick came on board, the Secretary of the Treasury named the largest vessel the King George, and the President of the Royal Society called the smallest the Queen Charlotte. Exclusive of the profits of traffic, or the advantages of discovery, this voyage was destined to other national objects. Several gentlemen's sons, who had shown an inclination to engage in a seafaring life, were put under my care for the purpose of being early initiated in the knowledge of a profession which requires length of experience rather than supereminence of genius. I at, at the same time, we engaged William Philpot Evans and Joseph Woodcock, two of the pupils of Mr Wales, the master of the mathematical school in Christ's Hospital, who were at once able to assist in teaching the boys the rudiments of navigation and might be usefully employed in taking views of remarkable lands and in constructing charts of commodious harbours. Having got most of our stores on board, we proceeded down the river and arrived off Gravesend on the 29th of August. This evening, I read articles of agreement respecting the voyage to both the ship's companies, which some of them at first refused to sign. But after a proper explanation, they all cheerfully consented, except two of my own crew, whom I immediately discharged, as I had resolved to engage no seaman who was not perfectly satisfied with the articles and altogether contented with his station. The next morning, the crews were paid their river wages with a month's advance, and having stood towards the downs with a fresh southwesterly breeze, the ships came to an anchor the same evening in Margate Roads. Early in the morning of the 31st, we got under sail and proceeded towards the downs, still having a fresh breeze at southwest and at eight, the same morning, we anchored off Deal in 82 fathom water, the South Foreland Point bearing southwest, distant five miles, and Deal Castle northwest, two miles distant. We lay at anchor during the rest of September, employed in procuring fresh beef and various refreshments. Next morning at one o'clock, we weighed anchor and stood towards the channel. But meeting with gales at once fresh and contrary, we were obliged to anchor under Dungeness in the evening of the 3rd, with the lighthouse bearing southwest by west, about four miles distant. A remarkable circumstance happened while we lay here. Charles Gilmore, one of the boys under my care, being at the main topmast head, attempted to come down by the topmast backstay. But losing his hold when he was almost at the top, he fell directly into the main chains. Yet he providentially received no hurt, and was not the least frightened with his fall. At three o'clock in the morning of the 4th, we weighed anchor and stood towards Spithead, where we arrived at one o'clock on the 7th. During our stay here, the crews were constantly served with fresh beef and plenty of vegetables. The employments which principally engaged us were setting up the rigging and replacing the water that had been expended. Several spare anchors and a variety of such other stores were purchased, which we judged would be necessary during so long a voyage, and with which we had not been supplied in the Thames. Every necessary business being completed, on the 15th, all hands were employed in getting the vessels ready for sea, and at seven o'clock in the morning of the 16th, we got under sail with light variable winds. By noon we were close in with Dunnows, which caused us to ply occasionally. At four in the afternoon, having a fresh gale and very hazy weather, we bore up for St. Helens, and soon afterwards anchored in St. Helens Road, Bembridge Point bearing southwest by west, three miles distant. At six in the morning of the 17th, we weighed and made sail with moderate variable winds, the weather hazy with rain. At noon, St. Catherine's Point bore northwest, five miles distant. From this to the 19th, we had little variety, the weather in general was thick and hazy, with frequent showers of rain. About seven o'clock in the evening of the 19th, the caskets bore east-northeast three leagues distant. It being then nearly calm, a rapid tide set us strongly towards them, and at one time we were not two miles distant from those very dangerous rocks. However, before nine o'clock, the tide eased, and at ten we could just discern the lights, bearing southwest by south, distant about three leagues. At ten in the morning of the 20th, we saw the island of Guernsey bearing south, at the distance of three or four leagues. Our latitude at noon was 49 de Gram, 30 nights north, the northeast point of Guernsey bearing south-southeast, five miles distant. At six o'clock, we came to anchor in Guernsey Road with the best bower, in 13 fathom water, the castle bearing west by south half a mile, and St. Martin's point south-southwest, 
one mile distant. We moored with the kedge to the east-southeast. A voyage round the world, but more particularly to the northwest coast of America by Captain Nathaniel Portlock. Chapter 2. Various refreshments procured at Guernsey. Leave that place and proceed on the voyage. Remarkable rock at east end of Madeira. Lay to in Funchal Bay, whilst dispatches are sent on board one of His Majesty's ships, Bonavista, Mayo, Sal. Arrival at St. Targo. Occurrences there. Refreshments to be met with. Departure from Thence. Precautions against the rain and sultry weather near the equator. Fortunate preservation of a boy who fell overboard, pass a vast quantity of shrimp spawn, arrival at Port Egmont, Falklands Island. As it was the intention of our owners to have the same quantity of spirits daily served out to the ship's companies as is customary on board His Majesty's vessels, our principal business at Guernsey was to procure a proper supply of liquor for that purpose. Accordingly, we received on board a considerable quantity of spirits, together with port wine and cider. Various stores were at the same time taken from my vessel and put on board the Queen Charlotte. These different employments engaged the whole of our time till the afternoon of the 24th, when all hands were busy in getting ready for sea. At five o'clock in the morning of the 25th, a breeze sprung up at southeast, and soon afterwards the pilot came on board. At eight we unmoored and got ready to heave ahead. When the wind suddenly chopped round to south-southwest, at noon, we had very strong gales and squally weather. About one o'clock, the wind veering to west-southwest, it was my intention to have weighed and gone to sea, but the weather in an instant changing its appearance and beginning to blow very hard, prevented me. The gale still increasing, I gave orders for the top gallant masts to be struck and got down upon deck. I likewise caused preparation to be made for striking the top masts and spliced one of the new cables to the best bower. Intending, should the gale continue till the evening, to lower the topmasts, to have veered to a cable and half on the best bower, and half a cable on the small one. If the ship had not held fast under these precautions, I should have run through the little rustles, as I had a pilot on board, and by having the lower yards aloft, might have brought her under the courses, and on occasion the topsails close reefed, but fortunately towards evening, the wind got round to the northward, though it continued blowing in sudden gusts through the night. At nine o'clock in the morning of the 26th, having a moderate breeze at north-northwest, we weighed anchor and got under sail. At noon, St. Martin's Point bore northeast by north, distant one mile and a half. Our observation gave 49 deg 20 north latitude. At four in the afternoon, the pilot left us. Salt provisions were first served out to the crews on the 27th, at a pound a man a day, together with half a pound of potatoes. At noon, we saw seven isles, which bore south eight or nine leagues, and the Isle of Bass southwest by south seven leagues distant. Our latitude was 49 to 6 north, and the longitude by lunar observation, through 50, 45 west. In the evening of the 28th, a heavy gale came on at southeast by south, attended with drizzling rain, which brought us under reefed top sails. The gale still increasing, we handed the fore and mizzen top sails. At half past eleven, we hauled round in consequence of seeing a light bearing about southwest, which had much the appearance of a lighthouse, and which, if a real one, must have been Ushant light. We judged ourselves to be about two leagues from it. The gale continued during the night with unceasing violence, attended with heavy rain. As we saw no land on the morning of the 29th, it is probable the light which was seen the preceding evening was the stern light of some vessel which stood on a contrary tack. At six o'clock in the morning of the 30th, I acquainted Captain Dixon with my intention of steering west-southwest as long as the wind continued favourable. This day, portable soup was served to the ship's company, with half a pint of peas each man three times per week. We saw a number of land birds, one of which was caught. I suppose them to have been driven off the French coast by the heavy southeast gales which we recently had met with. Our latitude at noon was 47 degree 58 Tabern North, and the longitude 9 de Xiuad west. In the afternoon we sounded with a line of 130 fathoms, but got no bottom. During the afternoon and night, 
we had light variable airs with frequent calms. At 10 o'clock in the forenoon of the 1st of October, we passed a Danish galliot. On this occasion, our company's ensign was hoisted in hopes she might take notice of us and mention it on her arrival in Europe. In the afternoon of the 2nd, a heavy gale of wind came on at northwest, which occasioned us to close reef the topsails. Towards evening, the weather growing more moderate, we made and shortened sail occasionally, in order to give the Queen Charlotte an opportunity of coming up with us. Indeed, we have often been obliged to take this step since our departure from England, as we found the King George to have greatly the advantage of her in sailing, especially when going large or by the wind. Towards evening on the 3rd, the weather having a very unpromising appearance, I kept under an easy sail and hauled up to west-south-west for fear of being too near Cape Finisterre. In the night, I had passed its latitude, but we had a light northwesterly wind, the clouds looking black and lowering. During the whole of the 4th and part of the 5th, we perceived a considerable rippling on the water, which I have reason to think was caused by a current, and our observation giving, for the last 24 hours, 24 miles less westing than the longitude by account, and the observed latitude giving 23 miles more than by account, I judge this current set to the southeast at a considerable rate. Our latitude at noon was 40 firm de Gaume 48 degrees north, and the longitude 11 degrees 40 or west. On the 7th, having very fine weather, the crew's bedding was got up to air, and every part below was thoroughly cleaned. From this to the 12th, nothing particular occurred. But at 8 o'clock that morning, we saw the island Porto Santo bearing west by north about 20 leagues distant. On this we hauled up to have a nearer view of it with a moderate breeze at north-northeast. At noon the north point of the island bore north 60 at Adam west, distant 14 leagues. We changed our course to west by south and steered for the east end of Madeira, which, having been one of the first of the western discoveries, has facilitated future voyages. Our observation at noon gave 33 degree 7 north latitude and the longitude was 15 degree 29 west. During the afternoon, we kept standing for Madeira, the west end of which, at 6 o'clock, bore due west by 12 leagues distant. As I wished to look into Funchal Bay and was not willing to lose the opportunity of doing it, we shortened sail and brought to during the night with the ship's head to the northward. At dawn on the 13th, we bore away and made sail. The east point of the island of Madeira, when it bears about west by north, has a most remarkable appearance. The land seems to be divided by many extraordinary chasms, and there is a large rock at the extreme east point, in the shape of a fortlet, which is perforated so as to form an uncommon arch. There is also a rock greatly resembling a spire, which seems entirely detached from the island, and which one might suppose could never resist the heavy surfs that constantly beat against it. By noon, we were close in with the island and kept finding for Funchal Bay, with a fine breeze at northeast. Soon after five o'clock, being abreast of the bay, we found riding there His Majesty's ship Grampus, of fifty guns, Commodore Edward Thompson, and under his command, His Majesty's ship Nautilus of sixteen guns, which were bound on the African station. We hove to, and I sent Mr. M. Leod, my chief mate, on board the Commodore with dispatches, in order to request that he would be so obliging as to send them ashore to the British Consul with a request that he would forward them to England by the first conveyance. At the same time, I discharged one of my crew and sent him on board the Commodore at his own request. Mr. Milliard returned about eight o'clock, and we made sail and stood to the southwest with a fine easterly breeze and clear weather. Nothing occurred worthy of note until the 22nd, when the water appeared remarkably coloured. We sounded at noon with a 130 fathom line, but got no bottom. Our latitude was 17 degree 19 of north and the longitude 26 degree of 55 west. At five in the afternoon, we saw the Isle of Sal bearing west northwest half west 11 leagues distant. At six o'clock, we shortened sail and stretched to the northward under the topsails, being apprehensive of falling in with some rocks which are laid down in the charts, about 10 or 12 leagues to the eastward of this island. At six in the morning of the 23rd, we made sail and bore up south. By mid-forenoon, we were in the lee of Bonavista, 
the extremes of which bore from north 49th Antigramat west to north 86 Degar west, distant about seven leagues. Our meridional observation gave 16 Deg 7 to north latitude, and the mean result of several lunar observations taken in the morning gave the longitude at noon 22 degrees 27 45. West, in this situation, the Isle of Sal appears together as one high mountain, and Bonavista as a number of detached hillocks. At two in the morning of the 24th, the Isle of Mayo appeared in sight, bearing west about three leagues distant. On this, we hauled up to south-southeast in order to give the island a wide berth. At five, we again made sail and stood for St. Jago, which we saw soon after seven o'clock, bearing west by north. The Isle of Mayo is considerably elevated and the land seems capable of yielding most of the productions natural to tropical climates. However, it does not appear that the inhabitants take any great pains to cultivate it. Formerly, this place was much frequented for salt, which was purchased by British ships and carried to America. But since salt has been so plentifully gathered in the Bahamas, that trade has greatly declined. With a fresh trade breeze, we stood well in for St. Jago, and at noon anchored in Port Pryor Bay, in eight fathoms of water over a sandy bottom, the fort bearing northwest by north, the east point of the bay east by south, and the south point southwest by west. I ordered the ship to be moored with the stream anchor to the southwest, a cable each way. Our distance from the bottom of the bay, when moored, was about one mile and a quarter. Soon after we were moored, there arrived in the bay the Hammett, Captain Clark, and a brig commanded by Captain Hawkins, both from London on the southern whale fishery. Captain Clark had been out 14 months and had a hundred tons of oil on board. The brig was outward bound. The filling up our water and providing ourselves with such fresh provisions as the island afforded, being principal objects here, I went ashore in the afternoon, accompanied by Captain Dixon, to learn the best method of facilitating our various purposes. After waiting on the commander of the fort, who is styled the Captain Moore, and paying a port charge of four dollars for each vessel, I went to inspect the wells, of which there are two, and both afford excellent water. One of them indeed is rather inconvenient for watering, being situated at a considerable distance from the shore. But the other is not more than 200 yards from the beach, with a good rolling way for casks. I am inclined to think it is better water than the other, as I observed it the most frequented by the inhabitants. I was informed that a market would be held at Praia on the morrow, where I might have an opportunity of furnishing myself with livestock and various kinds of refreshments, which were brought by the inhabitants from several parts of the island. At daybreak on the morning of the 25th, the longboat was hoisted out, and I dispatched Mr. Hayward, my raised mate, with a party, to fill water, following them immediately myself in the whaleboat. When we got near the shore, beach the surf running pretty high, I ordered Mr. Hayward to bring the boat to an anchor, as I did not think it prudent for them to land with her. Having set the people busily to work in filling water casks and rafting them off to the boat, I again waited on the Captain Moore, accompanied by Captain Dixon. Whether he was dissatisfied with us the preceding afternoon, or for what other reason he might have, I cannot say, but he now behaved in a very haughty manner, seemed disposed to prevent us from procuring any refreshments, and even refused to do a little waiter to drink, though the day was extremely sultry, but on my intimating a design of waiting on the governor, who I was given to understand resided at some distance from Pryor, to inform him of this improper treatment of the subjects of a friendly power, he relaxed a little and suffered us to trade with the inhabitants without molestation. The people in general appeared well disposed and ready to serve us. The remainder of the day was taken up in purchasing hogs, goats, sheep and oranges, which were brought to market in tolerable plenty. Early this morning I dispatched two of my mates with the longboat and a watering party, following myself soon afterwards. They immediately got to work, and by nine o'clock a boatload of water was sent on board. I likewise sent some sheep, goats, hogs and oranges for the ship's company. The boat returned at eleven o'clock, and by one in the afternoon a second load was sent on board, which completed our water. Understanding there were bullocks on the island, and as I was desirous to purchase some for the cruise, I called on a gentleman who acts here as agent for a mercantile house in Lisbon, 
and who I found was the only dealer for beef. On inquiring about the price of bullocks, I was told $10 each, but as they were very small, I thought the price too high, and I only engaged one. It was with difficulty I prevailed on this merchant to accept money for it. He behaved politely and treated us hospitably. This behaviour from a stranger called for a similar return, and we sent him tea, brandy, wine, and a few other presents. The watering of both the ships being completed, I determined to stay here two days longer, in order to give the crews an opportunity of recreating themselves on shore, being convinced this recreation would be of infinite service to them, especially at a place where there is no great quantity of spirituous liquors to be procured. Accordingly, on the 27th and 28th, both the ship's companies had liberty given them to go ashore, half one day and half the other, while those on board were employed in getting the vessels ready for sea. An officer from each ship was always sent ashore with our sailors and had particular orders given to them to prevent, if possible, any disputes with the natives. These directions were strictly attended to and not a single quarrel happened. Our people conducted themselves on shore with the greatest regularity. In the afternoon of the 28th, arrived in the bay the sloop Captain Barrett from London bound to the coast, of Brazil and a brig from Martinique commanded by a Captain Clark. The Diana, in letting go her anchor, got foul of the Hammett's cable, on which I sent my longboat to her assistance, and she was extricated without much difficulty. Every business at this place being now completed, and the crews in excellent health, I determined to leave it at the first opportunity. At daylight in the morning of the 29th, we unmoored, and at ten o'clock weighed and made sail, standing out of the bay with a moderate easterly breeze. Previous to this, I took my leave of Captain Clark of the Hammett, to whom I acknowledge myself greatly indebted for his assistance on many occasions during our stay at Port Pryor. At noon, the extremes of the island bore from north 53 degrees west to north 33 degrees east, distant from the harbour about five miles. St. Jaco is generally mountainous and appears to be a very fine island, but our short stay here and my professional duties prevented me from making excursions into the interior parts. The valleys appear to be fertile. There is a great quantity of land which is fit for producing sugarcane, and I have no doubt that with proper care they might cultivate some of the finest in the world. They raise cotton, and some of the natives appear to be industrious, but are exceedingly oppressed by the Portuguese soldiers, who exact an exorbitant toll from the unhappy countrymen who bring their commodities to market. Their sheep, hogs, goats, turkeys, fowls, oranges, lemons, limes, bananas and plantains, all of which are tolerably plentiful and might be purchased at very reasonable prices were it not for those oppressions which seem to be without remedy from an inattentive government. On the whole, the variety of refreshments which St. Jago supplies renders it a very eligible station for those vessels to touch at, which are employed in the southern whale fishery or on voyages bound, as we were, around Cape Horn. Having for some days past observed a rippling on the water, in the morning of the 4th of November, the whaleboat was lowered down in order to try the current, and we found it setting southeast by east at the rate of five fathoms an hour. Our latitude then was 70 44s north and the longitude 21 to 55 west. On the 11th, one of our seamen caught a sparrow hawk, which had settled on the mizzen topsail yard. I could scarcely find any difference between this bird and that of the same species to be met with in England. The observation at noon gave 4 degree 39, north latitude, and 21 degree 30, west longitude. Since our departure from St. Jago, we had seldom been favoured with a steady northeast trade. The wind frequently was variable, at times blew very harsh and in heavy squalls. The weather was close and sultry, attended with violent showers of rain. Such heavy rains and close, sultry weather very often bring on sickness among seafaring men, and too much care cannot be taken to guard against their fatal effects. Accordingly, every precaution was taken that could be thought of for preserving the crews in good health. There, clothes and bedding were brought upon deck to air whenever the weather permitted. Great care was taken to keep the ships between decks clean and well aired, and crout, sweet wort, borkol and portable soup were alternately served to the ship's company. These methods, with the blessing of Providence, succeeded to the utmost of my wishes, so that there was not one person sick on board during this passage. 
although we laboured under the disagreeable circumstance of our decks and upper works, leaking so much that many of the sailors could scarcely lie dry in their beds, and the rain prevented the caulkers from being set to work so constantly as our situation required. This inconvenience arose from the vessel being new and consequently having never been in a warm climate. On the 15th, David Gilmore, a boy about ten years old, fell overboard from the weather main shrouds and not being able to swim, dropped astern. Every effort was used to save him, but all had proved ineffectual had not Providence enabled him to keep above water till the boat picked him up, when he was near two hundred yards from the vessel and had been eight or ten minutes in the ocean, and when he was almost dead with fright and fatigue. Early the next morning, we caught a shark which had the greatest part of a large porpoise in his moor. This circumstance gave us fresh cause of thankfulness for the preservation of Gilmore and additional reflections on the various accidents to which a seafaring life is subject. The same day we crossed the equator in the 25th degree of west longitude with a moderate trade wind at southeast and pleasant weather. In the afternoon of the 24th, Captain Dixon came on board the King George and I signified to him my intention of touching at Port Egmont in the Falkland Islands in order to refit and water our ships, as we then would be enabled to prosecute the voyage without attempting to make any harbour near Cape Horn, a circumstance which would most probably be attended with difficulty and delay. This point being determined on, Captain Dixon returned on board his own vessel about five o'clock and we stretched to the southward with a favourable breezer. Towards evening on the 27th, Two sandpipers of the striated species were seen about the ship. After staying near an hour, they flew away in the direction of east-northeast. John Hamilton Moore, in his chart of the Atlantic Ocean, set down an island called Ascension, about 19 de Grand 45 e's south latitude and 35 de Grand 25 e's west longitude. And judging myself at this time nearly in the same vicinity, and not being certain of its situation as to longitude, I brought to and lay by during the night. At daylight next morning we bore away and stood southwest until ten o'clock, and afterwards west southwest until noon, when our observation gave twenty degree one mats. South latitude, which is more than five leagues to the southward of Ascension, and it being only a needless waste of time to search for that island, I altered our course to southwest by south in order to make Port Egmont as speedily as possible. Several large flocks of boobies and shearwaters were hovering about to the northward of us, and it is possible that there may be land not far from this situation. In the morning of the 29th, we passed a large quantity of rockweed, which I supposed had been driven from the island of Trinidad and the small islands adjacent to it. A land bird, about the size of a wild duck, and very much like one, was seen flying about. We were at that time in 20 months as 14, south latitude and 35 dig full five, west longitude. The same precautions that I have already taken notice of were still strictly observed in regard to the preservation of health amongst our ship's companies and were attended with the happiest effects, as we had not at this time one sick person on board. The trade wind left us on the 3rd of December, about 24 de Grelland south latitude, and was succeeded by a fresh gale at southwest. On this we stretched to the eastward but the wind gradually shifting to the southward, we were again enabled to steer southwest by south. In the evening of the 6th, being in 26 degree and 24 south latitude and 39 degree and 26 west longitude, we steered southwest during the night, as there is a rock laid down in Moore's chart nearly in that situation. Fortunately, however, we saw nothing of it, and next morning we again steered our proper course with a fresh easterly breeze. On the 12th, we passed through a prodigious quantity of spawn, some of which was taken up, and, on examination, it was found to be the spawn of shrimps. Each separate particle was about the size of a small bean, of a substance like blubber or jelly, quite transparent, and contained a small shrimp alive but not matured. I have reason to suppose this spawn comes out of the River Plata, as we were nearly opposite its mouth our latitude being 34 degree 35 south and the longitude 45 degree 37 west. The great numbers of sperm whales which are generally met with here are doubtless induced by these transparent substances to frequent a situation where they constantly find such abundant food. On the 15th, being in 37 degree 44, 
south latitude and 48 dig 20, west longitude, we passed a great number of sperm whales, a large piece of bark, which appeared to have been recently separated from the tree, was seen floating in the water, and albatrosses, shearwaters and a number of birds which were entirely white and greatly resembled a pigeon were flying about in every direction. During the forenoon of the 20th, the water was very much coloured, but as there is no known land near the situation we then were in, and having a brisk favourable gale, I did not choose to interrupt our progress by sounding. We saw a number of albatrosses, shearwaters, and silver-coloured birds, a shark and several whales. Our observation at noon gave 42 dig 26s, south latitude, and the longitude was 53 dig 39 west. In the evening of the 21st, we had a fresh gale of wind at west-southwest, and the sea breaking in a very extraordinary manner, we sounded but got no bottom with a line of 60 fathoms. The next morning, large patches of rockweed were floating on the water, and a great variety of birds such as albatrosses, shearwaters and stormy petrels were flying about the vessels. The latitude then was 45 degree 26 in south and the longitude 54 degree 3 east west. From this to the 2nd of January, we in general had very tempestuous weather, attended with violent squalls. A variety of birds in great numbers were daily seen, such as Port Egmont hens, albatrosses, petrels, penguins, etc. Large quantities of rockweed constantly floated in the water, and it being much coloured, we were frequently induced to sound, but we never got any bottom with a 120 fathom line. At length, early in the morning of the second, we got soundings in 72 fathoms of water over a bottom of fine grey sand, and immediately afterwards saw the Falkland Islands, the land then in sight bearing from south to southeast, about seven leagues distant. During the whole day, we had light variable winds and very hazy weather which obliged us to ply occasionally and prevented our getting into the land. About 11 o'clock in the forenoon of the 3rd, being about six leagues distant from the land, we saw something from the masthead which had greatly the appearance of a ship under sail bearing southeast of us, but on a nearer approach it was found to be a rock whitened over with the dung of birds. It is situated about three leagues from the land. Our latitude at that time was 55th to Guanmat South, and the longitude 58 de Grand 48 West. In this situation, we had soundings in 72 fathoms of water over a bottom of fine sand, and as we stood in shore, they lessened continually. It happened rather unluckily that we did not have a separate chart of the Falkland Islands on board of either vessel. This circumstance, together with the variable winds and foggy weather we constantly had, caused us to ply with caution though I was very desirous to make a harbour as soon as possible. The water we could get at being nearly expended without breaking up the hold, which I did not like to undertake in such stormy weather as we had recently experienced. At six o'clock in the afternoon, seeing the appearance of a harbour to the south, southwest, I sent my whaleboat on board the Queen Charlotte for Captain Dixon and communicated to him my intention of standing in for it the next morning as we, having then nearly a calm, had no chance of coming to anchor whilst daylight continued. We now had soundings in 26 fathom water, over a bottom of soft sand inclining to mud. The white rock just mentioned bore north 40 Wamada east, distant 4 or 5 leagues. The easternmost point of land in sight north 61 to east, and the westernmost point south 65 and west, about 7 miles distant. We tacked during the night as occasion required, and soon after two o'clock in the morning of the 4th stood for our expected harbour. But on our getting well in with the land, we found ourselves disappointed, the inlet not affording any shelter for vessels to lie at anchor. On this, we stood to the westward, as I judged we were too much to the eastward for Port Egmont, which I wished to make. In the morning, we had light airs, and so thick a fog that no land could be seen, but at ten o'clock, some highland made its appearance over the fog bank, and presently afterwards we saw low land bearing from south by east to south by west, about four miles distant. We had soundings in 32 fathom. The low land was situated about three miles from shore and seemed to form two islands, but on a nearer approach I found that they were joined by a reef and that a rocky shoal ran out from each extreme nearly a mile. We plied along shore with variable winds and foggy weather until daylight in the morning of the 5th, when, having a favourable breeze from the northward, 
we stood well in for the land. Soon afterward, a fine opening presented itself to the southwest, which promised an excellent harbour. On this, I ordered the whaleboat to be lowered down and sent Mr. Maleod, my chief mate, with orders to sound the entrance and to direct Captain Dixon to keep ahead of the King George. By five o'clock, we approached the opening very fast, on which I made a signal for the whaleboat to push on and look out for an anchoring place. Soon after six o'clock, the boat being about four miles ahead, made the signal for shoal water, which caused us to haul the wind and stand off. After sounding directly across the entrance, the boat proceeded on and presently disappeared within the east point of the opening. Notwithstanding which, I stood in under very easy sail, being doubtful whether we should meet with a harbour. Mr. M. Leod not having as yet made the appointed signal for finding one. At the same time, we were within some small islands, with an increasing wind which blew directly on shore, and there was every appearance of an approaching gale. However, soon after nine o'clock, I had the pleasure of seeing the Union flag flying on the top of a high hill over the east point of the opening, which was the signal for a safe harbour. I immediately made a signal for the boat to return, not thinking it, prudent to run in until I had the mate's report, but that no time might be lost. I requested Captain Dixon to send his whaleboat ahead to sound, and should they meet with shoal water, to continue on as a mark for the vessels to sail by. At about ten o'clock, Mr. Maleod returned and reported that he had found a good harbour and a place tolerably convenient for watering. When the signal was made for shoal water, he was in seven fathom water, over a bed of rocks covered with weeds which came up to the surface and which were situated near the middle of the channel. We stood in for the harbour under an easy sail, and at eleven o'clock came to anchor with the best bower on the east shore, in twelve fathom water, over a sandy bottom. But under the surface, I judge it to be a stiff mud. The ship was moored with the stream anchor to the southward. When moored, we were landlocked, except at the entrance we came in by, the east point of which bore northwest by west half-west, and the west point west by north, distant from the land to the northward about three quarters of a mile. A voyage round the world, but more particularly to the northwest coast of America, by Captain Nathaniel Portlock. Chapter 3 Various employments in Port Egmont, ruins of a town discovered, meet with two ships employed in the oil trade, method of extracting oil from the blubber of the sea elephant, several birds described, refreshments obtained there, leave Port Egmont and proceed to States Bay difference between the sea lion and sea elephant pointed out, remains of a wreck discovered, leave Falklands Islands and proceed on the voyage, pass Staten's Land, stormy weather in Dublin Cape Horn, pick up a number of turtle, fruitless search for Los Magos, arrive in sight of Ohaihi. I immediately after we were moored I ordered the whaleboat to be lowered down and went ashore, accompanied by Captain Dixon, to inspect the watering place pointed out by my mate, which was situated on the north shore. It afforded excellent water which ran through an immense bed of large stones. However, the path to the watering place was also very stony and liable to damage our casks. Therefore, I was induced to look out for a more eligible spot. We searched along the shore to the eastward and found several runs of good water, but the access to every one of them was equally stony. As these stones occupy a number of valleys whose declivity is considerable, and which are overlooked by high mountains, I think it very probable that they have been collected together by impetuous torrents of rain, though this seems not to have happened very lately, as they are universally covered with a kind of white moss. In the course of our walk we encountered a number of sea lions on the beach, several of which were killed for the sake of their fat, or blubber, to make oil for our lamps and various other purposes. By the time they were loaded into the boat, the day was far spent, which prompted us to return on board. During the afternoon, we had fresh gales from the northward with frequent squalls, but at night the wind shifted to the southwest, and the weather grew moderate. Early in the morning of the 6th, I went in the whaleboat to search for a convenient watering place on the west side of the harbour, not being entirely satisfied with any I had seen so far, and also to sound the bay to the southward. Captain Dixon also went in his boat for the same purpose, focusing on the northern shore. 
We found soundings from 12 to 10 fathom water over a sandy bottom until we reached within a quarter of a mile of the shore. Then the water shallowed to 5 and 6 fathom, with a bottom of rocks. Around the point of land to the southward, we still encountered a rocky bottom with 6 and 7 fathom water. After proceeding to the westward, for about 2 miles, we encountered a sandy bar that runs quite across, forming a bay within the other. Small vessels might go over this. Bar at high water and lie perfectly secure, but it not answering our purpose, we landed and walked into the country, which was all in a wild state, without the least appearance of cultivation, and not a stick of wood to be seen as far as the eye could reach. But a good substitute, as fuel, may easily be procured, as is the root of a long, coarse grass, that grows in many places quite to the water's edge, and when dry would make excellent turf. In our walk we picked up an iron hoop, and saw some dung which appeared like that of a hog, but our principal design in making this excursion was not answered, as we could not find any water so convenient as that to the northward of our present situation, on which I returned on board at one o'clock, and determined to make the ship as secure as possible, in order that we might proceed on our watering business without the least delay. At two o'clock, the wind blowing very strong at southwest, we got the top gallant masts down upon deck. The top masts were struck close down to the rigging, and the lower yards kept aloft. In the night the weather grew more moderate, and at four o'clock in the morning of the 7th, the longboat was hoisted out and sent on shore with a watering party. The cables were got upon deck, in order to get at the empty butts under them. At eleven o'clock, the boat returned with a load of water which filled thirteen butts in the main hold. She was immediately dispatched for another turn of water. During the afternoon, we had fresh gales and very squally weather, so that it was with great difficulty the longboat got a second turn of water on board. This completed the main hold, and the cables were again coiled down. On the 8th, I gave as many men as could be conveniently spared from the ship leave to recreate themselves on shore, and a boat to remain with them all day, in order to bring them on board in the evening. The 25th December being at sea, and the weather very unsettled, we declined celebrating Christmas until a more favourable opportunity. And this being a very convenient time, I gave all hands a double allowance of brandy and some fresh pork which I killed for the occasion. These indulgences, together with a good walk on shore, made the Christmas pass very pleasantly. And in the evening I had the satisfaction of seeing my ship's company in good spirits, not a single man incapable of doing his duty from drunkenness or any other cause. Our people, when on shore, made excursions into various parts of the country, and some of them discovered the ruins of a town, with some garden ground adjoining, in which were a few flowers, several sorts of vegetables in small quantities, such as horseradish, shallots, a few small potatoes, and some celery, which was in a degenerate state. They likewise saw a hog, but he was so wild they could not catch him. This forenoon we completed our water, and the longboat was sent for a load of stone ballast. The people who remained on board yesterday had liberty given them to go on shore. They landed on the west side of the harbour, near the ruins of the town I have already taken notice of, and at some distance in the country saw a bullock, a cow, and several hogs, which probably were left behind when the place was evacuated. From the 9th to the 14th we were engaged in various necessary employments. About seven tons of stone ballast were taken on board, and our boats likewise assisted the Queen Charlotte in the same business, as she required a much larger quantity of ballast than the King George. A number of seals and sea lions were killed for the sake of their skins and blubber, and the carpenters were fully employed in caulking the quick work and other parts that were found defective, in order that we might proceed to sea as soon as possible. I gave the people liberty to go on shore at every opportunity, being convinced that land, air and exercise conduce very much to preserve the health of seamen on long voyages. During this interval we generally had fresh gales at southwest, with squally weather and frequent rain. At nine o'clock this evening, a sloop arrived in the harbour and anchored off the town. Early next morning, Captain Coffin came on board the King George and informed me that his sloop is named the Speedwell and is tender to a ship called the United States, commanded by Captain Hughesley and now lying in a good harbour at Swan Island, in company with the Canton, Captain Whippy. Both these vessels were employed in the oil trade and had nearly completed their cargoes. 
the United States having 300 tons of oil on board and the Canton about half that quantity. The chief part of their oil is procured from animals they call sea elephants. These creatures are certainly amphibious, as they generally frequent sandy bays or the ands of bays that are composed of smooth, flat stones. A good sea elephant yields near half a ton of oil, which is produced without boiling. The blubber is so exceedingly free. If put into casks, the blubber will soon run to oil, and afterwards it may be strained off into other casks. But this process being rather tedious, where there are very large quantities of blubber. Captain Coffin informed me they had discovered a better and more expeditious method. They build a tank on shore, of a size sufficiently large to contain any quantity of oil they expect to procure. Over this tank, a grating work is fixed by way of strainer. The blubber is then thrown on the grating, and weights being put on it. The oil is soon pressed out. Adjoining to the large tank is a smaller one, into which the oil is strained a second time. By this means, it is rendered perfectly fine and may be put into casks at pleasure. From the description given by the late Captain Cook of an animal he saw at New Georgia, I have no doubt but it was a sea elephant, and there is every reason to suppose they may be found at that island in great plenty. The same may be said of Kerguelen's land, where we touched in Captain Cook's last voyage, and found a number of them, which we then assumed to be sea lions but this was certainly a mistaken notion, for they were very tame and killed with the greatest ease, whilst the sea lions met with at this place are quite furious, and ought not to be attacked without great caution. That the feathered tribe which inhabit these islands are very numerous and in great variety, but most of them are already well known. However, I procured specimens of the yellow-winged bunting, the rusty-crowned plover and the cenarius lark. Since my arrival in England, I have obtained correct drawings, from which the annexed engravings are taken, and a description of them may perhaps not be improperly introduced in this place. The yellow-winged bunting is nearly the size of a yellowhammer, length five inches and a half. The bill is brown, the plumage on the upper part of the body a reddish-brown, the sides of the head, quite round the eye, the chest and fore part of the abdomen white, at the lower part of the last a bar of reddish, the breast yellowish, the rest of the underpart dusky. The lesser wing coverts yellow, the rest of the wing, like the back and edges of the feathers, yellowish, the tail reddish-brown, all but the two outer feathers on each side, which are yellow, legs yellow. The female is much like the male, but the lesser wing coverts inclined to yellowish ash colour, the sides of the head, the chest and throat, dusky white. Rusty-crowned plover, size of kestrel-ringed plover, length seven inches and a half, bill three quarters of an inch long and black, the forehead, chest, all the forepart of the neck, the upper part of the breast and the belly white. Across the top of the head is a bar of black, passing downwards on each side of the neck in an irregular manner to the wings and from thence forwards on the lower part of the breast, forming thereon a board bar. Behind the black bar on the top of the head is a circle of rusty iron colour surrounding the back part of the head as a wreath. The crown of the head within this, as well as all the upper parts of the body and wings, are cinerous brown exuit the greater quills and tail, which are black. The legs are also black. The female is greatly similar to the male in colour, but wants the rusty-coloured wreath at the back part of the head. Cinerous lark. This species is smaller than the skylark, length six inches. The bill and legs are black. The plumage and upper parts of the body are ash colour, and the underpart the same, but much paler, inclining to white near the vent. The quills and tail are black, the outer edges of the feathers of both margined with white. This species is a variety of the lark found at New Zealand. Every necessary business being now completed, it was my determination to get to sea immediately, although we had fresh gales at southwest, attended with rain. But having occasion to send one of my mates on board the speedwell, he returned with a message from Captain Coffin informing me that Captain Huffe had on board the United States six or seven thousand fur seal skins, and that he had reason to suppose they would be disposed of at a moderate price. An opportunity of procuring such a quantity of skins was by no means to be lost, especially as there was a great probability of their selling well in China. I therefore sent for Captain Dixon immediately and consulted him on the business. He was entirely of my opinion, and we agreed to purchase them, if the price was not too high, and that this affair might delay us as little as possible, 
we learned to request Captain Coffin to pilot the vessels to Swan Island, where, as I have already observed, the United States lay at anchor. At four o'clock in the morning of the 16th, the Speedwell sailed for a bay on the east side of Keppel's Island. At five o'clock, we unmoored and got under sail in order to run farther into the bay. About ten, we anchored in twelve fathom water over a muddy bottom, the town bearing west-northwest, distant one mile and a half, the stony valley where we watered, north, three miles and a half, and the southeast end of Keppel's Land, east-northeast, six miles distant. We moored with the best bower to the westward and the stream to the eastward. At noon I went in my whale boat accompanied by Captain Dixon, after the speedwell, to have some conversation with Captain Coffin respecting the skins. We got on board about two o'clock, but the information he gave us about them was little more than I had already received by his message. However, he very readily undertook to pilot us to Swan Island, through the inner passage, as soon as he had got a quantity of elephant blubber on board, which lay at one of the outer keys. The day being far spent, and our distance from the ships considerable, we remained on board the Speedwell all night, and at five o'clock in the morning of the 17th, set off for our vessels, with an intention of surveying the bay to the eastward. At the same time, the Speedwell sailed for the quay where their blubber was left. At one o'clock I got on board my own ship, and the Speedwell arriving soon afterwards, I sent for Captain Coffin, and we agreed to sail in the morning if the wind and weather permitted. He then returned on board his own vessel. Some of my people that were on shore for recreation returned in the evening with a large sow and several small pigs, which they had caught at some distance in the country, and also great plenty of geese, ducks and various kinds of birds, caught chiefly near the seaside. During the night we had strong gales from the south-southwest, with squalls and rain. Next morning I sent my boat on board the Speedwell for Captain Coffin. He came immediately on board the King George, but was of the opinion that it would not be prudent for us to sail with the present unsettled weather. I therefore determined to keep my present situation till a more favourable opportunity. The wind blew very strong all day at south-southwest, attended with frequent squalls, but towards evening the weather grew moderate. At four o'clock in the morning of the 19th we unmoored, and at seven got under sail with a moderate breeze at south, shaping our course for Swan Island. The Speedwell took the inner passage, and we stood round Saunders's island. By eight o'clock we were just in the entrance of Port Egmont, and the wind inclining to southwest, we plied to windward, and at noon were working through the passage between Saunders's island and Low Islands. During the afternoon we had variable winds, with fogs and clear weather by turns. At eight o'clock, the west end of Saunders's island bore east by south three leagues, a ridge of rocks which extends from it, east-north-east five miles, the west end of Low Islands four leagues, and the east end of Carcass Island south by west four leagues distant. Soon after ten o'clock, we anchored off Carcass Island Bay, in fifteen fathom water over a bottom of coarse sand and broken shells. The morning of the 20th was ushered in with a thick fog and quite calm, but about seven o'clock a breeze sprung up from the westward and the weather cleared up, on which Captain Coffin came on board the King George in order to pilot us into West Point Harbour, the passage from our present situation to that place being amongst a number of small islands. He likewise put a pilot on board the Queen Charlotte. On this we immediately weighed and at nine o'clock passed between Beachy Island and the easternmost of the Middle Rocks. There is a most excellent harbour on the south side of Carcasses Island, well sheltered, which may easily be known by a small island that lies in the middle of it, within which a vessel may anchor with the greatest safety. At noon we anchored with the best bower in West Point Harbour, in seven fathom water, over a sandy bottom, and moored with the kedge. When moored, the north point of the harbour bore west-northwest one mile distant, and the west point of West Point Island West half north, distance three leagues. This harbour is certainly one of the finest in the world, being sheltered from east winds and easy of access, the wind being unfavourable and the weather very hazy during the afternoon we kept our situation, but the morning of the twenty west proving fine, we weighed and got under sail at seven o'clock. Soon afterwards, being directly opposite the southwest point of West Island, the gusts of wind came on so very heavy from the high land, that we were obliged to clue all up and keep the ship large. However, after we had rounded the point 
and got clear of the highland. We had a moderate steady breeze from west-northwest. The weather being very hazy, we steered southwest by south to make the Middle Islands, and at half past ten o'clock, the south end of Middle Islands bore southeast by east half east, one league distant, and Swan Island south half east, four leagues distant. At noon, we fixed an azimuth, which gave 50 degree 44 south latitude. In this situation, Loop's Head, which is the east point of the entrance into Swan Island Bay, bore southeast half east, distant about two leagues, and the westernmost of the Middle Islands east southeast, three miles distant. At one o'clock, we passed Loop's Head and stood into States Bay, so named by Captain Benjamin Huffy, who first discovered it when on a whaling voyage to these islands some years ago. Within this bay are several fine harbours, the principal of which I shall distinguish by the name of Huffy's Harbour in honour of the discoverer. Here we found riding at anchor the United States, the Canton, and the Speedwell and Maria Sloops tenders to the United States. At three o'clock, we anchored with the best bower in States Bay, in eighteen fathom water, over a muddy bottom, and moored with the kedge. When moored, the outer end of a reef without us bore north half east, one mile distant, the entrance of the bay east by north one mile and a half, and a small island south by west half west, one mile and a half distant. As soon as the ship was secured, I went in my whaleboat, accompanied by Captain Dixon, on board the United States, to have some conversation with Captain Huffy, respecting the purchase of his fur seals, but we found he was not disposed to part with them, and I am inclined to think he meant them for an eastern market, as he mentioned to me his intention of going to China immediately on his return home. The business which had detained us here for some days past being now finally put to an end, nothing prevented us from getting to sea immediately. However, as our next passage was likely to prove a long one, I was induced to give the sailors a day's liberty on shore prior to our leaving these islands. Accordingly, on the 22nd, most of the people from both vessels had a walk on shore, and the weather proved very favourable. I went along with Captain Huffy over to the north side of State's Baby, and there found a sea elephant, which at once it convinced me that those animals we saw at Kerguelen's land were really sea elephants, and that we were totally mistaken in calling them sea lions. I have already taken notice of how very different these animals are in their nature, and I now had a most convincing proof of it, for the elephant was killed with all the ease imaginable, but at the north point of the bay a number of sea lions were drawn up in a kind of rank on the beach, and disputed our passage with the greatest ferocity. Far from attacking them, we acted only on the defensive, and it was not without difficulty we got round the point. In the course of our walk we found several pieces of white wax, and saw a top, some spars, and various other pieces of a wreck. I mention this circumstance more particularly, as it may possibly throw some light on the following accident. Some years ago, two Spanish vessels came round Cape Horn, bound to Buenos Aires, laden principally with white wax. One of them arrived safe, the other has never yet been heard of, but there is too much reason to fear that she was lost on Falklands Islands, the day being pretty far advanced, I repaired on board my ship with a determination to put to sea at daylight in the morning, if the weather permitted. Having a fine southerly breeze at four o'clock in the morning of the 23rd, we unmoored, and at five weighed, and came to sail. We ran clear of Ball Island, which is situated on the west side of the entrance, into Swan Island Bay, and then shaped our course for New Island, which from Ball Island bears west half north, four leagues distant. On the east side of New Island, are three good bays. Its greatest extent is from north to south. Good water is scarce at this island, except in a bay on the south side, and there it is easily found as it is a boiling spring, situated nearly at low water. I was informed by Captain Huffy that most of the springs at New Island are rendered brackish by a very heavy sea, which constantly sets in with a westerly wind, the spray of which flies over the beach and mixes with the freshwater springs. At noon, the northernmost point of Round Island bore east southeast half east, ten miles distant, the southwest point of New Island, southeast half south eight miles, and the southwest point of all Falklands Islands, south southeast half east, six leagues distant. We had an observation which gave 50 Fernig 30 36 dig south latitude. The wind hauling to the westward at four o'clock occasioned us to tack, the weather moderate and hazy. At eight o'clock, Cape Parable, 
the westernmost point of Falklands Islands, bore east-southeast, six leagues, and the north point of New Island East, northeast, half-east, eight leagues distant. Ah. Having a moderate breeze to the northward in the morning of the 24th, I steered southwest, being well clear of all the islands, Cape Parabal at this time bearing east-northeast, about ten leagues distant. The weather was hazy and in the afternoon a very thick fog came on, but we were fortunate enough not to lose company. We saw numbers of whales and a variety of birds, such as penguins, silver-coloured birds and small divers. About seven o'clock the only hen turkey I had flew overboard, but the weather being very foggy and a heavy swell from the northward, I did not think it safe to venture my boat from the ship, though I was sorry for the accident as I had reserved her and a cock together with some other poultry to leave as breeders at any place where I thought there was a probability of their breeding and being taken care of. On the 25th, being then in 50 C sectogram 337 south latitude and 63 degram 12 hades west longitude, the variation was 23 degram and 6th east. In the evening we sounded with 60 fathoms of line but got no bottom. At 6 o'clock in the afternoon of the 26th, we saw Staten's land very high, bearing south, distant about five or six leagues. Soon afterward, it came on to blow very strong and in squalls, attended with rain, and the weather so thick that we lost sight of the land. This brought us under close reefed topsails and reefed courses. The top gallant masts were also struck. The weather clearing up at half past seven o'clock, the land again appeared in sight, on which we made sail and ran in for it. This, however, was of short continuance, for presently afterward there was every appearance of a bad night, so that I judged it prudent to shorten sail and haul our wind to the northward. We sounded at eight o'clock in forty-five fathom water, over a muddy bottom. The lead was kept going, but did not strike the ground with sixty fathom of line. At midnight we tacked, and at two o'clock in the morning of the on the twenty-seventh, we again saw Staten's land the extremes bearing from south-southwest to southeast by south, distant about six leagues. The weather being moderate, we made sail and shaped a course for the east end of it. At eight o'clock, the east end of Staten's land bore south-southwest five miles, and the small island opposite New Year's Harbour, west-southwest, about seven leagues distant. Soon afterward, we passed through a strong rippling, which I found was caused by a current setting to the northward. Immediately after we doubled the east point of Staten's land, I steered south by west by compass in order to get a good offing, not choosing to keep near the shore on account of the strong current which sets through the Straits of La Mer. At noon, Cap Saint Juan, which is the east cape of Staten's land, bore north-northwest by west half west, about six leagues distant. Our latitude was 54 deg 57 and south, and the longitude 63 deg 33 degrees west. Staten's land is high, but the mountains near the summit being very uneven, it gives them greatly the appearance of saddle lands. New Year's Harbour is already well known, besides which there is an appearance of a harbour on the north side near the east end. There also seem to be two openings, one near the west end, the other about the middle of the island, and which is situated within two small round islands that are detached from Staten's land. There was a patch of snow on the summit of the highest mountain, but not any wood to be seen. Seals were seen in prodigious numbers, and there is no doubt but the sea elephant frequents this place, so that certainly it would be a lucrative employ for one or two ships to be sent annually for oil. During the afternoon, we had a moderate breeze at west by north and cloudy weather. At six o'clock, Cap Saint Juan bore north 40 deg west, about eight leagues distant. Presently after this, the wind shifted gradually to the southward and blew a very strong gale, which brought on a heavy cross sea and caused the ship to labour exceedingly. The wind was, however, by no means steady, but veered from south to west, still blowing a fresh gale, with frequent heavy squalls, which occasioned us to tack as occasion required. We still had stormy, tempestuous weather, the wind continuing to the westward, on which I determined to stand well to the southward, by which means, after running down our southing, we were certain of gaining either from a southerly or westerly wind. Our latitude at noon on the 30th was 56 degrees 53 south and the longitude 63 degrees 35 west. A number of very large albatrosses and many small pieces of rockweed were seen about the ship. 
as I was apprehensive that a current set us to the eastward, I steered southwest when the wind permitted. The weather, which for some days had been very stormy, now grew moderate, and we had light breezes from the southward, attended with a thick fog and drizzling rain. This morning I struck a very remarkable fish. The hind part and tail were exactly like those of a shark. And its nose had the resemblance of a porpoise. I should gladly have got this fish on board, that I might have been able to describe it more minutely, but in struggling he extricated himself from the harpoon, after being struck near half a minute. The morning of the third being clear and the weather fine, I took this opportunity of getting the seamen's chests up, and had the ship well cleaned and scraped fore and aft, and thoroughly aired with fires. Towards noon it grew cloudy, and a strong gale came on at northwest, attended with squalls, which increased to a violent degree towards night. This caused us to hand the topsails and foresail, and bring two under a reefed mainsail, fore and mizzen staysails. The morning of the fourth was more moderate, but the wind still blew a fresh gale from the westward. An observed distance of the sun and moon gave 68 degree 1 west longitude, the latitude was 60 degree 19 south. On the fifth, I ordered the people one pound and a half of fresh pork a man, in addition to their allowance of salt provisions, together with an extra half allowance of brandy. This, and every indulgence in my power, I gave them with the greatest pleasure, as their behaviour has given me great satisfaction ever since they have been under my command. In 60 degree 9 south latitude and 70 degree 13 west longitude, the mean result of six azimuths gave 26 degree 19 easterly variation. Being now well to the southward, I steered west by south whenever the wind permitted. We continued our voyage, yet making much progress, as the wind was generally on the western board, blowing fresh and in squalls, the weather very stormy and unsettled. Our latitude at noon on the 18th was 55 degree 31 1 south, and the mean result of several lunar observations gave 82 degrees 22 1 west longitude. During this interval, every change of wind was preceded by a sudden squall, which generally was of short continuance, and succeeded by a calm. Not being able to carry top-gallant sails in such critical weather, I kept the yards down, and the top-gallant masts struck close down to the topsail yards, swaying them up or lowering them down, as we had occasion to take reefs in the topsails. Indeed, I find this method of great advantage to the ship, not only as it serves to ease the topmast heads, but makes her hold a much better wind. On the 22nd, the weather being very fine, I ordered the sailors' hammocks to be brought upon deck, and their bedclothes to be well aired. Being well assured that inattention to things of this nature often occasions fatality amongst seamen. Our observation at noon gave 54 degree 4 south latitude and the longitude by lunar observation was 81 degree 19 west. In this situation we found the variation to be 22 degree 56 easterly. We still had squally unsettled weather with northerly and westerly winds. In the afternoon of the 25th, a very strong gale came on at northwest, notwithstanding which, we were under the necessity of carrying more sail than the ship could well bear, in order to prevent our being driven to the eastward. It is the general opinion of navigators that southwesterly winds prevail in this part of the Pacific Ocean constantly, but we have experimentally found this opinion to be erroneous. The wind for a considerable time past has blown from the northward and westward, generally in strong gales attended with squalls. In the morning of the 28th, some seals were seen about the ship. A parcel of rockweed and the branch of a tree were floating in the sea. Our latitude was 56 degree 20 south, and the longitude 83 degree 59 west. We here found 19 du as easterly variation. The wind still continued westerly, frequently blowing a fresh gale with hazy weather. However, the 5th of March proving very fine, I ordered the ship to be well cleaned between decks, and properly aired with good fires. At that time we were in 45 deg 58 south latitude and 80 deg 45 fives west longitude. During the late tempestuous weather, the water had found its way into the sail room, and our spare sails and canvas were much wet. The weather on the 7th being pretty favourable, they were got upon deck and well aired. The same opportunity was taken to repair our rigging, some of which was much damaged. 
For some days past the wind had inclined to the southward, and I began to conceive hopes that we should be favoured with a steady breeze at southwesterly or south-southwesterly, especially as we had a prodigious swell from that quarter, and the clouds moved briskly towards the northeast. But now it again hauled to the westward. Indeed, appearances of this nature are not to be depended on in these seas, as we have been regularly disappointed in them for three weeks past. Towards noon, the water changed colour and had the appearance of soundings. If so, it must be a considerable distance from shore, our latitude being 44 to 20 south, and the longitude 79 to 40 90. On the 10th, we had 10 degree 41 easterly variation, yet on the 11th, it was 15 degrees 7 to the east. As the variation had gradually been decreasing for some time past, I cannot account for so material a difference, except that on the 10th, we were rather more to the eastward and consequently nearer the land, which possibly might have some effect on the compass. The wind still continued to the westward and brought on so thick a fog that we seldom saw each other, yet we were fortunate enough not to part company. On the 15th, the weather clearing up, we got a meridian altitude, which gave 42 to 14 T south latitude. The longitude by lunar observation was 85 to 44 and the variation 12 to 3 east. The fog was succeeded by squally unsettled weather, with frequent heavy rains and sometimes light snowstorms, which, however, were of short duration, and the weather gradually became temperate and pleasant, but the wind still continued to the northward and westward. On the 21st, the latitude was 36 to go 17 south, and the mean result of several sets of human actions gave 80 to 8 to 444 longitude. In the afternoon, I sent a boat on board the Queen Charlotte for Captain Dixon. He came on board the King George, and we determined to stand on directly for Los Marcos, an island discovered by the Spaniards and situated about 20 de Gras north latitude and 135 de Gras longitude. This island, being very little out of our track, induced me to steer for it, as there was a probability of meeting with a good harbour and water so that we should be able to refit our vessels and refresh the crews, without running down to the Sandwich Islands, which were considerably out of our course. At the same time, we appointed Ohaihi as our place of rendezvous, in case of separation before we arrived at Los Majos, there to wait for each other ten days, and if not joined during that time, to sail for King George's Sound. On the 25th, being in 30 circa degree 28 savant south latitude and 90 mifan degree to 51 longitude, we had a moderate steady breeze at east southeast with very fine weather, and I began to entertain hopes that we had fallen in with a trade wind. This forenoon the ship was well scraped fore and aft, aired with fires and afterwards washed with vinegar. Cider was also served to the people at the rate of a pint a man, besides their usual allowance of spirits. With a light easterly breeze, we steered northwest by west, and at six o'clock in the afternoon, a sail was seen from the masthead, or a rock which had greatly the appearance of one, bearing northwest by west half west. Not being certain whether what we had seen really was a vessel, I changed our course to west by north, and stood under an easy sail, so that we could easily haul our wind in case of danger during the night. But soon after nine o'clock, our doubts were changed into certainty for we plainly perceived the object in doubt to be either a brig or a snow, standing to the southward. The Queen Charlotte, on. Seeing this vessel showed a light, and on our answering it, the strange sail hoisted a light and tacked to the northward. By this time she was rather abaft our larboard beam, and as I did not think it prudent to make ourselves, or our business, known to strangers, I kept on my course and by half past ten o'clock we lost sight of her. There is reason to suppose that this strange sail was a Spanish vessel, and from her plying to the southward, she certainly was bound either to Baldivia or Conception on the Camot coast of Chile, though I was rather surprised at meeting. With a vessel of this description in such a situation, we being at this time 300 leagues from the coast, we continued our course to the northwest without meeting with anything worthy of notice. On the 2nd of April, we were well within the tropics, our latitude being 20 Fumdug, 44 south. At the same time, the longitude by lunar observation was 102 degree 9 uh, and the variation 4 degree 58 and east. From this until the 10th, we had little variety. That afternoon we passed a turtle and being very anxious to procure. 
a fresh meal for my ship's crew I brought the ship to, and ordered the whale boat to be lowered down, and sent Mr. Matt Maliod, my first mate, after it. He brought it on board, but it had been dead some time and was almost in a state of putrefaction, so that we threw it overboard and were much disappointed in our expected dainty. However, to make some amends for this disappointment, we picked up a very lively one on the 15th which weighed 65 pounds and was caught just in time for us to celebrate Easter, the next day being Easter Sunday. The cider, which had been regularly served to the ship's company for some time past, being expended, I ordered some sweet wort to be made and served out at the rate of half a pint per man each day. Our latitude at noon was Thursday 20th, Sevendigfort South and 159 Longitude. Saturday, 22nd, Sevendigfort South and 159 Longitude. We saw a large flock of white birds about the size of a tern and which I am inclined to think are of the same species as those we met with in great abundance at Christmas Island during Captain Cook's last voyage. Several turtles passed us and great numbers of dark-coloured birds were flying about. From these appearances, I conjectured we were passing near some land, but though the day was clear, we could see nothing of the kind from the masthead. On the 20th, we crossed the equator, in 115 degrees tenths longitude. The variation here was 3 degrees 28 east. In the latitude of 3 degrees 33 to north, longitude 116 degrees 35, we found a current setting to the eastward at the rate of one mile and a half per hour, in which I changed our course from north-northwest to northwest half west a cross swell from every direction inclined me to think that we were rather too near the Great Bay of Panama. However, I was under the necessity of keeping well to the eastward that we might be enabled to fetch the island's Los Majos, which, should they afford good water and some other refreshments, may be hereafter of the greatest importance to any ships coming round Cape Horn to the western coast of America, as they lie directly in the track for that coast and consequently are more conveniently situated than the Sandwich Islands. I had conceived hopes that when the southeast trade wind left us, it would have been succeeded by that at northeast, but we did not get a steady northeast trade until the 1st of May in 8 degram 53 zone north latitude and 120 degram 29 longitude. During this interval, we had light variable winds and calms by turns, with close sultry weather and frequent heavy rains. Notwithstanding every precaution, the scurvy made its appearance among us, and the boatswain in particular was so bad for some days that I almost despaired of his recovery. But it fortunately happened that some small salad, such as mustard and cress, which I had sown in several casks of mould procured at Falklands Islands, was now in great perfection. I planted some horseradish in a cask before we left England, which was in an improving state, and some potatoes, planted since we left Falklands Islands, began to sprout very finely. These things were given to the boatswain, and they had every good effect that could be wished. They checked the disorder, and he began to recover his health daily. This unwholesome weather had likewise affected the health of several seamen on board the Queen Charlotte, and Captain Dixon in particular being very bad, I went on board the Queen Charlotte and found his disorder to be the scurvy. At my return, I sent him a cask of fine mould, with salad growing in it, together with some kraut, garden seeds, and a few bottles of artificial mineral water, which was prepared by Dr. Melville in imitation of seltzer water, and supposed to be a most excellent antiscorbutic. We frequently caught turtles, which were constantly served out amongst the ship's company, and I sent some on board the Queen Charlotte. This, with the addition of kraut, portable soup and sweet wort, contributed greatly to preserve the health of the ship's crews. In the forenoon of the 7th, we were near the situation of the island Partida, according to Captain Cook's general chart, but no appearances of land were seen. Indeed, this island was not seen by Captain Cook, but copied into that chart from the authority of the Spaniards. Towards noon, the wind inclining more to the northward, we steered north-northwest, in order that we might get into the latitude of Los Marjos, without being to the westward of it, which I was afraid might be the case if the wind hauled to the northward as we increased our latitude. On the 11th, being in the latitude of 20 degree in Tuan south and 134 degree 11 east, 
I expected to have fallen in with the Los Majos Islands, as we were now exactly in the centre of them, according to the chart just mentioned, but not the least appearance of land was to be seen. The sickly situation of our people rendered it, however, absolutely necessary for us to make land as soon as possible. On which account, we lay to in the night time and spread during the day, so that we were favoured with fine clear weather and a steady breeze. It was impossible for us to miss them if they really existed. We stood to the westward between 19 degree 46 and 20 degree north latitude, till the 15th, by which time we were considerably to the westward of Los Majos, but no such islands were to be found, on which I determined to stand directly for the Sandwich Islands, as there was a certainty of our procuring whatever refreshments we wanted. The scurvy now attacked a number of the ship's crew. The first symptoms were a stiffness about the knees and hams. Afterwards the shin bones became sore, and in a few days those parts which before were stiff began to swell and turn black, and the mouth grew sore. My boatswain had all these appearances to a great degree, attended with a fever and a violent pain in his head, notwithstanding which he recovered in a surprising manner. As I never knew an instance of a person recovering from an advanced stage of the scurvy while at sea, I shall take the liberty of mentioning the regimen he was under during his illness, especially as it may be of great service to persons in the same situation. Besides the assistance he received from Mr. Hogan, my surgeon, who was very skilful in his profession, he had for breakfast a pint of sweet wort, with some soft bread, which I ordered to be made for him. About ten o'clock he gathered some small salad from the little garden I have just mentioned. This he ate with vinegar. For dinner, he had portable soup with barley, celery seed, mustard, cress, and rapeseed boiled in it. Besides which, he ate plentifully of kraut. These, these things had so good an effect that in a fortnight he was able to do his duty, as usual. Captain Dixon likewise grew better, though slowly, and he attributed this favourable turn in his disorder chiefly to the mineral water prepared by Dr. Melville, a few bottles of which I sent him, as already has been related. With a fine trade breeze we steered west by south in order to make Owyhee the principal of the Sandwich Islands. Our latitude on the 23rd was 19 degree 10 north and 153 degree 21 longitude. In this situation, we found a current setting to the southward. I expected to have made the land before night came on, but towards evening, the weather turned very hazy, on which we shortened sail and brought to during the night. At daylight in the morning of the 24th, we bore away and made sail, and at seven o'clock Oihi made its appearance, the east point bearing northwest by west, about six leagues distant. Soon after having an uninterrupted view of the island, I kept away along shore down the south side, and at noon the east point bore north half west, three leagues distant. The east and southeast parts of this island appear fertile and very pleasant, but that part which lies south and southwest is quite barren and seems to be covered with a kind of lava. By two o'clock, being within three miles of the land and running along shore with a moderate breeze, a number of the natives came off in their canoes and brought with them some small hogs and a few plantains, which I bought for beads and small pieces of iron. A number of their fishing lines were purchased many of which were from three to four hundred fathoms long and perfectly well made. Some were made with two strands and others with three strands and much stronger than our lines of twice the size. A Voyage Round the World, but more particularly to the northwest coast of America by Captain Nathaniel Portlock. Chapter 4. Range Along the Coast of Owyhee Arrival in Karakua Bay, unruly behaviour of the natives, leave Karakakua Bay, refreshments procured along the coast, disappointed in coming to anchor at Moratoy, arrive at Wahoo, fruitless search for a watering place, supplied with water by the natives, refreshments obtained, departure from Wahoo, account of the present government amongst the Sandwich Islands, pass Atui, arrival at Wanahau, transactions there. The Indians traded with cheerfulness and did not show any disposition to act dishonestly. After disposing of everything they had to sell and viewing the ship all around, they returned to the shore perfectly well pleased. As Karakakua Bay was the only harbour we knew of at Oahe, I determined to make it as soon as possible, and at eleven o'clock in the forenoon of the 25th, 
we passed the south point. But soon afterwards, the wind grew variable and frequently blew in squalls. Nah. During the afternoon, we stood to the northward along the west side of the island. And being well in with the land, a number of canoes came off, bringing hogs and other refreshments, which we chiefly purchased with small pieces of iron. I had conceived hopes that we should have come to anchor in Karakakua Bay this evening, but there was very little wind, and that little was unfavourable. Indeed, the trade wind is not to be expected after hauling round the south point of the island, as the highland to the eastward entirely breaks it off, and light breezes prevail from the northward and westward. Soon after the day was closed in, we observed a great number of fires all along shore, and I was inclined to think they were lighted in order to alarm the country. Indeed, it is customary for the natives on this island to light fires when they make offerings to their gods for success in war, and this might possibly be the case at present. But I had observed a shyness in the natives the nearer we approached Karakakua. They frequently inquired after Captain King, and seemed by their behaviour to think that we were come to revenge the death of Captain Cook. Soon after daylight on the 26th, Karakakua bore northeast by east, about six leagues distant, and a light breeze springing up at northwest, we stood in for the bay. In the forenoon, an inferior chief came on board, from whom I learned that Tereobu, who was king of Ohaihi when we last were at that island, was dead, and that the present king's name was Maiha Maiha. He importuned me very strongly to go ashore, but on my declining it and making him a present, he informed me that Maiha Maiha would pay me a visit on the morrow. However, I paid little regard to this piece of intelligence, as it was not likely that Maiha Maiha would venture on board after the active part he took in that unfortunate fray, which terminated in the much-lamented death of Captain Cook. Many canoes now came alongside, and the people were very importunate to come on board. They behaved in a very daring and insolent manner, and it was with difficulty they were prevailed upon to quit the ship. However, I bore all this with patience, being unwilling to use violence if it could possibly be avoided though at the same time I was much afraid from these appearances that we should not be able to do our business at Karakakua with ease and safety, particularly to fill our water and get the sick people ashore. As we approached the harbour, great numbers of canoes joined us, and many of them hanging by the ship retarded our progress so much that it was near four o'clock in the afternoon before we came to anchor. I moored with the best bower to the westward in nine fathom water over a bottom of white sand and the spare anchor to the eastward, in seven fathoms over the same bottom. The west point of the bay bore west, and the south point south half west, distant from the beach at the bottom of the bay about a quarter of a mile. Soon after our anchor was down, we were surrounded by an amazing number of the natives, both in canoes and in the water. They grew very troublesome, constantly crawling up the cable and the ship's sides, so that most of the seamen were employed in keeping the vessel clear, and it was not without some difficulty that we got moored. During this time, no chief who had any command on the people made his appearance, which was rather unfortunate, for if I could have got a person of consequence on board, he would have kept the rest in order, and our business would have been carried on with ease and dispatch. In the course of the afternoon, we procured a number of fine hogs and a good quantity of salt, together with plantains, potatoes and taro, which last was the finest I ever saw, and not in the least inferior to yams. Breadfruit was scarce and the little we got was not in a perfect state, so that I conclude this is not the proper season for it. At night, fires were lighted all around the bay and the people on shore were in constant motion. Several canoes continued near the ship and about midnight, one of the natives brought off a lighted torch, seemingly with an intention of setting fire to the vessel. On our driving him away, he paddled to the Queen Charlotte but there they were equally on their guard, on which he again went ashore. By daylight the next morning, we were visited by a vast multitude of the natives, but still no chief was to be seen who had power sufficient to keep them in order, and they grew so daring and insolent that I was under the necessity of placing sentinels with cutlasses to prevent their boarding us. This unexpected reception convinced me that we could do nothing with safety on shore without the protection of a strong guard, and our taking a step of that kind might probably be attended with fatal consequences, so that I determined to leave Karakakua as soon as possible. I acquainted Captain Dixon with my intention of sailing and the reasons I had for it. 
His opinion regarding the disposition of the inhabitants exactly agreed with my own. Notwithstanding the vast concourse of Indians that were assembled about the ships, we saw great numbers collected in bodies on shore, some on the beach and others on the top of a hill which commands the watering place, and there appeared to be many chiefs among them. At nine o'clock I gave orders to unmoor, but the crowd of people around the ship was so great that our boats could scarcely pass to the buoys. In this situation it was absolutely necessary for us to drive them away, and I was desirous of using some method that would frighten without hurting them. Accordingly, after drawing out the shot, we fired six four-pounders and six swivels. At the same time, our colours were hoisted and the ship tabooed by hoisting a white flag at the main top gallant masthead. This had the desired effect, for immediately on our beginning to fire, the Indians made for the shore with the utmost precipitation. In the hurry and confusion caused by this alarm, many canoes were upset. The owners, however, did not stay to right them, but swam immediately ashore. We now had an opportunity of unmooring without molestation, and soon after eleven o'clock, having light baffling winds, began to warp out of the bay to the westward. At five o'clock, judging myself in a good situation to wait for the land breeze, which usually blows off towards evening, we let go an anchor, and presently were visited by a number of canoes, who brought us some good hogs, a quantity of salt, and vegetables of various kinds. At seven o'clock, a breeze springing up from the land, we weighed and stood to the southwest until our distance from Karakakua was about three leagues. I then brought to, with an intention of standing off anon for twenty-four hours, in order to trade with the natives, being convinced that it is the best and safest method of procuring any refreshments the island of Ohahi affords. Early next morning, we were surrounded by canoes, and a brisk trade commenced, in the course of which we purchased a number of fine hogs and vegetables of various kinds. Many of our people were employed in killing and salting down hogs for sea store, our present situation being much better calculated for carrying on that business than in harbour. For now we had a fine free air, whereas in Karakakua Bay the weather is so extremely close and sultry that there is a great probability of the meat being spoiled even after it is salted. At noon we were standing along shore to the northward, with a light westerly breeze and fine weather. Karakakua Bay then bore east half-south, distant three leagues, and the high land of Mowi, north-northwest. Many canoes still kept about the ships, and some of the natives brought off water in calabashes, which we purchased for nails. Indeed, water now began to be an article of the first consequence to us, our fifty-second butt being a brooch, and there was as yet no certainty of our watering amongst these islands. The refreshments, however, that we already had procured were of great service to the sick people, all of whom daily got better. Now that During the night we stood off and on with variable winds and hazy weather. In the morning of the 29th, the southernmost part of Ohaihi in sight bore south-southeast half-east, twelve leagues distant. The northernmost part north by east, ten leagues, and the body of Moi north-northwest half-west, nine leagues distant. The natives of Ohihi still followed the vessels with hogs and vegetables, and we stood to the north-northwest under an easy sail, so that the canoes might be enabled to keep up with us. At six o'clock in the afternoon, a fresh breeze sprung up at northeast, which brought on a cross swell, and obliged all the canoes to leave us and make for the shore. During the night we had fresh gales and cloudy weather, which occasioned us to shorten sail and tack occasionally. Towards morning the weather moderated. At eight o'clock, Moi bore from north half-east to east-northeast, distant four leagues, and the west end of Renai north-northwest, two leagues distant. The unsettled state of the weather and the uncertainty of our being able to water the ships at these islands induced me to put the ship's company on an allowance of water at the rate of two quarts a man a day. Towards noon a few canoes came off from Renai, but brought nothing of any consequence to barter. At three o'clock, being about one mile and a half from shore, we sounded with a line of a hundred fathom, but got no bottom. The westernmost point of Moritoy now bore northwest by west, eight or nine leagues distant, and soon afterwards, a fresh breeze coming on at northeast, I stood directly over for that island. By six o'clock, the west end, which is low and rocky, bore northwest distant three leagues, and I had some hopes of getting round the point and anchoring in a bay situated on the west side of Moritoy, but the breeze rather failing, 
we had not daylight sufficient to accomplish our purpose. On this, we hauled up the courses and brought to, the Queen Charlotte being considerably astern. At half past seven o'clock, the Queen Charlotte being well up, we filled and stood to the southeast under the top sails. At the same time, the west point of Moratoy bore northwest two leagues and the easternmost point northeast, six leagues distant. At three o'clock next morning, we wore and stood in for the land, but when daylight came on, I was greatly surprised to find that we had been driven in the night eight or nine leagues to the southwest, so that instead of fetching in with the west point of Moratoy, as I expected, the wind being well to the eastward, I found we scarcely should be able to weather the east point of Wahoo, round which we knew there was anchorage. These disappointments mortified me a good deal, as I was very desirous to look for water in the bay on the west side of Moratoy, where, from the appearance of the land, it was likely we should find some. Had that plan failed, we then should have been able to get round the east point of Wohu with a large wind. But finding now that it would be a work of some days to get in with the west end of Moratoy, I gave it up and stood for the east point of Wohu, which then bore northwest under all the sail we could carry, with a moderate breeze at east-northeast. For some time, appearances were greatly in our favour. Indeed, I believe we should easily have fetched round the point. But about ten o'clock, the Queen Charlotte being a considerable way on our lee quarter, I was afraid she would not be able to weather the island, as I could plainly perceive we had a strong current setting to the southwest. On this we tacked and stood towards her, and soon afterwards wore and stretched to the northward. Just at this time the wind hauled round to the eastward, and we again stood on, in hopes of fetching our intended situation. However, about half past eleven o'clock, the Queen Charlotte drove in shore, and Captain Dixon, finding he could not weather the point, tacked, which occasioned us to tack immediately afterwards. At noon, the outermost rock off the northeast point of Woahu bore north northwest about four leagues, and the southernmost part of the island in sight south southwest, half west, five miles distant. The island of Wohu between the southeast and northeast points appears high and craggy, forming into several high rocks, within which there appears to be tolerable shelter. But as the wind blew fresh and right on shore, I did not think it prudent to run in with a lee shore to look for anchorage. We plied in this uncertain state till noon on the first of Thursday, June, when finding it would be impracticable for us to get round the northeast point of the island without wasting more time than could be spared we bore away for the southeast point, and at one o'clock being well up with it, a fine bay made its appearance, which promised to afford good anchorage. We hauled round the point and stood in for the bay. Soon afterwards, the whale boat was lowered down and sent ashore to sound. At half past two o'clock, we came to an anchor in the bay, which I distinguished by the name of King George's Bay, in twelve fathom water, over a bottom of speckled sand and broken shells, and moored with the best bower to the eastward, and a kedge to the westward. The east point of the bay, which I distinguished by the name of Point Dick, in honour of Sir John Dick, the first patron of this voyage, bore east by north one mile and a half. The west point, which was named Point Rose, after George Rose Eskent, Secretary of the Treasury, the second worthy patron of our undertaking, bore west southwest half west, about two leagues, and the bottom of the bay north two miles distant. Soon after our arrival, several canoes came off and brought a few coconuts and plantains, some sugar cane and sweet root, in return for which we gave them small pieces of iron and a few trinkets. Towards evening, a fresh breeze coming on at east northeast, our visitors left us and returned ashore. Next morning at daylight we had several canoes about the ship, which brought us a few small hogs and some wild vegetables. Great numbers of both sexes were in the water, impelled by curiosity to pay us a visit, notwithstanding our distance from shore. As watering the ships was now become an object of the first consideration, I went ashore early in the morning, accompanied by Captain Dixon, in order to find out a convenient spot for that purpose. We landed on some rocks just around Point Dick, quite dry, and met with no opposition from the inhabitants. On the contrary, they received us with great kindness, and answered every question we asked them very readily. On our inquiring for fresh water, they conducted us to some which was lodged in a kind of basin formed by the rocks, about fifty yards from the place where we landed. But the quantity was so small that it would not afford even a temporary supply. 
On this, we continued our inquiries along shore and were informed that there was no fresh water to be met with, but at a considerable distance to the westward. After making the Indians some trifling presents, we returned to the boats and rowed to the northward, close to a reef, which appeared to run quite across the bay, about a quarter of a mile distant from the beach. Having proceeded nearly a mile in this direction, a small opening in the reef presented itself, for which we steered. The channel was narrow, but in the middle we had two fathoms water, and after getting through, there was from three to four fathoms over a bottom of fine sand, and good room between the reef and the beach for a number of vessels to ride at anchor. We landed on a fine sandy beach amidst a vast number of the inhabitants, who all behaved with great order and never attempted to approach nearer to us than we desired. They informed us that there was no water near our landing place, but that we should find plenty farther down along shore, and one of the natives accompanied you as a guide. However, our progress was soon impeded by a little salt waiter river that has a communication with King George's Bay. This putting a stop to our progress by land, we again had recourse to our boats and attempted to get to the westward within the reef. But the water was so shallow that it was impracticable, so that we returned through the passage we came in at and afterwards rode to the westward, keeping close along the outside of the reef, until we got near the watering place pointed out to us by the Indians. In this situation, seeing a small opening in the reef, we made for it, and the moment we entered, a breaker overtook us, which almost filled and nearly upset our boats. However, through the good management of the steersmen, who were mine and Captain Winnow's ensign mates, we escaped without any misfortune, though we had the mortification, after getting over the reef, to find the water so shallow that our boats could not get within 200 yards of the shore. Under these circumstances, I found that we could not water at this place without an infinite deal of trouble, besides the danger of losing our casks, getting the boats dashed to pieces against the rocks, and the inconvenience of carrying our casks so far amongst a multitude of Indians, which would make it necessary to have an armoured force ashore, the ships lying at too great a distance for them to cover or secure a watering party. I therefore gave up the idea of watering at this spot and determined to send two boats the first opportunity to examine the western part of the bay for a good landing place and convenient watering. I returned on board at noon and found a pretty brisk trade, carrying on for small hogs, sugarcane and vegetables. Having given orders to Mr. Hill on my leaving the ship to purchase every refreshment which the natives brought alongside. No time was now to be lost in coming to some conclusive determination respecting our future transactions. I saw but little probability of watering the ships with our own boats. But Captain Dixon, as well as myself, was of opinion that the Indians might be induced to bring off water to the ships, sufficient at least for a temporary supply. At all events, I knew there was enough in each vessel to serve near three months with proper care, but it was all in the ground tier. I therefore determined to have all our water got to hand, and the ground tier filled with salt water. In the meantime, our spare hands could be well employed in repairing the rigging and making the vessels in every respect fit for the further prosecution of our voyage, so soon as the crews were well refreshed, and our present situation being the most eligible one we knew of at these islands, we resolved not to quit it before all our business was completed. Early in the morning of the 3rd, I dispatched Mr. Hayward and Mr. White in a boat from each ship to examine the west part of the bay for a landing place and fresh water. They likewise had orders to land and make an excursion to that part of the island around Point Rose, as there appeared from the ship to be a fine deep bay in that situation. The natives now began to bring us water pretty briskly, and some of their calabashes contained near ten gallons. For one of these, we gave a tenpenny nail, which was much cheaper than we could possibly procure the water ourselves, allowing for the damage our boats would sustain, and the presents we should be obliged to make on shore to the chiefs. The weather being very fine, our ailing people were sent ashore under the care of my surgeon, and as the inhabitants had hitherto behaved in a quiet, inoffensive manner, there was no great danger of their being molested. No chiefs of consequence paid us a visit as yet, the inferior chiefs indeed came on board without any scruple, and some of them slept with us every night. Among the rest, I had a daily visit from an old priest, who always brought by way of present, a small pig and a branch of the coconut tree. From him I learnt that their present king's name was Tahetera, and that he was also king of Moratoi and Mowi. 
The old man informed me that his residence was in a bay around the West Point and importuned me very much to carry the ships there. As that place, he said, afforded plenty of fine hogs and vegetables. Indeed, I had some reason to think that the inhabitants on that part of the island were more numerous than in King George's Bay. As I observed, most of the double canoes came round the West Point. But as the people now brought us plenty of water, I determined to keep my present situation, it being in many respects a very eligible one, for we hitherto had been favoured with a most refreshing sea breeze, which blows over the low land at the heat of the bay, and the bay all round has a very beautiful appearance, the low land and valleys being in a high state of cultivation, and crowded with plantations of taro, sweet potatoes, sugar cane, etc., interspersed with a great number of coconut trees, which renders the prospect truly delightful. In the afternoon, the boats returned, and Mr. Hayward reported that he had landed in the west part of the bay, where he found a pond of standing water, but it was very inconveniently situated and could not be got at without difficulty. He afterwards walked up to a rising ground, from which he could perceive the land round the west point of King George's Bay to fall in and form a fine deep bay running well to the northward, and the westernmost land stretching out to the southward. This, however, by no means induced me to change our situation. Towards evening, the surgeon returned on board with the convalescents and informed me that the inhabitants had behaved in a very quiet, inoffensive manner, though they were rather incommoded by the multitudes which curiosity brought about them. By this time, all our water from the ground tier was got to hand and the cables coiled down. The inhabitants now brought us water in such plenty that by noon on the 4th all our empty casks were filled, having procured 29 butts, 8 hogsheads and 3 brandy pieces, which contained 130 gallons each. As good water in any quantity may be procured at this island, with the greatest facility for small nails and buttons, it undoubtedly must be the safest and most expeditious method any person can adopt, who may chance to touch here, to barter for their water, in the manner we did. Potatoes and taro are likewise met with here in great plenty, but I never observed any breadfruit, and scarcely any yams, so that there is reason to suppose they are not cultivated by the inhabitants of Woahu. Having completed our water, and procured such refreshments as Wahoo afforded, I determined to proceed to Wanihau without loss of time, in order to get a supply of yams, which I knew that island produced in great plenty and perfection. Accordingly, at seven o'clock in the morning of the 5th, we weighed and stood to the westward under an easy sail, with a moderate breeze at northeast. As we approached Point Rose, a vast number of double canoes joined us, which came out of that bay to the westward, seen by Mr. Hayward, and which obtained the name of Queen Charlotte's Bay. An excellent bay it appears to be, stretching well both to the northward and southward. The southern extreme forms itself into a flattish point, which I distinguished by the name of Point Banks, in honour of Sir Joseph Banks. Point Banks bears west by north from Point Rose, distant about 12 miles. From each of these points, there runs a ridge of rocks for about three quarters of a mile, but they always show themselves by breakers and coloured water. When we were abreast of Point Rose, my old visitor, the priest, came on board in a large double canoe, bringing with him a very good feathered cap as a present for me from Tahiter, in return for which I sent him two large towels and some other trifles of little value. I also gave the old priest a light horseman's cap and another to a young chief who had almost constantly been on board since my arrival at the island, being desirous to show any future navigators who might happen to touch here that this place had recently been visited by British ships. My guests were highly delighted with their presence, and after many professions of friendship, they took their leave and went ashore. At noon, Point Dick, which is the southeast point of Wahoo, bore east by north seven leagues, and Point Banks, the southwest point, northwest, half west, four leagues distant. After passing Point Banks, we hauled to the northwest and with a moderate easterly breeze stretched along the western part of the island, accompanied by several canoes, who brought some flying fish to sell, the largest I ever saw, many of them measuring from 10 to 12 inches in length and thick in proportion. These fish are caught in nets, which the people here manage with great dexterity. The west side of Wohu is very high and uneven, and near the shore there appear to be several small detached islands within which there is a probability of meeting with good anchorage. From the northwest to the southwest points, 
The land trends northwest and southeast, and likewise seems to promise well for anchoring ground, but the day being very hazy, we were prevented from examining it distinctly. Before I quit Wahoo, let me observe that I think it the finest island in the group, and most capable of being turned to advantage, were it settled by Europeans than any of the rest. There being scarcely a spot which does not appear fertile. Here we found a great number of warriors and warlike instruments. Many of the warriors were tattooed in a manner totally different from any I ever took notice of amongst the Sandwich Islands. Their faces were tattooed so as to appear quite black, besides great part of the sinewy parts being tattooed in a variety of forms. The greatest part of the daggers left by us at these islands during our last voyage at present seems to centre here, for we scarcely ever saw a large canoe that the people in her had not one apiece, and at Ohaihi I do not remember seeing more than two or three. As they are very dangerous and destructive weapons, I did not suffer any to be made in either ship, though strongly importuned to it by many of the natives. Indeed, I always thought it on the last voyage a very imprudent action to furnish the Indians with weapons which, at one time or another, might be turned against ourselves, and my suspicions were but too well founded, for with one of the daggers given by us to the natives of Auhaihi, my much-lamented commander Captain Cook was killed. But for them, that ornament to the British nation might have lived to have enjoyed the fruits of his labour in ease and affluence after a series of years spent in the service of his country and for the benefit of mankind in general. He, however, unfortunately set the example by ordering some daggers to be made after the model of the Indian Pahuas. And this practice was afterwards followed by every person who could raise iron enough to make one. So that during our stay at these islands, the armourer was employed to little other purpose than in working these destructive weapons, and so liberally were they disposed of, that the morning we were running into Karakakua Bay, after the resolution had sprung her foremast, I saw Maiha Maiha get eight or nine daggers from Captain Clark in exchange for a feathered cloak. Though since our arrival at Wahoo, I have purchased some cloaks considerably better than that of Captain Clark's, for a small piece of iron worked into the form of a carpenter's plane bit. These the Sandwich Islanders make use of as adzes and call them Tawis, and to them they answer every purpose wherever an edge tool is required. Since the year 1778, at which time the Sandwich Islands were discovered, there appears to have been an almost total change in their government. From everything I now have been able to learn, Taheitere, the present king of Wahoo, is the only surviving monarch we left amongst the islands at that period. He then was king of Moratoi only, and Pereoran, who then governed Wahoo, was at war with him, and had sent a number of fighting canoes to attack his dominions. It seems that Perioranes forces were worsted on this occasion, for presently afterwards Tahiteri took possession of Wahoo, and flushed with this success, he attacked and conquered the island of Moi, which, as already has been observed, is now annexed to his dominions. Tereobu, who at that time was king of Ohaihi and Moi, fell in battle while defending his dominions. I have no reason to doubt the truth of these relations. For Maihamaiha, the present king of Ohihi, at the time we last were there, was only an inferior chief, and is now, as I understand, in some measure subject to Tahitere. Besides which, the Wawahu chiefs, having in their possession most of the daggers we left at Ohaihi, is a most convincing proof that they have been victorious for I am very certain the natives at these islands will never part with their weapons but at the expense of their lives. From the best account our short stay would permit me to obtain, the principal of the Sandwich Isles were at this time governed by the following persons. Wahu, Moratoi and Moi were subject to Tahitere. Maiha Maiha governed Ohihi and Ranai, and a chief whose name I understand is Tahao was king of Atui and Onechao. With a light breeze at northeast, we stretched to the northwest during the afternoon and were followed by canoes, bringing small hogs and vegetables, although our distance from the land was considerable. At eight o'clock in the morning of the 6th, the north part of Wahoo bore east-northeast, nine leagues, and the southwest part south-southeast, ten leagues distant. The island of Atui appeared in sight, bearing northwest by west, distant twelve leagues. We now had light variable winds, with calms by turns, the weather very close and sultry. 
Our observation at noon gave 20 by Astagma 36 as north latitude. In this situation, we found a pretty strong current setting west-northwest. At 8 o'clock, the extremes of Atui bore from northwest to west, half north, the nearest land about five leagues distant. The night was spent in standing off and on, as I wished to run well in with the south side of Atui on the morrow, in order to give the natives an opportunity of bringing us vegetables. The stock we procured at Wahoo beginning to run short. At five o'clock in the morning of the 7th, we bore away and made sail with a fine breeze from the eastward, which brought us by eight o'clock within two leagues of the land. The land on the east and southeast part of Atui rises gradually from the seaside till it terminates in high land, which seems situated near the centre of the island. These hills are clothed to the summits with lofty trees, whose verdure has a beautiful appearance. The land next the shore affords a few bushes, but seems quite uncultivated and destitute of inhabitants. On the eastern shore there are a few small sandy bays, but they afford no shelter for ships to ride in, being quite exposed to easterly winds which blow directly on shore and generally prevail here. After passing the southeast point we found the land cultivated in general, and houses were scattered here and there all along shore to the westward. By noon we had several canoes about the ship, from whom we procured a few vegetables. But the surf ran so high on the beach that the natives could not bring off any considerable quantity. As I knew Atui afforded plenty of fine hogs and a variety of other refreshments, we stood on for Wemoa Bay, where Captain Cook anchored the last voyage, as I was desirous of procuring some good hogs for salting, and also some to carry with me to sea. By three o'clock we were nearly abreast of the bay, when the wind inclined to the southward and blew so fresh that the anchoring ground was very unsafe to ride in, being entirely exposed to southerly winds, which send in a heavy cross sea, I therefore did not think it prudent to trust the ships in such a situation, so we wore and stood for Wanihau, under all the sail we could carry. At four o'clock, the extremes of Wanihau bore from north-northwest half-west to south-southwest by west, about four leagues distant from the nearest land. The south point of this island forms a remarkably high bluff, rising on all sides to a considerable height and breaking off abruptly. About five leagues to the eastward, it has the appearance of a detached island, being joined to the main by a low strip of land, which is not seen more than three leagues distant. At seven o'clock, the south point bore west by north about two miles, and the easternmost part of the island, north-northeast, four leagues distant. Finding we had not sufficient daylight to bring us into the bay on the west side of Wan Chao, we shortened sail and hauled on a wind to the southward, intending to spend the night in standing off and on. At eleven o'clock we wore, and made the signal to the Queen Charlotte, but she not observing it, continued standing to the southward. Soon afterwards, having nearly lost sight of each other, we wore, and stood after her. Having joined company, we again wore at one o'clock and stood to the northward. This mistake nearly occasioned us to miss one chow, for by standing too long to the southward, we got into a current which set us so strongly to the southwest, that at daylight next morning, Though the wind hung well to the eastward, we could scarcely fetch a league to the eastward of the west point. At six o'clock the south and east points of Wanihau in one bore north-northeast half-north. Our distance then from the nearest land was about two miles. I now perceived that we could weather well to the eastward of the road, therefore stretched along shore, about the distance of one mile, and had regular soundings from twenty to sixteen fathoms water over a bottom of fine sand the wind still continuing well to the eastward, I was tempted to run down and look into the West Bay. At nine o'clock we hauled round the West Point and opened a bay, which I found to be a very good one, the soundings from fifteen to seventeen fathoms water over a fine sandy bottom and distant at least two miles from shore. After running abreast the southwest part of the bay, we anchored with the best bower in eighteen fathoms water over a sandy bottom and moored with a kedge to the westward in twenty-four fathoms water, the extremes of the bay bearing from north by south to southeast, from which last point we were not more than half a mile distant. From the north point of the bay, a ledge of rocks extends itself in a direction nearly east and west for more than half a mile, some of which appear above water, and the extent of the rest may easily be known by the surf that continually breaks over them. About the middle of the bay is a fine sandy beach, 
within a quarter of a mile of which a ship may moor in seven and eight fathoms water over a bottom of fine sand, and boats may land with great ease and safety. No sooner were we moored than several canoes visited us, bringing yams, sweet potatoes, and a few small pigs, for which we gave in exchange nails and beads. Amongst the people in these canoes were several whose faces I remembered to have seen when at this island before, particularly an old priest, in whose house a party of us took up our abode when detained all night on shore by a heavy surf, and who treated us in a very friendly manner. Our principal business here was to procure a good stock of yams, and these I had the pleasure to see brought to us in tolerable plenty. I was also desirous to obtain a further supply of good hogs for salting, but this at present was very doubtful, for as yet we had seen very few, and the largest did not weigh more than twenty pounds. I expected to find no difficulty in getting water, at least sufficient for our daily use. As Mr. Bly, who was master of the resolution during our last voyage, and discovered the bay we now lay in, went on shore in order to examine this part of the island, and met with two wells of fresh water in the beginning of our present situation. Early next morning we were surrounded by canoes, who brought a plentiful supply of yams and some sugar cane. A chief, named Abanu, whom I knew when at this island before, also paid me a visit, and recognised his old acquaintance the moment he came on board. Having appointed six persons to trade with the natives for yams, and given orders to have them dried and stowed away, I went on shore in search of the wells mentioned by Mr. Bly, accompanied by Abanu as a guide. When we landed, a number of the natives who were assembled on the beach retired to a considerable distance, and we walked to the wells without the least molestation. I found one of them brackish and stinking. The other afforded good water, but in no great quantity. The good water was situated about half a mile to the eastward of the beach, and the direct path to it was over a salt marsh, to avoid which a considerable circuit must be taken, which renders the situation very inconvenient. Indeed, a ship in distress for water might procure it here, though much time must be spent in doing it. I would recommend it to all ships watering amongst Indians to have a sufficient number of casks hooped with wood instead of iron for the purpose of filling on shore. These might afterwards be started into other casks in the boats. By this means much mischief might be avoided, for the Indians, having no temptation to steal them, probably would behave in a peaceable manner and might safely be trusted to assist in rolling the casks. After examining these wells, I made an excursion into the country accompanied by Abanu and a few of the natives. The island appears well cultivated, its principal produce is yams. There are besides sweet potatoes, sugar cane, and the sweet root which is called tea by the natives. A few trees are scattered here and there, but in little order or variety. Some that grew near the well just mentioned were about 15 feet high and proportionably thick, with spreading branches and a smooth bark. The leaves were round and they bore a kind of nut somewhat resembling our walnut. Another kind were nine feet high and had blossoms of a beautiful pink colour. I also noticed another variety, with nuts growing on them like our horse chestnut. These nuts I understand the inhabitants use as a substitute for candles, and they give a most excellent light. Now, having viewed everything remarkable on this side of the island, I repaired on board, accompanied by my good friend Abanu, and found a brisk trade carrying on for vegetables. A few hogs had also been purchased, sufficient for daily consumption. A voyage round the world, but more particularly to the northwest coast of America, by Captain Nathaniel Portlock. Chapter 5. Continuation of Transactions at Wanihau. Method of salting pork in tropical climates. Departure from Wanihau. Method of brewing the sweet root. Arrive in sight of the coast of America. Stand on for Cook's River. Meet with some Russian settlers. Arrive in Cook's River. Visited by the Russian chief. Anchor in Coal Harbor. Various employments there. Abundance of salmon. Visit the Russian settlement. Their mode of living described. Proceed further up the river. I have already observed that Onihau belonged to Ta'ao, king of Atui. I now learnt that he was there at present, and that Abanu governed Onihau in his absence. I made the old man a present of some red bays and two large towels, 
which he sent away immediately to Ta Ao at Atui, and gave me to understand that I might expect plenty of hogs and vegetables from that place in consequence of this present. I placed no great reliance on this piece of information, but in the afternoon of the 10th, I was pleasantly surprised to see Abenui's messenger return, accompanied by several large double canoes, which brought a number of fine hogs to be disposed of, together with taro and sugarcane. The messenger gave me to understand that Ta'ao himself meant to have paid me a visit, but that he could not leave Atui under six or seven days, being detained there during that time, in order to perform some religious ceremonies for one of his wives, who was lately dead. And this intelligence was also confirmed by Abenu. However, I had no great reason to regret the absence of His Majesty, for Abenu kept the natives in very good order, encouraged them to bring us whatever the island afforded, and after the people from Atui had disposed of their commodities, he sent them back for a fresh supply. Being desirous to make Ta'ao some further acknowledgement for his supplying us with the various refreshments Atui afforded, though at such a considerable distance, I sent him as a present a light horseman's cap. This, however, Abenu scarcely thought sufficient, and strongly importuned me to send along with it an armed chair, which I had in the cabin, as it would be, he said, peculiarly useful to one of the king's wives who had lately lain in. I willingly complied with my friend's request, and he dispatched the chair and cap to Atui, under the care of special messengers. Our business now went regularly and briskly forward. The trading party were well employed in bartering for yams and other refreshments, and others were busy in killing and salting hogs for sea store. Observing the natives to break the yams in bringing them off, which prevents them from keeping for any length of time, I sent my second mate ashore on the 11th in the Yule to purchase some, by which means we procured a large quantity of very fine ones. Since our arrival here, such of the seamen whose recovery from sickness was scarcely confirmed were daily sent ashore, and found vast benefit from exercise and land air. Indeed, the inhabitants at this island are not numerous, and they were kept in such excellent order by Abenu that our people walked about wherever inclination led them, without the least molestation. Besides hogs and vegetables, we purchased some salt fish of various kinds, such as snappers, rock cod and bonetta, all well cured and very fine. The natives likewise brought us water in calabashes, sufficient for daily use, and to replace what had been expended since we left Wohu. Curiosities too found their way to market, and I purchased two very curious fly flaps, the upper part composed of beautiful variegated feathers. The handles were human bone, inlaid with tortoise shell in the neatest manner, which gave them the appearance of veneered work. By the twelfth, we had purchased near thirty hogs, weighing on an average sixty pounds each, the principal part of which were brought from Atawi, these were salted for sea store, as we daily got a supply of a smaller sort for present consumption. The method of curing pork in tropical climates was first brought to perfection by Captain Cook, yet his plan seems not to be generally known, on which account I shall here take notice of the mode I adopted, as I found it answer my most sanguine expectations. Three different parties were employed in this business, and the best times for killing we found to be about three o'clock in the afternoon and again in the cool of the evening. An awning was fixed over those employed in killing and salting to prevent the sun from damaging the meat. After one party had cleaned the hogs well, they were handed to another set, who took the bones entirely out to cut away all the bruised parts and blood vessels and cut the meat into four or six pound pieces, at the same time making incisions in various parts of the skin so as to admit the salt freely. These pieces were then given to the salters who rubbed them thoroughly with good white salt, and afterwards stowed them on some hatches that were fixed as a kind of temporary stage, about two feet from deck. A sufficient quantity of meat being placed on this stage, it was covered with canvas and boards on which heavy weights were placed. In this state it remained till morning, by which time all the blood was pressed out and the meat was hard and firm. Every piece was then carefully examined, and if any parts appeared the least tainted, they were cut away and fresh salt rubbed on. The pork was then packed in casks, filled up with strong pickle and pressed with weights as before. After remaining in casks 24 hours, it was repacked, filled up with fresh pickle, and put away for future use. Some pork that we salted at Ohaihi was examined after it had been packed a week and found perfectly sweet and the finest I ever saw. The bones were broke, rubbed well with salt, and afterwards put into strong pickle, 
and the flesh being cut from the heads, it was dry salted and kept exceedingly well. I also salted several whole sides after the bones were taken out without pickle and they made very fine bacon. Since our arrival at the Sandwich Islands, we had salted on board the King George seven tierces and two hogsheads of pork, besides two tierces of bones, and had not twenty pounds of meat spoiled amongst the whole quantity. In addition to the above, I shall just observe that after the hogs are killed, they cannot be too expeditiously cleaned and salted, for on that the safety of the meat principally depends, though I believe in most countries where much pork is cured, they usually leave it to cool before the salt is laid on. This method, however, is certainly a bad one, for I have known a house in Virginia, by following it, to lose near 600 hogs at one time. Whereas had they begun salting while the meat was warm and the blood running, I have every reason to think that the greatest part, if not all of it, would have been preserved. By this time we had procured near 10 tons of fine yams, and Captain Dixon had got about 8 tons on board the Queen Charlotte. The health of both ship's crews was well re-established, and every necessary business being completed, no time was lost in getting the ships ready for sea, as the season for commencing our operations on the American coast was already begun. At five o'clock in the morning of the 13th we unmoored, and at eight o'clock we weighed and got under sail, standing out of the bay, which obtained the name of Yam Bay from the great quantity of yams we procured in it, with a fresh breeze at northeast. As our visit to the Sandwich Islands was a very transient one, I had little opportunity of obtaining any information respecting the manners and customs of the natives, so that the reader may collect what little intelligence I can give him on that head from the foregoing detail of our transactions. Hoes, sweet potatoes, taro, sugarcane and yams may, as has already been shown, be procured in any quantity, and water is so easily obtained at Wahoo that in little more than one day we got upwards of thirty tons on board, but amongst the refreshments these islands abound with the sweet root, or tea, which we met with in great abundance at Woahoo, must by no means pass unnoticed, as it makes very good beer, which, after two or three trials, I brought to perfection. The great utility of this root was not known to us during the last voyage, so that the method I made use of in brewing, it may not improperly be mentioned in this place. The root was peeled very clean, cut into small pieces, and put into a clean kettle, and six of the large roots were found a sufficient quantity for twelve gallons of water. This was put on the fire at three o'clock in the afternoon, and after boiling an hour and a half, was put away to cool. By the time the liquor was lukewarm, a gill of prepared yeast was added and afterwards it was put into a cask. It generally began to work about midnight, and by nine o'clock the next morning it was excellent drinking. I found it necessary to make use of yeast only once. The grounds fermented the liquor afterwards, and I am inclined to think that when yeast cannot be procured, a little leaven would answer as a substitute. This beer was constantly drank by such of our sailors as were affected with the scurvy, and they found great benefit from it so that in addition to its being very useful as common drink, I may safely call it a most excellent anti-scorbutic. Having succeeded so well in brewing the sweet root, I tried sugarcane by the same method and made a good wholesome drink from it, though much inferior to the other. We stood to the north-northwest along the west side of Wonihau, which forms several fine sandy bays that seem to afford good shelter and anchorage. At ten o'clock, my worthy old friend Abenu took his leave of me, and all the canoes left us, on which occasion we hoisted our colours and fired ten guns by way of taking leave of this little friendly island. At noon, Yam Bay bore southeast eight or ten miles, and the west point of Wanhao south by east, six leagues distant. In the forenoon of the 15th, we saw great numbers of the tropic and man-of-war birds, together with terns and boobies, so that I conjectured we then were sailing at no considerable distance from some uninhabited island. Our latitude at noon was 24 degree 14 north and 160 degree 24 longitude. For some days the weather was close and sultry, attended with frequent heavy rains. But on the 20th, the weather became clear and pleasant, with a fine easterly breeze. This gave us an opportunity of examining our yams, and it was very fortunate that we did so. For they began to decay occasioned by heat, and in a few days would certainly have been spoiled. In the forenoon of the 22nd, we saw a great number of petrels, about the size of a pigeon and of a footy colour, 
and passed two large pieces of a substance which appeared to be a part of the cuttlefish. They were very much torn, probably by whales who feed on the cuttlefish. Our latitude at that was, was 32nd and 4 north, and 168 longitude. The wind now gradually shifted to the southward, and afterwards hauled to west and northwest, with rain and a heavy cross swell, which indicated that the trade wind had left us. On the 27th, being in 38 Tastu or 14th and north latitude, and 155 deg 56 it was longitude, we found 15 deg 30 stewards easterly variation. In the year 1778, when nearly in the same latitude, and about 3 degrees to the eastward of the above longitude, the variation was found to be 16 degrau 30 easterly, a difference of 1 degree, which is very considerable. In the forenoon of the 28th, I went on board the Queen Charlotte in order to appoint a rendezvous for the ships in case of separation, as the weather now was constantly thick and hazy. We fixed on a situation in Cook's River, near Cape Bede, which cape forms the south side of a deep inlet and anchor point the north side. This situation was a very eligible one, not only as there was a great probability of finding a good harbour, but whichever vessel arrived there first would be able to make signals to her other on her entering the river. Having settled this point, I returned on board my own ship. In the afternoon the water altered its colour and had the appearance of soundings, on which we sounded with a line of 120 fathoms, but got no bottom. Next morning, a number of seals were seen playing around the ship. But our distance from the coast of America was so considerable that I cannot think those animals came from there or from any known islands near the coast. On the contrary, there is great reason to suppose that we were near some land which has not as yet been discovered. For during our last voyage, in 1778, when in 44 Mundi 50 north latitude and 142 D30s west longitude, we passed a piece of wood which appeared to have been but a short time in the water and drifted from the westward. And in the same year, when in 40 de Quefetitin, north latitude and 157 de 55 west longitude, we saw a thag, which bird is never known to fly far from land. And as our present situation was nearly in the midway between those just mentioned, I had great reason to believe we should fall in with some. The weather for several days was constantly thick and hazy, attended with drizzling rain, so that had we passed within five miles of any land, it would have been impossible for us to have seen it, and the advanced season of the year not permitting me to waste any time in searching for undiscovered islands, I kept on my course to the north. Toward noon on the 3rd of July the weather cleared up, and our observation gave 44 to 4 sags, north latitude and 151 to 12 vers longitude. Since the 29th, we had daily seen seals, whales and porpoises, together with a great number of petrels and various other birds. We frequently sounded with a line of 150 fathoms, but found no bottom. Neither was there any appearance of land. I struck one of the seals that were playing about the ship and got it on board. At first sight, I imagined it to be a sea otter. Its fur was very close and fine. For some time past, the wind had kept to the northward and westward, which greatly retarded our progress. But on the 7th, in 46 degree 11, north latitude and 147 degree 8 longitude, it shifted to the southward, which enabled us to shape a course northwest by north for the entrance of Cook's River. We kept standing for that place without meeting with any particular occurrence. The weather, in general, was cloudy, with alternate fogs and heavy rain. Vast numbers of different kinds of birds, such as divers, gulls, petrels and albatrosses, were constantly about the ship, and we frequently passed pieces of wood and patches of seaweed, called by the sailors sea leek. The weather on the 14th being tolerably fine, I took the opportunity of cleaning the ship well, fore and aft, and afterward every part was aired with good fires, a most necessary precaution after the foggy, wet weather we so recently had experienced. In the morning of the 15th, the water altered its colour, and at 10 o'clock, judging we were in soundings, and willing to strike the edge of them as a future direction in coming on the coast, we tried soundings but had no ground with 190 fathoms of line, our latitude then was 57 degree 2 ast north and 148 degree 32 ast longitude. In this situation, we found 22 degree 1 easterly variation. The weather being thick and foggy, we frequently tried for soundings but got no bottom. At length, about 8 o'clock in the morning of the 16th, we struck the ground in 70 fathoms of water, 
over a bottom of fine grey sand with black specks, and at seven o'clock in the evening, the fog dispersing, we saw the coast of America extending from north by east to west by north, distant from the nearest land, which appeared to be a projecting point, about 12 leagues. In this situation, we had 57 fathoms of water over a bottom of shells and mud. At eight o'clock, the land in sight from north to south-southwest appeared to be entirely detached from the land in sight to the westward. This induced me to suppose that the land bearing south-southwest was Cape St. Hermogenes, and another point, which bore west by north, was Cape Elizabeth. A very great number of Galicia whales were seen near the shore, and indeed in every direction as far as the eye could reach. During the night, we sounded with a line of 55 fathoms, but got no bottom. The next day at noon, the land in sight bore from weft by north to north, 12 or 13 leagues distant. The latitude then was 58 dig to 23 degrees north and 149 dig 43 degree longitude. We continued during the afternoon to stand in for the shore, but the wind grew light and variable, so that we gained ground very slowly. At noon on the 18th, our latitude by observation was 58 degree 29 north. Cape Elizabeth then bore northwest by west, distant 15 leagues. The Barren Isles west northwest, about the same distance and Cape St. Hermogene is southwest, distant 12 leagues. With a moderate breeze at west-northwest, we stood towards Cape St. Hermogene's, but by six o'clock the wind entirely failed us, and it grew calm. Cape St. Hermogene is then bore southwest, six leagues distant. In that situation we had soundings in 40 fathoms water over a bottom of gravel and dark sand. At nine o'clock, a light breeze springing up at southeast, I changed our course from west-northwest to northwest by west, being apprehensive, should it again fall calm, that the tide might draw us in between the Isle St. Hermogenes and the land to the westward, a situation I wished to avoid, particularly in the night and with light winds. During the night, our soundings varied greatly. When the Isle St. Hermogenes bore south-southwest, six leagues distant, we had 45 fathoms water, after the island was brought to bear more to the south ward, we had from 65 to 70 fathoms water over a bottom of dark grey muddy sand. At two o'clock in the morning of the 19th, I again steered west-northwest, with a moderate breeze from southeast by east. Soon afterwards, the south point of the Isle St. Hermogenes bore south by west, six leagues distant. The morning proved so very foggy that we lost sight of land. However, towards 11 o'clock, the fog dispersing, I saw the barren islands bearing north-northwest, about three leagues distant. On this, I steered northwest by north in order to run to the westward of them, intending, if possible, to make the inlet, already mentioned, near Cape Bede, as we had thick, rainy weather and signs of an approaching gale. While standing on in this direction, the lead was kept going, but we got no bottom with thirty fathoms of line. At one o'clock, the westernmost part of the barren isles bore east-north-east, three miles distant. On this, I stood over for Capibeda, steering north by east under double-reefed topsails, with a strong breeze from the east-southeast and thick foggy weather. At four o'clock, we saw the land near Capibeda bearing north-northeast, about three leagues distant. In running from the barren isles, we passed several strong ripplings of a tide, and on standing well in with Point Bead, the wind shifted to northeast and east northeast, blowing in sudden puffs from the land with rain and dark, gloomy weather. I hauled in as near the shore as the wind would permit, and when we had brought Cape Bead to bear south 34 degram east, four miles distant, an appearance of a harbour presented itself, with a small island situated directly in the entrance and bearing from south 87 degree east to south 81 degree east, distant three miles. We stood for this opening but made little progress, the wind growing light and the little we had being directly against us. Just at this time, we were greatly surprised to hear the report of a great gun from the shore. It was now very thick over the land, which prevented us from seeing the smoke of the gun. However, we fired a gun and hoisted our colours, and presently afterward fired another, expecting it would be answered. Immediately after our firing the second gun, another was fired from the shore in the direction of east three-quarters south. 
It was now very evident that some nation or other had got to this place before us, which mortified me not a little. Soon after this, we perceived a boat rowing out toward the ships, on which we tacked and stood in shore in order to meet her. By seven o'clock the boat came on board and I found the people to be Russians. As we had no person who understood the Russian language, the information we got from this party was but little. If I understood them right, they came last from Kodiak, an island near the Shumagins, on a trading expedition, that they left their vessel at Kodiak and proceeded to Cook's River in boats. The harbour which I intended to make, they gave me to understand, was a very good one, and they offered to take a person from the ship in their boat to examine it. I accepted their offer and sent Mr. M. Leod along with them to examine the harbour and found the entrance, there being some rocks near it. The Russians left us at half past eight o'clock and immediately afterward we came to anchor in 35 fathoms of water over a bottom of coarse sand and shells. Point Bede bearing south 30 wasting east, distant two leagues and a small rocky island detached from it in the same direction. At the time we anchored it was high water and on the ebb making I found it to set from the north by compass and run at the rate of two knots per hour and fall 14 feet perpendicular. The flood set directly from the south and ran nearly at the same rate as the ebb. At four o'clock in the morning of the 20th, the Russian boat returned with Mr. M. Leod, who informed me that the harbour was a very good one and that there was a safe passage into it on either side of the small island at the entrance. After examining the harbour, Mr. Maleod landed on a beach just outside the south entrance of it, where the Russians had taken up their abode. It should seem that they only continue here during the summer season, as they had nothing more than tents covered with canvas or skins to live in. He observed but few sea otter skins amongst them, and they were mostly green and appeared as if recently taken from the animal. The Russian party consisted of 25 men. They had also a number of Indians along with them, who had skin canoes and seemed to be on the most friendly terms with the Russians, which inclined me to think they were not natives of this place, but brought here from Kodiak or Unalaska for the purpose of hunting, especially as Mr. Mliod could not perceive any Indian habitations near the Russian settlement. The Russian chief brought me as a present a quantity of fine salmon, sufficient to serve both ships for one day, in return for which I gave him some yams and directed him how to dress them, and likewise some beef, pork and a few bottles of brandy. He made his acknowledgments in the best manner he was able and returned on shore, perfectly pleased with his reception. These people, quite contrary to the Russian custom, were particularly careful not to get intoxicated, but I have reason to think that this caution proceeded more from a fear of being surprised by the neighbouring Americans in a state of intoxication than from any dislike they have to liquor. For Mr. M. Leod informed me that they were constantly on their guard, with their arms always ready, and that no man slept without a rifle-barrelled piece under his arm and his cutlass and a long knife by his side. We now began to be in want of wood, and the crews stood in need of some exercise on shore. Therefore I determined to get into the adjacent harbour, and more particularly, as there was not the least appearance of any inhabitants near it, so that our business could be carried on without danger or molestation. An additional reason for making this harbour was that during the time our various business was going forward, I might probably learn from the Russians how long they had been at this place and what time they intended to stay. Also the place where their sloops lay, as they had none in Cook's River. I likewise particularly wished to know whether they procured their furs by bartering with the natives or killing the animals themselves. At nine o'clock in the afternoon, a light breeze springing up from the north-northwest, we weighed anchor and stood in for the north entrance of the opening. After we were got some distance into the harbour, the wind failed us, and we were obliged to drop an anchor underfoot as there was a strong current setting directly out, although it was flood tide. This I could in no way account for but by supposing that we were in the entrance of a strait, leading out directly to sea. A nice breeze coming on soon afterwards enabled us to work well into the harbour, and at half past seven o'clock we anchored in eleven fathoms of water over a bottom of black muddy sand and moored with the best bower to the east and the stream cable bent to a spare anchor toward the shore. When moored, the inner point of the bay bore east-southeast, 
distant at three cable lengths and the point forming the north entrance into the harbour, west-northwest, half a mile distant, Volcano Mount in Cooks River, west-northwest, half north, and Mount St. Augustine, southwest by south. Early in the morning of the 21st, I went on shore in search of a convenient place for wooding and watering the ships. I landed on a fine smooth beach at the head of the bay, about a mile distant from the ship, near which I found a run of good fresh water. An opening which from the ship had the appearance of a creek was found to be a narrow entrance leading to a saltwater lake. Here was wood of different kinds in great abundance, such as pine, blackbush, witch hazel and poplar. Many of the pines were large enough for lower masts for a ship of 400 tons burden, and in every place were plants and shrubs of various sorts growing with great strength and vigour. However, this not being a very convenient situation for getting wood to the boats, I proceeded up the harbour to look for a place better adapted for our purpose. I found it a most excellent one indeed, with great plenty of wood everywhere and several fine runs of water. For a considerable distance, it runs up nearly east-southeast, and then bends rather to the southward, with fourteen fathoms water over a bottom of muddy sand. The east side affording plenty of black birch and other kinds of wood which grew close to a beach where the boats could have easy access, I fixed on it for a wooding place, and returning immediately on board, I sent the carpenters to get some spars and another party to cut firewood. None of the natives as yet had made their appearance, but as the Russians were constantly on their guard for fear of being surprised by the Americans, I judged it prudent that we should be so likewise, and accordingly sent a chest with arms along with the parties on shore. By noon we got several boatloads of wood on board. In the afternoon the seine was hauled at the head of the bay where we lay, but with little success, only a few codfish being caught. Whilst we were engaged in this business, the Russian chief paid me a visit and informed me that the place where we hauled the seine was not stocked with fish, but that near his residence plenty might be caught. I accordingly took the seine thither and in several halls caught about thirty salmon and a few flatfish. This indifferent success was owing, as my friend the Russian told me, to the time of tide, it being then low water when, for hauling the Seine, it should be nearly high water. However, he assured me, if I would leave the Seine all night, and a man along with it I should have plenty of fish the next morning, I embraced this offer with great pleasure and left one of my sailors, who I perceived had some little knowledge of the Russian language. Friday 24th This Russian settlement if I may be allowed to call it one, where the residence is only temporary, was situated on a pleasant piece of flat land, about three miles in length and two hundred yards wide, bounded by a good sandy beach on one side and a small lake of fresh water, which empties itself into the sea, on the other. In this lake, they catch plenty of fine salmon. The beach terminates at each end in high points of land, which form a snug bay where small craft might lie with great safety. The Russians were twenty-five in number, exclusive of the Indians, which I now found were brought from Kodiak and Unalaska. They had two skin boats, each calculated to row twelve oars, and the thwarts were double-banked. I understood that the chief and the Indians took up their abode in a small tent, covered with canvas, and the remainder slept under the two boats just mentioned. They have no bread, their diet seems to consist principally of fish, and a mess is made of the root of a plant, called by Stella the Serenat, which would taste very well were it not rendered unpalatable by being mixed with animal oil. They also had some very good tea. Among the party were three Indian women, one of whom I was informed came from Unalaska and the others from Kodiak. I could perceive that they procured no furs by bartering with the Americans and that they got no sea otter skins, nor indeed furs of any kind, but what the Kodiak Indians caught in hunting. During my stay among the Russians, they were all very busily employed. Some were dressing green sea otter skins, others repairing their boats and cleaning arms. Most of the Indians were out on a hunting party. The few left behind were busy fitting darts to their spears and making snuff from tobacco, of which they seem very fond, and their women in cooking and repairing canoes. No. It was very evident that this little party was under great apprehensions from the Americans, Indeed, the chief gave me to understand that they had attempted to surprise them several times, which made it absolutely necessary for them to be constantly on their guard. He told me that they were a set of savage, cruel people, but spoke much in favour of the Unalaska and Kodiak Indians. 
Having procured all the intelligence I could from the Russian chief, I returned towards evening on board my own vessel. During the night the weather was very unsettled, and the wind variable, blowing at times in heavy squalls from the land, with calms by turns. At seven o'clock the next morning, I sent the whaleboat to the Russian settlement to learn what success they had had with the Seine. The boat returned at nine o'clock, deeply loaded with fine salmon, part of which I sent aboard the Queen Charlotte, and now, having a plentiful supply of good fish, the people were no longer on salt provisions, but instead had fish and yams served to them. Part of the ship's crew was sent to cut firewood, and others were given liberty to recreate themselves ashore. Towards noon the Russian chief returned from my visit, the service he had rendered us in pointing out a situation where we could catch plenty of fish at any time demanded some addition to my former present, and I gave him several articles which, in my opinion, would be serviceable, such as salt, vinegar, port wine and brandy. Observing that when I was at his residence they had boiled some of the yams I had given them, which seemed to please them very much, I added about 400 weight more to my present. Though my new acquaintance and I understood each other only imperfectly, he seemed very pleased with this mutual exchange of friendly offices. After staying on board for a short time, he took his leave and returned ashore. Soon afterward, I went in the whaleboat, accompanied by Captain Dixon, to take a survey of the harbour. At first, we expected to find a strait leading out to sea, but we soon found ourselves mistaken. The harbour, from the small island at the entrance, which assumed the name of Passage Island, runs up about nine miles, nearly in an east-southeast direction, and afterwards terminates in a freshwater river that branches out in several directions. There are several projecting points on each side of the harbour that form very snug and good bays, with excellent beaches, where a ship might, if necessary, be hauled ashore with the greatest safety, the depth of water close to the beach seven and eight fathoms. On our way we called on the wooding party, whom we found busily employed. My carpenter informed me that he had seen a tree with two holes through it, which appeared to have been made by swivel shot. If so, they probably were fired from a Russian sloop when hereabouts at the American Indians, who I'm certain have recently inhabited this neighbourhood and fled at the approach of the Russians for we saw a number of huts scattered here and there, some of them very large, and several appeared to have been but lately deserted. After determining the extent of the harbour, we landed and walked up to the Freshwater River. Being at that time low water, the river was very narrow, it abounded with salmon, and on the banks we could perceive the tracks of bears and the moose deer. The flood tide making soon afterwards, we embarked and rowed into one of the branches, intending to proceed as far up it as possible. But on getting into the mouth of the largest branch, our attention was taken up by a large brown bear coming down to the river. I was in hopes that we should have come within musket shot of him, but he caught sight of us and made off into the woods with much greater speed than I imagined a bear could run, and was presently out of sight. In the course of an hour we saw more than twenty bears, but they were all so shy that we could not shoot. One night now coming on we left the shore and got on board about ten o'clock, July, Tuesday, 25th. By the 25th we had completed our wood and water and the ships were ready for sea. So I waited with impatience for an opportunity of proceeding up the river, as there was a probability of meeting with Gambia Islands and consequently we stood a chance of procuring furs. At present, however, the wind was light and variable, frequently coming to calm and the weather thick and foggy. In the afternoon, I went along with Captain Dixon to look into a bay situated to the eastward of the north point of the harbour. We found it a pretty good one, carrying soundings in 14, 12 and 8 fathom water over a bottom of fine black sand. We landed on the west side of the bay, and in walking around it discovered two veins of kennel coal, situated near some hills just above the beach, about the middle of the bay, and with very little trouble, several pieces were got out of the bank, nearly as large as a man's head. From this bay, we rowed across for the entrance leading into the harbour to the southward of Passage Isle, and found plenty of water, but the passage much narrower than the northern one. The best time to run into this harbour is as near low water as possible. Whatever danger there is may then be seen, either from the beds of kelp or the rocks showing themselves above water. In the evening we returned on board and I tried some of the coal we had discovered and found it to burn clear and well. Wednesday 26th. 
At six o'clock in the morning of the 26th, the weather, which for some time had been very thick, cleared a little little, and we began to unmoor. At eight o'clock we weighed and came to sail with a light variable breeze. At nine o'clock the wind came to the northward and westward, and the Queen Charlotte, being to the northward of us, was enabled to lie out, but I could not accomplish it. The flood tide making in and finding we set very fast towards Passage Isle, we brought up, and being exceedingly anxious to get into the main river, began warping against the tide. The Queen Charlotte got clear out, and I made her a signal to anchor, which she obeyed. About eleven o'clock it began to blow very fresh from the north-northwest, with constant rain, and we were obliged again to bring up. At noon the weather grew moderate, and we endeavoured by every means to get out to sea, but found it a difficult matter to accomplish, owing to the uncertainty of the tide and the wind continually shifting. However, at eight o'clock, having worked out as far as the outer rocks, a breeze sprung up from the southward, with which we made all sail and got out, though we passed very near a ledge of rocks to the northward. When abreast of that ledge, we were driven past it in a hurry by the flood tide, which took us and carried us very fast to the northward. Soon afterward the breeze failed us, and I was afraid of coming too near some sunken rocks, situated to the northward and eastward of the north ledge. Therefore, ran a warp out to check the ship. The breeze coming on again in a short time, we slipped the warp and ran further off, and at ten o'clock brought to for the yawl, which I had sent to weigh the kedge. At eleven o'clock the boat came on board, and about the same time we joined the Queen Charlotte and found she was nearly under way. During the night we had light airs, and the tide carried us very fast to the northeast into a deep opening which is formed by Anchor Point and the land to the northeast of Point Bade. Our depth of water was too much for anchoring, being upwards of sixty fathoms, so that we were under the necessity of waiting for a breeze to push out again. At five o'clock in the morning, a light breeze came on from the eastward, with which we stood north-northwest for anchor point, having got out of the opening with the ebb tide. The lead was kept constantly going, and we had soundings from forty-eight to thirty fathoms water over a bottom of fine grey sand. At noon, point bead bore south by east half-east, and anchor point north twenty and west, distant from the nearest land about five leagues. The latitude, by observation, was fifty nine dig thirty forward north. We stretched up the river with light breezes from the southward and eastward until half past five o'clock, when the flood tide being spent, we came to with the stream anchor in twenty fathoms water over a rocky bottom. Anchor point bearing north thirty three degime east, five miles distant. The volcano mount north eighty six degree west. The north land in sight on the western shore north twenty four degree west and an appearance of an opening on the west side, north 63 degree west. A scarce column of smoke issued from the summit of Mount Volcano, but no fiery eruption was to be seen, neither could we perceive any fires or other signs of the coast being inhabited on either side of the river, which was rather remarkable, as the adjacent country seemed pleasant and well sheltered from the inclemency of the weather. This inclined me to think that the Russians we found in Coal Harbour had been up the river and quarrelled with the natives, and I began to fear that our success in the river would be very small. However, I determined to stand on and leave nothing unattempted towards attaining the principal object of our voyage. At ten o'clock we weighed and stood up the river with the flood and a light breeze from the southward. The ebb making strong at eight o'clock in the morning, we could not stem it with a light breeze therefore anchored in twenty-four fathoms, over a rocky bottom, anchor point bearing south thirty de Grand east, distant five leagues, the volcano mount southwest half west, the extremes of an island on the west shore, from north sixty seep de Grand west to north forty-eight de Grand west, distant about five leagues. At the time we anchored, the tide ran four miles an hour, the ebb setting from the north by east, and the flood from the south by west, and about half tide, it ran nearly five miles an hour. Our latitude was 60 dig 9 north, and we found 23 dig 15 easterly variation. The land on the western side near the shore, appearing very pleasant and likely to be inhabited, I determined to stand over and look for anchorage. At four o'clock, a point of land which contracts the river to the westward bore north 54 dig west, five miles distant. We now had soundings from 20 to 25 fathoms of water over a rocky bottom but after hauling round the point, we shoaled it, 
and at six o'clock, having 13 fathoms water over a shingly bottom, we came to with the best bower, the northernmost land in sight on the west shore bearing north 20 deg east, and the distance from the nearest land about five miles. A voyage round the world, but more particularly, to the northwest coast of America, by Captain Nathaniel Portlock. Chapter 6. Indians come to the ships with furs, show a thieving disposition, bring great quantities of salmon to barter, description of the country near Trading Bay, climate, produce. The ships leave Trading Bay and proceed down the river, requested by the Indians to join with them against the Russians, presents given at parting, leave Cook's River and proceed towards Prince William's Sound, prevented from making it by contrary winds, proceed along the coast disappointed in meeting with Cross Sound. Soon after we anchored, two small canoes came off from the shore, nearly abreast of the ship, and went alongside the Queen Charlotte. I afterwards learnt that they had nothing to barter, except a few dried salmon which Captain Dixon purchased for beads, and also made them a few presents, in order to convince them that our intentions were friendly and that we wished to trade with them in a peaceable manner. They seemed to comprehend Captain Dixon's meaning and promised to bring furs the following day. About seven o'clock the next morning, we had the pleasure of seeing two large canoes and several small ones pushing off from the shore. The large canoes contained about 20 people each, the small ones held but one or at most two persons. When at some distance from us, they joined in a song which was continued for a considerable length of time and afterwards came alongside extending their arms as a token of their pacific intentions, and many of them held up green plants, probably for the same motive. Most of these Indians had their faces daubed entirely over with red ochre and black lead, which gave them a very disgusting appearance. Their noses and ears were in general ornamented with small blue beads or teeth, and they had a slit cut in the underlip, in a line parallel with the mouth, which was adorned in a similar manner. We procured from this party near twenty sea otter skins and a few cloaks made of the earless marmot skins sewed together very neatly. They traded in a fair open manner and were very importunate with us to go ashore. I entreated one of them, who appeared to be a chief, to come on board, which he declined at first unless I sent one of the sailors into his canoe as a hostage. But while I was speaking with him, one of his companions ventured on board, and presently afterwards, the chief and several others followed his example. However, to convince them that they were perfectly safe, I sent one of my people into their boat, agreeably to the chief's request. After staying on board some time and gratifying their curiosity with looking at the vessel, they left us and paddled ashore, seemingly well satisfied with their reception. From this favourable beginning, I was inclined to think we could not change our situation for a better, therefore determined to keep it a few days. Accordingly, we sighted the best bower and moored with it to the southward and the stream to the northward. Our observation at noon gave 60 d 40 latitude. On the 30th, we were visited by several canoes from whom we purchased some good sea otter skins, together with several marmot cloaks, raccoons and foxes. They also brought us plenty of excellent fresh salmon, which we obtained for beads and buttons. Our traffic for some days was much in the same state, and the behaviour of the natives was very quiet and peaceable. However, according to Indian custom, they made no scruple of thieving, and some that were on board the King George on the 3rd of August gave us a specimen of their talents in that line, by stealing the hook from a block strap and a grindstone handle, which being made of iron, was no doubt reckoned a prize. I did not, however, think it prudent to use violence with them for these trifling depredations and contented myself with ordering a good lookout to be kept to prevent their stealing anything in the future. An elderly chief went on board the Queen Charlotte, from whom Captain Dixon gathered some information respecting the Russians. He clearly understood from the old man's pointing to the guns and describing the explosion they made, as well as from other circumstances, that there had lately been a battle between the Russians and the natives in which the Russians were worsted. The chief at the same time intimated that they would not quarrel with us on that account, as he was certain we belonged to another nation from the difference in our dress. How this quarrel originated, we could not learn, but most probably it was caused by theft. 
The Indians, on leaving the ship, gave us to understand that their neighbourhood was drained of furs, but that they would go procure more in the adjacent country. In the afternoon, a strong gale of wind came on, which continued till the forenoon of the 5th, varying veering from south-southeast to south-southwest. A considerable sea set into the bay, which caused the ships to ride very heavily, but we found much more so at slack water than at any other time. This difference I imagine to be caused by our lying in a different tide than what there is in the stream, so that during the time of low water a sea rolls in, but as soon as the tide makes in the stream, it runs along the mouth of the bay and breaks off the sea considerably. About ten o'clock in the forenoon, the weather growing moderate, one large canoe and several small ones came alongside, bringing us four good sea otter skins, a few martens, raccoons and foxes, and plenty of fine salmon. The large canoe had been absent two days to trade for furs in various parts of the river, and the people now gave us to understand that the adjoining country was entirely drained of skins and that they could not procure any more. One of the Indians in the large canoe had a very good nankin frock, and another a blue frock which they wanted to sell. Several of them had a number of small blue glass beads, which they seemed very fond of, but the frocks were held in very little estimation. These articles must doubtless have been procured from the Russians previous to their quarrel, and soon after they came into the river. I was inclined to believe the information we obtained from our visitors respecting the scarcity of furs in this part. As I had observed for some days past, the canoes came from different quarters, and the few skins they brought were of an inferior quality. I therefore determined to seek Cook's River at the first opportunity and proceed to Prince William's Sound, where I expected to procure a good fuply of fine furs. At noon the weather was very unsettled, with every appearance of an approaching gale, which prevented me from weighing anchor. Towards evening, a fresh gale came on from the southward, and at nine o'clock, when the flood tide came, it blew very strong, which caused us to let go the small bower anchor and veer away on both cables until we brought the small bower anchor ahead. The gale continued until noon on the 7th, during which time no canoes came near us. However, about two o'clock, the weather began to moderate, and two small canoes ventured off, from whom we purchased a sufficient quantity of salmon to serve the ship's company for one day, but they brought no furs of any kind. Towards evening, two large canoes came off from the eastern shore, but the weather was very bad at that time, so they passed by without coming alongside. They went ashore abreast of the ships, where they hauled their canoes and turned them bottom up, probably to serve as temporary habitations, as we soon afterwards saw a fire lighted near each of them. Despite the heavy gale of wind we recently experienced, it did not cause any waves on the opposite beach. On the contrary, the water was so smooth that a small boat might be able to land on any part of it safely. We still had fresh gales from the southward with thick, hazy weather. However, this did not deter two small canoes from venturing alongside with a few salmon. In the afternoon of the 8th, two of the natives came on board, and I gave each of them a knife, a gimlet, and some beads. They were totally at a loss what to make of the gimlets, until I pointed out their use and taught them to bore a hole through a piece of wood, which at once discovered their value, and they admired the gimlets far beyond their other presents. When my visitors prepared to go ashore, it came on to blow very hard, on which I gave them to understand that if they would stay on board until the gale was over, I would haul their canoes upon deck. To this proposal they readily agreed, but an old surly man in one of the canoes objected to it and insisted on their leaving the ship, which they did, and after a good deal of difficulty got safely ashore. At eight o'clock the gale increased, and at nine it came on to blow so strong at south that I judged it prudent to have the top gallant masts got down upon deck, the top masts struck close down to the rigging, and the lower yards kept aloft, ready for making some sail, should we be forced from our anchors. The water, however, continued more smooth than could have been expected, and the vessel being made snug, rode very easy. At eleven o'clock, when she tended to the flood, apprehending that our present scope of cable would be insufficient to ride her against both wind and tide, we wore away to one and a quarter cable on the best bower. At eight o'clock next morning, the weather appearing more settled, we began to sway up the topmasts, but whilst we were engaged in this business, 
it came on to blow very fresh, which determined me to keep all fast, as I did not judge it prudent to quit our situation until there was a probability of our clearing the river. The heavy and continued gale of wind for some days past has raised no surf on the beach to the westward of us, and I am inclined to think there never is much sea near the Wednesday shore with any wind whatever. My reason for forming this conjecture is that the natives have fixed weirs for catching salmon in several places, which, should any sea set in shore, would certainly be washed away by the surf. The land to the westward is prettily diversified with valleys and gently rising grounds, which in general are clothed with pines and shrubs. Many of the vales have small rills of water which discharge themselves into the sea, and in one of them were several houses and some stages on which the natives dry their salmon. These contrasted with the mountains situated behind them, which are entirely covered with snow, compose a landscape at once beautiful and picturesque. During the late stormy, unsettled weather, the air had been mild and temperate, and I am inclined to think that the climate here is not so severe as has been generally supposed, for in the course of our traffic with the natives, they frequently brought berries of several sorts, and in particular blackberries, equally fine with those met with in England. Besides the various sorts of furs met with here, and which have already been enumerated, Cook's River produces native sulphur, ginseng, snake root, black lead, coal, together with the greatest abundance of fine salmon, and the natives behave quietly and barter fairly, so that a most profitable trade might doubtless be carried on here by any persons of sufficient enterprise to undertake it. Towards midnight, the gale subsided, but at three o'clock in the morning of the 10th, a light breeze coming on from the north-northeast, we began to unmoor. At five o'clock, we weighed anchor and set sail with a moderate breeze from the northeast. Soon after we got under sail, the wind began to veer around to the southeast, and noticing that the ebb tide was carrying us towards the south point of the bay we had just left, which obtained the name of Trading Bay, it became necessary to tack close to the wind. Just as we passed the point, we were caught by a very rapid tide setting to the southwest, which was a direction very different from what we expected, and with little wind, Mostly southerly we were unable to escape the tide even though a slight push would have sufficed as the south-southeast tide line was just outside use. Immediately after war, I spotted a dry shoal bearing southwest directly in the path of the tide's course and we were drifting towards it at the rate of five miles an hour. I quickly realized that the only way to avoid this shoal was by anchoring and I was relieved to find clear ground. Therefore, we anchored immediately in 11 fathoms of water over a bottom of fine dark sand inclining to mud. The Queen Charlotte anchored at the same time, about half a mile to the westward of us. The south point of Trading Bay bore north 24 Glyn west, four miles distant, the east point of an island to the southeastward of us, south 50 Glyn east, and the northeast point of the shoal south 14 Glyn east, distant a quarter of a mile. At low water the shoal was dry for about a mile and a half, extending from northeast to southwest. It appeared to be a bank of black muddy sand, flat on every side, and the water so smooth all around that if we had drifted onto it, we probably would not have sustained any damage. However, as we had little wind and fine clear weather, I sent my whaleboat to sound all around it. Within this shoal to the westward, the land appeared very high and in many places covered with snow. Near the sea was a narrow strip of low land covered with pines, and there appeared some openings like harbours, but time did not allow for my sending the boat to examine them. I spotted a rock from the masthead, which is covered before high water in the direction of north half-east, from the eastern point of that island to the southward of us, and forms part of a shoal that appears to stretch out two or three miles. A rock was also seen about half a mile from the south point of Trading Bay, which, together with the shoals, makes navigation in this part of the river much more dangerous than it was supposed to be. While we lay at anchor, several small canoes came off from a town near the south point of Trading Bay. In one of them was a man whom I had found very useful in procuring furs during our stay in the bay, hence he was called the Factor. I clearly understood from him that the Russians frequented the west side of the island to the southward, and that there is a passage between that and the mainland. If so, I think it must be greatly impeded with shoals and dangerous due to the rapidity of the tides. My friend the Factor, brought nothing to dispose of except a few salmon. It seems his principal motive in paying me this visit 
was to beg our assistance against the ruffians. He was very importunate with me to grant his request, intimating at the same time that he could presently assemble a large fleet of canoes, with which, assisted by our ships, they could easily get the better of their enemies. On my refusing his request, he seemed rather mortified, but to console him in some measure for this disappointment, I gave him a light horseman's cap, of which he was very proud, and his countrymen beheld him with such a mixture of admiration and envy that I greatly question whether he will be able to keep it long in his possession. I also distributed a few trifles amongst the other Indians, and they returned on shore perfectly satisfied, notwithstanding I refused to espouse their cause against the Russians. At one o'clock, the whale boat returned from sounding, and the officer who was in her informed me that he found four and five fathoms of water about half a mile from the shoal, and all round it near the same depth over a bottom of black muddy sand, the tide running at the rate of four miles an hour. Soon after four o'clock, the flood being nearly done, we weighed and stretched over for the eastern shore, with a light breeze from the south-southeast. After getting about two miles to the eastward, the water deepened so much that we got no ground with a 60 fathoms line, but after passing the mid-channel, we struck the ground in 34 fathoms. We sank over a shingly bottom, and the water shoaled gradually as we advanced towards the eastern shore. About nine o'clock, we anchored in 16 fathoms of water over a shingly bottom. As I judged the ebb to have been done, but it run down, near an hour longer than I expected. When at anchor, the south point of Trading Bay bore north 46 degrees west. The extremes of the island on the western shore were south 65 degrees west and south 30 degrees west, distant from the nearest land on the east shore about two leagues. Next morning, at half past five o'clock, the flood tide being done, we weighed and made sail with a light breeze at south southwest and carried soundings along shore about two leagues distant, from 15 to 20 fathoms, over a shingly bottom. At eight o'clock, the north point of an island on the western shore bore north 84 degrees west, six leagues, and some rocks that are situated two miles from the eastern shore, south 50 foot east, three leagues distant. These rocks make their appearance at all times of tide, yet are not noticed in Captain Cook's chart of the river, but are in Mr. Edgar's, who was master of the discovery. He, I think, has laid them down about a league too far to the southward. We tacked at nine o'clock, and soon afterwards saw a number of canoes, which at first I concluded were traders, coming off to the ship. But on looking at them through a glass, I perceived two Russian boats among them. They were about a league to the northward of us, and appeared to be standing over for the island on the western shore. Just at this time, the breeze from the south-southwest freshening, the boats set their sails and pushed over for the island. They, no doubt, were the same party we met at Coal Harbour, and probably the factor's intelligence regarding their having a settlement on the west side of that island was true. Having in general light variable winds, with calms by turns, we took advantage of the tide in standing down the river, and by noon on the 13th were well clear of it. At that time the extremes of the barren islands bore southwest and south 38 ding west, Cape Elizabeth north 80 ding west, distant about five leagues, and our distance from the nearest shore about three leagues. The land on which Cape Elizabeth is situated is an island, and in the straits formed by it and the backland, there is good anchorage and shelter. Hereabouts would be a most desirable situation for carrying on a whale fishery, the whales being on the coast and close inshore in vast numbers, and there being convenient and excellent harbours quite handy for the business. The barren islands, which are situated nearly in the midway between Point Banks and Cape Elizabeth, are very high and totally barren. They lie in a cluster and appear to have good passages between them. With a fine breeze from the west-southwest, we stood along shore at the distance of three leagues, steering east by north for Prince William's Sound. The lead was kept constantly going, but we got no ground with forty fathoms of line. At eight o'clock, I changed the course to northeast half-east in order to make the southwest point of Montague Island, the westernmost land in sight bearing west-southwest, and the easternmost north by west, eight or nine leagues distant. Light variable winds with intervening calms and hazy weather prevented us from making any great progress towards the entrance into Prince William Sound. At two o'clock in the afternoon of the 17th, having nearly a calm and the current setting us directly offshore, we anchored in 43 fathoms of water 
over a bottom of gravel mixed with small stones and shells. The extremes of Montague Island bore north 45 degrees east and north 9 degrees east, the middle of the passage into Prince William Sound, north 2 degrees east, and our distance from the nearest land 3 or 4 miles. During the afternoon and night we had light airs, inclining to calm with thick foggy weather. Next morning a moderate breeze sprung up from the west-southwest, but the fog was so thick that we could not see any object half a cable's length from the ship. At six o'clock in the afternoon, the fog rather dispersing, we weighed and came to sail. But the day being so far spent, I did not think it prudent to stand in for the passage. Therefore, in the night, we stood to the southward under an easy sail. We had soundings in forty-four fathoms of water with a bottom of grey sand. But at midnight, in standing to the northwest, we struck no ground with ninety fathoms of line, and presently afterwards got no bottom, with one hundred and six fathoms. At nine o'clock next morning, the fog clearing away over Montague Island, we saw the northeast point bearing north thirty-nine degrees east, four leagues distant. But light baffling winds prevented our making any great progress towards it. At four in the afternoon, the extremes of Montague Island bore from north by east to east, the nearest part about four miles distant, and a rock mire lies to the southwest of the Green Isles, north elevening east. A light breeze now sprung up at east, so we steered north northeast, and I began to conceive hopes that we should get into the passage before night came on. In this, however, I was disappointed, for as soon as we got the upstanding open, we took the current and the wind. Growing scant, it set us to leeward of the passage, and very fast towards some small islands and rocks which are situated at the south extreme of an island that forms the western side of the passage. I therefore, at six o'clock, was under the necessity of tacking and standing to the south-southeast, and even then, with a three-knot breeze and all the sail we could carry, for near three hours, we could barely keep clear of the rocks. Indeed, I could have. Anchored at this time, but we had eighty-four fathoms of water, which I thought too great a depth to anchor in. During our ineffectual attempt to make the entrance, we had the boats ahead towing the ship, but all to no purpose, and I must own that it was rather a mortifying circumstance to be thrown out after making ourselves almost sure of getting into the passage, as at one time we had every reason to expect and had got all ready for anchoring. The wind continued variable, but generally on the eastern and northern boards, which was quite unfavourable to us, and we consequently plied to little advantage. At three o'clock in the afternoon of the first, the southwest point of Montague Island bore northwest by north. Having then a fresh breeze at east northeast, I stood directly in for it, intending, if possible, to have luffed round it and to have anchored in a sandy bay that lies just around the southwest point. For some time, everything was in our favour, and I had hardly a doubt of gaining anchorage until we brought the southwest point to bear northeast by east, when the current took us on the weather bow and set us bodily to leeward, so that there was not a possibility of our making the desired entrance. At four o'clock, the extremes of Montague Island bore north fording east and north 45 degrees east, distant from the southwest point three miles. A fresh gale coming on at northeast with heavy squalls and thick rainy weather, we tacked and stood to the southeast by Montague. On sounding, we had twenty fathoms of water over a rocky bottom. Until the 24th, the wind continued at northeast, blowing fresh and in squalls with thick rainy weather so that I gave up all hopes of making Prince William Sound by the Southwest Passage and determined to try for an entrance that leads into the Sound by Cape Hinchinbrook. At five o'clock in the morning, on Thursday the 24th, the wind shifting to east-southeast, I steered northeast in order to make the Eastern Passage into the Sound. The weather was thick and hazy. For some days past, no land had appeared in sight, but this afternoon at four o'clock, we saw land, which formed a high bluff point bearing north 46 degree west, about four leagues distant. The former heavy gales from the northeast were now succeeded by light variable winds and thick foggy weather, which caused us to ply occasionally, though to little purpose, as it was totally impracticable with such weather to make our intended port. On Saturday the 26th, at eight o'clock in the evening, a light breeze came on from the southwest, the fog dispersed, and we had clear, pleasant weather so that I was in expectation of a settled southwest wind, therefore steered north-northeast for the eastern passage into Prince William Sound.
Towards midnight, the breeze freshening with thick, dirty weather, we brought to with the ship's head to the southward, and at three o'clock, the fog clearing up, we bore away to the northward and made sail. Our favourable prospect, however, was but of short duration, for we again had variable winds and foggy weather to encounter with. On this, I sent my whaleboat on board the Queen Charlotte for Captain Dixon, in order to consult him regarding our future proceedings. He came immediately on board the King George, and after fixing on King George's sound for our winter quarters, we came to a resolution of quitting this part of the coast in a day or two, should the wind continue unfavourable, and endeavouring to make some harbour farther to the southward. Indeed, it was high time to come to a determination of this sort. The season for our business was far advanced, and much time had been spent to no purpose, owing to contrary winds and bad weather, a continuation of which, together with heavy gales of wind from the westward, might soon be expected to set in with a continuance. It was therefore thought most prudent, should we be disappointed a short time longer, to make the best of our way to the southward, and endeavour to get into Cross Sound or the Bay of Islands, both of them being harbours seen by Captain Cook during our last voyage. Having settled these points, Captain Dixon returned on board his own vessel. The sun breaking out just at noon, we had an opportunity of taking an observation which gave 59 degree latitude and the longitude 146 degree 3 swings. We sounded at four o'clock with 100 fathoms of line, but got no ground. The extremes of the land in sight bore from west half north to north north, west half west, distant from the nearest part of it seven or eight leagues. At six o'clock the land in sight bore west by south and northeast. The land to the northeast appeared to be two low islands, which I conjectured were situated between Cayes Island and the land of Cape Hinchinbrook. At the same time, the points of an opening which I took for the eastern passage into Prince William Sound bore northwest, half north, and north northwest, distant five or six leagues. Having a moderate breeze from the northeast and fine weather, we stood in towards the opening till eight o'clock when the wind hauled to the north northeast, which laid us off so much that we could not fetch in. Therefore, we tacked and stood to the eastward under an easy sail, intending to try for the passage next morning. At two o'clock, we wore and steered north by west half west, with a breeze from the northeast by north. At four o'clock, having a fresh gale at northeast and fine clear weather, I expected from the course we had been steering during the night that we should have had the small islands, seen by us the preceding evening, bearing about north by east and distant about four miles from which situation, with the northeast wind we now had, we could have run into the passage with a large wind. But I was much surprised to see the small islands bearing northeast by north, and distant about nine leagues, so much had the current driven us offshore during the night. However, we stood to the north-northwest under all the sail we could set, hoping, if the weather remained settled, that we might be able before night came on to get into the passage and anchor there, so that if the wind failed us, we might be able to work into the sound with the tide. But at seven o'clock, it began to blow very fresh, with thick, hazy weather and every appearance of an approaching gale, the land entirely hidden with a thick fog. Under these circumstances, I did not think it prudent to run in for the passage. Therefore, at half past seven o'clock, we tacked and stood to the southeast. I now gave up all thoughts of getting into the sound this season, therefore determined to quit this part of the coast immediately and stand to the southward, where there was a probability of meeting with more favourable weather. With a fresh gale from the east-northeast, we steered southeast by south, the weather still thick and foggy, attended with rain. During the night we frequently sounded with eighty fathoms of line, but got no bottom. The wind never fixed at one point for any length of time, but varied continually sometimes blowing fresh and in squalls, with alternate calms and thick, rainy weather. On the 4th of September, finding myself very indifferent, I sent for Captain Dixon to come on board, intending, should my illness increase so as to prevent me from keeping the deck, for the Queen Charlotte to take the lead and make for Cross Sound, from thence to Cape Edgecombe, and afterwards to King George's Sound, where we had before determined to winter and build a shallop of about sixty or seventy tons burden, if we were fortunate enough to get in before the winter season set in, so bad as to prevent us from making the necessary preparations for effecting that purpose. At eight o'clock in the morning of the fifth, we saw the land manifesting in two very high mountains, one of which bore north-northwest half-west, and the other north-northwest 
half west, distant 14 or 15 leagues. These mountains we suppose to be Mount St. Elias and Mount Fairweather, according to their situation in Captain Cook's chart. We now had light variable airs, which caused us to ply occasionally, and retarded our progress very much. Our latitude at noon was 58 and 16 north, and the longitude 140 degree. In the afternoon, finding myself so ill as not to be able to keep the deck, I desired my first mate to speak to the Queen Charlotte and request Captain Dixon to take the lead, which he accordingly did. In the forenoon of the 9th, Mount Fairweather was seen bearing east-northeast. This mountain is situated a little to the northward and eastward of Cross Sound. At noon, having a moderate breeze from the southeast by east, with open cloudy weather, we stood in shore to the northeast by east, the land in sight extending from east northeast to north northeast half east, and a low point northeast half east, four or five leagues distant. Our latitude then was 57 to 54, and the longitude 137 to 58. At two o'clock, the wind being then at east southeast, our course was changed to northeast in order to make cross sound, but in a few hours afterwards, being well in with it, Captain Dixon hailed and desired my first mate to acquaint me that he saw no appearance of a port in the situation laid down in Captain Cook's chart for Cross Sound, but that what Captain Cook took for an opening in the land was nothing more than a deep valley with low land in it, which, at the considerable distance he was from the shore, might easily be mistaken for a deep opening, and consequently a good harbour might be expected. A Voyage Round the World, but more particularly to the northwest coast of America by Captain Nathaniel Portlock. Chapter 7. Fruitless attempt to fall in with the Bay of Islands. Proceed along the coast towards King George's Sound. Unsuccessful attempt to make it. Departure from the coast. Passage from thence to the Sandwich Islands. St. Maria La Gorta. Arrive off Owyhee. Refreshments obtained. Natives' propensity to theft. Plan of future proceedings. The ships leave Owyhee. Pick up a canoe with some Indians in distress. Anchor at Wawahu. Not falling in with cross sound as was expected, and having no spare time to look for it in any other situation, we tacked at four o'clock, and stood to the she with a moderate breeze from the east-southeast, and dark, unsettled-looking weather. The land in sight extending from north-northwest to east-southeast, about four leagues distant from the nearest part. The wind continued moderate till four o'clock the next morning, when a strong gale came on from the northeast, attended with heavy rain. At nine o'clock, the wind shifted to east-southeast, the gale increasing with thick, rainy weather, which obliged us to hand the topsails and reef the courses. Towards noon, the gale gradually subsided, and at six o'clock, we had a light breeze from the south-southwest, with a very heavy cross sea, which caused the ship to labour exceedingly. During the night, we had light variable winds with constant rain. This, however, was not of long continuance, for at noon on the 11th, a heavy gale sprung up from the east-southeast, the rain still continuing without interruption. The almost constant succession of bad weather we had experienced for some time past induced me to think that the bad weather season was set in and that our making a port on the coast would be very precarious. In that case, we should be obliged to water and spend the winter at the Sandwich Islands, under this consideration, I judged it prudent to put the ship's company on an allowance of water at the rate of two quarts a man a day. The gale continued to blow from the eastward and southward, with very little intermission, till noon on the 13th. It then grew moderate. Our latitude then was 56 degree 37, and the longitude 138 degree 31. Having then a moderate breeze from the south by east, we steered east-northeast, in order to make the land near Cape Edgecombe. At nine o'clock, the wind shifted to the southwest, blowing fresh with hazy weather. At midnight, we hauled the wind to the southward, and at five o'clock the next morning, bore away and made sail, standing in for the land with a moderate breeze at southwest. At six o'clock, the land near Cape Edgecombe was seen bearing northeast by north, and at eight, the land in sight extended from north half-west to north northeast half-east, distant from the nearest part four or five leagues. We now stood to the north by east, in order to gain the situation laid down by Captain Cook for the Bay of Islands, where we had great hopes of making a good port. But after getting within two leagues of the land, 
No place could be discovered which had the appearance of a harbour or even a safe bay. At the same time, we could get no ground with 80 fathoms of line. Just before noon, nothing like a harbour making its appearance and observing a ledge of rocks to the northward of us, stretching some distance from the shore, towards which a current was sweeping us very fast, Captain Dixon, who still took the lead, thought it most prudent to haul off shore to the westward. At the same time, the wind backed a little to the southward, which enabled us to clear the reef. We should not have been in much danger had there been a commanding breeze, but we unfortunately had light winds and a considerable swell rolling on towards the shore, against which the ship could scarcely steer or make any way. The latitude at noon was 57 degrees 06 and 136 degree 40 longitude. During the afternoon, we had light variable winds and dark gloomy weather. At six o'clock, the land in sight extended from north by east to southeast half east, distant from the nearest shore three or four leagues. Towards evening, the weather had a dirty, unsettled appearance, and in the night, a heavy gale of wind came on from the east-southeast, with thick, rainy weather, which continued till ten o'clock the next forenoon, when the weather grew more moderate. We plied with variable winds until noon on the 16th, when seeing no probability of meeting with a harbour near Cape Edgecombe, we gave up all further thoughts of it, and determined to stand for King George's Sound. A fresh breeze now sprung up from the west-southwest, which brought with it clear weather. On the 18th at noon, we were in 53 degree 46 latitude and 134 degree 06 longitude, and at one o'clock the land was seen bearing east-northeast, 14 leagues distant. At four, the land extended from north to east-southeast, and an appearance of a bay bore east by north. Having a fresh gale at north-northwest and clear weather, by six o'clock we were within two leagues of the shore, and had an opportunity of seeing that there was no appearance of a harbour, as we before had supposed nor any sign of inhabitants. At this time, the Queen Charlotte being some distance ahead, wore and stood under our lee, and Captain Dixon hailed and acquainted me that he saw no appearance of a harbour or any inhabitants. The land in this situation is high, and breaks into abrupt cliffs which hang over the sea, and are washed by a very heavy surf. We now steered south with a fine gale at northwest and clear weather, our distance from shore about two leagues. The wind still continuing favourable, we steered more to the eastward, in order to keep well in with the coast. On the 21st, in latitude 50 degrees 47 and 129 degrees 28 longitude, we saw an island bearing northeast by east half east, six or seven leagues distant, and at six o'clock in the afternoon, the island bore 20 degrees west, five leagues. At the same time, another island appeared in sight, bearing north, 45 degree east, distant 10 or 11 leagues. Early in the morning of the 20th, we saw the land extending from north to northeast, distant 10 or 11 leagues. At noon, the land extended from northwest half north to northeast by north. Woody Point bore north by west, three leagues, and a high rock detached from it north by west, a quarter west, two leagues distant. The land to the southward and Ballard appeared to form a good bay, which we steered for with a fresh breeze from the north-northwest, in hopes of coming to anchor before night came on. As we drew near the shore, I ordered the whaleboat to be lowered down and sent her ahead to sound, but at half past two o'clock, seeing not the least appearance of shelter, I made the signal for the boat to come on board. At that time, we were not more than three miles from shore and had thirty-four fathoms water over a foul bottom. Immediately after the boat was hoisted up, we stood along shore to the eastward towards King George's Sound, the land extending from north-northeast half-east to northwest by west. Woody Point, north by west, three leagues, and the rocks off Woody Point, north northwest, half north, two leagues distant. The space between those rocks and Woody Point appears to be foul ground, as there are many rocks just showing their heads above water, on which the sea frequently breaks. At seven o'clock, we hauled off the land and stood southwest by west, the wind then blowing fresh at north northwest by west, and at daylight next morning, we wore ship and steered north. Half east. The land at noon extended from east by south to west-northwest half-west. We steered east-northeast with a moderate breeze from the northwest by north and pleasant weather. Our latitude then was 49 degree 48 and the longitude 127 degree 8. At two o'clock, seeing a canoe putting off from the shore, we shortened sail and brought to for her to come up. She had two Indians in her, but we could not prevail on either of them to come on board. They had some fish which we bought 
and I made them a few trifling presents, after which they left us and paddled for that part of the shore between Woody Point and King George's Sound. At five o'clock, the north point of the entrance into King George's Sound bore north, 73 degrees east, the breakers that lie off that. Point east half north, three leagues distant, the eastern, most land in sight south, 73 degrees east, distant eight or nine, leagues, and the westernmost land west by north half north, 13 leagues distant. Having light winds and hazy weather, we found it impracticable to reach the sound before night. Therefore, we hauled to the south-southeast. In the course of the evening, we frequently sounded and had from 54 to 62 fathoms water over a muddy bottom. During the night, we plied occasionally with light variable winds and hazy weather. At six o'clock in the morning of the 24th, the haze clearing away, we saw the land about the sound, the north point of the entrance bearing northeast by east, nine or ten leagues distant. The wind being still light and frequently inclining to calm, our progress towards the sound was very slow. At four o'clock in the afternoon of the 25th, the north point of the entrance bore north, 61 degrees east, three. Leagues distant, having a clear breeze at south by east, we steered east by south, expecting to gain the entrance, but at five o'clock the light breeze we had shifted to southeast, and a current set us strongly to the north-northwest, so that it was impossible for us to fetch into the sound, and night coming on, we tacked and stood to the southwest by south. About six o'clock, the wind began to freshen at southeast, with every appearance of an approaching gale. Therefore, I thought it most advisable to get a little offing before it came on, as those gales from the southeast, after blowing hard a while in that quarter, generally haul to the southward and blow with great violence, in which case the land of the Bay of Good Hope all becomes a lee and dangerous shore. At eight o'clock, the horizon to the south and southeast looked remarkably red and wild, with strong flashes of lightning in those boards. At ten, the wind blew very fresh from the east-southeast, with thick weather and hard rain. At that time, we wore and stood in shore to the northeast, with an intention of keeping pretty near the entrance of the sound in order to be ready for pushing into it the next morning, should an opportunity offer. But at eleven o'clock, the gale increased so fast upon us that all hands were barely sufficient to make the ship snug enough for its reception. At midnight, we wore and stood to the south by west. Immediately afterwards, an exceedingly heavy gust of wind came on, which obliged us to clue the topsails down on the cap. The foresail, although a very small one made purposely for foul weather sail, gave way at both clues, and both the foot and leech ropes broke short off. Yet we fortunately got the sail made snug before it split, unbent it, and bent a new one. At three o'clock, the wind shifted to the southeast and blew a mere hurricane, which brought on a very heavy sea, occasioned the ship to labor and strain exceedingly. It certainly was the most dreadful night I ever saw, and to add to the awful scene of a tremendous sea, loud thunder, fierce lightning, and torrents of rain, we had at each masthead, and at every yard arm, those meteors called by sailors' corpuscents, which gave a light at least equal to the same number of lights hung aloft. Besides those on the masts and yards, they were flying about on all parts of the rigging. It is the generally received opinion of seafaring men that when the corpuscent reaches the top gallant mastheads, the gale is at or near its height, and indeed we found it so. For about half past three, after a most violent gust of wind, which did not continue more than two or three minutes, the clouds began to break, and the weather became more moderate, the wind inclining to the southeast by south. At six o'clock, it fell almost calm, and we had a prodigious heavy sea from the south-southeast. Soon afterward, we saw the land near the entrance into King George's Sound, bearing east-northeast, five or six leagues distant, on which we stood for it with a very light breeze at west, the weather looking unsettled, and a very heavy cross sea running. By two in the afternoon, it grew nearly calm, and finding all our efforts to get into the sound ineffectual, we hauled offshore to the southward. Light airs with intervening calms prevailed till four o'clock in the morning of the 27th, when a fresh gale sprang up at southeast by east, attended with thick rainy weather. We now stood to the northeast by east, but the wind shifted every hour so that there was not a possibility of keeping our course. At eight o'clock, having a moderate breeze at southwest, we steered east-northeast. At the same time, the land made its appearance through the haze, bearing from north-northwest to east-northeast. This breeze, however, was of short duration, for
for in the space of an hour it grew nearly calm and continued light and variable till four in the afternoon, when a little breeze sprung up from the southwest. But judging with so light a breeze that we could not reach the sound before night, our distance from it being about six leagues, we stood to the south-southeast, with an intention of spending the night in standing off and on, and then, if an opportunity offered at daylight, to run into the sound. During the former part of the night, the wind blew fresh and in squalls, with frequent heavy showers of hail. This was succeeded by light variable winds and thick rainy weather. At six o'clock next morning, we tacked and bore away to the northeast, the weather hazy, and a prodigious heavy swell from the southwest. The north point of the entrance into King George's Sound at eight o'clock bore northeast half north, distant four leagues, and the westernmost land in sight, northwest by north, six leagues distant. At nine it fell calm, and the heavy swell continuing from the southwest, and a strong current setting to the north-northeast drove us very fast towards the shore, and some breakers that are situated to the northward and westward of the entrance into the sound. At first, I had some thoughts of getting our boats out to tow the ship's head round and to keep her offshore, but the motion of the ship was so great, occasioned by the swell, that it would hardly have been possible to have hoisted them out without dashing them to pieces. Indeed, if they had been out, they could have had no effect on the ship against so heavy a swell rolling directly on shore. It continued calm till eleven o'clock, at which time we were very near the breakers, and the swell seeming to increase as we approached the shore, I was preparing to anchor with one of the bowers in sixty-four fathoms water when a light breeze sprung up at southeast. This was, in the situation we then were, almost directly from the entrance into the sound, so that we could not make it, and had no alternative left but to get the ship's head offshore and get an offing as well as we could. At noon, the breeze freshened at southeast, and we stood to the southwest, at the same time, an exceedingly heavy swell rolled in shore, which broke in a frightful surf on the rocks and breakers. The north point of the entrance into King George's Sound bore north, 65 degree west, four or five leagues distant. Our distance from the breakers, one mile and a half, and from the nearest land, about three miles. In the afternoon we had light baffling winds with frequent squalls and heavy showers of hail and rain. I now saw not the least probability of our getting into the sound this season. The bad weather appeared to be set in for a continuance. Our sails and rigging were much damaged, and the crews stood greatly in need of refreshment. Under these circumstances, I came to a determination nation of leaving the coast, and standing directly for the Sandwich Islands, and hailing the Queen Charlotte, I acquainted Captain Dixon with my intention. At eight o'clock in the morning of the 29th, we steered south by west with a fresh westerly breeze. Woody Point at that time bore northwest half west, the easternmost land in sight east by north, and the entrance of King George's Sound north, 50 degree east, 11 leagues distant. The breeze continued westerly till the morning of the 30th, when it was succeeded by light variable winds, inclining to calm. The weather being clear and fine, the sailors' hammocks and chests were got upon deck, and their clothes well aired. The ship was scraped clean between decks and aired with fires, in 46 degree 48 north latitude and 131 degree 6 longitude, we found 19 degree easterly variation. On the 7th of October, a strong gale of wind came on at south-southwest, with hazy weather and rain, which however was not of long duration, and the wind shifting to the southwest brought with it clear weather. The wind continued variable, chiefly on the southern and western boards, frequently blowing fresh and in squalls, with unsettled weather. On the 12th, in 38 degree 44 latitude and 133 degree 10 degree longitude, the wind hauled to the northward and blew fresh from that quarter until noon on the 14th, when after a few hours calm, it shifted to the southward and eastward. The scurvy beginning to make its appearance on some of the people, the ship's company were served a pint of port wine a day instead of spirits. We proceeded towards the Sandwich Islands without meeting with anything worthy of note. The wind hanging from south to southeast, and being in general light and very variable between these points, rendered our progress tedious. On the 26th, in 32 degrees 36 latitude and 143 degrees 35 longitude, we saw great numbers of tropic birds, one of which was in pursuit of a small land bird, very much like a snipe. In Captain Cook's general chart, the centre of an island named St. Maria La Gorta 
is placed in 28 degrees north latitude and 149 degree 20 west longitude. Our latitude at noon on the 1st of November was 28 degree 14 north and the longitude 148 degree 35, in which situation, having fine clear weather, we certainly ought to have seen that island, but not the least appearance of land was to be seen from the masthead. And the next forenoon, we ran directly over the spot where Santa Maria La Gorta should be situated, so that there is great reason to suppose no such place exists. In the morning of the 9th, the wind blew very fresh and in squalls from the southeast, attended with torrents of rain and fierce lightning. At nine o'clock, it increased to a strong gale, with violent squalls, which obliged us to close reef the topsails. But before that could be effected, the main topsail was split, another was immediately bent and close reefed. At three in the afternoon, the wind hauled to south by west, and the weather grew more moderate. During the 10th, the wind varied from south southeast to south by west, blowing fresh and in squalls, the weather dark and cloudy, with frequent heavy rains. Next morning, the wind gradually shifted to the westward, and at eight o'clock, we had a moderate breeze from the northwest, the weather still thick and rainy. This continued until four in the afternoon, when we had a light breeze at north, with clear, pleasant weather. At noon on the 11th, the latitude was 21 degrees 26, and 152 degrees 51 in longitude. With a moderate breeze at north, I steered south by west and south-southwest in order to get to the eastward of Oahe, so that if the wind inclined to the southward, we could easily run down the longitude. On the 14th at noon, being in 20 degrees 4 and latitude and 153 degrees 47 longitude, we steered west by south, and at five o'clock in the afternoon saw the land, which we presently found to be a high mountain on the island of Owyhee, with some patches of snow on its summit, bearing west-southwest half-west, near 30 leagues distant. Having light winds, we did not see the land until the next day at noon, when Oihi again made its appearance, bearing southwest half-west, about 14 leagues distant. On Thursday, the 16th in the morning, with a fresh breeze at south. East, we stood to the southwest for Oihi, the north point bearing west by south, 11 or 12 leagues, and our distance from the nearest shore about five leagues. As we ran along the coast, several canoes came off to us, but they had nothing to dispose of except a few small fish. Indeed, the wind blew fresh, and there was so much sea running that the natives could not with safety venture off with anything to sell. At noon, having a fresh breeze from the eastward, we stood to the northwest by north, about three miles distant from shore. About five o'clock, the east end of Moi bore north-northwest half-west, nine or ten leagues distant. When night came on, we could perceive large fires lighted in different parts of the country, most probably to inform the inhabitants in more distant parts of the island of our arrival. Early next morning, with a gentle breeze from the eastward, we ran along shore to the northwest, and our distance from it being not more than three or four miles, a number of canoes were preparing to follow us. After approaching the north point of the island, we sounded in rounding the point and had about 16 fathoms of water over a bottom of white sand and beds of coral rock, our distance from the shore about two miles. No shelter was to be seen for ships to anchor under, and a very heavy swell set in shore, which is principally composed of steep black rocks against which the surf beats with much violence. Here and there are fine little spots of white sandy beach where the natives generally keep their canoes. The adjacent country is very pleasant, and there appear to be several villages situated amidst fine groves of coconut trees. As we run along with a gentle breeze within musket shot of the shore, the natives of both sexes were assembled on the beach in great numbers, waving pieces of their white cloth as a token of peace and friendship. Expecting to find good shelter in a bay situated on the west side of the island and near a district called by the natives Toyaya, at eight o'clock I sent the whale boat to sound and look for a harbour. In the meantime, we stood off and on under an easy sail, which gave the natives an opportunity of bringing us the different produce of their island, which they promptly did in great abundance, such as hogs, plantains, breadfruit, taro, coconut, fowls, geese of a wild species, and great quantities of excellent salt. For these articles we bartered with nails, toes, and trinkets of different kinds. And so brisk a trade went forward that in the course of four hours we purchased large hogs sufficient, when salted, to fill seven tierces, besides vast numbers of a smaller sort for daily consumption. 
Nearly two tons of vegetables, such as taro and breadfruit, were also procured. And so ample were the supplies of those very useful articles from the natives that we were obliged to turn away vast quantities for want of room to put them in. Indeed, it would not have been proper to purchase more of those kinds of vegetables than what would be sufficient for six or seven days' consumption, for after that time they begin to decay very fast. We also acquired about one ton and a half of fine salt, and I immediately set twenty hands to kill and salt pork. The Indians during the whole day traded very fairly, but some of the spectators, of whom we had great numbers of both sexes, showed their usual inclination for thieving, and one man had dexterity enough in his profession to steal a boat hook out of a boat alongside, though there was a boat keeper in her, and another crept up the rudder chains and stole the azimuth compass out of one of the cabin windows and got clear off with it, notwithstanding a person was set to look after them over the stern. Many other trifling articles were stolen from us in the course of the day, which is scarcely to be wondered at, as I do not think we had less than 250 canoes about the ship at once, which certainly contained more than 1,000 people. When our trade was over, the natives entreated us to stay near the land, and in the morning they would bring us abundance of fine hogs. On my making them this promise, they parted with us in the most friendly manner, and paddled on shore. At five o'clock the boat returned, and the officer who was in her informed me that in rowing into the bay which he had been to examine, he carried soundings from twenty to twenty-five fathoms of water over a bottom of coral and sand, but that he could find no good anchorage or shelter for the ships. In consequence of which information, I gave up the intention of proceeding further into the bay, and determined to stand off and on a day or two near our present situation to procure a quantity of good hogs to salt for sea stock. We tacked occasionally during the night, and at eight o'clock in the morning of the 18th, the north point of Awihi bore east by south four leagues, and the extremes of Moi north by west, and northwest by west, eight or nine leagues distant. With a light variable breeze, we steered southeast towards Ohi, and by noon we were within three miles of the shore. Many of our yesterday's visitors now came alongside, bringing a number of fine hogs and plenty of vegetables, which we procured on the usual terms. At four o'clock, it began to blow fresh from the south-southwest, and the natives, having disposed of their cargoes, left the ships and went ashore. At six o'clock, the north point of Owaihi bore east by south, and our distance from the nearest land was four leagues. During the night, we had light variable airs, and frequently calm, attended with strong lightning to the westward. On Sunday the 19th in the forenoon, I went in my whaleboat on board the Queen Charlotte, to consult Captain Dixon regarding our future proceedings. By this time, we had purchased all the large hogs the natives had brought alongside, and probably pretty well drained this part of Owaihi. The ships were very light, having expended such a quantity of water, and our rigging fore and aft stood much in need of repairing and overhauling, so that we thought it prudent to quit our present situation and proceed for King George's Bay, Wohu, where we could lie well sheltered from the prevailing winds and do everything necessary both to the hulls and rigging of the ships. Accordingly, at half past ten o'clock, with a light breeze at south-southwest and very dirty, unsettled-looking weather, we bore away to the northward, intending to pass to the eastward of Moi, and then to run down for Wahoo. Towards noon, the wind began to blow fresh from the west-southwest, and a few canoes which were alongside left us and paddled for the shore. The extremes of Moi in sight bore north by west half-west, and west by north, distant four or five leagues. At two o'clock we had a fresh gale from the southwest, on which I returned on board my own ship. The gale increasing, we close reefed the topsails and got down the top gallant yards. Being then within two leagues of Moi, with the appearance of very bad weather, we edged off to the northeast in order to get a good offing before night came on. A little before dark, we saw a canoe to the southwest making after us, with a small mat up for a sail, and also paddling very hard. On this we brought to and picked her up. There were four men in the canoe, besides a quantity of provisions such as potatoes, plantains, etc. It seems they belonged to the island of Moi, and on our standing in for the east part of it, had put off with their little cargo, hoping to bring it to a good market. But after we bore away from the island, they found the weather so bad, with a strong wind directly against them, that they could not reach the shore. Therefore they bore up after us, set their little sail, and used every effort in their power to get up with the ship. I was greatly pleased that we were fortunate enough to get sight of them, for they must certainly have very soon perished, 
their canoe when they came alongside being almost full of water, and themselves so much spent with fatigue that we were obliged to help them up the ship's side. We got all their things safe into the ship, hauled the canoe in upon deck, and made use of every method in our power to recover them, which had the wished for good effect. And never were men more grateful than these poor Indians for the little favours we were so happy in showing them. When the canoe was got on board, we edged away again to the eastward, and at seven o'clock hauled to the wind on the starboard tack, it then blowing strong from the southwest with thick rainy weather. During the night we lay to, and at four the next morning, having a fresh breeze at south-southwest and clear weather, we wore and stood to the westward. At noon, the south part of Moe bore south half-west, and the north point west, six leagues distant, the latitude by observation, 20 degree 58. Light variable winds, chiefly in the western board, with alternate calms, continued during the afternoon and night. At eight o'clock in the morning of the 21st, we saw the island of Morotoi, the extremes bearing west by south half-south, and south-southwest by west, distant eight or nine leagues. The island Ranai also made its appearance, bearing from south-southwest by south to south-southwest half-west, distant at least ten leagues, and Moi about nine leagues distant. At two o'clock, being within three leagues of Moi, we tacked and stood to the north-northeast, with a moderate breeze from the northwest. At that time, the extremes of the island bore southeast and west by south. The weather being very unsettled, no canoes ventured near us, but towards noon on the 22nd, having light winds and clear weather, a number of large and small canoes from Moi and Moratoi came alongside with the various produce of those islands, which consisted chiefly of a few small pigs, some sweet potatoes and sugarcane. At one o'clock, finding that a strong current was drawing us in very fast between the west end of Moi and the east end of Moratoi, we hauled off to the north by west with a very light breeze from the east-northeast. At four o'clock, having drawn a little out and got clear of the current, which set strong to the southward between the islands, we edged away to the north-northwest, the wind then blowing a light breeze from the east-southeast. Towards sunset, our visitors, after disposing of their cargoes, took leave of us in a very friendly manner and pushed for the shore. The extremes of Moi at that time bore from southwest to southeast by east, four leagues, and the extremes of Morotoi west, half south and west southwest half south, five leagues distant. In the afternoon of the 23rd, it then being nearly calm, with clear pleasant weather, the Indians that we picked up off the east end of Moi took this opportunity of going ashore. I endeavoured to prevail on them to stay on board until the morning, that I might have an opportunity of standing close in shore, when they might have gone with greater safety. But they chose to go away at this time, and made light of the distance to the shore, though it was not less than five leagues. These poor fellows did not go away empty-handed, for besides the presence they had from me, almost every person on board gave them some little token of friendship, so that their misfortune turned out to great advantage. The wind still kept to the southward, with unsettled weather, at noon on the 24th, the east point of Moi bore south by east half east, and the westernmost part in sight, south southwest half west, distant ten leagues. I already have observed that it was our intention on leaving Owyhee to proceed immediately down for King George's Bay, Wahoo, and there to have done the necessary work of the ships as quickly as possible. But on getting to the northward of Moi, I found the wind changing much to the southward and westward, and the weather very unsettled. The wind from those points blows directly into King George's Bay, so that I judged it the safest method to keep the sea to windward of the island until a true trade wind set in with settled weather, and then push into the bay, which is exceedingly well sheltered against the winds from west by south, around by the north, to about east, but quite exposed to the other winds, which seem to prevail a good deal at this time of the year. Accordingly, we plied with variable winds till the morning of the 30th, without any material occurrence, at that time, the wind seeming fixed to the northward and eastward, and the weather more settled than it had been for many days past, we bore away for Wahoo, the south point of which at noon bore south-southwest by west, six leagues, and the north point west by north, distant from the nearest of the islands eight miles. At at four o'clock, we hauled round Dick's Point, and at five o'clock came to anchor in King George's Bay, with the best bower in twelve fathoms of water, over a bottom of grey sand intermixed with small red specks, and moored with the stream anchor in eleven fathoms. When moored, Point Dick bore east half south, one mile and a half, Point Rose west by south six miles, 
and the bottom of the bay northwest half north, two miles distant. A voyage round the world, but more particularly to the northwest coast of America, by Captain Nathaniel Portlock. Chapter 8 Visited by Tahitere, pernicious effects of Yava route, transactions at Wahoo, wood purchased, an e erected. The chiefs make offerings to their gods, mediate an attack on the ship, shown the effect of firearms. Two Indanes embark for Atui, take leave of Tahitere, of Ainold Priest, departure from Wawahu, anchor in Waimea Bay, Atui, an excursion on shore. A few canoes came alongside soon after our arrival in the bay, but they brought scarcely anything to sell. Indeed, there seem to be but few inhabitants in this bay, and those few are of no great consequence. I gave them to understand that we wanted water, and directed them to bring it to us, as they formerly had done. They would willingly have complied with my request, on account of the nails and beads which they were to have in exchange, but assured me that not only water but everything the island produced was tabooed by the king's order. Finding things in this situation, I gave to a man who appeared of the most consequence amongst our present visitors, a present for the king, and another for my old acquaintance the priest, requesting him at the same time to inform his majesty that we wanted water and such refreshments as the island afforded, and therefore I should be glad if he would immediately take off the taboo that we might obtain a supply of those articles. At sunset, the natives, at my request, left the ship and went ashore. Early the next morning we had some canoes alongside who brought us water and a few vegetables, notwithstanding the taboo. A number of large and small canoes came round Point Dick into the bay and landed at the head of it. Presently afterwards my old friend the priest paid us a visit and came, according to his former custom, in a large double canoe, decorated with branches of the coconut tree. After paddling around the ship with great solemnity and running down every small canoe that came in his way, he came alongside. But before he entered the ship, he inquired for me. On my appearing at the ship's side to receive him, he handed up a small pig, which at his coming on board he presented to me as a token of peace and friendship. Indeed, I have before observed this to be the usual practice at all the islands. The old man informed me that in a short time the king, who had just arrived in the bay with a large fleet of canoes, would be on board to pay me a visit, and that when he returned again ashore, the taboo would be taken off, and the natives at liberty to bring us everything the island afforded. I made him a present, and also gave him one for the king, which I desired he would carry ashore and deliver with his own hand. The priest left us about ten o'clock, and returned again at eleven in his own canoe, accompanied by many others, both large and small. In a very large canoe, pad led by sixteen stout men, was the king himself, attended by many of the principal chiefs, arrived. When his canoe approached near the ship, all the rest paddled off to some distance to make way for his majesty, who, after paddling three times around the ship in great state, came on board, without the least appearance of fear, and would not suffer any of his retinue to follow him until he had got permission for their admittance, which I gave to eight or ten of the principal chiefs. The king brought me a few hogs and some vegetables by way of presents, for which I made him a return that seemed to please him highly. Most of his attendants likewise brought a few articles, which I received and gave them in exchange for such trifles as seemed to take their fancy, being desirous to establish myself on a friendly footing at this island, that our business might go regularly forward, and our wants be expeditiously supplied. The king, whose name I before have observed is Tahi Terry, is an exceedingly stout, well-made man about fifty years old, and appears to be sensible, well-disposed, and much esteemed by his subjects. He inquired whether we had been at Ohaihi, and on my answering him in the affirmative, he was very desirous of learning some particulars respecting that island and the king, with whom he seems to be at variance. But I could give him no other information than that the king was in good health, and that the island was in a very flourishing condition when we left it. Tahitera remained on board the greatest part of the day, and gave directions to the natives to bring us plenty of water and everything else that the island produced. Towards evening he returned ashore, perfectly satisfied with his reception and the presents I had given him, and at sunset all the canoes left the ships. 
We soon began to feel the good effects of Tahiteri's visit. The natives, now no longer under the influence of the taboo, brought us water very plentifully, and we procured a good supply of hogs and vegetables, so that I set a party to salt pork for sea store. The boatswain and another set were employed about the rigging and the carpenters in decking the longboat. On the third, Tahitere paid me another visit attended as before and brought his customary present of a few hogs, vegetables and coconuts. Great numbers of canoes were about the ship and multitudes of both sexes playing in the water, notwithstanding our distance from the shore. My friend, the old priest, was almost constantly on board and, according to his usual custom, drank vast quantities of yava, which kept him in a most wretched condition. He seemed quite debilitated, and his body was entirely covered with a kind of leprous scurf. The old man generally had two attendants on board to chew the yava root for him, and he found them so much employment that their jaws were frequently tired, and he was obliged to hire some of the people alongside to chew for him at a bead for a mouthful. One of the yava chewers, a very intelligent man, informed me that to the westward of Point Rose, in Queen Charlotte's Bay, there was an exceedingly snug harbour, where the ships might lie with safety. As we had a heavy swell setting into the bay round Point Dick, which caused the ship to roll very much, I determined, as soon as the carpenter had finished the longboat, to send her down to examine it, and if it was found a safe situation, to remove the ships thither. The district near which the harbour lies is, as I understood, called by the natives Waititi, and the Yavachua, whose name is Toanuha, and who I found was a man of considerable property on the island, offered to go in the boat when she was ready and guide them to the place, which offer I readily accepted. We were favoured with another visit from His Majesty on the 4th, and in addition to his usual present, he brought a large quantity of very fine mullet, which he told me were caught in a small salt lake at the head of the bay. He frequently ate with us, but I never could persuade him to touch either wine or spirits, nor did he ever use the yava, but always drank water. He seemed greatly delighted with the attention paid to him. Indeed, his visits were by no means unacceptable, for he not only encouraged the natives to supply us freely with water and other necessities, but at the same time kept them in good order, so that we were not in the least incommoded by the multitudes that were constantly about us. This afternoon our water was completed, having, in the space of three days, filled forty butts, besides a number of puncheons and brandy pieces. I eagerly did the natives pursue this profitable traffic. We now began to be in want of fuel, as a great deal was expended in heating water to scald hogs and various other purposes. On signifying our wants to the natives, they brought us a plentiful supply of excellent hue woes, which we purchased for nails and buttons. The forenoon of the 5th, the carpenters, having finished decking the longboat, she set her sails out, and some hands employed in rigging and getting her ready to go down to Queen Charlotte's Bay. Numbers of sharks were about the ship, four or five of which we caught, and after taking out the livers they were given to the Indians, who thought them very acceptable presents, particularly the old priest, who got two of the largest, and having ordered them to be carefully lashed in his canoe, was going to send them ashore. On this occasion, a very remarkable circumstance happened, just as the priest canoe got astern of the ship. One of the sharks, not being securely fastened, fell out of the canoe and sank to the bottom in eleven fathoms of water. At the same time, there were several large hungry ones swimming about, yet an Indian went down with a rope, flung the dead shark, and afterward hauled him into his canoe without any apparent fear of the others that surrounded him. I found that sharks were esteemed valuable, as they answer a variety of purposes. They salt the shark and seem very fond of it. The skin serves for a cover to their rum heads, and the teeth they fix in the wooden instruments which they use as knives. The natives continued to bring us wood, hogs and vegetables, and vast numbers visited the ship to gratify their curiosity. Those who had no canoes would swim from the shore, though nearly two miles distant, and after staying all day in the water, swam away for the shore with as much composure as if they had only a few yards to go. From the 7th to the 11th, we had fresh gales from the northeast and east-northeast, with frequent squalls and unsettled weather. A heavy swell set into the bay from the southeast, which made the ship roll very deep. During this interval, 
the surf running very high on the beach, few canoes ventured off, and some that attempted it were overturned so often that they gave up their design. Two or three canoes, however, got alongside in the afternoon of the 9th, with a little wood and some breadfruit which we purchased, and I made them some presents in addition, as a reward for their venturing off at so much risk. After disposing of their little cargoes, they made for the shore, but not being able to land were glad to return to the ship again and take up their lodgings on board for the night. The old priest was almost a constant visitor. Sometimes, indeed, he would go ashore under the pretense of paying a morning visit to his majesty, but I soon found that his principal motive was to replenish his stock of Yava, of which, as has already been observed, he consumed a great quantity. By this time the longboat was completed, and at eight o'clock in the morning of the twelfth, the weather being moderate, I sent her under the direction of Mr. Hayward. To Queen Charlotte's Bay, to look at the harbour so much spoken of by the natives, and to Anuha, the Yava Chua, accompanied him as a pilot. Tahiter paid me a visit this forenoon, and the surf on the shore still running very high, he came off in a single canoe, it being much safer in the surf than a double one. The king made use of a paddle himself, and when he came near the ship, observing her to roll very deep, he would not venture his canoe near her, but jumped into the water and swam alongside. We gave him a rope by which he got on board, but the motion of the ship disagreeing with him, he took leave of me in a very short time, jumped overboard, got into his canoe and paddled for the shore. My friend, the priest, now grew very restless and uneasy. On my inquiring the reason, he hinted that Taheter and his principal warriors were meditating some mischief against us, and taking me upon deck, he pointed to a large house on the top of a hill over the eastern point of the bay, which ascends from Point Dick. This house, the old man assured me, was building for an Iatua, or God's house, wherein they were going to make great offerings to their different Ituas, for almost every chief has his separate one, and to consult them on the event of an attack, which he assured me they intended to make on us if their oracles gave them encouragement. He appeared quite displeased with the king's conduct on this occasion, and desired we would be constantly on our guard against him. Though this piece of information seemed rather improbable, yet I thought it prudent to be on our guard to prevent a surprise, and at the same time I ordered a constant watch to be kept on the cables to prevent their being cut by the natives. I had observed the natives building this house a day or two before the priest pointed it out to me, and had seen people constantly going up towards it loaded, probably with offerings to their different deities. Towards noon I could see, with the help of a glass, that the house was nearly finished, and the natives were covering it with red cloth. As I had constantly treated the king and his attendants with great kindness and attention, I could scarcely give any credit to the old priest, although the hopes of possessing all the iron they might suppose we had on board might possibly tempt them to attack us. At any rate, I determined to admit to Haye Terra on board as usual whenever he came, and to regulate my conduct by his behaviour. In the evening, the priest left us and went ashore, promising to return the next day. On the 14th in the morning, a vast number of canoes came to the ships, chiefly loaded with firewood, what hogs and vegetables we now procured being scarcely more than sufficient for a daily supply. Towards noon, the king came off in a large double canoe, attended by a number of his principal chiefs, all of whom I admitted on board, and treated with the usual freedom but was well prepared for an attack if they had attempted it. Having all the loopholes in the combings of the hatches fore and aft, opened and twelve or fifteen stand of arms below under the direction of proper people, who very soon would have cleared the decks if the Indians had offered us any violence. Besides which, I had sentinels placed in different parts of the ship, and all our great guns and swivels were pointed into the canoes alongside, with lighted matches at hand. Tahiteri could not help observing our situation, and spoke of it to his attendants, notwithstanding which, he behaved in his usual manner. After being on board some time, he was very desirous to see the effects of our firearms, which I showed him by discharging a pistol loaded with ball at a hog that stood at some distance, and killed it on the spot. The king and his attendants were startled at the report of the pistol, but when they saw the hog lie dead and the blood running from the wound, they were both surprised and terrified and I have not the least doubt but this instance of the fatal effects of our firearms made a deep impression on their feelings and prevented them from attacking us. The king stayed on board near two hours, and after receiving a small present took his leave. 
informing me at the same time that he intended to leave the bay and return to his residence at Waititi in the evening. I could not help remarking that immediately after Tahai Ter left the ship, all the canoes left us and paddled to the shore in different parts of the bay, but the greatest number of them landed in the eastern part of it, where the king had a temporary residence. Soon afterwards the old priest came on board, not in a large double canoe as usual, but in a small, old, crazy one that would scarcely swim and appeared as if he had come off by stealth. The moment the old man got upon deck, he began to tell me that the king was a great rascal, persisted in his former story and begged me to watch him narrowly. After haranguing for a short time, he left me and went on board the Queen Charlotte, where he spent the remainder of the day. By this time, our wooding business was completed, having purchased a quantity sufficient for at least six months' consumption. Next morning at eight o'clock, the longboat came alongside, and Mr. Haywood informed me that on going down to the place where his guide conducted him in Queen Charlotte's Bay, he found a small bay with very deep water, close to a sandy beach where the natives generally landed with their canoes, but no place for a ship to ride in with safety. Adjoining to the beach, in a beautiful valley surrounded by fine groves of coconut trees and a delightful country, there was a large town where, as Tawanuha informed him, the king generally resided, and the district around it was called Waititi. According to Mr. Hayward's account, there were very few canoes in the bay, neither did he see any great number of inhabitants, so that we may reasonably suppose they had come into the bay where we lay, led either by business or curiosity. Not a single native came near the ships for two days, and their canoes were hauled out of sight, but we could perceive vast numbers of the inhabitants about the house on the hill. During this time, our people were busily employed about the rigging and getting the ship ready for sea. At daylight in the morning of the 17th, the old priest, attended by his Yavachua, Bowani Kohe, came on board. The old man seemed quite enraged at the king's recent conduct. He told me that the king and all his principal chiefs had been making offerings to their gods and consulting them, but that the gods were good for nothing, and that the king and his adherents were no better than villains for intending to do us any mischief after the many presents they had received from both ships. I thanked my old friend for his intelligence and told him that we should be constantly on our guard. For some days past, I had been strongly importuned by Toanua and a very fine young man of the first consequence in the island, who was a constant companion of the king's, to take them along with me to Atui. And indeed, Tahayetere had more than once urged me to take them, but I never thought they were in earnest until this forenoon, when the young chief, whose name is Papa, came on board and joined his entreaties with those of Toanua in so very pressing a manner that I promised to take them on board. And they returned ashore, in order to prepare themselves for the passage. The Yavachua, being now, as it were, a gentleman passenger, no longer considered himself as a servant, but took to drinking Yava heartily, and laid in a plentiful stock of that route. In the afternoon, we had a fresh gale from the east-northeast, with frequent squalls, which prevented any canoes from coming near us. Towards evening, I observed the natives uncovering and pulling to pieces their newly built house on the hill, and about eight o'clock, several large houses were on fire along the shore near the bay. But as we had no Indians on board, I could not learn whether they were set on fire by accident or design until the next morning, when the old priest and our two passengers came on board. I inquired the reason for the fires we had seen on shore the preceding evening, and was given to understand that they were etuas, or houses belonging to gods with whom the chiefs were displeased. Therefore, out of revenge, they had burnt gods and houses both together. In the forenoon, a great number of large and small canoes came off and brought us a tolerable supply of various sorts of vegetables and a few hogs. Since our water was completed, having expended several casks, I directed the natives to bring us a further supply, which they very soon did in great abundance. The king also, with his retinue, paid me a visit. At his first coming on board, he seemed rather shy, but upon the whole he conducted himself nearly in his usual manner. On my taking notice of the red house on the hill, he appeared a good deal confused, and waving that conversation, began to talk about his two countrymen who were going with me to Atui. He seemed very much interested in Papa's welfare. He particularly requested me to take care of him and treat him well, and if we stopped at Atui, he begged that I would leave him under the care of Tao. 
who it seems is the brother of Taheteri and a relation of Paapa's. The two passengers asked me for a few trifles to leave among their friends before they set off, which I readily gave and also made the king a present, on which he took leave of me for the last time, and after taking a very affecting one of his countrymen, particularly of Papa, he quitted the ship and went ashore. The other canoes remained alongside to dispose of their cargoes, and we procured a supply of good hogs, which enabled me to set the salters to work again. In the afternoon, the rigging was set up, the sails bent, and everything ready for sea. In the night, the Queen Charlotte parted her bower cable and brought up with the other bower. I sent a boat the next morning to assist them in creeping for the end of their cable, which was fortunately hooked in a short time, and the anchor was recovered before noon. On examining the cable, some were of the opinion that it had been cut by the natives, and it certainly bore that appearance a good deal. At four o'clock, we began to unmoor, as I proposed getting to sea with the breeze that usually blows out of the bay in the night. But in a short time, we found the stream cable gone about three fathoms from the hawes. As we lay in ten fathoms of water, this part could never have been at the ground, and we never had rode the least strain by it, so that I was convinced it must have been cut by the natives. We had a buoy on the anchor, therefore I sent the longboat to weigh it, and we began to heave ahead on the best bower. Just as we had got a stay peak, the best bower also parted four fathoms from the anchor. On this we immediately let go in the small bower and brought up for the night. The Queen Charlotte having weighed and standing out of the bay, we made the signal to Basher, on which she stretched into the bay and came close by us. At daylight the next morning, we warped to the buoy of the best boa, weed the ancho, and at the same time we could the small boa and got under sail with a light breezer from the northeast. The old priest was still on board along with my new passengers, and we were followed by several canoes. But towards noon, the friendly old man took his leave and I made him a present, with which he was highly pleased. He then went on board the Queen Charlotte to take leave of Captain Dixon, and soon afterwards left the ships, accompanied by the other canoes, and paddled for the shore. At noon, the extremes of Wickaway bore west by north half north, and northeast half north, distant from the nearest part of the island about three leagues. On getting in the bower cable that had parted, we found it a good deal rubbed by the coral sand, of which the bottom where we anchored is chiefly composed, and on examining the place where it parted, I was of the opinion that it had been cut with a knife until the cable was opened, when I found all the yarns cut in the same manner, and no doubt by rubbing on the coral sand. The best situation for anchoring in King George's Bay is near the middle of it and about a mile from the reef, where there are six and seven fathoms of water over a bed of dark sand entirely free from coral. But as the inconvenience of our situation was not discovered until we were leaving the place, we had no opportunity of changing it for a more eligible one. We stood to the southwest with a light easterly breeze till night when it grew nearly calm, and next morning the wind hauled to the northward and westward. At noon, the extremes of Wahoo bore from north by west half west to northeast, three quarters east, six leagues distant. The wind freshened during the night, and at eight o'clock next morning blew a strong gale at north-northeast, with dark, rainy weather. Soon afterwards the island of Atui made its appearance, bearing northwest by west, seven or eight leagues distant. Towards noon the weather grew more moderate, and being then within seven miles of Atui, we stood on for Wimoa Bay, and at two o'clock anchored in thirty-five fathoms of water over a bottom of fine black and grey sand. As I knew the bank to be very steep, and the wind blowing fresh, I was afraid our anchor would start off. To prevent which, we wore away to a cable and a half, and then the ship lay in forty-eight fathoms of water over the same bottom. One cable's length astern there was one hundred fathoms, and a little further we found no ground with the deep sea line. Soon afterwards, the Queen Charlotte let go her anchor a little within the King George, but by checking the cable too soon, she dragged it off the bank, and could not get it to catch again with a whole cable out. Therefore, got her head offshore, hove their anchor up and made sail. But finding they could not get up to us before night came on, they stretched well in and anchored about a mile and a half to the westward of the village of Waimoa and a freshwater river, and opposite a large grove of coconut trees that lie near the western point of the bay. The King George lay to the eastward of Waimoa, 
That town and the river bearing north by west, the east point of the bay bore east by south a quarter south, and the west point north northwest by west half west, our distance from the nearest shore about two miles. Several canoes came off soon after our arrival, bringing abundance of fine taro. I inquired for the king and my old friend, Abenu, and was informed that they, together with most of the principal chiefs belonging to the island, were at Apunu, a town situated towards the northeast part of the island, where the king usually resides. But the natives told me the king and his retinue would shortly be down at Waimoa. I desired the natives to bring a supply of hogs, which they promised to do on the morrow, and indeed, I had no reason to complain of their want of punctuality for at daylight the next morning we were surrounded by canoes, which brought a number of very fine hogs for salting, and great plenty of taro, sweet potatoes, coconuts and sugarcane. And on my asking for water, they presently got into the method of supplying us and brought off great plenty of excellent water. Next morning at eight o'clock I went ashore to Waimoa, accompanied by my two passengers and one of the sailors, with an intention of walking round the western point of the island in hopes of finding a well-sheltered bay for the ships to ride in. After getting ashore I was received by a vast multitude of the inhabitants in the most friendly manner, and presently we were joined by a few people of some consequence who offered to accompany us on our walk, which I readily accepted and found them of great service in keeping the crowd at a distance, though they did not gather round us with a mischievous intention but on the contrary to render us any little service in their power. After walking two or three miles along the shore, we sat down to take a little refreshment. During our short repast, a chief named Tiana, who I understood was brother to the king, joined us and pressed me very much to walk back to Waimoa and eat with him there. As I was very anxious to find out a good bay for the ships, I declined this friendly request, but promised to call on him at my return, on which he took his leave with many professions of friendship, and we continued our walk along the shore. By three o'clock we got to the northwest point of the island, and I found all that part of the coast open and exposed, with a very heavy surf rolling in on the beaches. Being disappointed in my search for a harbour, I began to think of returning on board, but after we had walked four or five miles, I found it would be impractical for us to reach Waimoa before night came on. At this time, we were not far from a comfortable house belonging to Abenu. Therefore, I determined to take up my lodging in it for the night, and my companions were glad to embrace the same opportunity, as they were greatly fatigued with their walk. We arrived at the house about sunset, and one of Abenu's men, who had joined us in the course of the afternoon, I gave directions for a hog and a dog to be immediately killed and dressed for our suppers, together with a large quantity of taro. The house was well lighted up with torches made of dry rushes, and at eight o'clock supper being ready, it was served up in great order, and I think few people ever ate a heartier supper than we did. My friend's man acted as master of the ceremonies and served the provisions to each person, and after our feast was ended, he ordered the remains to be taken care of, as he told me it was for us to eat before we set out in the morning. We got up next morning at daylight and finished the remains of the preceding evening's repast. Prior to our quitting the house, there were nearly a hundred women around it, most of them with children in their arms. They were very inquisitive to know my name, which they pronounced as Po Pote, and such of the infants as could speak were taught by their mothers to call me Po Pote. Upon this, I distributed some trifles amongst them, with which they appeared highly satisfied. We walked towards Waimoa and reached the shore abreast of the Queen Charlotte about nine o'clock. I desired my companions to walk down to Waimoa and being very anxious to get on board, I took a canoe and went on board the Queen Charlotte, where I found my own whaleboat and got on board the King George towards noon. During my absence, they had carried on a brisk trade for provisions, and I had the pleasure of seeing the decks full of fine hogs for salting. Being now well assured that Atui afforded no place for the ships to ride in equal to Wimoa Bay, I determined to keep our situation for a short time for the purpose of salting pork for sea store and afterwards to proceed to Wanihau for a supply of yams and to remain there until the proper season for the prosecution of our voyage to the coast of America. A Voyage Round the World, but more particularly to the northwest coast of America, by Captain Nathaniel Portlock. Chapter 9. Variety of Refreshments Procured 
visited by the king, presents given and received, deplorable situation of the old warrior, ceremony of the tabuara, a remarkably large shark caught, grateful behavior of Nihyohua, arrival at Wanahau, obliged to cut the cables in a gale of wind, leave three invalids on shore, anchor again at Yambe, the sick return on board, leave Wanahau, and arrive at Atui. Remarkable circumstance of a woman with a puppy at her breast. Chiefs exercise with spears, house built for Captain Portlock. The ships leave Atui and arrive and Wanihau, recover the king, George Anchors, attempts on the life of an Atui chief, departure from the Sandwick Islands. In the morning of the 25th, Tiana, the chief whom I saw on shore, came off in a large double canoe and brought me a present of some hogs and vegetables, which I received and made him a return that pleased him very much. He informed me that the king, accompanied by Abanu and a number of other principal chiefs, would be down in a day or two, and in the meantime, we should be plentifully supplied with everything the island produced. After many professions of friendship, Tiana took his leave and returned ashore. Soon afterwards, I sent the whaleboat ashore to Wimoa for the sailor I left. Behind, along with Papa and Tawanoha, my men returned with the boat, but the other two chose to remain on shore a day or two among their new friends, and I understood they were greatly caressed by the natives in general. Besides hogs and vegetables, the natives brought baskets and grass rope to barter, which we purchased, as it was likely to prove useful for various purposes. The natives, finding we encouraged this traffic, were very busy on shore manufacturing rope, which they did very expeditiously, and brought off whole coils made of green rushes and grass. This we bought for the purpose of rounding the cables and the baskets for running rigging. The natives continued to bring us an abundant supply of fine hogs, fruit and roots, and a large party were constantly employed in killing and salting pork for sea store. In the forenoon of the 28th, we observed a number of canoes come round the eastern point of the bay, and soon afterwards, my good friend Abanu came on board, but so much reduced, and so covered with a white scurf, from the immoderate use of the Yava, that I scarcely knew him. He brought two canoes loaded with different kinds of provisions, as a present for the two ships. After staying a short time with me, he went on board the Queen Charlotte, with the present he intended for Captain Dixon, and returning again in the evening, took up his lodgings with us. On the 29th, the wind blew very fresh from the east-northeast, with frequent heavy squalls from the land, which prevented the king from coming off to the ships. But the weather growing moderate towards night, Abanue went on shore early the next morning, and returned at nine o'clock, in company with Taiao and most of the principal chiefs belonging to the island. His Majesty brought me a very handsome present, consisting of hogs, taro, coconuts and plantains, together with cloth, mats and several elegant feathered cloaks, all of which he insisted on my receiving. Accordingly, they were got into the ship and I made him a gift in return. With Papa and Tawanoha now on board, I took an opportunity of introducing them to the king, agreeably to Tahitere's request. Previous to this, I gave them a few trifling articles which they presented to him, and were received with great affability and kindness, and he assured me that they should be under his immediate protection. According to my expectation, I found that Abanu was a man highly esteemed by those who consulted him on every occasion. Ta'ao appears to be about forty-five years old, stout and well-made, and seemed the best disposed man that we had met with amongst the islands. He offered me his friendship in the most earnest manner, and assured me that we should be well supplied with everything this and the adjacent islands afforded. He requested Abanu to remain on board, in order to prevent any disputes arising between our people and the natives in the course of their traffic. The king and his retinue stayed on board for about two hours, gratifying their curiosity by looking at different parts of the ship, which they seemed greatly to admire. After taking leave of me, they went on board the Queen Charlotte, where they stopped for a short time and then returned ashore. Abanu attended His Majesty to see him safely landed, and afterwards came on board for the night. As he constantly took up his abode with us, I had ordered a cot to be hung for him in the cabin, which pleased him so much that he never slept out of it. Vast numbers of canoes came off on the 31st, bringing hogs and vegetables as usual. The king also paid me a visit, accompanied by an elderly man named Nihio Hua, whom I understood was his uncle, and a person of the first consequence. This old chief has, it seems, in his time, 
been one of the greatest warriors that Atui or any of the islands could boast of and has been greatly instrumental in settling them under their present kings Tahitere and Ta'au. Indeed, his very appearance bespoke the hardy veteran. His body was almost covered with scars and he was quite a cripple. And to add to his distressing situation, he had entirely lost one eye and the other was in a weak state, caused by some wounds he had recently received in battle and which were beyond their art to heal. Tao appeared very unhappy on account of his uncle's situation and perhaps thinking that we could perform wonders, begged us to cure him. I recommended him to the care of my surgeon who washed his wounds, applied dressings to them and gave him some fresh ones, which he was directed to use once a day. Niho Hua seemed perfectly to understand the surgeon's instructions and promised to follow them in the most punctual manner. After remaining on board a few hours, Tao and his uncle left us, highly pleased with the treatment they had received. The next morning scarcely any canoes were to be seen, though the weather was very fine. On my asking Abanu the reason, he told me they were detained on account of a taboo being laid by the king. The taboo, it seems, is a kind of tax which the king imposes on the property of those subjects whose plantations are near at hand and consists of a certain portion of their various produce. At Abanu's request, I attended him ashore to see the ceremony, and indeed I could not but admire the order and regularity with which the natives conducted themselves on this occasion. Men, women, and even children paid their contributions with cheerfulness and goodwill. Some brought hogs, others taro, breadfruit, and indeed everything the island produced, all of which were placed in separate heaps. Ta'ao and most of the principal chiefs attended to see the taboo punctually complied with, and when it was finished, the whole was divided into two parcels, which the king told me were a present for the two ships and desired me to send boats ashore to carry them off. I was greatly pleased with the king's generous method of proceeding and determined he should not be a loser by his liberality, though I happened to have nothing ashore that I thought a suitable return for so noble a present. After taking a very friendly leave of me, the king retired to a house situated a little to the eastward of the river, where he resides when at this part of the island, and I went off in the longboat, accompanied by my friend Abanu. Before nightfall, we had gotten the whole of our present on board, and the taboo being over, the canoes came about the ships as usual. On the second and third, the wind blew very fresh at east by north, with frequent squalls, during which time we had but little intercourse with the natives, and our stock of vegetables was nearly expended. However, Abanu, ever anxious to supply our wants, went ashore to procure a supply of hogs and roots, ready to come off when the weather grew moderate. And early in the morning of the fourth, he returned on board and informed me that he had got a number of hogs and vegetables ready for us. The weather being now pretty moderate, I sent the longboat ashore at eight o'clock and soon afterwards followed myself in the whaleboat, accompanied by Abanui. The sea being very smooth, we landed with the boat on a beach abreast of the village of Waimoa, and while the people were getting the hogs and other provisions into the longboat, we walked two or three miles up a valley, which leads from Waimoa towards the mountains. This valley abounds with taro, which is planted in trenches that contain about six inches depth of water. The taro grounds are divided at convenient distances by raised footpaths, which, as well as the trenches, are made of stones in a very regular manner and must have cost the natives an infinite deal of time and travel. Abanui conducted me to a large new house belonging to him situated at some distance up the valley and very well built after their manner. Here we sat down for a little while and after taking some refreshment returned to Waimoa. By this time they had gotten everything into the longboat and we took a passage in her on board. During my absence they had purchased a number of fine hogs and great plenty of taro, potatoes, etc., so that we again began to kill and salt pork for sea store. In the afternoon we caught a shark, so very large that it was obliged to be hoisted out of the water with a tackle. It measured 13 feet and a half in length and 8 feet and a half in circumference, and the liver 6 feet. Its mouth was so large that it admitted the head of a puncheon with ease. On the shark being opened there were found 48 young ones in her, each about 8 inches long, two entire turtles weighing about 60 pounds each, besides several small pigs, and a large quantity of bones. The liver was kept for oil, and I gave the fish to the natives, who seemed to regard it as an inestimable treasure. Ta'ao paid me another visit on the 5th, 
accompanied by his eldest son, named Taevi, a very fine boy about twelve years of age. The king told me that he intended this as a farewell visit, as he intended to return to Apunu very shortly, but that Abunu should remain on board and accompany us down to Wanihau, which island and its produce he pressed me very much to accept as a present, and desired Abunu to take care that the natives supplied us well with yams, without taking anything in return, but I begged, if he would not permit them to sell the produce of the island, that they might be suffered to receive something for their trouble in digging and bringing off the yams to us, which at length he reluctantly assented to, and after receiving a present that seemed to please him highly, he took leave of me in the most friendly manner, as did his son and the attending chiefs, to each of whom on parting I gave a small present, and they went ashore with the greatest appearance of satisfaction. Amongst the persons of consequence who attended Tao on his farewell visit was his uncle Ni Hua. His wounds were getting better, and he seemed quite at a loss how to express his gratitude and thankfulness. He begged permission to come on board every day to have them dressed, and seemed to think they would soon be healed. After attending his nephew ashore, he returned with a large double canoe full of hogs as a present to the surgeon and myself as a token of his gratitude. I took the hogs on board, but we declined receiving them as a present, though it was with some difficulty I prevailed on the old warrior to receive anything in exchange. I desired him to come daily on board to have his wounds dressed, which pleased him very much, and he went ashore highly satisfied with the treatment he received. On the seventh, the king in a large double canoe, attended by several others, left the bay and set off for Apunu. Apunu still remained on board the King George, and we found him a most useful person. If ever any little dispute arose in our traffic with the natives, he always settled it to general satisfaction. We still were furnished with a few hogs and vegetables, and the natives brought us a plentiful supply of firewood, some of which made very good handspikes and capstan bars. And as we began to run short of these articles, the carpenter set about making some. Not many canoes making their appearance today, I supposed a number of the natives had gone to their respective homes, having disposed of the articles they had brought for us and satisfied their curiosity. Present weather, with light variable winds from east-northeast, the anchor end of the best bower cable being much worn, we yesterday cut about nine fathoms of it off, and today were employed in rounding it with grass rope. A few hogs were purchased, and some firewood, several hands employed in sawing up and stowing the wood away. But few hogs brought today, I suppose that we had bought nearly all the natives wished to part with, and should for the future think ourselves well off in procuring a sufficiency for our present use. The canoes belonging to the bay constantly attended us. Their principal cargoes consisted of coconuts, very fine sugarcane, and bale and grass rope. Employed purchasing wood and bale ropes and getting all clear for sea, at seven o'clock up top gallant masts and yards, and at eight hove up and came to sail with a light breeze from the northward. Between nine and ten it fell quite calm, at eleven a gentle breeze sprung up from the westward, with which we ran in and anchored again in Waimoa Bay. I think a number more canoes must have come into the bay during the night, for we had more about us now than I have seen since our arrival in the bay. We bought a few very good hogs, but the chief of their remaining merchandise seems to be now confined to what we term curiosities, such as their country cloth, mats, spears, and various other articles. On the 11th, employed in preparing for sailing, dark, short, cloudy weather and rain. At six o'clock, with a fresh breeze from the northeast, we weighed and came to sail, Queen Charlotte and the longboat in company. After clearing the bay, made sail for the south point of Wanihau, our distance from the nearest shore about three leagues, my first officer, who had been dangerously ill, now recovered and does duty again. From the 12th to the 16th, nothing particular occurred. When we came to anchor in Yam Bay with the best bower in 15 fathoms water over a bottom of coarse sand. When moored, the following bearings were taken. Namely, the north point of the bay 26 to east, distant 3 or 4 miles, and the end of the reef that runs from that point north 15 to east. The highest part of the south head run over the low land of the bay south, 37 degree east. The south points of the bay, 15 degree east, distant three or four miles. The island of Tahura south, 43 degree west.
the island of Wan Chao North, 25 degree east, and the bottom of the bay North, 60 degree east, distance about a mile and a half. We found a very heavy swell rolling into the bay, which caused such a surf on the beach as made it very dangerous for the natives to come off with anything. Queen Charlotte, not in sight, went on shore to desire the natives to bring us off a supply of yams. The surf still continued so heavy on the shore that the natives could have no intercourse with us, and it is very different from what we found it when we were here before. As then, I safely landed with our whaleboat, and she might have remained on the beach without any danger of filling. At that time, there was no westerly swell, and the true trade wind prevailed, which is by no means the case at this time. Towards noon the weather cleared up a little, when some canoes came off with a few yams, just sufficient for a present supply. On the 17th, about 10 o'clock, I went on shore with the whaleboat, accompanied by Abenu, and as the surf ran even too great for canoes, we were obliged to row in under the reef, where we found a place that the boat could lie at her anchor with safety, and we went into a canoe to go on shore, but were upset by the surf before we reached it, and were obliged to swim for it. After landing, we walked about seven miles to the northward along the hills, at some little distance from the beach, but in our walk I observed the coast all along to be very foul and no place equal to Yam Bay to ride in. The country seemed very poorly cultivated, and Abenu told me that since we took our stock of yams in, the people have in a great measure neglected the island, barely planting enough for their own use, and that some had entirely left the island and taken up their future residence at Atui. Towards evening we returned on board, the Queen Charlotte not in sight. On the 18th and 19th, the carpenter employed in caulking the sides, the people working up junk, and the armourer at the forge. The surf on the beach appearing not very high, I gave the first watch leave to go on shore. They went on shore in our own boats, and had canoes to take them on shore from the boats, notwithstanding which they were upset, and some of them would undoubtedly have been drowned, had not the natives swam into the surf and got them safely on shore. In the evening the whaleboat returned, having from the south seen the Queen Charlotte at a considerable distance. This day several of my people had liberty to go on shore, all of whom returned except three who were in a very poor state of health and whom I thought of letting remain a few days until they got better. And Abenu had provided a comfortable house for their reception and ordered them to be supplied with every refreshment the island afforded. Presently after, a heavy gale coming on, obliged me to cut our cables and run out of the bay, followed by the longboat. We were under the necessity of leaving our three invalids on shore, but they were perfectly safe and taken proper care of. Abenu and several others of the Indians were on board at the time and went to sea with us. After getting a little offing, we steered to the northward, meaning if the westerly winds continued to go through between Atui and Onochao and join the Queen Charlotte, who I supposed was still to the eastward of Wanahau, not having an opportunity of getting down to the bay. From the 21st to the 26th, kept beating off and on about Wanihau and Atui, without being able to come to anchor till the 26th in the south point of Yam Bay. Our Indian visitors very impatient to get on shore again, which the heavy surf still running prevented. The Queen Charlotte came to anchor about two miles to the southward of us. A heavy sea continuing made it difficult for any canoes to get to us. At last, a few ventured off from Yam Bay. One of them called alongside the longboat, which I had sent into the bay on the 22nd, to endeavour to get in the ends of the cables if he found it practicable, and lie at them until I should arrive with the ship. They brought me a letter from the officer, acquainting me that on his arrival in the bay the ship buoy of the best bower was gone, and that after getting hold of the ship buoy rope of the stream cable, before they had, well, got it taut, it parted, being chafed off by the motion of the rope against the coral sand. In their canoes also came our three invalids, who had been on board the longboat ever since their anchorage in the bay. These people had been very well treated by the natives during their stay on shore, and in consequence of their not seeing the ship return so soon as they expected, the Indians supposed we had gone to Waimoa to remain, and were just at the time when the longboat made her appearance in the bay, about taking them to Atui in some of their canoes to join the ship. But on the longboat's arrival, they sent them immediately on board her and brought with them the ship buoy of the best bower cable and the buoy of the stream anchor, 
both of which broke adrift and drove ashore during the night after we cut out, at which time it blew very strong from the southwest, with a very heavy sea. Abenu went on shore with an intention of procuring a stock of yams for us, and to get them at the first opportunity, the weather continued still so bad that we could not make any trial for our anchor. From the 28th to the 29th, the weather still so very squally that we could not attempt getting our anchors, and not thinking it safe to lie in our present situation, we weighed and came to sail. The Queen Charlotte and the Longboat in Company We sailed to the southward to clear the island of Wanihau, and as the wind still lay to the northward and westward, which prevented us from doing anything towards recovering our anchors, I intended to anchor and get a fresh supply of provisions. On the 31st, we came to anchor in Wimoa Bay with the small bower in 29 fathoms of water, over a bottom of fine muddy black sand. When moored, we lay nearly abreast of the river and the town of Wimoa, from which we immediately had a sufficient supply of provisions of different kinds. Various tasks were employed on board. Abenu dispatched a messenger to the king to acquaint him of our arrival. On the 2nd, 3rd and 4th we were employed in working up junks, painting the ship and other necessary jobs. A gentle breeze from the southwest, with fine weather. I gave the second watch leave to go on shore. A number of Abenu's people attended them by his order to prevent quarrels between the seamen and the natives and to furnish them with provisions. His orders were punctually attended to. In the evening, when the people returned, I found not a theft had been attempted, but they had been treated with every luxury the island afforded, and that in a most friendly manner. A remarkable circumstance, related by Mr. Goulding, a volunteer in the second voyage, shows the great regard the natives have for their dogs. In walking a considerable way along the shore, he met with an Indian and his wife. She had two puppies, one at each breast. The oddity of the circumstance induced him to endeavour to purchase one of them, which the woman could not, by all his persuasions or temptations, be induced to part with. But the sight of some nails had such powerful attractions upon the man, that he insisted upon her parting with one of them. At last, with every sign of real sorrow, she did, giving it at the same time an affectionate embrace. Although he was at this time a considerable way from the ship, the woman would not part with him till they arrived where the boat was lying to take him on board, and just upon his quitting the shore, she very earnestly entreated to have it once more before they parted, upon his complying with which she immediately placed it at the breast, and after a time returned it to him again. Tuesday, at my request, two chiefs that were on board from Wimoa exercised with their spears. The dexterity and astonishing expertness shown by them wonderfully surprised everyone on board. One of them, whose name was Namat Iray, that is blind of one eye, is a well-made man of about five feet six inches high, his skin much affected by his immoderate drinking of Yava, and though he appears to be a person of very little property, is yet much respected and his company courted by all the principal men of the island. I suppose the attention paid him proceeds from his having been, and still remaining, a great warrior. The loss of his eye, one informed me, he met with in battle by a stone flung from a sling, but this accident does not prevent him from being a nice expert warrior. His manner of exercising gave us sufficient proofs to the contrary. He took his stand about three or four yards from the cabin door, unarmed. The other person stood at about eight or ten yards distance from him, provided with five spears. Upon the signal being given for commencing action, a spear was thrown with the utmost force at Namatire, which he avoided by a motion of the body, and caught it as it passed him by the middle. With this spear, he parried the rest without the least apparent concern. He then returned the spears to his adversary, and armed himself with a pahoa. They were again thrown at him, and again parried with the same ease. One of the spears struck a considerable way into the bulkhead of the cabin, and the barbed part was broken off in endeavouring to get it out. The remarkable coolness he showed at the time the spears were cast at him proved at once his courage and expertness. All who were spectators of the fight shuddered at the danger he seemed exposed to, and were astonished to see with what ease he parried everything that was cast at him. Tuesday I gave the third watch leave to go on shore. The rest of the people variously employed, moderate breezes and fine weather. Being on shore myself with my old friend Abanu, I observed in the village of Waimoa, about 300 yards from the beach, 
a string of four or five houses, tolerably large, in very good order, without inhabitants. On my asking Abanu the reason of them being tabooed, he informed me that they were houses built for the king whenever he honoured Waimoa with a visit and that no persons whatever were allowed the use of them in his absence. He likewise informed me that the king had given him directions to build me a house on a clear spot, just to the westward of these houses, and that he had brought me to this place for me to point out a situation to my own liking. For some time, I declined accepting the favour, but my friend's earnest entreaty made me at last consent to gratify his generosity, and I fixed on a spot. No sooner had I given my consent than workmen were immediately employed. Some were sent to fetch wood from the country, others to bring a kind of long grass for thatching, all of which orders were received with the greatest satisfaction, everyone wishing to exert himself to the utmost and delighted with the idea of having their friend Popute amongst them. Near the spot I fixed on, I procured a large flat stone on which I etched the initials of my name, the country I serve, and the year of our Lord. I explained as well as I could the meaning of this to my friend, who appeared much pleased with it. I desired he would cause the stone to be placed in the centre of the house. One very great inconvenience attends their houses, which is their want of windows. The extreme hot weather they have so much of makes it very uncomfortable and close, but they seem to think it a matter of no consequence to guard against anything but the rains and cold. When they find it too warm, they directly go into the water to cool themselves, it being a matter of indifference to them, whether it is night or day. I requested of my friend in the building of my house I might have windows in it, one at each end, one on each side of the door, and one at the back, for the benefit of both, light and air. He said it should be done as I desired, and everything being settled to general satisfaction respecting the building, we proceeded up the valley, attended by a number of the natives of both sexes, young and old, who behaved with the greatest hospitality and friendship, pressing me earnestly to go into every house we came to and partake of the best fare in their power to give, and numbers of the mothers bringing me their children to Honey, that is, salute them, by touching noses, my compliance with which seemed to give them infinite satisfaction, and I can safely affirm it gave me equally as much. I was delighted to see so much happiness in the faces of hundreds of the Indians, whom we had formerly so much reason to think were a treacherous people. This excursion gave me a fresh opportunity of admiring the amazing ingenuity and industry of the natives in laying out their taro and sugarcane grounds, the greatest part of which are made upon the banks of the river, with exceedingly good causeways made with stones and earth, leading up the valleys and to each plantation. The taro beds are in general a quarter of a mile over, dammed in, and they have a place in one part of the bank that serves as a gateway. When the rains commence, which is in the winter season, the river swells with the torrents from the mountains and overflows their taro beds, and when the rains are over and the rivers decrease, the dams are stopped up and the water kept in to nourish the taro and sugarcane during the dry season. The water in the beds is generally about one foot and a half or two feet over a muddy bottom. The sugar cane, generally in less water, grows very large and fine, and is a great article of food with the natives, particularly the lower class. The taro also grows frequently as large as a man's head, and is esteemed the best bread kind they have. They frequently make a pudding of it, which they keep till it becomes a little sour, and then they are very fond of it, preferring it to everything else. The Indians that were a little while at sea with me almost fretted themselves to death when their stock of poe was exhausted, which was very soon done, from the immoderate quantity they ate of it. I have seen my friend Abanui eat near two quarts of it at a meal, besides a quantity of fish or pork. While we were walking among these taro beds, a number of the natives were in them. Gathering it and sugarcane to supply the ships, they were up to their middle in water. After gratifying my curiosity amongst the plantations, my friend accompanied me to a large house situated under the hills on the west side of the valley and about two or three miles from the sea beach. I found this house to be very large, commodious and clean, with a new mat on the floor. On the left side of the door was a wooden image of a tolerably large size, seated in a chair, which nearly resembled one of our armchairs. There was a grass plat all round the image and a small railing made of wood. Beside the chairs were several tuis and other small articles. 
My friend informed me that this house had been built with the Toei I had given him upon my first calling at Wanahau, and that the other articles were presents that I had made him at different periods, and that the image was in commemoration of my having been amongst them. Few people were admitted into this house. Among other articles in it were several drums. One in particular was very large, the head of which was made out of the skin of the large shark I have already mentioned, and I was told these drums were dedicated to their gods. We had some refreshments, such as pork, salted fish, taro, plantains and coconuts, and then returned to the beach. The long boat being ensured to take off some provisions of different kinds that were collected by a tabura, or general tax laid on the natives by the king. I ordered the officer in her to remain at anchor a little distance from the beach, until some of the things came down and during the whole time had great reason to be well satisfied with the natives who attended, some in canoes, others swimming about. I went off in the longboat, accompanied by Abanu and some other chiefs, who were highly delighted with the sail to the ship, as there happened to be a very brisk breeze. The method of steering with the rudder took much of their attention, and Abanu took a spell at the helm and said that he would try to steer their canoe in the same way. On my arrival on board, I found everything in good order. It is not in my power to give half the praises that are due to these people, from the king to the Tauto. Their attention and unwearied industry in supplying us with everything in their power was beyond example. Their hospitality and generosity were unbounded, and their eagerness to do as acts of kindness was amazing. I hope, by the help of their own ingenuity, they will be enabled from their observations upon our methods of sailing, building, etc., to bring these articles among themselves to much greater advantage than they are at present. My friend Abanu's attachment to both ships' companies was singular. In general, he slept on board the King George, where I had a cot hung up for him in the cabin, with which he was very much pleased. The old man had some falls before he was used to it, by getting in at one side and rolling out at the other. But he always got up Sierra again with the greatest good nature, and in a very little time surmounted that difficulty. On the 7th, the people were employed in getting provisions, which Abenu informed me he had got ready for the boats. About 10 o'clock, the boats returned well laden with hogs and other provisions. This day the king arrived in the bay, attended by several large canoes. He came on board and appeared very well pleased at the friendly intercourse that subsisted between his subjects and us. Our people always went on shore unarmed which prevented the natives from having any apprehensions of danger and created mutual confidence in each other. The king stayed on board a few hours, and then I attended him on board the Queen Charlotte to see Captain Dixon. From the 10th to the 14th, nothing particular occurred. Light winds from the westward, with clear, pleasant weather, the swell from the southwest still continuing, led me to think that we should have the wind again from that quarter, and not wishing to ride out another western gale in our present situation, I determined at the first opportunity to weigh and get out of the bay. About ten o'clock, the wind hauled to the west-northwest, with which we weighed and stood out of the bay, the Queen Charlotte in company. At nine o'clock, the Queen Charlotte being a considerable way astern, we wore ship and hove to, with the ship's head to the northward, to give her an opportunity of joining us. Three canoes came off with provisions. After having sold their cargoes, they took their leave of us, as did our faithful friend who left his son on board, wishing to go with us. The Queen Charlotte was in company. From this day to the 16th, nothing particular occurred. Early on the 16th, our old friend Abanu came off from the east point of Atui in a large double canoe and brought us a fine hog and some taro. I made him a present, with which he was satisfied, and immediately went on board the Queen Charlotte. As he left her, I bore away to the westward intending to run for one chow, to make a trial for the recovery of our anchors left there. Should I succeed, I meant then, if possible, to return to Waimoa Bay and endeavour to get the Queen Charlotte's small bower. I would have tried for hers first if there had been any dependence on the weather. However, as the anchors at Wanihau were the greatest concern and there was a likely probability of retrieving them, lying in shoal water and the best bower having a boy on it, I was glad to seize the first spell of good weather with an easterly wind to make the trial. Northerly, southerly or westerly winds create such a swell that it would make it impossible to do anything of that kind. At six o'clock, we brought to with the main topsail to the mast. My reason for taking this step 
was that in case the breeze should fail and prevent us from proceeding to Wanihau, we might be near Wimwa in the morning, from where there was a chance of procuring some vegetables. When we brought to, the extremes of Atui bore about north and northwest, about seven miles distant. Until daylight, when the wind appeared to have settled to the eastward, we bore away and made sail for Wanihau. Served half a pound of bread per man and a pound and a half of fresh pork. At noon, the extremes of Wanihau bore west-southwest, distance from South Head about five leagues. The clouds to the westward flying from south-southwest and a swell from the southwest induced me to bring to and wait until these appearances of an approaching westerly wind subsided. I think we may with great truth affirm that during the time we were among these islands, we had more disagreeable weather and crosswinds than was experienced in the resolution and discovery during their whole voyage, which was upwards of four years. Moderate breezes from the east, southeast and southeast. About two o'clock, passed the south head of Wanihau and ran towards Yam Bay, and at five anchored with the small bower in twenty-nine fathoms over fine white sand, the Queen Charlotte anchoring at the same time a little to the southward. The weather continuing fine, all hands were up and began to look for our anchors, both of which, in the course of the day, were recovered and got on board. At about two o'clock in the morning, we began to unmoor, got the kedge on board and started heaving in the bower cable. The weather beginning to look unsettled, with a swell continuing from the westward, led me to think we should very soon have bad weather and a westerly wind. Experience had sufficiently taught me that we could not ride in this bay with the wind any way to the westward of north or south without imminent danger. At five we weighed and made sail, with the Queen Charlotte in company, stood to the westward until we got a convenient distance from the land, which was when we lost hearing the surf, and then northward. During the night, we steered from north-northwest to northeast with a moderate breeze, the wind suddenly chopping around to the southwest with rain and every appearance of bad weather prompted me to haul to the northwest under the three top sails until daylight, which was about five o'clock. We bore away to the northeast at seven. We saw the west part of Atui bearing east by south, distant eight leagues, and at half past seven, we saw the west part of Wanahau bearing south, distant seven or eight leagues. Around ten, the weather cleared up and the wind became light and unsettled, ranging from east southeast to south. At noon, there was a moderate breeze, with the island of Atawi bearing from east to southeast by south, distant about six leagues from the nearest part. Our course was about east for the north side of Atawi, latitude 22 to 29 north. During the time of working for our anchors, I employed some hands in procuring yam salt and water, which the natives brought us off in small quantities, and before we got under sail, I think we had purchased yams enough for three or four days. I cannot commend highly enough the behaviour of both the ship's companies during the whole of the voyage to this time. Sometimes trifling differences have arisen, but I think, I may venture to say, there were never fewer among such a number of people. Their attention and unwearied industry during the time of getting our anchors, without the least murmuring or backwardness, delighted me, although they had scarce time to swallow a mouthful of victuals. At one o'clock, a fine breeze from the south, steering east by south along the north side of Atui. I was in hopes that as we drew near the north side of the islands, we should have canoes with hogs and vegetables. We had pretty well drained the south side. As for Wanichau, I believe if all the hogs were collected together, they would not amount to a dozen, and I was afraid we would fall very short of a supply of yams, as my old friend Abanu informed me that since the stock we previously carried from the islands, they have neglected cultivating the land. Indeed, his information agreed with my own observations while on shore. I walked over a great deal of ground, lying entirely waste. It appeared to me that a number of the natives that formerly inhabited this island have quitted it to reside at Atui. Probably the iron which they procured from us previously enabled them to purchase possessions in Atui, as Wanihau is but a poor spot, abounding in scarce anything but yams, potatoes, sugarcane and the sweet root, with a very trifling quantity of wood. Whereas Atui is amply provided with many articles of provisions, particularly the taro, which the natives prefer to yams or potatoes, and I am sensible that none of them will live at Wanihau that can procure a sufficiency to reside at Atui. During our run along the north and west parts of Atui, 
we saw no appearance of any harbour. Latitude 20 Sodegu 14 North From the 20th to this day, the people were variously employed on board, repairing the rigging etc., standing off and on for a favourable wind to take us to Waimoa Bay, where we anchored this day with the small bower in 37 fathoms of water. Black, muddy sand, the east point of the bay bearing east three quarters south and the west point northwest by south, the river's mouth north half west and the valley that runs up from the village of Waimoa northeast half east, our distance from the shore about two miles, made an attempt for the Queen Charlotte's anchor without success. No canoes coming to us this evening made me send the whale boat ashore to purchase some taro. Variable winds with pleasant weather, the people employed in procuring provisions, most of the canoes having left the bay with the greater part of the chiefs and gone to Apunu. This day, a man of some little consequence named Nohomi Tehiti, who had been very often on board and rendered us a good deal of assistance in procuring a, pressed me very much to take him into the ship with us. The man appeared so very earnest in his solicitations that at last I consented to his going in the ship and meant to have given him a trip to the northwest coast and at our next touching at these islands, either to have left him there or brought him to England. He informed me that he had collected a number of little articles which he made a present of to his father, a very old man, almost worn out with age. But Pu Are Are, one of the king's messengers, who rules with unbounded sway when the king and principal chiefs are from the island, knowing the old man was possessed of a great many articles, went to him and demanded all his treasure, consisting of a few toes, beads, rings, and various little articles which his son had given him. The old man denied having anything, for he had taken care not to lodge them in his house, but had deposited them in a hole in the ground at a convenient distance from the house. The messenger still persisted in his demand, and the old man continuing obstinate, the messenger caught hold of him by the throat and threatened that, if he would not deliver up his goods, he would murder him. And indeed, he had nearly strangled him before he would show him where his treasure was deposited. At last, the old man was obliged to reveal all, which was immediately taken away by the messenger. Rig Oa Etiese landed with his canoe just at the time and saw his father in this situation, but did not interfere. Perhaps not for want of courage, but dreading to lay hands on a messenger of the kings who are held in great esteem. He left his father to get out of the affair and came on board as before related. Being pretty late in the evening, and knowing we never allowed any of them to come on board at night, he took good care to call frequently out for Poputi, in a most piteous tone, to let me know it was he and that he wanted to come on board, which he did. He then told me his sorrowful tale and wanted me to punish the messenger for his ill behaviour. But had I been inclined to do it, I could not for he never after that put himself into my power. No homi tehiti, in a few days after that, being tired of living on salt provisions, left me, and I had no opportunity of seeing the king or abundance before I left the islands to inquire what was done about it. From this time to the third employed in getting provisions, when we weighed and set sail, Queen Charlotte in company, and stood out of the bay with an intention to proceed immediately to the coast leaving for the second time these friendly islands. Voyage round the world, but more particularly to the northwest coast of America, by Captain Nathaniel Portlock. Chapter 10. Passage from the Sandwich Islands to the coast of America. Good effects of beer made of the sweet root. Arrival at Montague Island anchor in Hannings Bay, boats sent on a trading expedition, meet with a vessel from Bengal, their distressing situation, refreshments sent to the Nootka, plan of future proceedings, visited by a powerful tribe of Indians, their propensity to theft, departure from Montague Island, the ships separate, arrival of the King George in Hinchinbrook Cove. We now proceeded for the coast a second time, and until the 19th, nothing of material consequence occurred, Latitude, 26 degree tours north. This day, finding myself about 25 or 30 leagues to the eastward of the Resolution and Discovery's track along the coast, and nearly in the latitude that the islands of Santa Maria la Gorda are laid down, having a strong gale with very thick weather, 
I did not deem it prudent to run during the night. The foray at six o'clock handed the foresail and brought us under close reefed main topsail, mizzen stay sail, and fret top mast stay sail, with the ships hid to the southwest. Queen Charlotte brought to close under our lee quarter. During the night, it continued to blow very hard, with heavy squalls from the south southeast. From this time to the 12th of April, we kept our course for the coast, latitude 56 to 46 north. Both ships' companies were very well except the carpenter of the Queen Charlotte, who had been troubled with a lingering complaint for a long time, and Richard Greenhalt, one of my quartermasters, who had been very ill at the islands, had recovered amazingly and was now out of danger. The method of brewing the sweet root having already been mentioned, at this time I shall only observe that three quarts of molasses were put into six gallons of beer, in addition to a pint of essence of malt, and after being a short time in bottles, it was nothing inferior to the finest cider. Richard Greenhalt had a bottle given to him daily, and it was found of infinite service to him. Indeed, its good effects were almost instantaneous, and it certainly is a most excellent and valuable remedy, for the poor man was so reduced with an almost continual spitting and vomiting of blood that at one time my surgeon was of the opinion he could not live many days. We kept standing to the northwest, with fresh breezes on the southern and western boards, on the 16th, the water being much coloured, we tried for soundings but got no bottom with 140 fathoms of line. Our latitude at that time was 58 to get 10 north and 147 to get 18 longitude. In our last passage to the coast, in nearly the same latitude and 2 dig 15's longitude to the westward of our present position, we struck soundings in 70 fathoms of water, which inclines me to think that after getting to the westward of that longitude, Though in the same latitude, the water deepens very much, and to the westward of that longitude, and in the same latitude, it shoals, especially on drawing towards Cape Greville or the Isle St. Hermogenes. At three o'clock in the afternoon, we saw a seal, and passed several patches of sea leak and pieces of driftwood, but got no soundings with 150 fathoms of line. Our latitude at noon on the 17th, by double altitudes, was 57 degree 54 degree. At the same time, the latitude by account was 58 to go 25 E's. This difference I paid no regard to, as there was a probability that neither the watch nor the altitudes were to be depended on. But on speaking with Captain Dixon, I found he had taken an altitude by his timepiece when it was very near noon, which gave the latitude 57 degree 50 am, so that we must have been set by a current during the last 24 hours, 35 miles to the southward. Indeed, last year, when we were about this coast, we found almost a constant current setting to the southward. Towards evening, judging that we were not more than ten leagues from the southwest point of Montague Island, I hauled the wind to the westward, under an easy sail, in order to wait for daylight to run in for the land. But in this, I was disappointed, for soon after midnight, it began to rain and the weather grew very thick about three o'clock in the morning, the weather cleared a little, and being very anxious to make the land, we bore away with the wind at south by west and steered northwest by west. However, this was of short continuance, for in less than an hour the weather again became very thick, and the wind began to blow very fresh at south. On this, we hauled to the wind and sounded with 150 fathoms of line, but got no bottom. We now had a succession of fresh gales and thick, dirty weather, which caused us to ply occasionally as I did not think it prudent, under such circumstances, to stand in for the land. Strong gales, attended with thick, hazy weather, continued with very little intermission till the 23rd. On that day at noon, being in latitude 59 degree 11 and longitude 148 degree 15, we had soundings in 76 fathoms of water over a muddy bottom, with small black specks and black stone, and at two o'clock, the land made its appearance through the haze, entirely covered with snow, bearing from north-northwest to west by south, about eight leagues distant. But soon afterwards, the weather grew thick, which prevented me from getting a good sight of the land, so as to be certain of our exact situation. The fog rather dispersing at four o'clock, we again saw the land bearing west by south, which at first I took for the southwest point of Montague Island, but presently afterwards, Land was seen bearing north-northeast, which I immediately knew to be the point just mentioned, and the land bearing to the westward, 
to be the land to the westward of the passage into Prince William Sound. We continued standing on to the northwest till seven o'clock, when we wore and stood to the eastward. Just at this time, the weather cleared up and gave us a good sight of the land and passage into the Sound, the middle of which bore north-northeast, about eight leagues distant. No, no, no. During the night, we stood to the eastward under an easy sail, and at daylight the next morning, we stood in for the southwest point of Montague Island with a light breeze at northwest, under all the sail we could make. At eight o'clock, having a fine breeze at west southwest, we steered north for the entrance, the east side of which bore north by east and the west side north, distant from each point five or six leagues. At nine o'clock, the west point of Montague Island bore north northeast one fourth, five leagues distant, and the middle of the passage north half east. I now judged that we were in about 35 fathoms of water, and on sounding we had 34 fathoms over a bottom of sand and shells. I have found from experience that in going off in the same direction, the water deepens gradually, and in about 50 fathoms there is a muddy, sandy bottom. But on crossing that direction, either to the eastward or westward, the water deepens very quickly into 80 and upwards of 100 fathoms. The wind failing us a little, the whaleboat was sent ahead to tow. At noon, the extremes of Montague Island in sight bore east by south five miles and north by east four leagues, our distance from the nearest shore about three miles. On sounding, we had 16 fathoms of water over a rocky bottom. Our observation gave latitude 59.950 hours, and according to the bearings and distance of the southwest point of Montague Island, I made its latitude to be 59947, which I am certain is right within a mile or two. In Captain Cook's chart, that point is situated in the latitude of 59D36 X, which is 11 miles too much to the southward. But as he had no opportunity of getting an observation near it and trusted to his ship's run, he might easily make a mistake of 11 miles. Mr. Edgar, in his chart, has placed it very near the truth. According to good observations taken of the sun and moon on board both ships a short time before we made the land and brought forward by the ship's run, we agreed in a mile with the longitude, which Captain Cook has laid the southwest point down. It may not be amiss to observe that all ships coming into this harbour ought to keep the shore of Montague Island on board as close as they can. For if they get off into the channel and over towards the west shore, they will soon find 60, 70 and 80 fathoms of water, and that depth too close in shore for anchoring. Towards one o'clock, an appearance of a good bay or harbour presented itself on the Montague Island shore, towards which I directed my course. The bay is situated five or six leagues within the southwest point of Montague Island and nearly abreast on the island that forms the west side of the channel. At two o'clock, the whale boat was sent to sound and examine the bay. In the space of an hour, she returned, and the officer who was in her reported that the ships could ride in it with safety. On this, I hauled in for it and anchored at four o'clock in twenty fathoms of water over a muddy bottom. We moored with the best bower in twenty-one fathoms over the same bottom. In running into the bay just off the south point, we had seven and eight fathoms of water over a bottom of black mud and sand. This bank appeared to run nearly across the mouth of the bay, and after passing it, we deepened the water to 21 fathoms in which depth we anchored. When moored, the south point of the bay bore southwest by south two miles and a half, and the north point north-northwest half west two miles distant, our distance from the nearest shore about one mile. On looking around the bay, I thought I could perceive it to take a short turn around a point nearly at the bottom, on which I went accompanied by Captain Dixon to examine it. We carried good and regular soundings to the said point and found that a ship could lie in four and a half and five fathoms of water, with the south point of the bay just shut in with this point at about a cable's length from the shore. The inner point may be taken close on board, as it is quite bold. The bottom of the bay is flat. Before I left the ship, we were visited by five canoes, some with one man in them and others with two but I was rather surprised to find that they had not the skin of any animal among them. They had many beads of various sorts, particularly some small green and some yellow ones, which they seemed to value very much, and I observed they were of the same kind as those we saw in Cook's River last summer. Our visitors frequently repeated the word walker, pointing at the same time up the sound. 
Never having heard the natives make use of this word before, either at this place or in Cook's River, I was induced to think that they had been taught the word by some visitors, who had recently been at Nootka, and I was presently convinced that there had lately been some people trading with them. For on my asking after the sea otter skins, I was given to understand that they had sold all their skins to a supposed Mr. Malloy, who I could understand had left the sound. This piece of information, however incorrect it might be, gave me small hopes of our being able to do anything in Prince William Sound. However, I thought it was but right to try for it, and only to wait in this place for an opportunity of proceeding up. Towards evening our visitors left us and paddled out of the bay after stealing several fishing lines that were hanging overboard. The only wind to which this bay is exposed is at southwest, and with that wind a vessel may run before it into the harbour, leaving the north point on the larboard hand. After hauling close round and bringing that point on with the south point of the bay, a ship may anchor and run a hawser to the trees to steady with. In which situation there are four and a half and five fathoms water over a soft muddy bottom. On the 25th, we got some water off for present use and the seine was hauled, but without success. Part of the ship's company were sent ashore on the 26th to gather shellfish, which were the only refreshment this place was known to afford. The only space to walk in was along the beach, the adjacent country being entirely covered with snow. There were plenty of wild geese and ducks about, but so very shy that we could not get within shot of them. In a walk I took along the beach, I saw the remains of two Indian huts and a quantity of wood that had been cut down with edge tools. The cuts in the wood were so large and fair as to convince me they were made by tools of a different kind to those used by the Indians. I therefore concluded that the Russians had visited this place the last autumn, not supposing that the people of any other nation had been in these seas. No Indians coming near us, I determined to leave this bay the first opportunity. Accordingly, at four o'clock in the morning of the 27th, having a light breeze from the south-southwest, we unmoored and hove short ready for getting out of the bay and proceeding up the sound. But about five, the weather grew very thick and the wind shifted to the northeast, which induced me to veer away and steady the ship with the kedge. During the 28th, we had light variable winds with calms by turns, but next morning at three o'clock, the weather again grew favourable, and a breeze springing up at east, we unmoored the ship, weighed, and sailed out of the bay. I was in hopes that after getting out, we should take the flood tide and be enabled to get fair a few leagues up the channel, but we found the tide very faint and the wind directly against us. Indeed, I have reason to think that the flood tide hardly ever has any strength in this situation, but the ebb is much stronger, owing to the great freshets that are always running out. At seven o'clock, finding we got no ground, we bore up and ran into the bay again, and anchored nearly in our former situation. Immediately after anchoring I set off, accompanied by Captain Dixon in his whaleboat, in quest of Indians, and to examine the coast of Montague Island up towards the Sound. As we rowed along, we found a bold shore with anchorage in thirty fathoms water, over a muddy bottom, about a mile from the land. After rowing about five leagues from the ships, we came to a deep wide bay where vessels may safely ride at anchor, in from twenty to ten fathoms water over a muddy bottom. In ten fathoms the situation is near the bottom of the bay and about half a mile from the shore, but the best anchorage seems to be nearest the south side and no nearer the land than in ten or twelve fathoms water. We landed on the north shore and walked a considerable distance, but could not perceive the least trace of any inhabitants. While the people were dressing some pork and mussels for dinner, I went in my whale boat round the north point of the bay and could perceive the coast of this island towards Prince William's Sound for six or seven leagues, without any appearance of a harbour or even a safe bay. I returned into the bay again, and after taking some refreshment we proceeded towards the ships, where we arrived about nine o'clock without seeing any Indians during the whole day. Having still light variable winds, chiefly from the northward, I sent the whale boat in the morning of the 30th to sound from the ship across the channel and along the coast of an island which makes the west side of the channel. The weather was very fine and pleasant, but still no Indians came near us. Towards evening the boat returned from sounding. They had, very soon after quitting the bay, fifty and sixty fathoms water over a muddy bottom, and in the mid-channel, no ground, with all their line, which was seventy fathoms. 
Close over to the island, there were 40 and 50 fathoms water, within a cable's length of the rocks and beach, and they carried the same kind of soundings as far as the north extreme of the island, when, the day being far advanced, they sounded no further. Short round this north point, in the direction of northwest and west-northwest, the officer who went in the boat informed me was a deep sound, in which were the appearances of good harbours. As I was desirous of examining every place where there was a probability of meeting with inhabitants, I set off early the next morning with the whaleboats, accompanied by Captain Dixon, to look into this sound. But, previous to our setting off, I left orders with Mr. M. Leod to move the ships up the channel as far as the Green Isles, if an opportunity offered, and there to wait my return. By ten o'clock, we got round the north point of the island, which I distinguished by the name of Mulgrave Island, and found the land take a quick turn to the west and west-northwest. We rode into the sound about eight or ten leagues, and the land to the westward and southward of us appeared like islands lying between us and the sea. To the northward also, the land appeared detached and in islands, and the high land to the northwest was certainly those mountains which from Cook's River are seen to the east and northeast. During this excursion we saw neither inhabitants, huts, nor the least traces of any, although it appeared a very eligible situation, being very near the seaside and well sheltered from the inclemency of the weather. Towards noon we rowed into and landed in a small cove where we took some refreshment. Shortly afterwards I observed the clouds to rise from the southwest, and being anxious to join my ship and proceed up the sound with the first favourable wind, we set off towards them. After getting out of the sound, we found a fresh breeze from the south ward, with which we stretched over for Montague Island with sails and oars, and about eight o'clock in the evening saw the ships lying in the bay examined by us on the 29th of April, and which was named Hannings Bay, after the worthy family of the Hannings, who are strenuous supporters of our present voyage. We got on board about ten o'clock, where I found everything in good order. My first mate informed me that about four hours after we left the ship, a breeze began to rise up from the southwest, of which, agreeably to my order, he took advantage and proceeded thus far where he anchored, in consequence of the winds failing and the ebb tide making down. I found the ships in a very good situation in the bay, riding by their bowers in twenty-one fathoms water over a muddy bottom, and steadied with their kedges. The southernmost point of the bay bore south-southwest, half-west three miles, the north point north, half-east one mile, and the bottom of the bay east by south one mile and a half distant. During the night we had light variable winds with calms by turns, but at nine o'clock the next morning, a fine little breeze springing up from the westward, we weighed and stood out of Hannings Bay, and after clearing the north point of it, stood up the channel towards Prince William Sound. At noon, I sent the whaleboat ahead, and in shore, to sound, and the ships ran along shore about one mile and a half distant from Montague Island. In forty fathoms water, the whaleboat carried from thirty to thirty-five fathoms water over a muddy bottom. The wind growing scant, I ordered the whaleboat ahead to tow the ship. About two o'clock, a fine breeze came on from the south-southwest, with which we continued running up the channel, still having soundings from thirty-five to twenty fathoms water over a muddy bottom, until we drew near the green islands, when the water shoaled, and we frequently had seven and eight fathoms over a rocky and sometimes a shelly bottom. At six o'clock, we passed three beds of kelp, which we avoided. As it was near them, we had the shoal water, and at this time it was dead low water. After running two or three leagues above these shoals on the Montague side, there appeared several small islands situated near the shore, and some rocks, which are covered at high water, lying to the northward of them, and about two miles from the shore stretching along nearly as high as the upper end of Montague land. However, night coming on, and there appearing a good channel between the two westernmost rocks, with a probability of finding good anchorage within them, and the place very likely to be well ease I was induced by these circumstances to push in. Accordingly, I sent the whaleboat ahead to sound, and we carried in from seventeen to twelve fathoms water, until we got some distance within the rocks. The water then, as we approached the shore, began to shoal very quickly, and we came to anchor in ten fathoms over a bottom of black sand. Presently afterwards, observing a patch of kelp at a very small distance from the ship, 
I sent a boat to sound on it, and they found only three fathoms water over a rocky bottom. The shoal was about a ship's length from east to west, and nearly the same breadth, with nine or ten fathoms water all round it. As our present station was by no means a safe one, I went in the whaleboat to sound beyond a point that lay to the southward, round which promised good shelter. Immediately on passing the shoal just mentioned, I found the water to deepen as we rowed towards the point from ten to twenty-two fathoms over a muddy bottom. After finding safe anchorage for the ships, I went on board, got underway directly, and ran in round the point, whence we anchored in twenty-one fathoms, water over a muddy bottom, and moored, with the stream anchor to the northeast in fourteen fathoms. When moored, a small island, forming the southernmost part of the bay, bore southwest half a mile. The northernmost point of the bay, northwest three quarters north, three miles and a half, and the bottom of the bay, northeast by east, two miles distant. The westernmost of the two rocks that we passed in between was just to be seen above water and bore west three quarters south more than a mile distant, and the easternmost rock was covered, it being then about two-thirds flood. It would not be prudent for any ship to run through this passage in thick weather, but when the weather is clear, it is tolerably safe with a good lookout, the lead going and keeping nearly in the mid-channel. Early the next morning the carpenter was sent ashore to cut down some trees for sawing into plank, and I went myself up the bay to sound and examine it. I found a most excellent port landlocked, with seven fathoms water over a muddy bottom, about one cable's length from the nearest shore. But to my great surprise, I could not meet with a single Indian, or the least traces of any having been there recently, although the place seemed very likely to be inhabited, so that, finding my search fruitless, I returned on board. In the afternoon, the longboat was hoisted out, and a party was employed in fitting her for a trading expedition up the Sound. About four o'clock in the morning of the 4th, the wind blowing fresh from the northwest, with an increasing sea, which caused the ships to ride heavy, I came to the resolution of running into the harbour. Accordingly, we unmoored and got under way. But soon after getting within the first point, the wind failed us, and we were obliged to warp in. In heaving up our stream anchor, the stock broke close to the shank, and as it was an iron stock, the anchor was rendered useless. This accident was likely to prove a very unlucky one, as I had spared Captain Dixon an anchor in the room of one which he lost at Atui, so that I now had not a small one to steady the ship with, except a kedge, which would not hold with the least wind. By three o'clock, having warped the ship into a good berth, we anchored with the best bower in seven and a half fathoms water over a muddy bottom and moored with a hawser made fast to the north shore. When moored, we lay in five fathoms at low water. The people were employed in getting my longboat and the whaleboat belonging to each ship ready for going up the sound on a trading expedition, under the direction of Captain Dixon, and in the meantime I proposed staying with the ships, in order to have them hauled on shore for the purpose of cleaning and paying their bottoms. We could also fill our water and do many other necessary works, this harbour being a very convenient one for all our various employments. Next morning at daylight, the boats set out on their expedition, and by five o'clock were out of sight clear of the harbour. Our various operations now began. I sent a large party to clear away the stones on a part of the beach, where I intended to lay the ship. At ten o'clock, we began to haul her in, and by noon she was placed. Some hands were employed in cutting pine branches to bream with. The cooper was sent ashore with two assistants to brew spruce beer and others were busy in the hold. In the afternoon, the starboard side of the ship was cleaned and paid with a coat of tar, chalk and train oil, well mixed together. The sheathing had worn thin in some places, but not so much as I could have expected. When last at the Sandwich Islands, I bought a double canoe, which was now fitted up, and I sent her with two of the people into an adjacent creek to catch crabs and pick mussels. They being the only refreshment, the decoction of spruce accepted in our power to obtain, the Seine had been hauled repeatedly, but without success. Towards noon, I had the pleasure of seeing an Indian come into the harbour in a single canoe. He presently came alongside, but brought nothing to barter except a little porpoise blubber, which he seemed to consider as a dainty. I made our visitor a present which pleased him very much, and at the same time endeavoured to make him comprehend what kind of trade we wanted. 
He seemed to understand me and left the ship, well satisfied with his reception, so that I had hopes he would bring others to us with some trade. Great numbers of wild geese and ducks were flying about, but they appeared very shy. Indeed, I did not choose to fire at them, fearing that the report of firearms might prevent any Indians from coming into the harbour. By noon on the 7th, the larboard side of the ship was finished, and at high water we attempted to heave her off, but she did not float, on which I ordered some salt water that we had under the cables in the main hold to be started to lighten her against the night tide, being pretty certain of her floating then as I had observed the night tides to be considerably higher than those in the daytime. During this time, the people were all busily employed in watering and wooding, both of which being found close to the beach made it very convenient, and the Cooper Brewing Spruce Beer to a puncheon of beer three gallons and a half of molasses were added. It was afterwards worked with prepared yeast and we succeeded in the first brewing, which is not generally the case. Next morning at three o'clock, being high water and a high tide, we hove the ship off and laid her in her former station. The Queen Charlotte took our place on the beach, and as the tide fell they began cleaning and breaming. Her sheathing was somewhat worm-eaten, but everything else in good order. Captain Dixon was apprehensive that a part of her false keel was knocked off by a shock they received at sea, which was supposed to be against a whale, but I found all secure. In the forenoon of the 8th, we were visited by three of the natives in two canoes, but they brought nothing to sell except two river otter skins and two seal skins, which I bought and made them a present besides, so that they went away highly satisfied. These Indians mentioned the word avutka very frequently, and every time it was repeated, they pointed up the sound. They also mentioned the name of Thomas Malloy. I found they were acquainted with the use of firearms, and I rather suppose they have gained that knowledge from the Russians. From several circumstances, I was inclined to think that our late visitors belonged to the party we saw in the first harbour we anchored in early in the morning of the 10th, Captain Dixon returned with the boats from Snug Corner Cove. During this excursion they had purchased about 36 sea otter skins of different qualities and a few other furs. The chief part were procured near Kapahinchin Brooker to which place they first went and afterwards proceeded towards Snug Corner Cove. As the Indians gave them to understand there was a vessel in that neighbourhood, the natives spoke several English words very plainly and pointed out to Captain Dixon the place where this vessel lay. In consequence of this information, he set off, attended by some of the Indians in their canoes, to the place they directed him to, and in the evening of the 8th arrived on board. He found her to be the Snow Nootka, Captain John Mears, from Bengal. Captain Mears had left that place in March 1786 and arrived in Prince William Sound sometime in October, where he wintered and had buried a great part of his ship's company who died of the scurvy and the survivors were in a very weak, sickly state. Captain Dixon brought me a letter from Captain Mears, in which he pointed out his wants and his distressing situation, most earnestly begging my assistance. As without it, he despaired of getting his vessel from her present station. I read this letter with great concern and determined to give them every assistance in my power whenever an opportunity offered of conveying it to them. Now, it has already been observed that the Nootka wintered in Prince William's Sound. Another vessel belonging to the same owners left it just before the Nootka's arrival. Both these ships, I learned from Captain Dixon, had given such great prices in barter for skins that the value of our cargo was greatly reduced. The only articles the natives would even look at were green and red beads and unwrought iron in pieces nearly two feet long. But hatchets, hoes, saws, adzes, brass pans, pewter basins and tin kettles would not be taken in barter even for fish, so that all we could depend on in our trade with the natives at this place was pieces of iron and a few beads. I therefore ordered a tent to be erected on shore for the armourers, and they were busily employed in working up iron into toes about 18 inches long, and spearheads nearly two feet in length, these being articles the Indians were very fond of. About eight o'clock being on shore giving directions about the armourer's tent, I was informed from the ship that they saw a boat about the entrance of the bay, plying into the harbour. Conjecturing it to be the Nootkas, I went immediately on board and sent my whaleboat out to her assistance. At ten o'clock, 
My boat returned with the Nautka's longboat in tow. Their assistance was very acceptable, for the longboat's crew were almost worn out with wet and cold and were in a very weak condition. Captain Mears came in the boat himself, and from him I received some further account of their distressing situation during the winter. And indeed it must have been a very dreadful one, for before the winter broke up, the captain and a Mr. Ross, his chief matey, were the only two persons capable of dragging the dead bodies from the ship over the ice and burying them in the snow on shore. Nay, there was not a single person on board who was not deeply affected with the scurvy. I learned from Captain Mears that on his arrival in the Sound, he could not for a long time purchase one single skin. They being all disposed of to his consort, the Sea Otter, commanded by a Mr. Tipping, who, as well as himself, was a lieutenant in the English Navy. Both these ships had traded with unwrought iron and small transparent beads, the same kind as those we saw amongst the natives in Cook's Bay, who no doubt had got them from Captain Tipping, as he was in the Sound at the very time we were in Cook's River. Captain Mears also informed me that several other ships have at different times been trading on the coast from India and China, a circumstance that we had no idea of at the time we left England, and in all probability will hurt our traffic so much that instead of 4,000 sea otter skins, which I at one time expected to procure, I shall be very happy if in the course of the season we can purchase a thousand between both ships. I understand that he expected a ship to arrive at King George's Sound early in June next. It therefore became necessary that the King George and Queen Charlotte should separate, and Captain Dixon and myself agreed for the Queen Charlotte to push on directly for King George's Sound in order to get the start of that vessel if possible, and the King George to remain in and about Prince William's Sound. I also resolved to dispatch my longboat on a trading expedition to Cook's River under the direction of Mr. Hayward, my third mate, and Mr. Hill with six good and trusty men, in whom I could place entire confidence. I appointed Hinchinbrukikova as a place of rendezvous for the longboat, and for her to be with me by the 20th of June. If she did not join me by that time, I was to wait for her till the 20th of July, but no longer. Afterwards, I directed Mr. Hayward to procure a passage for himself and the people to China from this sound, if he should find any ship in it bound that way. If not, to proceed immediately to Kodiak and procure a passage to Europe by way of Asia. Towards evening, the wind blew strong and in squalls, as we were riding chiefly by the shore hawser, I was afraid of it parting, therefore let the small bower go underfoot. But next morning, the weather growing moderate, it was hove up again. All hands were busily employed in wooding, watering, brewing and working in the hold. The Queen Charlotte, having finished cleaning, breaming and paying, hauled off the beach into her former station. In the afternoon, we completed our water, having filled forty butts, two brandy pieces, and nineteen puncheons. At five o'clock Captain Mears took leave of us and proceeded on towards his ship with as many refreshments of various kinds as the boat could well carry. We spared him some flour, loaf sugar, molasses, sandwich island pork, gin, brandy and cheese, and two good seamen to assist in navigating his ship to China, at which place he was to return them. Their names were George Willis and Thomas Dixon, both of whom went on board the Nootka, agreeably to their own requests, and not from any entreaty whatever. Besides the above articles, I furnished Captain Mears with a hundred hundred and fifty coconuts, which I had great hopes would help to recover his people. Most of our necessary business being now completed, the armourer's forges and the brewing utensils were brought on board, and everything was got in readiness for sailing. At six o'clock in the afternoon, the longboat set off for Cook's River, her crew in good spirits and well found for a six weeks cruise. In the evening, four canoes came alongside, but they brought no trade, and after staying a short time, paddled back for the shore. In the afternoon of the 13th, we were visited by two large Indian boats, containing about 40 men, women and children. A number of small canoes attended them. They brought only two very indifferent skins and a few fish, which I bought and made their chief, whose name I understood was Shinawa, a handsome present. Shinawa, I found, was chief of the most powerful tribe in the Sound. They were audacious thieves, and, what was very remarkable, even the little boys were furnished with small hooked sticks for the purpose of picking pockets. Our visitors remained about the ship until near six o'clock, when they left us and went out of the harbour. 
At this time, the Queen Charlotte's boat was about two miles outside the harbour with a fishing party, and the Indian boats immediately joined her. Being rather uneasy for fear of their pillaging the boat, I kept a lookout on them with my glass and presently perceived a struggle between the two parties. On this, I immediately set off in my whaleboat, she being always ready armed, and leaving directions with my mate to follow in the yawl, pushed out towards them with all speed. The Indians no sooner the boat rounded the point and then they took to their paddles and went off as fast as they were able. I rowed out and joined the Charlotte's boat and found the Indians had taken away all their fishing lines and were just forcing their anchor out of the boat when I hove in sight. On inquiry, I found Captain Dixon's people had no firearms in the boat, which was very unlucky, as even the sight of a musket would prevent the Indians from attempting any violence. So thoroughly have the Russians taught them, by experience, the fatal effects of firearms. Captain Mears told me, and he had his information from the Russians, whom he saw at Kodiak, where he touched on his way hither, that a party of them, since our visit in the Resolution, had wintered in the Sound, and, according to their description of the place, in the very harbour we now were at anchor in, where they had a battle with the natives who were beaten off, but seven Russians lost their lives in the skirmish. Captain Mears likewise touched at Unalaska, and proceeding from there along the coast, he passed the Shumagin Islands. When he came as far as what Captain Cook calls Whitsunday Bay, he mistook it for the entrance into Cook's River, and finding an opening, he stood into it and did not realise his mistake for some time. At length, meeting with some Russians, they informed him that the strait he then was in led into Cook's River, and that all the land between the Isle St. Hermogenes and the strait was the island of Kodiak. On receiving this information, Captain Mears stood on and got into Cook's River near Smoky Bay, but was prevented by bad weather from proceeding much further. During his short stay in the river, he procured only two sea otter skins, the natives about Cape Douglas and Mount St. Augustine being in the Russian interest. Everything being now ready for sea, we waited anchor at daylight in the morning of the 14th, and with a light breeze from the northeast, proceeded out of the harbour, and after getting out of the bay, hauled up towards Prince William's Sound. During the former part of the day, we had light variable winds, so that the boats were sent ahead to tow the ship. At three in the afternoon, a fine breeze came on from the southwest, with which we stood over for Hinchinbrook Cove. At six o'clock, I sent my whaleboat on board for Captain Dixon, and this appearing a good opportunity for his getting out of the sound, we determined on separating and each ship to adopt the plan that has already been mentioned. Soon afterward, Captain Dixon returned on board and we took leave of each other. The Queen Charlotte shaped her course out of the sound and I bent mine for Hinchinbrook Cove. At nine o'clock, the southwest breeze failed us and we had light winds about northeast, right down the cove. At that time, we were close to some rocks that lie at the entrance and in 50 fathoms of water, and upon this, the boats were sent ahead and we stood over for the south shore of the cove. The wind continued scant all night and that little was directly against us so that we could barely hold our own. I would have anchored within half a mile of the shore but we had near 50 fathoms of water, so that it was necessary to keep underway and wait for a breeze. And at six o'clock next morning, a fine breeze sprung up from the south-southwest, with which we ran up. And observing a point well up in an arm of the cove that promised good shelter around it, I sent the whaleboat to examine and found the place. And following with the ship, I presently saw that there was an excellent harbour around the point, therefore stood in and at eight o'clock came to anchor with the best bower in seven fathoms of water over a muddy bottom and moored with the small bower. A Voyage Round the World, but more particularly to the northwest coast of America by Captain Nathaniel Portlock. Chapter 11. Indians visit the ship with sea otter skins. Boats sent on a trading expedition plundered by the Indians, return of the boats, arrival of the Nootka, assist in getting her ready for sea, long boat sent to Cook's River, departure of the Nootka, long boats return, sent a second time, visited by different tribes of Indians, various employments carried on, abundance of salmon, herring and crabs, arrival of the long boat, departure from Port Etches, though our situation was a very eligible one. 
I found on sounding around the ship that we could have a still better sea by lying higher up the harbour. I therefore determined to shift about a cable's length further in. But the people being greatly fatigued by towing the vessel all the preceding night, I deferred my design for the present and gave them leave to take some rest. In the course of the day, several canoes came alongside, from whom I purchased ten or twelve good sea otter skins. Several parts of the harbour appearing likely to afford some fish, we hauled the seine frequently, but met with no success. In the morning of the 16th, we hove up the small bower, and after hauling the ship within shore of the best bower, let it go again in five fathoms water. Over a muddy bottom, we moored the ship, head and stern. When moored, we had the sound open to the southwest between two points of land, about half a point of the compass, through which face we could see anything that passed in or out of the sound by Cape Hinchinbrook Passage. The land all around us had a dreary appearance, being covered with snow five or six feet deep, quite down to high watermark, so that the only space where we could walk was on the beach after the tide had fallen. At the head of the harbour were two fine freshwater rivulets, likely to produce plenty of salmon at a proper season. A few of the natives came alongside with some good sea otter skins and a small quantity of fish, for which we were obliged to pay extravagantly. In the morning of the 18th, I went in the whaleboat to examine an arm trending to the eastward above our present harbour. After passing the upper point, I found the arm soon terminated in a flat shore, with shoal water at some distance from the head of it. I then rowed along the north shore and discovered an arm leading in between two points, not more than a quarter of a mile distant from each other. I stood in for the entrance and had five and six fathoms of water over a muddy bottom between the two points. The passage now widened considerably and branched out in opposite directions, one arm leading nearly southwest and the other northeast. I went up the southwest arm and carried five and six fathoms of water over a muddy bottom for more than two miles. It then grew flat at a considerable distance from the head. After sounding this arm, I returned with an intention of sounding the other, but on getting a sight of the ship, I observed the ensign flying, which was a signal for canoes being alongside. I therefore deferred sounding and rowed immediately for the ship, where I arrived about noon and purchased a few good skins from the natives. On my inquiring for salmon, they gave me to understand that there was none at present, but that when the snow melted from the hills, there would be plenty. As the articles we had to barter with did not seem to be held in great estimation, I determined to dispatch the whaleboat and yawl under the direction of Mr. Crosselman, the second mate, and Mr. Bryant, on board the Nootka, to request of Captain Mears some articles of trade which I wanted and knew he could well spare. At the same time, they were to trade with the natives up the sound if any opportunity offered. I intended to have gone myself, or sent Mr. MacLeod on this business, but he had been so frequently laid up with a complaint in the bladder that I could neither trust him with the care of the ship for any length of time, nor send him out with the boats, for fear of his complaint returning at a time when he might be particularly wanted. In the forenoon, we had fresh gales from the eastward, but the weather growing moderate about two o'clock, I sent the boats off to proceed up the sound. We now had no boat left by the ship, nor any other way of getting ashore, but in the Sandwich Island canoe. And she being very dangerous for anyone who did not understand how to manage her, it became necessary to contrive some safer kind of conveyance. Accordingly, the carpenter, assisted by the cooper and three other hands, began to build a punt of twelve feet long, six feet wide, and about three feet deep. This plan was first suggested by the carpenter, and I approved of it very much, as the punt could not fail to be useful in wooding and watering whilst the boats were absent. Next morning, several canoes came alongside with a trading party. They brought thirteen very good sea otter skins and a few indifferent ones. The harbour affording very fine crabs and mussels, I sent a number of the people to procure some, and they returned in the evening with a good quantity of each. The weather being moderate, our operations on shore went briskly forward, one party was employed in cutting wood, another in sewing plank, and the carpenter, with his assistants, was busy about the punt. In the afternoon of the 22nd, two canoes visited us and brought a few good skins. If I understood them right, the adjacent country was called Taklatimuke, and that it was principally inhabited by a tribe, 
the name of whose chief was Nutuk, and the name of another chief belonging to the same tribe was Kucha. Three canoes belonging to Nutuk's tribe came to the ship on the 23rd, but brought nothing to sell except a few halibut. Indeed, most of the sea otter skins we have procured since our arrival here were green and recently taken from the animal, so that we were obliged to stretch and dress them ourselves. On the 24th, we had strong gales from the east by south with rain, which prevented any canoes from coming near us. In the afternoon, the carpenter and his party launched the punt and came on board in her. In the forenoon of the 25th, the whale boat returned from the sound. They had parted with the yawl just off the north point of the bay. Mr. Crosselman brought none of the things I sent for to the Nootka except a compass. The other articles, Captain Mears assured me I should have on his, joining me near Cape Hinchinbrook, which he proposed doing as soon as possible. In the forenoon of the 26th, we had a very heavy gale of wind from the eastward, and the yawl not making her appearance, it gave me great uneasiness, as her crew were not only quite exposed to the weather, but might probably be driven out of the sound and all perish. Neither could I send the whale boat to look for and assist them without running a great risk of losing her crew likewise. At six o'clock, the gale increasing to a violent degree, with constant rain and sleet, the top gallant masts were got down upon deck, and the top masts struck close to the rigging. The wind continued blowing very strong till six o'clock in the afternoon of the 27th, when the weather growing rather moderate, I dispatched the whale boat in search of the yawl, with proper refreshments for her crew, if they were fortunate enough to meet with her. At nine o'clock, both boats came alongside, and the yawl's crew were in a much better state than I expected to see them, though they must have suffered very much. The whale boat met the yawl at the entrance of the bay, making an effort to get in. But it must have been a fruitless one, had they not met and taken them in tow, for the boats were scarcely alongside before it began to blow as violently as before. From this to the 30th, the weather was so strong that our operations on shore were greatly retarded, and scarcely any business was carried on. During this interval, we had only three canoes came alongside, with cod and halibut, sufficient to serve the ship's company for one day and a few fairly good sea otter skins. On the 30th, the weather growing moderate, the people were sent ashore to cut wood and bring off water for present use. On the 4th of June, the weather appearing settled, I dispatched the whaleboat and yawl on a trading expedition in the direction of Mr. Crosselman and Bryant. I at first intended to have sent them round Cape Hinchinbrook and on toward Kayes Island, but on second consideration, I judged it would answer my purpose best to send them up an opening situated between that we lay in and Snug Corner Cove, by which means they would stand a chance of obtaining part of the trade intended for the Nootka, but by going on the other side they were likely to meet only with Indians coming to the King George. In the evening, I sent a few hands in the canoe to procure some crabs, and in two hours they returned with a good quantity of fine ones. Just as night came on, a few Indians came alongside, bringing some halibut and cod, but no furs. Early the next morning, I sent the carpenter with a party of men over to the north shore to cut some sticks for spare topmasts, a mizen mast, and a main yard. Another party was employed in sawing into boards, the Cooper Brewing Spruce Beer and the remainder of the ship's company were clearing the gun room and airing the sails, some of which had gotten wet during the late bad weather. On the 6th, the weather being fine, I sent the boatswain with four of the people to dig a piece of ground for a garden on a small island situated at the entrance of the cove, which I named Garden Island. After the ground was ready, we sowed a variety of seeds in it, such as cabbage, onion, scotch kale, radish, savoy, purslane, thyme, celery, spinach, cauliflower, turnip, mustard, rape and cress, with peas, beans, French beans and lettuce, besides oats and barley. The soil being tolerably good, it would be rather extraordinary if, among so great a variety, nothing should come to perfection. In the afternoon of the 7th, a small open canoe with five Indians in it came alongside from whom I bought two good sea otter skins and a large quantity of fine cod. At ten o'clock in the evening, the whale boat and yawl returned from their expedition with a few very good skins, which they purchased from a chief named Shina Awa, whom I conjecture to be the same person that paid us a visit at Montague Island. I intended them for a longer trip, 
but it seems they unluckily got into a large flat bay where the boats grounded, and before they could extricate themselves from the shoals, the tide ebbed and left them dry for near two miles around. Shinawa and his tribe, which consisted of near 200 men, saw their situation and paid them a visit, most of them armed with spears and knives. The boat's crews at first were greatly alarmed at their situation, but their fears subsided when they found out that plunder was what the Indians wanted. They endeavoured to prevent this, but at the same time kept their plunderers in good temper, which was the most prudent method the people could possibly have taken. For had they acted in any other manner, and strive to have prevented them from stealing by force of arms, not a man in either boat could have escaped the vengeance of their numerous opponents. This plundering party obtained an excellent booty in their own estimation. They stole most of the trading articles, two muskets, two pistols, and some of the people's clothes, and what old Shenawa seemed to regard as a thing of inestimable value was Mr. Crosselman's quadrant, which he seized together with his ephemeris and requisite tables. It was at this time that they purchased the skins I have just mentioned, Shinawa's people affecting to traffic, as a sort of introduction to their depredations. During this short expedition, our people had an opportunity of seeing that the land on which Cape Hinchinbrook is situated is an island. In the afternoon of the 9th, being at Garden Island, I saw the Nootka turning in towards the port, and immediately sent the whale boat and yawl to her assistance. At seven o'clock, she anchored just outside the King George. Two canoes came alongside in the morning of the 10th, with only one sea otter skin. The Indians appeared rather shy on seeing the Nootka, which I cannot account for in any other way than their having fired at some of the natives just before they left Sutherland's Cove, and, as I was given to understand, wounded one of them. In the forenoon, Captain Mears came on board the King George and requested me to send my carpenter on board his vessel to examine her masts, pumps and sides, which request I complied with, although he had much work to do on the ship's account. Towards evening, I went ashore to visit our different parties at work and had an account from the carpenter of the situation he found the Nootka in. Her masts and yards were in good order, but the sides in many parts were dangerously open and her pumps in a very bad condition, not having a spear or lower box that would fit either pump nor even a pump brake fit to work with. The next day, Captain Mears requested me to let my carpenter work on board the Nootka for a few days in order to put her in a condition fit for sea, which I readily complied with, and thinking the leaks in her sides and the pumps the most material objects, I recommended him to have them put in order first. The carpenter accordingly went on board and presently sent me word that they had no oakum. On this, I gave him directions to make use of our own, and by the time he had finished, he expended near 200 weight. The pump gear that needed armourer's work was sent on board the King George, and I set the armourer to work on it immediately. I also sent a party ashore to cut wood for the Nootka, and the punt was employed in carrying it on board, and whenever the weather permitted, the cooper was employed in making spruce essence for her use. In the forenoon, the longboat arrived from Cook's River and had met with tolerable success, Messrs Hayward and Hill assuring me that much more could be done in another trip. As soon as the boat was cleared, I ordered her to be fitted out with provisions and an assortment of trade for a second expedition. Mr. Hayward informed me that on their arrival in Cook's River, soon after getting above Point Bead, they fell in with a party of Kodiak Indians, who they supposed were hunting on account of the Russians. But they saw none of the Russian party, and the inhabitants of Cook's River behaved in a very friendly manner. The longboat, being provided with provisions and articles for trade, sailed again for Cook's River early in the morning of the 10th, with positive orders to return by the 20th July, and the same crew that went in her the first trip were volunteers to go a second time. In the forenoon we saw several canoes, one of which went alongside the Nootka, but the rest kept at a distance, seeming afraid to come near. Our seamen and artificers were engaged in various employments for the Nootka till the 15th, when a very strong gale coming on from the eastward with violent gusts of wind from the valleys and constant heavy rain prevented any work from being carried on. During this interval not one canoe appeared in the cove. The weather becoming moderate on the 16th, our people resumed their various employments and by the 17th had put the Nootka in a condition fit for sea. 
Several canoes visited us, bringing a few indifferent skins and some fine halibut. For some time past, the weather had in general been very wet, which affected the health of the sailors very much, and many of them were laid up with fevers and violent colds. The Nootka being ready for sailing, I sent my whaleboat in the morning of the 20th to assist them in getting underway, and at one o'clock she stood out of the cove. Our spruce beer was now in good order, and daily served out to the ship's company, and I had the pleasure to find the sick people get considerably better. The surrounding country now wore a different aspect from what it did on our first arrival. The heavy rains had melted most of the snow, and everything seemed to promise the speedy approach of summer. The surgeon and those people who had lately been ill took a walk on shore on the 20th and gathered a good quantity of watercresses, which they found growing near the freshwater rivulets. We caught plenty of flounders alongside with hook and line. These, with crabs, which were now very fine, proved an excellent change from salt provisions. Some of the people, in fishing alongside for flounders, caught several cod and halibut. On this, I sent the canoe on the 22nd out some distance into the bay to try for them, and they soon returned with a load of fine halibut and cod. This success induced me to send her out frequently with a fishing party, and they caught considerably more than what was sufficient for daily consumption, so that I ordered the remainder to be salted for sea store. In the afternoon, a party of Indians visited us, from whom I bought some good sea otter skins. They pointed towards the southwest and gave me to understand that we might procure plenty of good furs from that quarter. This piece of information determined me to send the boats on another expedition, and in the afternoon of the 24th, I dispatched the whale boat and yawl on a trip to the southwest part of the Sound with provisions for a month and a proper assortment of trade. All the remaining part of the ship's company that could be spared had live given to recreate themselves on shore. Some of them ascended the highest hills in the neighbourhood, on the sides of which they found good quantities of snake root and a variety of flowers in full bloom. About eight o'clock in the evening, I observed two Indian boats and several canoes come into the bay. They all landed on a sandy beach which bore west-southwest from the ship and about three miles and a half distant. Next morning at five o'clock, our new visitors came alongside in one of their large boats. The party consisted of about 25 men, women and children. Their chief appeared to be a well-disposed man, rather low in stature, with a long beard and seemed about 60 years of age. He was entirely disabled on one side, probably by a paralytic stroke. The old man made me a present of a good skin, but had little to sell except a few salmon, which we bought from him. I made the chief, whose name I understood was Tayatuk Telling Nuke, a present and one to each of those who seemed to be of consequence. I also distributed some trinkets among the women and children. Tatuk Telling Nuki gave me to understand that the country he came from was called Chinikok and situated in the southwest part of the Sound. Our new friends stayed alongside during the whole day and went ashore in the evening perfectly well satisfied. I found the whole of this party very friendly and well disposed, and indeed most of those who had visited us were so, particularly the natives belonging to Taklakimute, who I am inclined to think inhabit Comptroller's Bay, and the Shuklamute people, who take up their abode on the north side of Montague Island. I learned from my late visitors that the country where Shinawar and his tribe take up their residence is called Tatiklagmute, that they were the most powerful tribe about the sound, and hated by all their neighbours, with whom they were continually at variance. Old Chenawa, since his plundering of our boats, had never appeared in the harbour, but some of his people sometimes brought us a few sea otter skins, which they had obtained either by plunder or barter, for I understood that his country does not produce any of the sea otter, but they have abundance of river otter. Taklakimute, Shuklamute and Wallamute are the countries that afford the sea otter. This last-mentioned place, from every information I have been able to obtain, is situated considerably beyond Comptroller's Bay to the eastward, and we have seen none of the inhabitants. But the Indians that have traded with us frequently brought skins which they said came from that country, and I always observed that none of those skins were marked, as is the usual custom when they are intended for sale, but made up into cloaks and worn by the people to defend them from the inclemency of the weather.
Shinawa, whose rapacious disposition has already been noticed, whilst the Nootka wintered in Sutherland's Cove, sent frequent messages, intimating that he intended to come and cut them off. These messages, or rather threats, were always delivered to an Indian girl that an officer belonging to the Nootka had purchased on their first arrival in the Sound. This girl made her escape from the Nootka towards the latter part of the winter, and probably gave the Indians an account of her weak and defenceless situation, for there is hardly a doubt from the number of men that Shinawa had with him at the time of the affair with our boats that he then meditated an attack on the Nootka, but very bad weather coming on immediately afterwards probably frustrated his design. The party who were daily sent out to fish for cod and halibut had their hooks and lines often broken by large ground sharks. Several of these were killed, but they were of no use, their livers yielding scarcely any oil. Tatuk telling Nuka paid me a visit on the 26th and was particularly anxious to take one or two of our people with him on shore to spend the night, offering at the same time to leave some of his people on board as hostages till their return. I complied with this singular request and gave two of the people leave to accompany him on shore. He left three of his tribe on board, being desirous to convince me that he intended no harm. Early the next morning, the friendly old chief came on board in one of his boats and brought our people with him. After we had exchanged hostages, I made the old man and his companions some trifling presents, and they went on shore highly pleased. I found that these Indians lodged in temporary huts, composed only of a few sticks and a little bark. The principal part of their food was fish. By way of variety, they ate the inner rind of the pine bark dried. But their greatest luxury was a kind of rockweed, covered with the spawn of some fish or other, of which they gather and eat great quantities. They also eat the inner rind of the angelica and hemlock roots, which, though poisoned to us by constant and habitual use, become to them familiar and serviceable. In hauling the Seine on the 30th, we caught a large quantity of herrings and some salmon. The herrings, though small, were very good, and two hogsheads of them were salted for sea store. Old Tatuk Telingnuku took leave of me on the 1st of July, and with his tribe left the harbour and paddled towards Montague Island. At noon on the 6th, the whaleboat and yawl returned from their expedition without the least success, not having seen a single canoe during their trip. Their route was from our harbour towards Montague Island, and from thence over to the southwest part of the Sound, having my directions, if they found it could be done without much risk, to look into an opening that is supposed to lead from the Sound into Cook's River through the River Turnagain. On getting over on the southwest shore, they met with great quantities of drift ice coming, as they supposed, out of that opening, and at the same time heard a constant jumbling noise resembling the breaking up of ice in a large river. Foggy weather now coming on, the officer who had charge of the boats did not think it prudent to venture in with them, but spent the night near that situation, and the morning being still foggy, he directed his course to the north and came back by Snug Corner Cove, without, as I have before observed, meeting with any Indians whatsoever. Being now convinced that little or nothing could be done by sending the boats on another expedition, and expecting the longboat's return in a few days, after which I intended to get to sea as quickly as possible. I set all hands to work in getting the ship ready. A large party was sent ashore to cut wood, and others were employed about the rigging. We daily caught large quantities of salmon, but the unsettled state of the weather not permitting us to cure them on board, I sent the boats in with a party ashore to build a kind of house to smoke them in. On the 9th, the house was finished, and the boats in with his party were employed in smoking salmon, there was sufficient room to hang 600 fish up conveniently, and seven fires being constantly burning, they were cured very well. In the forenoon, one canoe came alongside with two very good frocks made of sea otter skins. The people gave me to understand that they had been to Wallamute and purchased the frocks at that place, which I had no reason to doubt, as I recollected seeing them about the ship nearly a month before this time, since which they never made their appearance until now. The Seine was frequently hauled on the 11th, and not less than 2,000 salmon were caught at each haul. The weather, however, preventing us from curing them, as well as could have been wished, we kept only a sufficient quantity for present use, and let the rest escape. The salmon were now in such numbers along the shores, that any quantity whatever might be caught with the greatest ease. During the 12th and 13th, the wind blew very strong, and in violent gusts from the eastward, with constant heavy rain, 
which prevented any work from going forward. Towards afternoon on the 14th, the weather grew more moderate, and the people resumed their different employments. In the morning of the 21st, I went in the whale boat into a small bay about three miles from the ship, on the south side of the harbour, where some days before I discovered a quantity of fine watercresses. The weather being tolerably fine, I took the carpenter, who had lately been very ill, and a few others in the boat along with me, so that they might have a walk and receive some refreshment from the watercresses. This little excursion had a wonderfully good effect on everyone. We sat down on the grass and made a hearty dinner of fried pork and salmon, and, by way of salad, had an abundance of watercresses. We likewise gathered a sufficient quantity to serve every person on board. Behind the beach where we landed is a freshwater lake that empties itself into the bay by a small river at the northern part of the beach, in which there was an abundance of salmon. Just above the beach, between the bay and the lake, there was a piece of wild wheat, about 200 yards long and 5 yards wide, growing at least 2 feet high, among which we found the watercresses. This wheat, with proper care, might certainly be made a useful article of food. On the edge of the lake I saw the track of an animal, which greatly resembled that of the moose deer. We returned on board in the evening without seeing any Indians. At 10 o'clock in the morning of the 22nd, the longboat appearing in sight, I sent the whale boat to her assistance, if it should be necessary. At noon she came alongside, and I found all the crew in good health. In this trip, they had experienced a great deal of very bad weather and had not met with such good success as we expected, their purchases being about 40 prime skins and a number of inferior ones. They fell in with numbers of the Kodiak Indians, who always behaved in the most friendly manner, as did all the inhabitants of the river. During this expedition, they were up about a league above Trading Bay, on the opposite shore, where they found good and safe anchorage for shipping, and a greater number of inhabitants than in any other part of the river. Having clear, pleasant weather on the 23rd, the powder was sent to Garden Island to be dried and sifted, and the cooper was employed in repairing the casks which were defective. A party was employed in getting firewood on board, and others in getting the ship ready for sea. In the afternoon of the 24th, our wooding and watering was completed, and everything from the shore was got on board. We lopped off all the branches of the highest tree on Garden Island and fixed a staff about ten feet long at the top, with a wooden vane on it, and near the bottom was inscribed the ship's name, with the year and day of the month. Everything being ready for sea at six o'clock, we unmoored and hove short on the best bower, but it being then calm we could not proceed out of the port. However, at two o'clock the next morning, a breeze sprung up from the eastward, with which we weighed and got under sail, and by four being clear of the cove the boats were hoisted in. A voyage round the world, but more particularly to the northwest coast of America, by Captain Nathaniel Portlock. Chapter 12 Range along the coast of Montague Island, short account of Prince William's Sound, description of the inhabitants, their persons, manners, dress, diseases, ornaments, food, cookery, situation for a settlement, produce weapons, hunting implements, specimen of their language, proceed along the coast, anchor in Port Locks Harbour, intercourse with the natives, long boat sent on a trading expedition, visited by a distant tribe of Indians, on quitting the harbour which obtained the name of Port Etches, I at first intended to stand out of the sound by way of Cape Hinchinbrook, but on opening that passage, the weather looked very thick and dirty to the southeast, so that I came to the resolution of pushing for the passage on the west side of Montague Island. Knowing that with a southerly wind, we might get good and safe anchorage in that passage. But should we be taken on the eastern side of Montague Island, with a southerly or southeast wind, which in general brings dirty weather with it, we probably might be thrown into a very dangerous situation. I, therefore, shaped a course for the north point of Montague Island, with a fresh breeze at east-northeast. At seven o'clock, we passed two bays situated on the northeast point of the island both of which are noticed in Mr. Edgar's chart. In the afternoon we had light variable winds inclining to calm, and at four o'clock the bay we first anchored in on coming up this passage bore south half-west, four leagues distant. I was very desirous to make that bay before night came on, as the weather began to look very unsettled. 
but the wind now shifted to south, southwest, which was directly against us. At seven o'clock, the wind freshened and brought with it very thick, rainy weather, so that we could scarcely see the land, though not more than five miles from it. Not liking the appearance of the weather, I stood over for a passage between Foot Island and the land to the westward of it. Through this passage, our longboat had generally sailed in going to and returning from Cook's River, and they had named it the Prince of Wales's Passage. As Mr. Haywood informed me there was good anchorage in it, I was very desirous of getting in before worse weather came on. Therefore, with a fresh breeze from the south-southwest, I stood directly for it, but on opening the passage at eight o'clock, I found the wind blowing directly down it, and a strong tide setting against us, so that we were obliged to spend the night in plying between Montague and Foot Island. We plied occasionally until noon on the 26th, when a light breeze coming on from the northward, we stood down the channel. At four o'clock, the wind hauled round to the southwest. Hannings Bay at that time being under our lee, we bore up and ran for it, and at seven o'clock came to anchor in that bay in sixteen fathoms water over a bottom of coarse sand. We weighed anchor again at eight o'clock the next morning, and the wind being light the boats were sent ahead to tow the ship. At noon a fresh breeze came on from the south-southwest, which being directly against us we stood in again, and at one o'clock came to anchor near our former situation. There being no probability of our getting out to sea that afternoon, I went ashore, accompanied by Messrs Hayward, Hill and Bryant, in the whaleboat and yawl, and near a freshwater creek which lies in the southern part of the bay, we hauled the seine and caught a quantity of salmon sufficient to load both the boats and afterwards returned on board. During the 28th, the wind continued to blow fresh from the south-southwest, which kept us at anchor, but at seven o'clock the next morning, a light breeze springing up from the northward, we weighed and with the boats ahead towed out of the bay. The wind presently shifted to the southward, which greatly retarded our progress, and at six o'clock in the afternoon, the ebb tide being done, we anchored in the south bay in twenty-four fathoms water, over a bottom of muddy sand. At four o'clock the next morning, a light breeze coming on from the eastward, we weighed and got under sail. At six o'clock, however, the ebb being done, and the wind hauling to the southward, we were obliged to anchor in twenty-one fathoms water, over a black sandy bottom, the south point of the bay bearing south three-quarters west, two miles, and the south point of some low land lying off the entrance into the Prince of Wales's passage, west by south, three leagues distant. In this situation it was low water at 6.45, the moon 15.14, old. Soon after we arrived in the bay, three of our old acquaintances from Cheenicock came alongside in two canoes. They were out on a hunting expedition and had three very good sea otter skins, which I bought and made them a trifling present. At noon, we weighed and came to sail with a light breeze from the south-southeast. At four o'clock, the southwest point of Montague Island bore southeast, two leagues distant. Being then about two miles from shore, we sounded in sixty-three fathoms of water, over a muddy bottom. At seven o'clock, observing that we began to lose ground very fast, although there was a two-knot breeze from the west-southwest, with which we stood to the south-southeast, we prepared for anchoring, and soon afterwards came to in sixty-five fathoms of water, over a muddy bottom, with the kedge and a hawser, the southwest point of Montague Island bearing east three-quarters south, five miles, and the north point of Foot Island north by east, four or five leagues distant. I suppose the flood to have made soon after six o'clock, and come from the southeast half south at the rate of three miles an hour, it set directly towards the entrance of the Prince of Wales's passage. At nine o'clock, the tide made still stronger, and though we had our sail set with a gentle breeze from the northward, the kedge came home. On this we bent another hawser and veered it to the better end, which rode the ship, the tide now going at the rate of three and a half miles an hour. The flood being done at one in the morning, we weighed and came to sail. Presently afterward, a fine breeze sprung up from the west-southwest, with which we steered to the southward. And at four o'clock were well clear of the land, the southwest point of Montague Island, bearing north-northeast half-east, three leagues, and the westernmost land in sight, west half-south, sixteen or seventeen leagues distant. As we are now taking our leave of Prince William's Sound, though the publication of Captain Cook's and other voyages 
has obviated the necessity of a copious description of the natives, their manners, customs, etc., and the produce of their country. Yet a few particulars may be selected from what has hitherto come under general observation, which may afford the reader satisfaction, as they are the result of very close attention and minute remarks on their behaviour and general conduct. These people are for the most part short in stature and square-made men. Their faces, both men and women, are in general flat and round, with high cheekbones and somewhat flattened noses. Their teeth are very good and white, eyes dark, quick of sight, their smell very good, which they quicken by smelling at the snake root parched. As to their complexions, they are generally lighter than the southern Indians, and some of their women I have seen with rosy cheeks. Their hair is black and straight, and they are fond of having it long, but on the death of a friend they cut it short to denote them to be in mourning. Nor have I ever observed that they have any other way to mark their sorrow and concern for their relations. The men have generally badly shaped legs, which I attributed to their sitting in one constant position in their canoes. They seem possessed of as great a share of pride and vanity as Europeans, for they often paint the face and hands, have their ears and noses pierced, and the underlip slit. In the hole in the nose they hang an ornament, as they deem it, made of bone or ivory, two or three inches long. At the ears they mostly wear beads hanging down to the shoulder, and in the slit in the lip they have a bone or ivory instrument fitted with holes in it, from which they hang beads as low as the chin. These teeth in the lip disfigure them very much, some of them having it as large as their mouth. But with all this fancied finery, they are remarkably filthy in their persons, and not frequently changing their garments. They are generally very lousy, and in times of scarcity those vermin probably serve them as an article of food. For I have seen them pick and eat to the number of a dozen or more, and they are not very small. Their clothing consists wholly of the skins of animals and birds. I must do them the justice to say that we generally found them very friendly, and they appear remarkably tender and affectionate to their women and children, that you cannot please them more than in making them small presents, but carry your attention to their women no farther, for nothing gives them greater displeasure than taking liberties with them. Another very prevalent inclination is that of thieving, which is by no means peculiar to them, but is equally to be seen in all other Indians, not only from strangers, but from one another. I have frequently, in the course of my trading with them, seen them steal from one another, and on being detected, they will give up the articles they have stolen with a laugh and immediately appear as unconcerned as if nothing had happened amiss. I am sure that with them, thieving with dexterity is rather thought a grace than a disgrace, and the complete thief is a clever fellow, but the bungling pilferer is less admired. You can generally know the man who comes as a professed thief, for his face will be all daubed with paint, and whilst you may be viewing the curious figure he cuts with his painted face, you may be sure that his hands are not idle, if there is anything near him worth stealing, and whenever you see the arm slipped from out the sleeve of the frock of skins which they always wear, you may be well assured that the person is intent on thieving, and they always conceal the articles they have stolen under their frock until they have an opportunity of stowing them away in their canoes. But notwithstanding our knowing the professed thief, and all our vigilance, they frequently steal little things from us but of no consequence. During our intercourse with them they grew less addicted to thieving, in consequence of my sometimes appearing a little angry with them and taking some pains to convince them of the impropriety of their behaviour. Upon the whole, they appear a good kind of people, and I am convinced in a little time, provided a settlement of sufficient strength were established, they would be an industrious set of people in hunting and procuring the sea otter and other skins for sale to the settlers. The weaker tribes, I think, are frequently robbed and plundered by the stronger, and prevented from hunting, which would not be the case, were there a proper settlement established in some convenient place, for that would give protection to the whole of the inhabitants of this sound. And indeed, I believe from this to King George's sound, they are by no means as numerous as was in general supposed, therefore not so dangerous to settlers. I think this sound, and as far as Comptroller's Bay, would not muster three hundred fighting men, and Cook's River, according to Mr. Hill's observation, could not muster much above that number, and the whole of these people stand much in awe of firearms, that a few men well provided would be perfectly secure.
and were I to advise a place for wintering at and forming a settlement, it should be the West Harbour of Port Etches. It has several advantages over any place I have seen on the coast. One of them is that it lies so near the sea that in all probability it would be one of the last places that would freeze and one of the first in which the ice would break up. In the next place, you would be much sheltered by the high land lying to the eastward and northward from the bleak winds in the winter, and you have all the southern aspect open over the low land, which lies to the southward of you, which land in a little time might be turned to very useful purposes in raising articles of food for the settlers. You might see from this situation the passage from the sea and a great part of the sound. The country around, after the snow leaves it, which is about the middle of June, is pleasant enough. The weather is at times, long before that period, very fine and pleasant, and at other times exceedingly boisterous, with constant rain, which washes in a short time great quantities of the snow away, soon leaves the lower parts clear, and you immediately perceive the vegetables coming forth. This country abounds in trees of the pine kind, some very large, a good quantity of alder, a kind of hazel, but not larger than will do for making hand spikes. The fruit bushes are in great abundance, such as bilberry bushes, raspberry bushes, strawberries, alderberry bushes, and currant bushes, red and black. The vegetables are watercresses, wild celery, sour dock, shepherd's purse, angelica, hemlock, and wild peas. We did not see any wild onions in Cook's River. Besides the above-mentioned vegetables, they have the wild onion. Unfortunately, none of our seed that was sown on the Kittle Island came to anything. I am much afraid the greatest part of it was spoiled from age, being before we left England near a twelve-month-old. I sowed some in different parts about the country. Perhaps some of it might thrive. The berries were none of them on our sailing fit for gathering, but would in a little time be quite ripe, and I am sure any quantity of them might be gathered for a winter stock. We made use of the alder buds when they were tender as greens, and when boiled they ate very well. All hands partook of them one day for dinner, but they had a strange effect, not a person on board, but what was physicked in a most extraordinary degree. On some, it acted as an emetic as well as a purge. It kept us going for about 36 hours, when it stopped, leaving us all somewhat lighter than we were. This bout prevented me from sending the boats on a trading expedition two days longer than I intended. The buds of the young black currant bushes we made use of as tea, with the pine tops mixed, which drank very pleasant. The articles of food of the inhabitants are fish and animals of all kinds, of which they eat very heartily when they have it in their power. They eat the vegetables which the country affords, and the inner bark of the pine tree, which in the spring of the year must be of infinite service in recovering them from the scurvy, with which disease I am apt to think they are much afflicted during the winter, having seen many of them with swollen legs and sores, which I am pretty certain proceeded from that disease. As the summer advanced, we saw little of those appearances. They never practice the method of smoking their provisions, and, for want of salt, have no other way of curing their winter stock of fish than drying it in the sun. Their fresh fish they generally roast by running some sticks through to spread it, and clapping it up before the fire. Their animal food they generally dress in baskets or wooden vessels, by putting to it red-hot stones until the victuals are dressed enough. And it is surprising how quick they dress their provisions in this way. During the summer season, they lead a strange wandering life, and the shelter they live under in bad weather, when from home, is either their canoes or small sheds, made of a few sticks covered with a little bark. Their winter habitations are also very ill-made and inconvenient, those I have seen are not more than from four to six feet high, about ten feet long, and about eight feet broad, built with thick plank, and the crevices filled up with dry moss, and in those houses they generally stow very thick. The method they use in making plank is to split the trees with wooden or stone wedges, and I have seen a plank twenty or twenty-five feet long split from a tree by their method. Their weapons for war are spears of sixteen or eighteen feet long, headed with iron, bows and arrows, and long knives, all of which they are amazingly dexterous in using. Their fishing implements are wooden hooks, with lines made of a small kind of rockweed, which grows to a considerable length, and will hold a good strain, if kept clear of kinks, and properly moistened. With these hooks and lines they catch halibut and cod, 
Salmon they catch in weirs or spear them, and herring I believe they catch with small nets, the implements with which they kill. The sea otter and other amphibious animals are harpooned with bone harpoons, with two or more barbs, with a staff of about six or eight feet long, on which is fastened a skin or large bladder well-blown, as a buoy, and darts of about three or four feet long, which they throw with a wooden instrument of about a foot long. I omitted in its proper place to mention that at the south part of the little bay where we found the watercresses, we saw a tree with an inscription on it. The characters, some were of opinion, were Greek, but for my own part I could not make out what most of them were, they were badly cut. It appeared to me as if the inscription had been made in the latter part of the last year, and I am of the opinion by a man who some time after the Nootka's arrival, left her. This man is a native of one of the islands in the Mediterranean, and it should seem was driven from the Nootka by bad usage, and I believe is full among the Indians. In regard to the dialect of these people, it may be proper to introduce a few specimens, though it appeared to be such a confused, unintelligible jargon that it was not without some difficulty that we could collect these instances. Nutuch, a principal chief's name of Taklakamut, a friendly tribe about Comptroller's Bay, the best traders about the sound, uh, and bring most sea otter skins. Kocha, a chief of Ditto, Nuskukwilik, a ditto of Montague Island, called by the natives Shukake, a friendly tribe. This chief changed names with me. Deskaluk, a ditto, ditto, ditto. Abagak, a ditto, ditto, ditto. Sharnutan, to sleep. Walamut, a country to the ENE of Port Ethkis. Ithkar, to get up after sleeping. Kaana, to take. Teiku, to bring. Neltuli, a toe or iron. Yamak, beads. Konganak, a marmot skin. Onaka, snow. Farnikuk, a tribe the southwest part of Prince William Sound, a friendly tribe. Kaunuk, fire. Muk, water. Tartuk, telling Nuk, chief of Chani Kok, a country to the southwest of Prince William Sound, a friendly tribe, not many skins. Shinawa, chief of Tar Tiklag Mute, a country to the west northwest from Port Etches, a very troublesome tribe. Abundance of river otter but few sea otter skins. Gauluk. Shore. Nataki snow according to Skinawa's tribe. Nagawaktuki. Wood. Kuskuk or Nuskuk chief. Kulin ten. Nayanuk twenty. Okluk wind. Marjak sun. Ingiti. Ground on shore. Kapuka river otter. Takenuki. Let me look at it. Seam. Rain. Chilha. A child. Uganuk. A woman. Yagala. Good or handsome. Nayatunasuk, sea otter. Nayatunamokta, young sea otter. Lukluk, a bear. Yauna yonders, Yutka, gone away. Chetla, no, no, Piduk, all gone, I have no more. Piduk, Natunasuk, I have no more sea otter skins. Lawler, friendship. At the same time, they extend their arms and repeat the word Lawler frequently. And to signify that you are a friend, you must do the same. After getting well clear of the passage into Prince William's Sound, we steered east-southeast, with a light breeze from the westward and pleasant weather. But the wind afterwards hauling to the southward, we steered to the east by north. The 3rd of August being remarkably fine, the sailors' hammocks were got upon deck. The ship was scraped fore and aft, and sprinkled with vinegar, and well aired with fires. The mean result of several observed distances of the sun and moon taken on the 4th gave 138 cogents 20 longitude. The latitude at that time was 50 b 7 doom 12 in north. At three o'clock we saw the land, bearing north by west and more than 20 leagues distant, which we took for Mount Fairweather. The wind now shifted to the eastward and continued for some time from that quarter, which prevented us from making any great progress towards Cape Edgecombe. However, as we could fetch something to the eastward and southward of Mount Fairweather, I determined to try for a port near the situation in which Captain Cook places Cross Sound, although we were not fortunate enough to fall in with that place last season. At four o'clock in the afternoon of the fifth Mount Fairweather bore North Tendig West, near twenty leagues distant. This mountain, or rather ridge of mountains, as it forms into several, is by far the highest land on this part of the coast, much loftier than Mount Edgecombe, and I think nearly the height of Mount St. Elias. At six o'clock, the appearance of an opening presented itself. 
bearing north 20 degree east, and having then a light breeze from the northwest by west, we stood in for it. Next morning, at four o'clock, Mount Fairweather bore northwest by west, 12 leagues distant. What was taken for a wide opening in the land, on the preceding evening now appeared to be joined by low land, as we could from the masthead see the low land extending from side to side, and no good appearance of a harbour. Indeed, our distance from the land was so great that we could not determine at this point with certainty. But as the wind was now rather scant for proceeding in towards the place where we had supposed the opening to be, and a fine wind for running towards Cape Edgecombe, I desisted from standing any further in the north-northeast direction, and edged away to the east-northeast, with an intention of getting pretty well inshore in order to look for a harbour as we stood towards the Cape. At ten o'clock we saw an opening in the land bearing northeast, which promised well for a good harbour. On running in for it, another good appearance of a harbour presented itself, bearing north by east, and seems to be situated about eight leagues to the southeast of Gross Cape. But the land next to the sea, beginning about eight leagues to the southeast of Cross Cape, and trending to within ten leagues of Cape Edgecombe, seems to be composed of low woody islands, among which there appear several places of good shelter. The inland country forms into a number of peaked hills, some well wooded and others quite bare. On drawing near the opening, and about two miles from the shore to the northwest of it, we had twenty and twenty-five fathoms of water over a muddy bottom, and just in the entrance were some high barren rocks. A large Indian boat came out, probably to view the ship. There were twelve people in her, and only three of the men, the rest women and children. On getting into the entrance of the passage, which is about a mile across, we deepened the water to thirty fathoms over a sandy bottom, the barren rocks just mentioned forming the south side. The northern side is low land, forming itself into several small bays, from whose points are breakers at no great distance. About half a mile within the barren rocks, we had thirty fathoms water over a rocky bottom, which depth and bottom we carried at least a mile farther, steering northeast by east, which is nearly the course into the harbour. The passage so far is nearly a mile across, with bold rocky shores on each side. Presently afterwards we shoaled the water to ten fathoms, being then in the narrowest part of the channel, which in that situation is not more than half a mile across, formed on the northern side by some bold rocks, and to the southward by a bluff point of land, to the eastward of which, a small distance from the shore are some rocks that just show themselves above water. Immediately on passing these rocks, we deepened the water very quickly, having from thirty to forty fathoms, and a most spacious and excellent harbour opened itself to our view, trending to the northwest and southeast, and running deep into the northward, with a number of small islands scattered about. We ran up towards the northwest part of the harbour, and after passing a small island near the north shore covered with trees, we anchored about noon with the small bower in thirty-one fathoms water over a muddy bottom, and moored with the best bower to the eastward, entirely landlocked, the rocks lying in the inner part of the passage, jutting shut in with the small island already mentioned, and bearing south three or four miles distant. Soon after we were moored, the Indian boat which had followed us in came alongside, and the people gave us a song in the usual Indian manner. I found their language totally different from that spoken by the natives in Prince William's Sound, but they extended their arms as a token of peace, nearly the same as those people. Their boat was the body of a large pine tree, neatly excavated and tapered away towards the ends until they came to a point with the forepart somewhat higher than the afterpart. Indeed, the whole was finished in a neat and very exact manner. I made my new visitors a few trifling presents and inquired for the sea otter skin by the name it bears at Prince William Sound, but they not understanding me, I showed them a sea otter skin and made signs for them to bring me some, which they seemed inclined to do. They were ornamented with beads of various sorts, and had some other articles, which induced me to think that the Queen Charlotte had touched near this neighbourhood on her way to King George's Sound, particularly a tin kettle and some towels, exactly the same sort as ours. They made me understand by signs that the vessel from which they procured those articles had been in a port to the eastward of Cape Edgecombe, and described her as having two masts. This little information led me to think that possibly the Queen Charlotte might still be somewhere about the Cape, and as I before had formed an intention of sending the longboat on a trading expedition, 
I determined to fit her out with all possible dispatch, and accordingly, I ordered a proper assortment of trade goods to be got ready, and six weeks' provisions of all kinds that the ship afforded. The Indians, after receiving a few presents, left the ship and went ashore, where they remained a short time and then returned with a few good dry sea otter skins. I took notice that these Indians were not so particular in dressing or stretching their skins as the inhabitants of Prince William's Sound and Esket River. Neither were any of them marked with paint, as if intended for a market, which is the general practice in the Sound and River. I showed a man in the boat who appeared to be the chief, a marked skin, and he immediately knew, probably by the mark, what country it came from, and described the inhabitants as having their underlips slit and wearing ornaments in them. He also described their canoes with their method of paddling, and on being shown a model of the Prince William Sound canoes, he gave me to understand that it was the same sort with those he had been describing. I learned that they had an intercourse with the natives of Prince William Sound, in the course of which quarrels often arose and battles frequently ensued, and one of the men showed me a deep wound near his lip, which he received in an engagement with them. That these people have communication with each other is pretty certain, and I am apt to think that this part of the coast and farther on to the northwest is the country which the inhabitants of the Sound call Wallamute, as I saw two daggers in the possession of two men belonging to old Shinawa's tribe, which were made exactly in the same manner as those worn by the natives at this place, and they gave me to understand that they had bought them at Wallamute. The daggers which the people hereabouts use in battle are made to stab with either end, having three, four or five inches above the hand, tapered to a sharp point, but the upper part of those used in the sound and river is excavated. Towards evening, our visitors prepared to go ashore, but by way of securing my friendship, were desirous to leave one of their party on board for the night and take one of our people with them ashore. As they seemed to betray neither a mischievous nor thieving disposition, I had no objection to the proposal, particularly as I thought the person who went might have an opportunity of observing what number of sea otter skins they possessed, and might also form some idea of their manner of living. Accordingly, I permitted one of my people to go ashore, and that I might be under no apprehension about his safety. Two of the Indians, instead of one as was first proposed, remained on board, and behaved remarkably well. They were both young, very well made, good-looking men, and appeared to be brothers. The other man, who appeared to be the chief of this small tribe, went away with my man and the rest of his tribe at seven o'clock. I observed they went to the northward and turned round a point of land, beyond which most probably their habitation was situated. About eight o'clock next morning, the Indians returned with our man, but they brought very little trade. The person who went ashore with the Indians informed me that their residence was at the foot of a hill near a run of fresh water, which issued out of an adjacent valley. Their house, for they had only one, appeared to be only a temporary habitation, and he could observe very few articles of trade among them. The way to this Indian hut is to the northeast through a little sound, full of small islands covered with wood. At daylight, the longboat was hoisted out, and some hands were employed in fitting her for an expedition to the eastward. The seine was hauled in several parts of the harbour, but we did not meet with any success. The longboat being properly equipped at five o'clock, she set out on a trading expedition towards Cape Edgecombe and among the islands to the southeast of that cape, with the same officers and men that went in her to Cook's River. I gave them particular orders to return in seventeen days, and in case they fell in with the Queen Charlotte, to desire Captain Dixon to sail with them towards our present harbour and remain in the offing until I should join him. As I proposed leaving the coast towards the latter end of the month and proceeding for China, unless circumstances warranted my staying on the coast to a later period. The adjacent country abounding with white cedar, I sent the carpenter ashore with a party on the 8th to cut some for sawing into sheathing boards. The remainder of the ship's company were busy in various necessary employments. In the course of the day, we had a small canoe alongside, with one man and a woman. But they brought nothing to dispose of, and probably were out on a hunting party, as they had all the implements for that purpose. However, after staying a short time with us, they returned towards the eastern point of the Sound, from whence they came, in order to give their tribe intelligence of our being in the harbour. 
Towards evening, our first visitors came alongside, and the two young men again requested to sleep on board, which I permitted, and Joseph Woodcock, one of my apprentices, slept ashore with their party. When the Indians left us, they did not go to their habitations around the North Point, as on the preceding evening, but took up their abode in a small bay near the ship, where they erected a miserable hut insufficient to keep out either wet or cold. Not having any success in hauling the seine near the ship, I sent the whale boat with the seine round a point to the northeast. Around that point, they proceeded up an arm of the sound, which took a direction about north and north by east, for four or five miles. This arm has two or three small woody islands lying at the entrance, and is navigable for a ship of any size, almost the whole way up. At the head of it, they found a small freshwater rivulet, where they caught a few good salmon and a great number of very indifferent ones, most of which were suffered to escape. The indifferent salmon appear to be a different kind from the others, and I am inclined to think we're out of season. They had a most disagreeable colour, to appearance as if in a state of putrefaction, and the upper jaw had a number of large teeth projecting almost right out of it. Since our arrival, I had frequently seen in the freshwater creeks, in which places these kinds of salmon get a considerable height, many of them dying and great numbers on the banks quite dead. Indeed, there is reason to suppose that few of them survive the approach of winter, but the other sort keep in deep water, and about the mouths of the creeks. Those caught by our people were fine large fish, of a very good colour, and without the teeth, or tusks, in the upper jaw, which so particularly distinguish the inferior sort. The small canoe which visited us in the morning from the eastward returned again at eight o'clock, in company with two large boats, containing about twenty-five men, women, and children. They entertained us near an hour with singing, and afterwards took their leave and went ashore to the little bay just mentioned, where some of them erected temporary huts to lodge in, but others contented themselves with such kind of shelter as some rocks which hung over the beach afforded. On leaving the ship they gave me to understand that they had some excellent skins to dispose of and would bring them in the morning. Accordingly, soon after daylight, the Indians again came alongside, bringing five very good sea otter skins, which were all they had of the kind, and a number of beautiful black skins, such as I had never seen before. But I'm apt to think they were a species of seal. This tribe, as well as our former visitors, traded very fairly, and as they did not seem to be of a thieving disposition, I admitted a number of them on board. When dinner was brought into the cabin, my guests required very little invitation to partake, but began to eat very heartily. And so well did they relish our victuals, that the table was presently cleared, and there was occasion for another course, which was sent in, and they fell to with as keen an appetite as at first, till at length, being fairly satiated, they gave over, though with some reluctance. After looking at various parts of the ship and receiving some little presents, they returned to the shore well satisfied with their entertainment. In the forenoon, we got several fine logs of cedar on board, and two of the people were set to work in sawing them into sheathing boards. The cooper was sent ashore to brew spruce beer and essence of spruce for sea stores, there being an abundant quantity of excellent pine for that purpose, not far from the ship. Others of the ship's company were employed in wooding and watering, and I sent two of the boys with the canoe into the passage to try for fish, but they returned without meeting with any success. About one o'clock an Indian boat came into the sound with two men, a boy about twelve years old, and a young child in her. One of the men was a remarkably fine-looking fellow, and appeared to be a person of great consequence. This small party came from the northwestward and I am inclined to think their usual place of residence is near the spot where I have before mentioned there is a probability of finding a good harbour between this sound and Cross Cape. They came through a passage that leads into another sound to the northwest of that we lay in, and which passage makes the land to the westward of us an island. I sought from our new visitors a few very good sea otter skins and a number of wild geese. The method they make use of in catching those birds is to chase and knock them down immediately after they have shed their large wing feathers, at which time they are not able to fly. These Indians had a number of beads about them of quite a different sort to any I ever saw. They had also a carpenter's adze made in a different manner to ours, with the letter B and three fleur de lis on it. The chief informed me that he received these articles from two vessels which had been with them to the northwest and described them as having three masts. He gave me to understand that they had a drum on board 
and a number of great guns. These circumstances incline me to think that the vessels described by this chief were the French men of war that were fitting out for discovery at the time we left England. Besides these ships just mentioned, I was informed by some of the Indians that another vessel had visited the coast a little way to the northwest of our situation, and from their description, I should rather suppose her to have been the Queen Charlotte than any other vessel, as they described her having only two masts, and her boat like our whaleboat. They also made me understand very clearly that an unfortunate accident happened to one of her boats, which was fishing at anchor in the mouth of the port where she lay. While fishing, the wind came in fresh from the sea, which caused a good deal of sea to set in, and when endeavouring to weigh their anchor, the cable slipped on the broadside of the boat which overset her, and before any assistance could be given them from the ship, five men were drowned. The boat to which this misfortune happened, they gave me to understand, was that an accident of the kind might possibly have happened to the Queen Charlotte's boat. After this small party had finished trading, the chief requested leave to stay all night on board with the elder boy, which I granted, and sent Joseph Woodcock ashore with the other man and child. The chief from the northwest, with his little party, took leave of me the next morning and proceeded towards home, telling me at the same time that he would return in ten days with more sea otter skins. A voyage round the world, but more particularly to the northwest coast of America, by Captain Nathaniel Portlock. Chapter 13. A new party of traders from the east. Under a necessity of exchanging hostage, part of the ship's company go on shore, meet with Indian tea, visit the natives at their own residence, their habitations and manner of living described, an account of the Spaniards having been on the coast and left the smallpox. The longboat returns from an expedition to the eastward, Examine the sound. Another visit from our northwest friends. Ceremonies to be observed before commencing trade. Joseph Woodcock sent as a hostage. Three days in the country. An account of the natives, their thieving disposition, nastiness, ornaments, dress and language. Observations on the advantages, likely to accrue from a settlement on the coast. Some thoughts of an expedition by land. Leave Portlock's Harbour. In the morning of the 11th, two large boats came into the sound from the eastward. This tribe was entirely new to us and consisted of 25 men, women and children, from whom I bought a few very good sea otter skins, a cloak made of the small black skins I have before taken notice of, and several skins of the same sort. This new party of traders did not associate with the other Indians, but after their business was over and their curiosity gratified by looking at the ship, they went on shore in a bay not far from the ship where the cooper was employed in brewing spruce beer and took up their lodging in a good convenient house, which he and his assistants had built to shelter themselves from the rain, and which was well covered with cedar bark. The seine was hauled in the afternoon, and we caught a good supply of excellent salmon. Some of our old acquaintances came on board in the evening to sleep with us, and I sent a person ashore by way of hostage as usual. Indeed, I found it absolutely necessary to conform to their custom in this particular, for more than once, when I had refused to exchange hostages with them, in consequence of the appearance of bad weather, they were immediately alarmed and would not come near the ship on any account whatsoever. But on my permitting a person to go along with them ashore, they would receive him on entering their boat with a general shout of exultation and feel perfectly convinced that no harm was intended to them. On these occasions, instead of one Indian staying on board in exchange for the person I sent ashore, more than half a dozen would offer themselves as volunteers, and I sometimes permitted three or four of them to sleep with us. The two young men who first visited us were generally of the party, and indeed one of them was almost constantly on board. On the 11th, I gave part of the ship's company leave to recreate themselves ashore. As a walk I knew would be highly serviceable to them, and the adjacent country was pleasant and agreeable, and afforded great quantities of blackberries and wild raspberries, quite ripe and exceedingly good. This party, in the course of their ramble, fell in with a large spot of low swampy ground, situated at a small distance behind the brewery beach, on which grew a large quantity of the Indian tea. This discovery was a timely one, for by this time the greatest part of our other tea was expended, and our newly discovered tea was a most excellent substitute. It grows on a low small shrub, not more than 12 inches long, and tapers gradually to a point, 
the underpart covered with a light downy substance. In the forenoon I wet in the whale boat, accompanied by Mr. Wilby and one of the young Indians, to visit their residence, he undertaking to direct the way. We rode to the northwest for about two miles, and then came to what had the appearance of a point of land from the ship, but we found it to be an island, situated at the entrance of an arm of the sound, which trends away between north and northeast. The Indian informed me that their place of abode was up that arm, therefore we proceeded on, and found it to run in a zigzag direction between north and northeast, about five miles to the head of it from the island in the entrance, and near seven miles from the ship. This arm appears to be navigable for at least four miles up, for vessels of any size, and there are a number of small islands covered with trees scattered in various parts of it. We arrived at the Indian's habitation about noon and found one small temporary house and the ruins of two others which had been much larger and appeared to have been made use of as winter habitations. The uprights or supporters were still remaining and some boards that were intended for a floor. On the beach was a large boat and three of a smaller size, the large boat capable of holding 30 persons and the others about 10 people each. From this circumstance, I expected to have seen a numerous tribe and was quite surprised when I found that it consisted only of three men, three women, the same number of girls, two boys about 12 years old and two infants. One of the women was very old, I should think not less than 80. I observed the oldest of the men to be very much marked with the smallpox, as was a girl who appeared to be about 14 years old. The old man endeavoured to describe the excessive torments he endured whilst he was afflicted with the disorder that had marked his face and gave me to understand that it happened at some years ago. This convinced me that they had had the smallpox among them at some distant period. He told me that the distemper carried off great numbers of the inhabitants and that he himself had lost ten children by it. He had ten strokes tattooed on one of his arms, which I understood were marks for the number of children he had lost. I did not observe any of the children under ten or twelve years of age that were marked. Therefore, I have great reason to suppose that the disorder raged a little more than that number of years ago. And as the Spaniards were on this part of the coast in 1775, it is very probable that from them these poor wretches caught this fatal infection. They, it should seem, are a nation designed by Providence to be a scourge to every tribe of Indians they come near, by one means or another. <coughs> the Spaniards were among them in the height of summer, and probably they caught the infection about the month of August. To see their manner of living at that season of the year, one would think it a miracle that any of them escaped with their lives. I found men, women and children all huddled together in a close house near a large fire, and entirely surrounded with stinking fish round the house for at least 100 yards, and all along the banks of a little creek that ran down by this miserable dwelling were strewn stinking fish, and in several places were beds of maggots a foot deep and 10 or 12 feet in circumference. Nay, the place had really such a dreadfully offensive smell that the young Indian himself, though habituated to such wretched scenes from his earliest infancy, having remained on board with us a few days, could not bear it but entreated me very earnestly to leave the place, which I did, and returned to the boat accompanied by him and the rest of our party. Possibly the smallpox only raged during the warm weather, and the infection was destroyed by the setting in of a severy winter, but the sufferings of the poor Indians, when the disorder was at its height, must have been inconceivable, and no doubt the country was nearly depopulated, for to this day it remains very thinly inhabited. A number of the Indians who visited us from the eastward were marked with the smallpox, and one man who had lost an eye gave me to understand that he lost it by that disorder. But none of the natives from the westward had the least traces of it. I cannot account for this circumstance any other way than by supposing that the vessel from which these unfortunate people caught the infection was in a harbour somewhere about Carpi Edgecombe, and perhaps none of the natives further to the westward than this sound had an opportunity of having any intercourse with her and by that means happily escaped the disorder. After I left this miserable habitation, the Seine was hauled, and we caught a good supply of fine salmon. In the evening, our late visitor from the northward returned and slept on board, together with the rest of his party, and we hauled his boat up alongside. He informed me that the weather was so bad that he could not possibly get home. However, he set off again at daylight the next morning to make another trial. In the forenoon, 
Part of the ship's company had leave given them to go ashore, and though rainy weather came on, yet they were so intent on picking Indian tea and berries of various kinds that few of them returned on board before the approach of evening. In the course of the day, our neighbours in the Sound brought us a few sea otter skins and some others of various kinds, and a few of the natives that had been out on a hunting party returned with three very fine sea otter skins just taken from the animal. On the 14th, part of the ship's company were employed in wooding and watering, others hauled the seine and caught a supply of good salmon, and the sawyers were busy sawing cedar into sheathing boards. At nine o'clock in the morning of the 15th, the longboat returned from her expedition to the eastward. They had been just to the eastward of Cape Edgecombe, where they met with some inhabitants and purchased about twenty pretty good sea otter skins. Between the harbour we lay in and the cape, they fell in with a strait about a league wide at the entrance, and running in about east, or east-southeast, with bold shores and good anchorage. Soon after getting in, the southern and eastern point of the strait in 50b7-30 latitude, and the northern and western point in 50b7-36 latitude, they stood up between south and south by east, near four leagues, the strait for that distance appearing near three leagues across, with several small islands scattered about it. From the southern point, there were several appearances of fine openings branching out in various directions. However, they did not examine any of them but kept along under the southern shore as the most likely place for leading out near Cape Edgecombe. After getting up this passage about four leagues, they found it not more than half a league across, with good anchorage all the way up, and after carrying that width two leagues higher, it became very narrow and shallow one part in particular so shallow that it became dry at low water for near two miles. In this narrow part, they struck a rock which shivered one of the planks in the forefoot of the bow and caused the boat to make a good deal of water. This accident might have been attended with serious consequences. However, they hauled the boat on shore and nailed a piece of sheet lead over the damaged part, which effectively stopped the leak. After passing the narrow part, which they did by taking a proper time of tide, they found the passage to grow wider, still trending away to the northeast. The depth of water increased gradually and nearly as salt as seawater. This circumstance gave them great hopes that the passage they were in had a communication with the sea to the southeast, and consequently that they should get to the southeast, ward of the Cape, by a very safe and easy navigation. In this opinion, they were soon confirmed by coming into a large sound, where they saw a great number of whales. They also had a sight of Mount Edgecombe, and some islands lying to the southeast of Cape Edgecombe. In the course of their cruise thus far, they had landed several times in a fine level, pleasant country, where they could perceive the traces of inhabitants having been there recently. However, what is rather extraordinary, they saw neither huts nor Indians. On getting round the north point of this passage, through which they had come thus far, they saw an opening that appeared to run about a league up in a north direction and then branched out various ways. In the entrance of the main opening were several small islands. I think it very probable that the northwest arm of this opening runs into the first large sound that we entered. They still saw no inhabitants, therefore continued to steer towards the southeast for a passage about a mile and a half across made by the northern part of an island just under Mount Edgecombe, which was distinguished by the name of Pitts Island, and the opposite point of land which we supposed to be the mainland. Through this passage they had a view of the sea and the islands lying to the southeast of Cape Edgecombe. After getting through the passage, they steered among a cluster of islands lying near the shore to the northward of Cape Edgecombe, and anchored to the northward of the largest. This island bore north from the Cape about three leagues distant, and several other islands lay to the southeast of this cluster, six leagues distant. They remained there some time without seeing any inhabitants, and as the wind had set in from the southeast, which prevented them from proceeding any further in that direction, they were preparing to return back again when a canoe made its appearance with six people in her, from whom they procured some sea otter skins. Soon afterwards, they were visited by a few other canoes but the people were not as numerous as might naturally have been expected in such a fine situation. Their visitors gave them to understand that a vessel with two masts had lately anchored near the place where the boat then lay, and from the articles of trade which the natives possessed, there was scarcely a doubt that this vessel was the Queen Charlotte.
The different articles our people saw were hawks' bells, tin kettles, buckles and rings, all of them the same pattern as our own. They also had a Sandwich Island calabash and a number of towels. The boat lay in this situation for two days, during which time the people were on shore, but they did not see any appearance of wood having been recently cut down or any other sign of a ship's crew having lately been on shore. So, I would suppose if the Queen Charlotte had anchored near this situation, it was in her passage to King George's Sound, and having wooded and watered before she left Prince William's Sound, they would have no occasion to carry on any operations of that sort at this place. Messrs Hillcand and Hayward observed many of those people to be marked with the smallpox, and made the same observations there regarding that disorder as I had done in this harbour, which was that none under ten or twelve years of age bore any marks of the disorder. A short time before they intended to return to the ship, and while the people were busy in putting the boat to rights on deck, the Indians went in two boats and took an opportunity by cutting their cable. The anchor lay in 28 fathoms of water without a buoy, so there was no chance of recovering it. After doing this piece of mischief, the Indians made for the shore with all the haste imaginable and landed at a little distance from the longboat. Our people pursued them, and being a good deal exasperated at their daring and insolent behaviour, they landed with the boat and entirely destroyed both the Indian boats. The natives fled with precipitation into the woods, which put a stop to our people's pursuit, and I believe they did them no further injury. I was sorry that the boat's crew should have been under the necessity of taking this step, but undoubtedly this crime committed by the Indians was of so very mischievous a nature that it became necessary to punish them in some measure for it, and it is very probable that destroying their boats, which must cost them much time and trouble to rebuild, would make a greater impression than even taking away numbers of their lives. After filling their water and getting a little wood on board, the longboat returned to the ship by the same passage that they went through, and during the whole passage did not see a single canoe. The night before they got on board, James Blake, one of the boat's crew, fell overboard. The boat was going very fast through the water when this accident happened, and had got a considerable way to leeward before they brought her to. Blake could swim but very indifferently, but fortunately was saved by John McCoy, another of the boat's crew, swimming to him with an oar, which supported him until he was pulled into the boat, and it was near an hour before they got him on board, owing to a fresh breeze and his being directly to windward. On the 16th, the ship's company were employed in wooding and watering, and getting the ship ready for sea. In the forenoon, two Indian boats came alongside, from whom I bought a few tolerably good sea otter skins. In the afternoon we completed our water, and the longboat's crew had leave given them to go ashore. The weather during the whole of the 17th was squally and unsettled, the wind blowing very fresh from the eastward, which prevented any business from going forward. In the course of the day we were visited by one canoe, which brought a few indifferent sea otter skins. At eight o'clock in the morning of the 18th, I went in the whaleboat to the south point of the entrance into the sound to see how the wind prevailed out at sea. I landed on a part of the point that was sheltered from the surf by some rocks, from which situation I had a good view of the sea and the shores to the northwest and southeast of this entrance. I found the wind in the entrance and at sea to be about southwest by south, blowing strong and in squalls, which sent in on the rocks Tidizi I Betichida surf. After taking some bearings from this point, I embarked with an intention of examining the eastern part of the sound. About noon, we rowed under the lee of a small island and took shelter under some trees that hung over the water, where we refreshed ourselves with some smoked salmon. From this, we proceeded on to the eastward, under the southern shore of the sound, and after rowing about two leagues, came to another passage leading out to sea in the direction of southwest. This passage is about three quarters of a mile across, with bold, rocky shores against which the surf broke with great fury, and the wind being directly in, a heavy sea set up the passage. I found in the mid-channel between twenty and thirty fathoms of water over a bottom of hard sand, and the passage from the inner to the outer points appeared to be about two miles long. The wind blowing fresh and there being a very heavy sea, I was prevented from going through it as I at first intended and got only two-thirds of the way, from which situation I could see the sea break on some rocks that run out a little way from the outer point, but between them the passage appeared good and clear. 
This passage I guess to be about two leagues to the southeast of the one we came in at with the ship. Finding it impossible to proceed further out, we bore up, set our sails, and ran in again to the sound. I proceeded on, and found the south shore to run nearly east for one mile and a half, when a small river emptied itself into the sound. The shore then took a north-northeast direction for about two miles more, in which situation the land took a quick turn round, and there appeared a passage neat half a mile across, navigable, and trending away directly to the eastward. I did not follow this passage, as the boat's crew were quite wet, and a good deal fatigued with pulling, but landed in a small bay to the northward of it, where we took some refreshment. In this bay, and not more than ten yards from the beach, there was a kind of monument erected probably to the memory of some distinguished chief. This edifice was composed of four posts, each about twenty feet long, stuck in the ground, six feet distance from each other, and in a quadrangular form. About twelve or fifteen feet from the ground, there was a rough-boarded floor, and two of the sides were boarded four feet higher up, the other sides were left open. In the middle of this floor an Indian chest was deposited, which most likely contained the remains of some person of consequence, and on that side of the edifice to the westward, and which pointed up the sound, there was painted the resemblance of a human face. This wooden edifice, from its tottering condition, had certainly been erected a considerable length of time, and as it began to decay, I could perceive that the Indians had fixed supporters to the original uprights, and the painting appeared to have been frequently touched over. As none of the inhabitants were near us, I was desirous to know what the chest contained, but on one of the boat's crew attempting to get up in order to examine it, the whole fabric had liked to have given way, on which I ordered him to desist, as I was not willing to destroy a building that probably was looked upon by the Indians as sacred, and which they apparently took very great pains to preserve. Some of the inhabitants had lately visited this bay, as we saw a place where a fire had lately been made, and which appeared not to have been long put out. From this place Joseph Woodcock took a view of the land as given in the annex plate. We now steered nearly west for the ship, and as we rowed along, I found the north shore of the Sound to run in a northwest direction for about a mile and a half. It then took a quick turn to the northward, and formed a fine harbour with a few small islands well covered with trees scattered about the entrance, and the harbour seemed to run in for three or four miles. About six o'clock in the afternoon, I got on board, and understood from Mr. Hill, to whose direction I left the trading business, that some of the natives had been on board, from whom he purchased a few pieces of sea otter and some good ermine skins. On the 20th we had a fresh gale from the south-southwest, with violent squalls and heavy rains. Towards evening, the wind shifted to the eastward and grew moderate, but the weather still continuing rainy, none of the natives came near us. Neither the wind nor weather appearing settled enough to get out to sea with. I kept the cooper ashore brewing spruce essence for sea store. The rest of the people were employed in other necessary works. In the forenoon of the 20th, our late visitor from the northwest made his appearance in a large boat. His party consisted of 20 men and women, besides 10 or 12 boys and girls, and a few infants. As this chief, when he last took leave of me, had promised to return with a good cargo of sea otter skins, I expected a brisk trade to commence every moment and prepared myself accordingly. But I presently found that at this time my old acquaintance was not for transacting his business in a hurry, and perhaps he thought that on his last visit we were not impressed with a sufficient idea of his importance, for now he came alongside with his party in great pomp and solemnity, all of them singing and in addition to the vocal concert, they entertained us with instrumental music, which consisted of a large old chest, beaten with the hands, by way of a drum, and two rattles. The rattles were two feet long and about two inches round, made of hollow pieces of wood neatly joined together, and a number of small stones being put in. They were closed at both ends. The chief held one of these rattles in his hand, which he frequently shook with an air of meaning intelligence, and the rest of his tribe seemed to follow his directions, in singing in the most exact manner. His dress was an old coat made of cloth which formerly had been scarlet, with some old gold or silver fringe about the shoulders. But that ornament being esteemed of little value, the cloak was decorated down each side with buttons and small lead pipes, each about an inch long. His hair, after being well rubbed with oil, was entirely filled with down taken from gulls, 
which is always worn by the Indian chiefs when in full dress. In this grotesque figure, he displayed as much importance as any Spanish don could possibly have done. Besides the curious dress which the chief himself wore, he had another in the boat not less remarkable than his own, and ornamented nearly in the same manner, which was worn during the time of their singing by a woman whom I took for his wife. After this long ceremony was over, the chief made me a present of half a sea otter skin, but did not produce anything for sale, giving me to understand at the same time that he must go ashore before any traffic could be carried on. After staying there some time, which I apprehend was taken up in assorting their furs, he returned with his party, and now I expected our trade to begin in good earnest, but in this I was again disappointed, for the singing again commenced, and by way of varying our amusement, the chief appeared in different characters during the time his people were singing, and always changed his dress when he varied his character. In doing so, some of his companions held up a large mat by way of scene, to prevent us from seeing what was going on behind the curtain. At one time, he appeared in the character of a warrior and seemed to have all the savage ferocity of the Indian conqueror about him. He showed us the manner in which they attacked their enemies, their method of fighting, and their behavior to the vanquished enemy. He next assumed the character of a woman and to make his imitation more complete, he wore a mask which represented a woman's face with their usual ornaments. And indeed, it so exactly resembled a woman's face that I am pretty certain it was beyond the reach of Indian art, and must certainly have been left by the Spaniards in their last visit to this part of the coast. After this entertainment was over, with which it was necessary for us to appear pleased, the chief and some of his people came on board, and trade at last commenced between us. In the course of the day, I bought 25 pieces of tolerably good sea otter, equal to about 10 whole skins, but it should seem as if the chief wanted me to pay for the entertainment he had given us, as well as his furs, for I could not purchase a good skin for less than a light horseman's cap, two yards of inferior broadcloth, a pair of buckles, two handfuls of small beads, and two fish hooks. The articles we bartered with were light horseman's caps, striped woolen blankets, towels 18 or 20 inches long, buckles, buttons and beads of all sorts, but particularly small transparent ones, either green, blue or yellow. However, I could not procure even a piece of a skin with any of the latter articles. They only were given by way of concluding a bargain, as were tin kettles, brass pans and pewter basins, but hatchets, adzes and hoes they would scarcely take for anything whatever. My visitor was equally tedious in trading, as he had been in his entertainment, so that I could not get everything he had to dispose of during the whole day, and about eight o'clock in the evening, our traffic for the day being over, he sent his boat ashore and remained on board with one of his people for the night, and as he required a hostage, I sent Joseph Woodcock ashore with his party. Woodcock, having frequently been ashore as a hostage, was well known to the natives, and they seemed very fond of his company. On one of these occasions, he remained among the Indians for three days, during which time he had a good opportunity of seeing their customs and mode of living, and his account perfectly agreed with my own observations when ashore. Their filth and nastiness were beyond conception. Their food, which consisted chiefly of fish, was mixed up with stinking oil and other ingredients equally disagreeable, and the remains of every meal were thrown into a corner of their hut, upon a heap of the same kind, that was in a state of putrefaction which, together with large quantities of fat and stinking oil, caused a very loathsome and offensive smell. And to make it still worse, the same apartment was used by them both to eat and sleep in. This uncomfortable situation frequently induced Woodcock to take a ramble into the woods, but he was always very narrowly watched by some of his new companions, who seemed to apprehend that he was endeavouring to make his escape from them. Once in particular, having wandered a considerable distance from the Indian's place of residence, he began to amuse himself with whistling part of an old song, not expecting, if the natives heard him, that it could possibly be a matter of offence. But in this he was mistaken, for several of them immediately ran up to him and insisted on his giving over. At first he did not comprehend their meaning and went on with his tune. However, one of them soon put a stop to it by laying his hand on Woodcock's mouth, being apprehensive that he meant the whistling as a signal for some of his companions to come for him. Except for their watching him so closely, they treated him with great kindness, and at their meals always gave him what they considered as choice dainties, 
mixing his fish with plenty of stinking oil, which, in their opinion, gave it an additional and agreeable relish, and he found it no easy matter to persuade them to let him eat his fish without sauce. These poor wretches, by living in so filthy a manner, were entirely covered with vermin, but this they seemed to consider as no kind of inconvenience, for at any time when the lice grew troublesome, they picked and ate them with the greatest relish and composure. Sometimes indeed, when they were greatly pestered, and had not an opportunity of ridding themselves of their guests in that manner, they would turn their jackets and wear the inside outwards, by way of giving them a few hours' respite. Poor Woodcock soon became as much encumbered with vermin as his companions, but Hughes had not as yet reconciled him to such troublesome guests, and he felt his situation extremely disagreeable. The Indians endeavoured to persuade him to dispose of them in the manner they did, but this was so totally repugnant to his feelings that they soon perceived his dislike to their proposal. At length, he persuaded one of the women to rid him of the vermin, and she, probably considering them as a peculiar dainty, accepted the office with pleasure and entirely cleared him from everything of the kind. At daylight in the morning of the 21st, I sent Mr. Haywood in the yawl out to the entrance of the sound to see what wind prevailed there and in the offing. He returned about eight o'clock and informed me that the wind was at southwest by west in the offing, which threw a heavy sea into the passage. As there was no prospect of our getting to sea with the wind in that quarter, I kept the people to work in brewing, sawing plank and other necessary employments. At around seven in the morning, the Indian chief with his party returned on board, and our trade again commenced, but I found him equally tedious in the disposal of his furs as on the preceding day. Towards noon, I sent Mr. Hayward to the south point of the entrance into the sound to get a meridian altitude. He landed on the south point and got one, which gave the latitude of that point as 50 Sambum de Gwul 44 north. The latitude of the ship's place in the harbour was 57 de Gwul 40 e. During the day, I bought from my visitors about the same quantity of furs as I had done the day before, and nearly at the same prices. Around seven o'clock, our trading was finished and as I knew the neighbourhood was cleared of all the furs, I determined to quit the sound at the first opportunity, and this evening the ship was put in a state fit for sea. I found this party from the northwest much more addicted to thieving than any of our former visitors in the sound were, and it is really astonishing to see with what patience a thief will wait once he has fixed his eye on the thing he means to steal, and with what secrecy and dexterity they will convey their booty away. One fellow in particular took a liking to my drinking mug, which was a blackjack, and he had got it under his frock, which are made in the same manner as at Prince William Sound. But very unfortunately for the poor fellow, it happened to be about half full of beer, a part of which, splashing over, discovered the thief and his intentions. Notwithstanding, I kept two people constantly in my cabin to watch the bystanders while I traded with one fellow found an opportunity to get a cutlass under his frock, and was not discovered till he was going down the side of the ship. I immediately took it from him and gave him a very severe chastisement with the flat side of it, and afterwards drove him out of the ship. Yet notwithstanding all our vigilance and attention, another of them found means to steal out of a box in my cabin, four pairs of worsted stockings, and some other things, with which he found means to get out of the ship undiscovered. Our visitors from the east were much easier to deal with, and much more honest. It appears to me that the inhabitants of this sound, and those farther to the eastward stand much now of them, for they frequently importunate me very earnestly to drive them away, being extremely uneasy all the time they were on board. The western people appear to me to be much more warlike and savage than any of their neighbours. Their language varies a little from the others, but their songs and music are entirely different. Their boats, weapons for war and hunting implements are much the same. They appear to be very indolent and dirty, which naturally exposes them to all manner of vermin, and which is disposed of in the manner already mentioned. They have not the use of bladder skin frocks for their dress, but make dresses of the skins of land and sea animals, made up in the same manner as the inhabitants of Cook's River and Prince William's Sound. The men do not use the method of slitting their underlips, but wear their ornaments of beads, shells, etc. at their ears, through which they have small holes bored. They likewise bore a small hole through the gristle of the nose through which they will sometimes put a needle or nail that they purchase in trade, or may have given them as a present, 
but the women disfigure themselves in a most extraordinary manner by making an incision in the underlip, in which part they wear a piece of wood, made in an oval form a little hollow on each side, and about the thickness of a quarter of an inch. The outer part of the rim is hollowed all around. This curious piece of wood is thrust into the hole, and is secured there by the rim of the lip going round it, fixed in the hollow which is made around the wood. They appear to be worn large or small in proportion to the age of the women, or perhaps to the number of the children they have borne. Those that I took to be between thirty and forty years of age wore them about the size of a small saucer, and the older larger in proportion. One old woman, I remarked particularly, having one as large as a large saucer. The weight of this trencher or ornament weighs the lip down so as to cover the whole of the chin, leaving all the lower teeth and gum quite naked and exposed, which gives them a very disagreeable appearance. When they eat, it is customary for them to take more in the mouth at a time than they can possibly swallow. When they have chewed it, the lip piece serves them as a trencher to put it out of their mouths on, and then they take it occasionally. It seems a general practice among the females to wear the wooden ornament in their underlip. The children have them bored at about two years of age, when a piece of copper wire is put through the hole. This they wear till the age of about 13 or 14 years, when it is taken out and the wooden ornament introduced. Its first size is about the width of a button. They likewise have their ears bored, where they wear their ornaments of beads and other things. Their apparel is the same kind as worn by the men, both men and women being very fond of long hair, which is considered as a great ornament. At the death of a friend, the hair is cut off pretty short, which seems to be the general mourning of all Indian tribes. The woman wear the hair either clubbed behind or tied up in a bunch on the crown of the head. The men wear theirs either loose or tied at the crown. The method of dressing the hair with birds down is only practiced by the men. The women, in general, are hairdressers for their husbands, which office they seem to perform with a great deal of dexterity and good nature. Polygamy, I think, is not practiced here, as I never observed any one of them to have more than one woman whom he seemed to consider as his wife, to whom they pay very strict attention and treat with a great deal of affection and tenderness. You cannot affront them more than by attempting to make advances to their wives. They likewise are very fond of, and remarkably affectionate to, their children. The women are the keepers of their treasures or riches, which they generally have in a box or basket, and always take the lead in fashions, which they show by the placing of their ornaments, or fixing such a curiosity to be the favourite of the day. It is not the custom with those people, as with the South Sea Islanders, for the men and women to eat separately, nor are the women confined to eat meats of a particular description, but for men, women and children to sit down indiscriminately at their meals, which chiefly consist of fish of different kinds, such as salmon, which they have in the greatest abundance, mussels, and various other shellfish, sea otters, seals, and porpoises. The blubber of the porpoise. They are remarkably fond of, and indeed the flesh of any animal that comes in their way. I could never observe that they had any quantity of dried salmon provided for a winter's stock. So what they live on at that severe part of the season, I'm at a loss to find out, unless they catch land animals in the neighbourhood of their winter quarters. I am greatly inclined to believe the principal part of their provision at that season is confined to the inner fine bark of the pine tree. Any tin kettles they get from us they make use of to drink out of. They boil their victuals in wooden vessels by constantly putting red-hot stones into the water. Their persons are in general much about the size of Europeans. The men have a very fierce and savage aspect, which, with their dress, gives them much the appearance of warriors. Their weapons of war are daggers and long-pointed spears. They are very easily irritated and would make very little scruple to kill you when they think themselves injured. More than once I had nearly experienced that fate, from some trifling disagreements in trade. But being pretty well acquainted with their tempers, I guarded as much against them as possible, and on all occasions took care to be well provided for them in case of an attempt, by keeping my pistols ready charged before me. Their women, were it not for the filth and nastiness which continually cover them, would be by no means disagreeable. Their features in general are pleasing, and their carriage modest. They frequently gave us opportunities to observe their wish to please, particularly when the wooding party were on shore. At these times they would place themselves in a line and begin singing and making motions all the time the men were at work. 
and if their drollery happened to please the people and make them laugh, they all immediately joined in a loud burst of laughter. And when the Indians were not there, they would assist the people in getting wood and taking it to the boats. They were particularly useful in taking the wood from the beach, through the surf to the boat, as they were not encumbered with shoes and stockings, and it saved the men from wetting themselves. But if at any time the Indians came to them at the time when they were thus making themselves useful, they would instantly drive them all away with very little ceremony. Upon such occasions as these, I used to give the people small bright buttons to make them presents, with which their pride and ambition were highly gratified. One time, not having an opportunity of sending the boat on shore at the usual hour to fetch the wooding party on board, the women gave them an invitation to their habitations, which was about 300 yards from the place where they were at work, and upon this occasion treated them, or offered to do it, with everything their wretched habitations afforded, and behaved very kindly to them. Their huts are made of a few boards, which they take away with them when they go to their winter quarters. It is very surprising to see how well they will shape their boards with the shocking tools they employ, some of them being full ten feet long, two feet and a half broad and not more than an inch thick. <laughs> the country is very mountainous and covered with the pine tree, a great number of which grow to an amazing size. Their language is harsh and unpleasant to the ear, a specimen of which I have here given, spelled as near the manner of their pronunciation as I could give it. Hat seen a give or hand me, ute sea otter, Hatata bring, Korwout beads, Hoitar iron, Karkongo blanket, Een water, Utis gatea young sea otter, Egwa goon, Bad, Kawakana bostage or friendship, Onawika a box, Lala the tongue, Clake, berries like a wild raspberry, Sulk, marmot or ermine skin, Clacker, one, Taike two, Nuik three, Takun four, Kachin five, Clay, two shoe, six, Takatushu 7, Nuskatushu 8, Kushuk 9, Chini Court 10, Chin Court Kakachin 15. They have a great number of curiosities amongst them, many of which show them to be a people of great ingenuity. They make a curious basket of twigs, in which they frequently boil their victuals by putting red hot stones into them. They have tolerable ideas of carving, and indeed almost every utensil they make use of has some kind of rude carving representing an animal or other. Whilst Woodcock was with them, one of the women gave him a comb, which is made in such a manner as to represent an eagle, an engraving of both sides of which I have given in the annexed plate. But as curiosities were not the articles we were in pursuit of, I gave strict charge to my people not to purchase anything, being apprehensive that if I allowed a traffic of that nature, the natives would not have been induced to have brought us any skins for sale, as they are very useful and necessary for their clothing, whilst the others are only the amusements of their leisure hours, and many of them made by their women. I shall now take leave of my Indian friends and for the last time of the American coast. The estimable value of their furs will ever make it a desirable trade, and whenever it is established upon a proper foundation, and a settlement made, will become a very valuable and lucrative branch of commerce. It would be an easy matter for either government or our East India Company to make a settlement of this kind, and the thinness of the inhabitants will make it a matter of easy practicability, and as the company are under the necessity of paying the Chinese in cash for their teas, I look upon a settlement on this coast might be effected at a very inconsiderable expense, which would more than pay them for every article that is brought from China. Another convenience likely to accrue is from a well-known enterprising character having, if he meets with proper pecuniary assistance from the country, intentions of going overland to these parts, by this means will be finally determined the long-sought northwest passage with some account of the interior parts of the country to which we are yet entire strangers. That such an event may take place must be the wish of every lover of his country. And though the enterprise is fraught with every danger that idea can suggest, yet what is it? that British valour dares not attempt. On the 22nd at daylight, I sent Mr. Hayward out to see what wind prevailed in the passage. In the meantime, we unmoored. About five o'clock, Mr. Hayward returned. He found the wind light and variable, with some swell in the passage. At seven o'clock, a breeze sprung up about west-northwest, with which we weighed and came to sail, and proceeded towards the entering of the sound, which, as we approached, 
we found the wind very light and variable, from west to west, southwest with a considerable swell. Heaving into the passage about ten, the wind very faint, and almost directly in, got the whale boat and yawl ahead to tow the ship. At eleven, very near calm, making very little progress. But soon after, a steady, moderate breeze sprung up from the west, and just about this time, the tide of ebb making, and the two boats ahead, we got out apace, the Indians in their boats following us at some distance, and on our getting out of the passage, they returned and went into the sound. On the 23rd, about one o'clock, we cleared the rocks which lie off the south point of the harbour, and stood away south, the wind at west, southwest. On the 24th, a breeze at southeast by south, with thick rainy weather, with which we stood to the southwest by south, the land in sight. No observation, the 25th light winds and variable, with thick drizzling rain, steering southwest half south. On the 26th, a fresh breeze and foggy, steering south southeast, the wind at southwest. The 27th, a fresh gale from west northwest, and cloudy steering south southeast. On the 28th, a fresh gale from northwest, with fog at times. Passed some driftwood, a seal, and several pieces of sea lead. Our latitude 40 degrees 6 north. A voyage round the world, but more particularly to the northwest coast of America, by Captain Nathaniel Portlock. Chapter 14 Passage from the coast to the Sandwich Islands. Transactions there. Letters received from Captain Dixon and Mr. Ross. Some particulars received from Tabu Arani respecting the death of Captain Cook. Description of the White Turn. Cruelty of the chiefs to their inferiors. Observations on a trade to Botany Bay from these islands. Our final departure from them. Passage to China. Arrival there. Wednesday 28th August 1787 to Sunday 16th September. Nothing in the course of this time occurred which claims particular notice. But being now in longitude 136 to 24 some, there is a small island said to have been discovered by some Spanish navigator and laid down, the north part of it, in latitude 26 50 north and longitude of the west part of it, 135 to 0 as west, and estimating myself about five leagues to the north ward of that latitude, and in the longitude of 136 degree 20 west, I thought it not prudent to run nearer its latitude near daylight. Therefore, at two in the morning tacked and stood to the west-northwest until half past three, when I stood again to the southward. At four, a moderate breeze and cloudy weather, the wind at southwest, standing to the south-southeast, and at daylight, there was no appearance of land. On the 17th, at two in the morning, standing to the south by east, saw a large flight of flying fish, the first during September. At 2.30, I got two sets of distances of the sun and moon, which gave the longitude at that time 136 degree 80, 15, west. I judge these sights to be the most accurate I had taken, and therefore shall suppose the longitude deduced from here to be the true longitude of the ship. On Tuesday the 18th, at five in the morning, saw a few tropic birds and some bottle-nosed porpoises. From this time to the 27th, nothing happened to engage attention, and then, at half-past eight, we saw the high land of Ohaihi, bearing west-southwest half-west, distant fifteen or twenty leagues. On the 28th at five in the morning, at which time it was daylight, we found ourselves about two leagues and a half from the land, at which time we bore up and made sail towards the shore. At half past five, we were about six miles from the shore when a multitude of canoes came off with the different productions of the island, such as hogs, fowls, breadfruit, taro, plantains, and a few coconuts. Of these articles, they brought us an abundant supply, and although there was a heavy swell and the day unsettled, some of them made three or four trips to shore before evening came on for other cargoes, as they disposed of their first. We remained within four or five miles of the shore from seven in the morning until about seven in the evening, during which time I suppose we bout of hogs and pigs near two hundred, fowls about six dozen, and some bascaropi and fishing lines, enough, when laid up, to make about hundred and fifty fathom of two-inch ropey, the best lines that can be made, 
and we found very little trouble in trading with them and bout provisions very cheap. They brought very little salt, and I think very little of that article can be procured about the island, except on the west side, where it may be bought in great abundance. The whole day, about fourteen hands were employed in killing and salting for sea store, and by the evening we had salted about two tierces. A number of the large hogs we skinned, finding their skins of great use for the purpose of leathering the foot of our sails. To preserve the skins we let them lie twenty-four hours in pickle, and then hung them up to dry. After they had been two or three days hanging out, we made them up in bundles, and by airing them now and then, found they would keep any length of time. At noon, squally unsettled weather with some rain, the wind about east-northeast, the northernmost parts of the island in sight west by north, the east part of the island covered with squalls, our distance from the nearest part of the island about five miles. I could not learn from these people of any ship, having been lately at this island. Saturday, September 29, 1787, light variable winds, with frequent showers of rain, a very heavy swell from the northeast rolling in on shore, which made the surf very furious on the rocks. At four in the morning, although only four or five miles from the shore, the weather was so thick that we could not see it. At half past five in the morning, it cleared up a little, when the northernmost part of the land in sight bore west by north half north, eight or ten leagues distant, and the east point bore south by east. At six in the evening, a light breeze at east, with open cloudy weather. Two canoes remained with us until this time, when they went for the shore. At eight in the evening, judging myself about three leagues from the land, at which distance I wished to keep during the night, we hauled up our courses, and under our top sails, stood to the north by east, about a knot and a half per hour until midnight then wore ship and stood to the southeast, by south a knot and a half per hour until two in the morning, then wore again and stood to the north-northeast until four in the morning, at which time we wore and stood to the southeast until daylight, which was about half an hour past four. We then found ourselves about three leagues from the land, bore up and ran in about southwest until about half past seven. We were then about five miles from the shore, the canoes coming off in numbers, and at eight a brisk trade began for provisions and other necessities. Hauled off to the north by east, with a light breeze and the east by north. A heavy swell rolling in made it necessary to keep the ship under sail, and with all the sail we could make, we could scarcely hold our own against it. At noon a moderate breeze from the eastward with clear weather, the east point of Ohihi bore southeast by south about twelve leagues, and the northernmost part of the island in sight, west by north about nine or ten leagues, our distance from the nearest shore about four or five miles, no observation to be depended on. During the day caught several very large sharks. It is really astonishing to see how little these people appear to dread those fish. I have seen five or six large sharks swimming about the sea, when there have been, I dare say, upwards of a hundred Indians in the water, men and women, they seemed quite indifferent about them, and the sharks never offered to make an attack on any of them, and yet at the same time would seize our bait greedily. Whence it is manifest that they derive the confidence of safety from their experience that they are able to repel the attacks of those devouring monsters. On Sunday, September 20th, a moderate breeze from the eastward, with pleasant weather, a vast number of canoes about the ship, which remained with us till between three and four in the evening, when having sold all their cargoes and gratified their curiosity, they returned to the shore. By this time I suppose we had bought about three hundred hogs and pigs, and an abundant supply of bread kind. About four in the evening, with a fine little breeze from the northeast by east, we made sail from the island and stood to the west-northwest, meaning to run down on the north side of the islands to Atui where, if the Queen Charlotte had been before us, I should expect to receive some intelligence. If not, I should have an opportunity of leaving a letter with our old friend Abenu for Captain Dixon, in case he should call at that island. At four in the evening, the northernmost part of Oihi in sight, west three quarters north and the east point south, southeast half east, from the nearest shore about four leagues. At six, the north point of Oihi bore west about nine or ten leagues, and the east point south by east three quarters east, twelve or fourteen leagues distant, and the high land of Moe from west northwest, half west to northwest by west half west. At eight, moderate and cloudy weather. At midnight, light winds with open cloudy weather. 
steering northwest by north, about two knots and a half per hour, the wind at east-northeast. At four in the morning, a light breeze from the east-southeast, with cloudy weather. At eight, the east point of Ohaihi bore south-southeast by south, and the north point bore south-southwest, distant from the nearest shore seven or eight leagues, the island of Moi extending from west half south to west by north. During the day, a number of hands were employed in cutting and salting pork for sea store. Monday, 1st October, soon after dark, I was surprised to hear some Indians calling out to us and immediately saw a canoe paddling towards the ship. She came alongside and remained a few minutes, then returned towards the shore. She was from Mowi and had nothing for sale except a few bits of cloth. It is surprising how these people do venture off in their ticklish canoes. This one was so small that she would hardly contain the two men that paddled her. Tuesday the 2nd at noon, a moderate breeze at east by north with fair pleasant weather. The extremes of Wahoo south 38 degrees east and south 73 degrees east, distant from the nearest part about 7 or 8 leagues, the island of Atui, extending from south 80 degrees west to north 80 degrees west, distant about 12 leagues, latitude observed 20 58 north. At 4 in the morning, a moderate breeze at north by east and fair weather. Soon after four, hauled in for the land, and at daylight, which was soon after five, we found ourselves about two leagues from the south point of Atoi, at which time we edged away for Wimoa Bay. In running alongshore, a number of canoes, both large and small, came off to us, but brought hardly any articles of provision. I learned from them that the king and most of the principal men of the island were at Unihau, and that previous to their setting off for that island, they had tabooed the hogs, which effectively put a stop to our getting any. I also learned from these people that the Nootka and Queen Charlotte had been at the island. The Nootka, they gave me to understand, did not anchor but proceeded to Wanihau, where she lay some time. The Queen Charlotte, they told me, anchored in Waimoa Bay and remained two days, when she left the island and stood to the southward. I found from their information that Captain Dixon had left a letter for me with Abenu, and that it lay at his house at Waimoa. I therefore stretched in for the bay, and when about a mile and a half from the shore brought to, with the main topsail to the mast. Between eight and nine, a young man named Tahiri, a son of Abenu's, came on board and informed me that the letter was tabooed in the house, and that I could not get it until Abenu either came himself, or sent directions for its being delivered. I thought the best step I could take was immediately to push for one chow and anchor, where I might have an opportunity of procuring some yams whilst a messenger was going to Atui for the letter. Accordingly, I bore up about ten in the morning and made sail for Wanaka with a fair breeze at east-southeast and fair weather. At noon, a moderate breeze with fair weather, Atui extending from east by north to north-northeast, Waimoa Bay north-northeast by east about four leagues, the south point of Wanihau, South Asia, Welt by west, three quarters west, seven or eight leagues, and the Etat of Orehor northwest by west, eight leagues, latitude observed, 20 Ferngo 51 Ant north. Tawires, Abenue's son, and one or two others took their passage with us from Atui to Onihau, and from them I learned that there had been some disturbance between the Nootka and them, and that Tiaana, a principal chief of Atui, had gone off with the Nootka. A moderate breeze from southeast, with fair weather, steering to the southwest half west, at the rate of three knots an hour. At four, the northernmost part of Wanihau in sight north northeast, distant about three leagues, and the south head west by south, distant about two miles. At six in the evening, came to an anchor on the southwest side of Wanihau in 62 fathoms water, a fine white sandy bottom, and veered to a cable and a half the south head bearing over a point of land, east-southeast, half-east, distant about four or five miles, the west point north, Tendergeest, distant about two leagues, and the peaked mountain bearing over the low land, north 40 degree east, our distance from the shore about two miles. It was by no means necessary to anchor in such deep water as we then lay in, as, by going about half a mile nearer the shore, you may anchor in forty fathoms, a tolerable good bottom, and at a sufficient distance from the shore. And I would advise no person to anchor in less water about this island, as if they do, they stand a hazardous chance of being in foul ground. No canoes came off, at midnight light and variable winds, with clear pleasant weather. 
At nine in the morning, two canoes came alongside, of which we purchased a present supply of yams. The people of Onihau met those canoes, told me that Abanus would be on board in another little time, accompanied by the king and his principal papacy men. Towards noon, no appearance of any canoes. I came to the determination of sending our whaleboat and yawl ashore, to try if any yams could be purchased from the natives, meaning if Abanu did not make his appearance towards the evening to sail from the island. At noon, light variable winds, with some smart showers of rain, sent the boats ashore under the direction of Messrs Hayward and Bryant. For most of these 24 hours, a fresh breeze and variable from east-southeast, around by the east to northeast, with some showers of rain. About two in the afternoon, the king, accompanied by Abanu and most of the other principal men of Onihau and Atui, came on board and brought with them a good quantity of yams and potatoes. I learned from Abanu that Captain Dixon's letter was at Wimoa, to which place he assured me he would send for it immediately, pressing me very hard to remain until the return of the messenger, which he told me would be in about 36 hours. Judging that I could procure yams sufficient to last us to China, I promised him I would stay, and he accordingly dispatched a canoe immediately for it under the care of a trusty messenger, and in the meantime we carried on a very brisk trade for yams and water, which the natives brought off to the ship in their canoes, the water in large calabashes. Towards the evening the boats returned on board, not having purchased many yams. Abanu observing. One of the people who had just returned from shore revealed to have only one shoe on, inquired what had become of the other, and the man told him he had lost it in the surf just as he got into the boat. My old friend asked him to point out the place, saying he would go and look for it, observing at the same time that one shoe only was of little use. I attempted to dissuade him from going, as the evening was now setting in and the wind blew very fresh, but all to no purpose. Abanu, determined to search for the shoe, took a canoe that we kept for his use and paddled away for the beach, and in less than an hour he returned on board, bringing the shoe and buckle, and was pleased to the last degree that he had been successful in his undertaking. My old friend informed me that the Nootka Tester sailed from this place about a month ago, and Captain Dixon having sailed from Atui about 18 or 20 days ago. He gave me to understand that the Nootka and them parted on bad terms, but that Captain Dixon and they parted on terms perfectly friendly. He told me that they had been fired on by the Nootka, but that no person had been hurt. He also confirmed the account of Tai E. Anars having gone off with the Nootka. Towards the evening, the king and most of the principal people went ashore. Abanu and a few others remained on board with us all night. In the morning, we began again a brisk trade for yams and water. At noon, a fresh breeze from the northeast with open cloudy weather. Fresh breezes from northeast with open cloudy weather. The whole of these 24 hours employed purchasing yams and water. In the morning I received a letter, by the hands of one of the chiefs, from Mr. David Ross, chief mate of the Snow Nootka, in which he mentioned their having sailed from this island on the fifth day of the last month. He likewise informed me that they left an anchor in Yam Bay, and supposed that their cable was cut by the Indians, but I should rather suppose by the rocks. Some other letters were received by different people on board from the Nootka, which gave an account of their having lost an anchor at Mowi and a large grapnel at some other place. A fresh breeze from the eastward, with open cloudy weather, most of these 24 hours. In the evening, busily employed in purchasing yams and water, and by six o'clock had completed that business, having procured about 12 tons of yams, a quantity of potatoes, and filled seven butts and two puncheons of water. At eight in the morning, the messenger returned from Atui with Captain Dixon's letter, which I found dated the 18th of September, and that he had left the coast on the 9th of August all well and with 1,500 skins. He likewise informed me that off King George's Sound, he fell in with a ship and sloop under company's colours. I should suppose our company's the ship called the Prince of Wales, commanded by a Captain Colnett. The sloop's name he did not mention. She was commanded by a Captain Duncan, and Mr. John Etches was supercargo. Captain Colnett informed him that he had just come out of King George's Sound, at which place he had found lying a ship under Imperial colours, commanded by Captain Barclay, and manned by Englishmen. He said nothing of their success or intentions. 
Immediately on the receipt of this letter, I began to heave short. About half past nine, we were underway. We lay to until near noon, when, having finished a letter for Captain Colnett, or Duncan, or any other commander belonging to the King George's Sound Company, and delivered it to the care of my old friend Abenu, we made sail from the island at noon and steered to the west by south, intending after getting clear of Tahura and the Shoal, called by the Indians Modu Papapa, which I never saw but judge from the information I have received from different Indians to lie about west-southwest from Tahura at a little distance, to howl to the southward as far as 14 dig or 13 dig 30 dig north, as the safest track, until we got the length of the Ladronis. On quitting our friends thereabouts, I must do them the justice to say we have ever found them friendly and useful. A man of some note, named Tabu A Ra Ni, belonging to Uhai He, took his passage with us to this place and was received by the king and principal men with much satisfaction. I saw a very striking likeness between him and Ka Ni Na, who was killed at the time Captain Cook fell, and who was always a most friendly chief. I inquired if he knew Kanina, at which he seemed surprised and hesitated for some time, seemingly considering what answer he should make me. At last he informed me that he was his own brother, of which I had little doubt from the great resemblance of their features. Tabu Arani is a well-made, tall, handsome fellow, and from what I could judge of him, had a disposition equally good with his unfortunate brother. He could scarcely refrain from tears while speaking of him, and assured me that to the last moment of his life he was our sincere and faithful friend. I asked him if Captain Cook was killed with a pahoa. He told me no, that he was killed with another weapon, the point entering in between the shoulders and coming out at his breast, and I am certain he was right in his explanation of the instrument, for on my showing him a pahoa, he said that was not it, and hunted about the cabin till he found a bayonet, and assured me that the Orono was killed with an instrument of that kind. And it is very probable it might be so, as the natives had got some from the ships, either by stealth or by trading with the people. And I am inclined to believe the man knew, as he informed me, that he was present when Captain Cook was killed. He said a great number of their people were wounded from the fire at different times, the greatest part of whom died, particularly those that were wounded in the body, such as recovered were only wounded in the fleshy parts. He told me that the present King Koma Amaa and other chiefs were very much afraid of coming on board, dreading our resenting the fate of our countrymen. He informed me that Paria is the principal chief around Karakakua Bay and is at present in great esteem. He confirmed the account of old Teriobu's dying a natural death and being succeeded by his relation Koma Amaa, and that he was much lamented by his subjects. Tabu Arani likewise gave me an account of two vessels having anchored in Karakakua Bay, where they remained five days. He said they were ships from Britannia, and in the two had fifteen women and eight children on board, and described them as European women. This I looked on as a strange account, and well knowing that these people are very apt to invent stories, I gave no credit to that part of the account respecting the women and children being on board. The rest might possibly be true, though one improbable circumstance rendered the whole doubtful and suspicious. For though there seems to be a kind of propensity generally prevailing among these people to invent and contrive reports, with a view to please and oblige, yet there is another quality which seems the most predominant in them of all others, and which is always visible in those who are vested with any degree of authority or power, or are anyways elevated or exalted to a station superior to their neighbours. For arrogance, insolence and veracity are the distinguishing properties by which their inferiors are taught to dread them and be awed into the most submissive obedience to their commands, however opposite to their ease, interest or safety. Inasmuch that I have seen a considerable chief at Wurhu sit in his canoe alongside, without an article for sale himself, and watch a poor fellow that had perhaps paddled from the opposite side of the island with all his family and perhaps all their worldly property and substance, such as two or three pigs, a few plantains, pieces of cloth, and some breadfruit. And after selling their little cargo and getting for it a few bits of iron and some little trinkets, things, the iron in particular, that are inestimable to them, that greedy and tyrannical chief hath jumped out of his canoe into the water, swam to the poor man, and demanded of him every article which he had seen him receive, which was instantly given up. On these occasions I spoke to the king, 
who made me understand that it was warranted by their established custom, and after receiving such an answer, I was apprehensive that any further attempts to intercede on the poor man's behalf might aggravate the injury to the sufferers and be productive of worse and more serious consequences to him, as well as create some disgust to me for presuming to call into question or suggesting the impropriety of the rules by which they were governed, and therefore I waived the subject and desisted from my purpose, though urged to it by all the sense of pity and compassion. Among the variety of occurrences that happened during our last visit to Atui, the reader may recollect the circumstance of Puarear, a messenger belonging to the king, obliging an old chief by force to discover where his treasures were deposited and afterwards seizing on them as his own. As we left the island soon after that transaction, I had no opportunity of learning how it terminated. But when Abanu came on board at Wankau, he informed me that when Ta'o heard of the affair, he was so much displeased with the messenger that he ordered Puaria, although a favourite, to be put to death for the robbery and his cruelty to the poor old man. This order was executed by a chief named Namaterai, whose courage and activity have already been spoken of. Namaterai found the culprit in a village situated a little to the eastward of Waimoa, where he attacked and, after some resistance, killed him with a pahoa. The messenger also happened to have a pahoa, but was so unequal a match for the warrior that it was of no use to him. These instances serve to show that though the common people are plundered at the pleasure of their superiors, yet the chiefs are not suffered to assault and rob each other with impunity. And most of the birds met with at the Sandwich Islands are already well known. However, I brought a specimen of the white tern home with me, and as I do not find that it has yet been figured in any English work, I have procured a correct drawing of it from which the annexed engraving is taken, and with Mr. Latham's permission, have taken the following description from the sixth volume of his Synopsis of Birds, Pisum 363, where an account of it is given. White tern, length 13 inches, breadth 30, bill slender, black, eyelids the same, the general colour of the plumage white as snow, but the shafts of the scapular quills and tail, except the three outer feathers, are black. The tail is forked in shape and shorter than the wings when closed by an inch. Legs brown, webs orange, claws black. In some, there is a slight mixture of brown on the back. This bird inhabits various places of the southern hemisphere, having been met with off the island of St. Helena, the Cape of Good Hope, etc., and many of the islands of the South Ocean. With respect to the description of the natives of these islands, I mean their persons, their houses, canoes, customs, civil, military and religious, I refer the reader to the more full account of Captains Cook and King. But one piece of advice I will venture to give to those whose business may lead them to these islands for the purpose of watering and refreshing is this, that they make the island of Ohaihi, a little to the southward of the east point and run down the south side of the island. There is no danger but what shows itself, nor indeed did I perceive any that lay half a mile from the shore until you come the length of the south point. There is off that point a reef that runs off about a mile, which is easily discovered by breakers and coloured water. In this run, you may get small hogs and vegetables enough for present supply, and after hauling around the south point, you will begin to get a supply of salt, which article cannot be procured at the eastern part of the island. I mean, not after you get to the eastward and northward of Karakakua Bay. And as you draw towards Karakakua, you will get a plentiful supply of fine hogs, breadfruit and sweet potatoes, taro, sugarcane and coconuts. This island is not famous for the sweet route, and between Karakakua and the South Point, you may procure all the refreshments the island affords, and you may also get the natives to bring off fresh water enough for present use. Take care they do not cheat you by filling their calabashes with salt water, which they will do and sell it if you are not careful in tasting. Several of my people were cheated this way. And hereabouts is the situation I would recommend for salting pork. You will have the open and unconfined confined air, and at the same time moderate breezes and smooth water, which enables the canoes to come off with greater care and safety with their hogs and salt. From this part, I would advise the navigator to run for the west end of Ranai. The bearings and distances of these islands from each other will be found by consulting the chart of them in Captain Cook's last voyage, and from that point sail directly for the west point of Moratoy. Should night come on, there is anchorage to the northward of the west point of Moratoy, 
sheltered from the prevailing winds. After leaving this island, sail directly for the southeast point of Woahu, and on rounding that point anchor in King George's Bay. If found necessary to stay there any time, it would be advisable to buoy the cables. At this island I would advise the watering and wooding business to be done, not by sending on shore for either article, but by encouraging the natives to bring them to the vessel. To give any further directions respecting the navigation amongst these islands would be superfluous, as every particular on that head may be collected from the detail of occurrences during our second visit to them. I cannot help observing that I think their situation and produce may be productive of material benefit to our new settlement at Botany Bay, and at the same time be a considerable saving to government in the articles of provisions, which may be purchased here at a trifling expense. A fresh breeze with hazy weather, the wind at east, the west end of Tahura bore south 15 west east, distant 7 or 8 leagues, the south head of Onichau east about 11 or 12 leagues distant, and the northernmost part of the island in sight north 65 degrees east. At noon a fine gale with pleasant weather, latitude observed 25 degrees 26 north, longitude about 161 degrees 56 west. Taking our departure from the island of Tahura, it lying in the latitude of 21 degrees Morty Furies north, and longitude 160 degrees 24 west of Greenwich, variation about 9 degrees east. From this time to the 4th of November, nothing particular occurred. October, Monday 8th. A fresh gale from the northeast with hazy weather, steering west-northwest half-west, 5 knots per hour. At 5 in the evening, I got a set of azimuths, which gave the variation 7 degrees 54 east. At 8, hauled in the lower steering sails. At this time, according to the situation given Tinian by Captain Cook, East Point latitude nearest 14 degree 55 north and longitude 200 months in 3 degree 45. West of Greenwich, I judged it to bear north 84 and west and distant 84 miles. And as we had a fine brisk gale from the northeast with clear weather, I determined to run on all night, hoping to get a sight of the island about daylight, which is between 5 and 6. At midnight, a fine steady 6.5 knot gale from the northeast. At 2 in the morning, a seven knot gaily, how led in the topmast steering sails. Just at daylight, which was about half past five, saw the islands of Saipan and Tinian, the north point of Saipan bearing west northwest, distant about seven or eight leagues, and the east point of Tinian bearing southwest half west, distant eleven or twelve leagues, the north point of Tinian shut in with the south point of Saipan. At this time, our latitude by account was 15 degrees 16 north and longitude. From observations made forward, 200 to 16, 30, west. The east end of Tinian, according to Captain Cook's chart, should then have borne 55 degrees 00 west, 37 miles, and the bearing we then had of it was 58 degrees 00 west, and as near as I could guess, distant about 33 miles. Therefore, I shall conclude that the situation given those islands by Captain Cook is very nearly the truth. We continued to stand onto the west northwest half west, with a fresh gale from the northeast by north until six, when we altered the course to west and set steering sails. We stood in west until seven o'clock, then steered southwest by west and southwest by south, ranging along the east side of Saipan, at the distance of about two and a half leagues. At half past eight, the passage between Saipan and Tinian open, steered for it, and about nine passed close to the south end of Saipan immediately to the westward of which point is a good bay, with perfect smooth water and a fine sandy beach, on which there was scarce any surf. I did not stand into the bay, therefore cannot speak as to the soundings, but I dare say the anchorage may be very good. A little to the westward of this bay is another, which looks well for anchorage. In passing through this passage, which trends about west by north and east by south, distance from one island to the other, between two and three leagues, we observed no foul grounds lying off from either island until we got nearly through, then discerned a reef lying from the southwest point of Saipan northwest, distant about half a mile. Indeed, all the west side of Saipan appears to be bounded by a reef running nearly the same distance from the shore, and from the Said southwest point is a small island bearing north half west, distant three or four leagues, from which island there is a reef running off in the direction of about southwest to the distance of a league and a half, and there is also a reef running off from this small island, 
that seems to join to it. We observed a cluster of white animals grazing on the plains of Tinian, which we suppose to be the white cattle Mr. Anson says the island of Tinian so much abounds with. We could not, although within half a mile of Saipan, observe an animal of any kind. Both islands appear beyond description beautiful, abounding in immense quantities of coconut and other trees. We could not pass so near these beautiful islands without wishing very much to partake of the refreshments they could so amply furnish us with, particularly the fresh beef and acid fruits, articles to which we have been strangers for upwards of two years. But as through the blessing of God we were all in perfect health, and not being in need of any refreshments, and aided by a fine, steady, brisk gale, I thought it most advisable to push on for China, and after getting through the passage, stood away to the west-northwest, with a brisk gale at northeast by north, and to the honour of the King George's ship's company be it ever remembered, that on this so tempting an occasion, as indeed on all others, not a murmur was heard, nor a discontented face seen. From this time to the 15th of November, nothing occurred in particular to excite the reader's attention. A fresh breeze from the northeast, with hazy weather and a heavy sea from the northeast, with which we are steering about west-southwest, down towards the south point of the small Botel Tobago Shima. About two in the afternoon, we passed the reef, which runs off its southeast point at the distance of about half a mile, and then hauled to the west by north, with a six-knot gale at northeast. Those islands I found to lie in the latitude of 2452 gus north and longitude of 238 dig 35 and west, lying nearly north and south of each other, with an apparently good passage of about two or three miles broad between them. On the southwest part of the large island, the land appeared to bend in and form a good bay, well sheltered from the northeast winds. We observed a little wood, but it appeared to be low and small. The western side of the large island appeared very green and pleasant, and in many places was laid out in cultivated plots, and in several places along the shore were towns of considerable extent. We did not attempt to haul in for anchorage, but continued to steer over west by north to make the island of Formosa, and at half past three I saw it, the south point bearing west by north, distant about ten or eleven leagues. At four a fine gale at northeast, with which we steered west by north six knots per hour, the large Botel Tobago Shima, bearing north by west half west and east by north, distant from the nearest part of it about four or five leagues. At five, altered the course to north by west, the wind at north northeast, the extremes of Botel Tobago Shima, bearing northeast by east half east, distant about five leagues, and east by north six leagues, the south point of Formosa, west half south, distant about eight leagues. At six, a fresh gale at north northeast with dark cloudy weather. We then close reefed the topsails, warship, and stood to the eastward. At half past four, saw a large light on the isles of Botel Tobago Shima, bearing east southeast, warship, and stood to the northwest, the wind at northeast. At midnight, a fresh gale with cloudy weather. At four in the morning, warship, and stood to the east by north, and at half past five, daylight, when we bore away to the south southwest and made sail set steering sails. In the course of the night we had a current which set us about six leagues northward along the coast of Formosa, the south point of which island bore southwest half south, distant about five leagues and the northernmost part of the said island in sight north by west, distant about twelve leagues. Up main top gallant yard and set the sail. We were steering along shore south southwest towards the south point at the rate of six and a half to seven knots per hour. Our distance from the shore abreast about two leagues, and in running down saw a good appearance of a harbour about four or five leagues to the northward of the south point, which seemed to run in about a southwest direction, and between that and the south point several small hammock rocks, lying at a little distance from the shore. The coast that we run down along might be approached within three or four miles without any danger. At half past ten passed around the south point, within about a mile of the shore. From off this point, there is a reef runs off about half a mile. In about a south-southeast direction, we saw nothing of the Villarete rocks, it being very thick in their direction, and after passing the south point, we hauled to the west-northwest at the rate of six and seven knots an hour. 
immediately on getting round the south point, I observed the land to bend short into the northward and form a very good bay for shelter against the northeast winds, the water in the bay quite smooth and scarce any surf on the beach. I had an intention of anchoring upon this coast and would have done it had I seen any inhabitants or habitations to have entered into a traffic with them. But as I saw no appearance of this part of the land being peopled, I gave up the idea and proceeded on towards the coast of China, with a fresh gale at northeast by north, with frequent gusts from the land and dark cloudy weather. At noon, moderate with unsettled looking weather, the south point of Formosa bearing east by south, distant about five leagues, and the northernmost part in sight on the western side, northwest one quarter west, distant four leagues, no observation. Latitude account 20 C Wang D Aero 6 E's north, longitude by account 229 D 377, longitude by departure 239 D or 2. This morning at daylight, we were surrounded by a multitude of Chinese fishing vessels or junks. At seven saw the land through the haze, bearing from north to west northwest, and at eight saw Pedro Branca, bearing west by north, distant four or five leagues, a moderate breeze at north, with very hazy weather, with which we steered, west by north, about four and a half knots per hour. In this run from the south point of Formosa, the ship ahead of the reckoning nearly 80 miles of longitude. At half past nine, seeing a Chinese vessel steering down towards us, we shortened sail and brought to, in hopes of getting a pilot out of her. Sent the whaleboat on board her, which returned soon after, accompanied by a boat from the Chinese vessel, in which came a pilot with whom I agreed for his carrying the ship to Macau for fifty dollars. At half past ten, filled, and stood to the west-northwest, the wind at north, a three-knot breeze. At two, hazy weather, sounded in twenty-four fathoms black muddy sandy bottom, Pedro Blanco bearing northeast by north, distant about four miles, and the coast in sight to the north-northwest, distant eight or nine leagues, no observation, latitude by account, twenty circuiting thirty-eight north, longitude by departure, two hundred forty-two d sixteen. West. Light winds from the northward with hazy weather, with which we steered to the west northwest, one knot six fathoms per hour, sounding from twenty two to nineteen fathoms over a bottom of black muddy sand. At four in the evening, the land in sight extended from north by east to west by north, distant from the nearest part five or six leagues, and Pedro Blanco, north eighty eight degree east, distant about seven leagues. A strong tide or current setting us to the westward, at five sounded in seventeen fathoms, black muddy sand. At half past five, the land extended from north northeast to west northwest, distant from the nearest part about five leagues, a small island lying off the coast bearing northwest, distant about four leagues. Moderate breeze from the north, with hazy weather, with which we steered to the west northwest, about two knots per hour, regular soundings, from nineteen to seventeen and a half fathoms over a bottom of fine black muddy sand. At nine, anchored with the best bower in seventeen and a half fathoms over a bottom of black mud sand. The small island before, mentioned bearing northeast half north, about four leagues, the coast in sight from northeast by north to west southwest, distant from the nearest point four or five leagues. During the night, moderate and variable winds. At six in the morning, a moderate breeze at northeast by north with which we weighed and came to sail up top gallant yards and set the sails and steered to the southwest by west about three knots per hour. At eight, a light breeze at northeast, with hazy weather, the westernmost part of the Grand Lima bearing southwest by west, distant six or seven leagues, the easternmost part of the coast or islands northeast half north, about the same distance. And the small island before Mentionid, northeast half east nine or ten leagues distant and our distance from the nearest shore of four or five leagues. During the forenoon, a brisk breezy at northeast, with which we steered in west-southwest, at the rate of four or five knots per hour for the passage to the northward of the Grand Lama. Regular sounding from fifteen and a half to nineteen and a half fathom over a bottom of muddy sand, and at eleven, squally, hauled in the steering sails. At noon, a fresh breeze at north-northeast, with squalls, and with which we steered west-southwest, in the passage to the northward of the Grand Lima, six knots per hour. The east part of the Grand Lima, bearing southeast by south, thirteen or fourteen miles, 
and the northernmost land in sight, northeast by east, our distance from an island to the north-northwest, about one mile. No observation. A fresh breeze at north-northeast, with hazy weather, with which we steered west-northwest four knots per hour, sounded frequently as we run in, and found depth of water from thirteen to fifteen fathoms over a muddy bottom. At four in the evening, a moderate breeze at north with which we stood to the west-northwest half-west, nine knots per hour, almost surrounded by islands. At sunset, anchored with the best bower in eight and a quarter, fathoms of water, over a bottom of mud, the extremes of lantern bearing southeast by east, a quarter east, and southeast half east, islands all around, our distance from the nearest shore about two miles, down top gallant yards. During the night, light and variable winds with cloudy weather. At six in the morning, with a light breeze from the northward, we weighed, sounding frequently as we approached the passage leading to Macau, and found from eight to six fathoms over a muddy bottom. About nine, by bearing too near the southern and eastern shore, we suddenly shoaled our water to three and a half fathoms, but by keeping a little to the north, we deepened it again to six fathoms and then stood through the passage, a fresh breeze at about northeast by north, with clear weather. At half past ten, the ebb tide having made, we came to anchor with the best bower in nine fathoms, muddy bottom, the city of Macau bearing northwest half north, Isla about five or six leagues. At noon, a moderate breeze with fair weather, observed latitude 20 sectang tending north, a moderate breeze at north with hazy weather. At one in the afternoon, the ebb tide having slacked, we weighed and stood towards Macau, and at half past four, anchored with the best bower in four and a half fathoms, muddy bottom in Macau Road, the town bearing west by south, distance two or three leagues, and Lantern Peak East. At five, sent the whale boat ashore to Macau. At six in the evening, a fresh breeze at north by west with fine weather. Saw lying in the Taipa two large ships under French colours, one of which I found to be a 32-gun frigate and the other an armed store ship. Their destination, after leaving this, is generally supposed to be to the island of Tarat, where it is believed the French mean to get a footing. About seven in the morning the boat returned, having finished her business. The officer in her brought me a letter from Captain Dixon, informing me of his safe arrival in China, and that in consequence of cargoes being procured for our two ships, he had proceeded up to Wampur, where the Nootka was also arrived from Prince William's Sound, and a ship called the Imperial Eagle, commanded by a Captain Berkeley, from King George's Sound, English property, under Imperial colours. We heard of two vessels from India to the northwest coast being missing, the one commanded by a Captain Peters and the other by a Captain Tipping, most likely cut off by the natives of that coast. After receiving on board for the use of the ship's company 257 pounds of fresh beef and some vegetables, sent the boat ashore again to get a pilot for the ship to Wampoa. Light winds at north by west with pleasant weather. In the afternoon moored ship with the kedge anchor, Arrived on board nine seamen, late belonging to the ship Imperial Eagle, and too late of the Nootka, to take a passage to Wampoa. Moderate breezes from the north-northeast with fair pleasant weather. At seven in the evening the pilot came on board. At four in the morning, weighed, and came to sail from Macau towards Wampoa, and at noon was turning to windward between Macau and Lantern. Before we left Macau, received on board eleven Lascars and four seamen more as passengers for Wampoa a moderate breeze from the eastward, with fair pleasant weather. At one in the afternoon, the flood being spent, came to with the best bower in ten fathoms water, loose sandy bottom, the island of Lantern, the peak, bearing east by south and the southwest point of Macau west southwest. At half past four, weighed and came to sail, set steering sails, the tide of flood being expended, at ten came to, with the best bower in nine and a half fathoms of water, muddy bottom. At seven in the morning, weighed and came to sail. At eight, passed the Boko Tigris, and at noon, were plying to windward up Canton River. Light breeze from the eastward with pleasant weather. At two in the afternoon, came to with the best bower in seven and a quarter fathoms of water, muddy bottom. At the same time, came on board Captain Dixon of the Queen Charlotte, 
the first pagoda bearing northwest half west, four or five leagues. At seven in the evening weighed and came to sail. At eleven came to with the best bower in six fathoms, two miles below Wampoa, and at ten in the morning weighed again and dropped up to Wampoa and moored ship with both anchors in five fathoms of water. Whilst we lay at Wampoa, our principal business was to refit the ship and take a cargo of tea on board on account of the East India Company. An account of the disposal of our furs and other material incidents being given in Captain Dixon's voyage, I refer the reader to that publication. During this interval, a dangerous mutiny happened on board the Belvedere, Captain Greer, then lying at Wampoa. A thing of this nature being of the most dangerous consequence to a commercial country, I have Captain Greer's permission to publish the examination of the mutineers before a court of inquiry, which, together with some anecdotes of Tyana, whom I met with at Canton, will be the subject of the next chapter. A Voyage Round the World, but more particularly to the northwest coast of America, by Captain Nathaniel Portlock. Chapter 15 An account of a court of inquiry, held at the request of Captain Greer of the Belvedere, on his people who mutinied in his absence. The court's determination thereon, and punishment inflicted upon the mutineers, account of meeting with Tiana at China, his behaviour there, attention paid him, return to his own country, a short description of his person. Wampoa, 9th of December, 1787. At a court of enquiry held on board the Earl Fitzwilliam in consequence of the following letter from the Council of Supercargoes, to Captain James Dundas, commander of the Earl Fitzwilliam and senior commander. Sir, having taken into serious consideration the circumstances of the late riot and mutiny on board the Belvedere, and the dreadful consequences that might be apprehended to the Honourable Company's property and the general interest of the nation in the trade of this place were such an instance of licentiousness passed over without due punishment. And being of opinion with the commanders whom we have consulted on the occasion that the inflicting immediate and severe corporal chastisement on the principal offenders will more effectively contribute to the end proposed of deterring others from following so dangerous an example than consigning them over to the more dreadful punishment which they have incurred from the laws of their country, on account of the distance of time which must necessarily intervene, and the probable absence of those on whom we wish it to operate, as an example. We request you will, at such time as shall be most convenient to you, assemble the commanders of the several ships, to consult and determine on such punishment to be inflicted on the offenders, as shall appear to you proportion to their several offences, and report to us your opinion of the same. We are, sir, your most obedient humble servants, Henry Brown, John Harrison, Jr., G. Cumming, Jr., Alex Bruce, Charles Edward Pigou, and Henry Lane. Canton, 18th December, 1787. On receiving the foregoing order, I made the signal for all commanders, read the said letter, sent for the prisoners and principal witnesses on board the Earl Fitzwilliam, and requested them to prepare themselves for a court to be held here at eight o'clock next morning. Wampanoa, 10th December, 1787. Present, Captain James Dundas, President. Alexander Montgomery, Joseph Huddart, J. H. Dempster, James Monroe, Henry Churchill, Gurge Blatchford, William Hardcastle, David Tolmy, George Millet, Richard Pennell, William Storey, Philip Dundas, John Dennis, John Piber, Charles Lindegren. The court being convened, I read the above order from the Council of Supercargoes. I then called the prisoners forward and read the following charge. You, John Berry, Abraham Lilly, Henry Ladson, James Keefe, Anthony Garland, Robert Skinner, Thomas Langford, William Connor, Timothy Kelly, and John Hastings, not having the fear of God before your eyes, are charged with the high crime of mutiny in first meditating a forethought a design to insult the officers of the ship December Belvedere, to which you belonged, and carrying the same into execution by refusing to obey the commanding officer, by seizing him, beating him, and otherwise ill-using him, on Saturday night the 1st of December in this present year, and continuing your mutinous behaviour till Sunday noon, when you attempted to carry the command of the ship Belvedere against your officers, which you in some measure effected by turning the guns aft upon them and threatening to murder them, 
by breaking open locks and threatening to fire the powder and blow up the ship. Further, even when assistance was called from the rest of the company's ships for the purpose of enabling the officers to resume their command and procure a peace to such of his Maesty's subjects as were willing to return to their duty on board the Belvedere. You wantonly armed yourselves with shot and other dangerous weapons and attempted the life of such of His Majesty's subjects as endeavoured to suppress your mutinous behaviour, entreating and persuading the rest of the ship's company to assist you and threatening to murder them if they did not join you in this mutiny. But thank God the murders that might have been the consequence were happily prevented by the immediate assistance from the Commodore. We are therefore called upon by our Honourable Masters to make inquiry into this matter. Mr. David Dunlop, Chief Officer of the ship Belvedere, was called in and examined. I asked him to inform the court of what he knew of the prisoners and the mutiny they are accused of, which he did as follows. On Saturday night, the 1st of December, between 10 and 11 o'clock, I was going to bed and heard Ladson, Keefe and Connor singing and making a noise on the gun deck. I desired them to leave off and not make such a noise to disturb the people on board the ship, to which Ladson replied that he thought it was hard he had not the liberty of singing a song. I told him he might go on the forecastle and sing till he was teared, but he must not sing on the gun deck. They left off making a noise and I went to bed. In half an hour afterward was surprised to hear them make more noise than before. I turned out and desired my servant to bring me a light. I went forward to them and desired them to leave off when James Keefe laid hold of the candle that was in my hand. I seized him by the collar and endeavoured to get the candle again when he put the candle out. I was very ill-used in the dark by Keefe and others. I received several blows. There were several billets of woodhove. I then called for lights. The mates who were on board were soon with me. I held Keefe fast by the hair of the head, being determined to put him in irons. The people turned out and said he should not be put in irons. The men who made the people turn out were Abraham Lilly, John Berry, Henry Ladson, James Keefe, Anthony Garland, Robert Skinner, Thomas Langford and William Connor. James Keefe was handed upon the quarter-deck and while the carpenters were getting the irons, the prisoners behaved in a mutinous manner and William Connor threatened the fifth mate, Mr Law, and said he would be his butcher. Berry, Lilly and Ladson appeared at their head near the quarter-deck and declared they were on board of a merchantman and no man should be put in irons or punished for any offences whatsoever. The man, James Keefe, was put in irons. I desired the people to go to their hammocks, but they would not quit the deck where they remained until between two and three o'clock on Sunday morning when they began to drop off. And I believe by three the deck was clear of them, I then ordered one of the officers with two midshipmen and a quartermaster to keep watch and in case of any disturbance to call me. I then went to bed. On Sunday morning when the hands were called, the boatsmen informed me the people refused to turn out, on which I went forward among them, telling them the bad consequence that would attend refusing to do their duty and behaving in such a mutinous manner for which I was convinced they had no cause. Upon which they went and washed the decks and remained very quiet till one o'clock of the same day when they rushed suddenly up from the gun deck, armed with gunner's hand spikes, billets of wood, marlin spikes and double-headed shot, and rushed aft on the quarter deck with John Berry and Abraham Lilly at their head, threatening they would murder any man who should attempt to oppose their releasing the prisoner. The sixth mate, Mr. James McCulloch, was knocked down by John Berry with a marlin spike, which he held in his hand with a lanyard to it. I attempted to stop them, but was very near being thrown overboard. I saved myself by getting hold of the lanyard of the foremast main shroud. They took the prisoner on the main deck, knocked off his stools, and threw them overboard. Berry then said the day was theirs, and ordered to give three cheers, which they did. I ordered the gunner to hand the arms out of the gun room, that I might secure the ringleaders and take them into custody. The people then went down on the gun deck, secured the ports, knocked away all the ladders and pointed the two bow guns aft. They also broke open the fore scuttle and cleared away a quantity of cordage that was on the magazine scuttle. They clapped bolts and the poker into the fire to serve as matches. Being afraid I would come down upon them, they raised a report that they had broken open the magazine and loaded the two bow guns. Seeing that all the officers were of the opinion that it would be dangerous to attack them in that situation, lest they might accidentally or willfully blow up the ship, 
I went forward to the fore hatchway on the upper deck and desired them to keep away from the magazine. Berry, Lily, Ladson, Skinner and Garland were the men that spoke to me from the gun deck. They said if any of the officers attempted to come down on the gun deck, they would certainly murder them, and sooner than they should be taken would blow the ship up. In a few minutes after this, the second mate, Mr. Craig, came on board. Finding that there was no probability of getting them from the magazine while I remained on board, I left the ship, leaving orders to the second mate not to let any boats come alongside, nor let our people out of the ship, or suffer them to have any liquor. I then went on board the Earl Fitzwilliam, and returned with Mr. Rate on board our ship, and sent for the third mate, and ordered him, as soon as all hands were called, to take possession of the Lazaretta with six quartermasters, armed and if any attempted the magazine to run him through. I ordered the gunner, with his two mates, to defend the gun room, and if any attempt was made, to shoot those that did. All hands were then called, and appeared upon the upper deck, with John Berry and Abraham Lilly at their head, and Mr. Rate and myself endeavoured by fair means for them to deliver up the ringleaders, which Berry and Lilly absolutely refused to do. Berry said he would fight all the ships at Wampoa, so long as the Belvedere's side stuck together, and would die to a man before any of them should be punished. I found that the boats were advancing, and the people, armed with shot, threatened to sink the boats if they attempted to come alongside. I immediately ordered the officers to arm and clear the deck of them, and to kill any man who should attempt to throw shot at the boats. The upper deck was immediately cleared, they jumped down the fore hatchway and rushed to the main scuttle. There was immediately a cry on the gun deck that they had got possession of the magazine. While Mr. Rate and myself attempted to clear the main deck, John Berry and John Hastings were armed with shot and threatened to throw them at us. I went down then on the main deck by the main scuttle. The first man I met with was Keefe, whom I secured and handed upon the quarter deck. I believe in the space of five minutes, all the prisoners were secured. Questions to the witness. Abraham Lilly, was I the head man present with AL when Keefe was taken out of irons? Answer. You were. Lily, was I one of the men that answered you from the gun deck? Answer, you were. Lily, was I one of the six that threatened to cut the people down to turn out? Answer, to the best of my knowledge, you were. So Anthony Garland, was I seen at the fore hatchway? Answer, yes. Garland, was I on the quarter deck when Keefe was rescued? Answer, to the best of my knowledge, you were. Henry Ladson. Was I at the fore hatchway when the people spoke to you from below? Answer. To the best of my knowledge, you were. Garland. Was I one of the six that threatened to cut the people down to turn out? Answer. To the best of my knowledge, you were. Robert Skinner. Was I one of the six that threatened to cut the people down to turn out? Answer. To the best of my knowledge, you were. Skinner. Was I one of those who spoke to you from the fore hatch? Answer. To the best of my abilities, you were. John Berry. Was I one of the six that threatened to cut the people down to turn out? Answer. To the best of my knowledge, you were. Court. Did you see or know who those men were that took off the irons and threw them overboard? Answer. I cannot say. Court. At what hour was it when those people spoke to you from the fore hatchway? Answer. About a quarter past one o'clock when the ports were lashed in. Court. Was any officer present at the above conversation at the fore hatchway? Answer. Yes, the third and sixth mate. Court. This witness further says there are two of the prisoners, Hastings and Connor, who always behaved well until this affair, and he believes they were led into it by the rest. Court requested to know if the prisoners wanted to ask Mr Dunlop any more questions? Prisoners? No. Mr. Millican Craig, second officer of the ship Belvedere, called in and desired to inform the court of what he knew respecting the prisoners and the mutiny. It was near one o'clock on Sunday when I met Captain Clarkson between the Earl Fitzwilliam and Hillsborough. He inquired if Captain Greer was in the boat. He said not, when he immediately told him there was a mutiny on the Belvedere. When I came on board at one o'clock, I found the ship in a mutinous state. The people would not permit boats to come alongside, they threatened to sink them with shot if they did. I went into the cuddy with Mr Dunlop and the rest of the officers of the ship to dinner. 
When I came out again, Mr. Dunlop left the ship. The orders that Mr. Dunlop left were, I was to endeavour to keep the ship in quietness if possible, and to prevent liquor coming into the ship. I was to do nothing else until I received further orders, the men at that time in a state of madness with liquor. When Mr. Dunlop was out of the ship, all the mutineers came aft, among whom were the prisoners now before me. They said they intended to be obedient to my command, till such time as they saw Captain Greer. I told them I immediately expected they would. I desired they would point the guns forward they had pointed aft, to give up the possession of the magazine, to haul up the ports, and in every other case to put the ship in order, which they did. They asked, if Kaif was a free man, I told them I should wait for orders how to act with him. I then sent for the gunner and desired him to see the magazine and the gun secured. He reported it was done. The officers at the same time were allowed to walk the deck or any part of the ship they pleased. The ship was perfectly quiet till the note came from the Commodore and also afterwards till Mr. Raitt and Mr. Dunlop came on board. They then objected to their coming on board and came aft in a mutinous manner upon which I prevented their obstructing the passage of the above gentlemen. Mr. Dunlop desired all hands to be called. Mr. Raitt and Mr. Beether Dunlop delivered these orders sent by the Commodore, which was to deliver up the ringleaders. They all objected to it and swore they would hoist a red flag before they would permit it. Mr. Raitt then pointed out the folly of standing out against so many ships here. They said they did not care. They would give it red hot on both sides, particularly Berry. The attack was then made on the mutineers by the officers on board and in the boats. They were driven below and taken prisoners. Questions from the court. What boats were those that were prevented from coming alongside? Answer. Mr. Temple was in the boat. Do not know what ship the boat belonged to. Court. When the people came aft to prevent Mr. Dunlop from coming into the ship, who were the men that came forward? Answer. Berry and Lily. Court. What did Mr. Dunlop say to you when you went in to dinner? Did he mention the circumstance of the man being taken out of irons and what steps he had taken previous to your coming on board? Answer, yes. Court, when the ship's company refused to give up the ringleaders, were there any of the men that you particularly observed to take the lead? Answer, yes. Garland, Ladson, Berry and Lily. Court, when you were going alongside, did they endeavour to prevent you? Answer, no. Court. When the attack was made on the mutineers, where were you, and did you observe any man take a more active part than another in the mutiny? Answer. I was on the quarter deck loading my pistols. The most active men were Berry and Lily. Court. Were you present at the securing of the hole or any part of the prisoners? Answer. I recall sending Skinner up the fore hatchway. Court. What was his behaviour at the time? Did he resist much? Answer, no, he did not. Captain Greer, when Mr. Dunlop quitted the ship, did they demand any terms of you? If so, what were they? Answer, none. Court, did you give orders to prevent boats coming alongside after Mr. Dunlop left the ship? Answer, I did not to let boats come alongside without my knowledge. The prisoners were then asked by the court if they had any questions to put to the witness. They all answered, no, they had none. Mr. Adam Cumine, third officer of the ship Belvedere, called in and desired to inform the court of what he knew of the prisoners and mutiny. At about half past ten o'clock on Saturday night, the 1st of December, I heard the chief mate get up and call for a light, as the people were then singing and making a riotous noise. I suspected he meant to go forward and quiet them. The fifth mate followed them immediately and myself very soon after. I had at that time no idea the chief mate would meet with any ill treatment, but by the time I got forward, was much surprised to find that James Keefe had seized the light out of his hand, and the chief mate, who had then got Keefe down upon a chest, was attempting to retrieve the light, the fifth mate, giving him every assistance in his power. We dragged Keefe aft into the steerage. I then perceived the people meant to make a general mutiny, there being a cry from all quarters, Turn out, turn out. At the same time, a stool and some other things were hove aft amongst us in the steerage. The petty officers then interposing in our favour, we got Kaif upon the quarterdeck and put him in irons. The people were by this time all upon the quarterdeck and were insisting upon having the prisoner delivered up to them. But being opposed by the officers at the break of the quarterdeck, they did not attempt to force their way aft. 
Ladson, Connor and Kelly, being the principal ringleaders, gave the chief mate a great deal of abuse and even threatened to take the fifth mate's life. The chief mate begged they would go to their beds, assured them if they offered to relieve the prisoner, he would instantly arm and proceed against them, represented how dreadful the consequences might be, and he would at any time get assistance from the other ships with which he could, with the greatest ease, secure every one of them. They still continued their abuse and even resolved not to quit the deck without the prisoner. However, about two o'clock, many of them began to slip off the deck, and by three there were very few remaining, and everything was once more quiet and remained so till the next day at noon. Some time after we had piped to dinner, the chief mate sent for me, told me he believed the people intended forcibly to relieve the prisoner after dinner and desired I would order all the quartermasters to be ready. Before we could get armed, they all rushed aft in a body, Berry at the head, who threatened to knock the first man down who came in their way, with a marlin spike which he carried in his hand. We, the officers and petty officers, threw ourselves in before them, and Berry struck the sixth mate on the shoulder with the marlin spike, which brought him to the deck. We found it impossible to detain the prisoner, whom the mutineers carried forward, knocked off his irons and threw them overboard. Then Berry called out, we have got the day, let us give three cheers, which they accordingly did. They then went down below, pointed the two bow guns aft, lowered down the ports and unshipped all the ladders. Berry and Lily came aft into the steerage and gave the officers every abuse they could think of. They were even heard to say from below they would break open the magazine. The boatswain then went down below to see if they intended to take such a dangerous step. They told him they were all December ready for doing it, and would certainly do it the moment they were attacked by the officers, which prevented the chief mate from attacking, as he meant to have done. Having ordered everybody to arms, the chief mate ordered me to take the yawl and go on board the Fitzwilliam and request Captain Dundas to give his advice. In the dangerous situation the ship was in, Captain Dundas desired I would return, and if the chief mate wanted assistance from the other ships, to let him know immediately and he would send a boat from every ship in the fleet. By the time I returned, the second mate came alongside, and the people seemed inclinable to return to their duty, but in a most daring manner came aft and insisted upon terms which were not granted them, as they had possession of the gun deck and magazine, and we had every reason to think from their behaviour when the second mate came alongside that they would be perfectly quiet when he was left commanding officer. The chief mate quitted the ship in a sampan, it being his opinion, the second mate's and my own, that the ringleaders could be secured when the people were in a state of sobriety. It happened as we expected. The moment the chief mate quitted the ship, they returned to their duty, got the guns in their places when ordered by the second mate, and everything appeared perfectly quiet. About three o'clock the Loco's boat came alongside to know if we wanted any assistance. The people let the officer come on board without any disturbance, he soon after left the ship. About four o'clock, the chief mate and Mr. Rate, the chief mate of the Fitzwilliam, came on board. The mutineers let the officers come on board after some altercation, but ordered the boat to shove off, threatening to slay her if they refused. The chief mate then called me and ordered me to take six quarter-deck mariners down to the lazaretta armed and defend the magazine and to run any man through that should attempt to enter it. I can give no account of what passed after this upon the upper deck and gun deck, as I did not come up till most of the mutineers were seized. Having read this to the court, and affirming it as true, he then proceeds as follows. After I had been some time in the lazaretta, they lifted the scuttle leading to the magazine and were going to jump down. Being opposed, they afterwards laid the scuttle over again. A little time after they lifted it off again, and then they said they were determined to jump down. I assured them if they did, I would run the first man through. Notwithstanding which, a man, Patterson, jumped down and I wounded him. After him, numbers immediately jumped down, first throwing billets of wood and shot, and drove me from the lazaretta. I cannot recall if any of the prisoners were there. Court. Do you know who took Cafe off the quarterdeck and who knocked his irons off? Answer. Berry and Patterson. Court. What were the terms that the people demanded of the chief mate? and what officers were present when they did so. Answer. They demanded that they should have an allowance of grog, and likewise that Kaif should be at liberty. 
The officers present were the chief, the second, fifth and sixth mates and the witness. Court. Who were the men that asked those terms? Answer. Lillian Garland. Captain Greer. Did they not demand a midshipman, Mr. Clayton, to be turned before the mast? Answer. I heard it called out but do not know from whom. Court. Did it appear to you during the mutiny that the people were in a state of intoxication? Answer. Very few of them, I think. Court. Do you recollect any of that few that were in that state? Answer. Kelly. None else among the prisoners with him. Court. Do you know the man that threatened the fifth mate's life? Answer. Yes, Connor. Questions asked by the prisoners. Barry. Whether he saw me knock the irons off Kaif? Answer. The witness saw him carry Kaif forward and very active about him, but cannot say who immediately knocked them off. Mr. Law, fifth officer of the Belvedere, called in and desired to inform the court of what he knew of the prisoners and the mutiny. At half past ten o'clock on Saturday night, the 1st of December, I heard Mr. Dunlop call for a light. I was then in the great cabin. I followed him and saw Mr. Dunlop collar Keefe and Keefe take the light from Mr. Dunlop. A scuffle then ensued. Keefe tore Mr. Dunlop's shirt. I assisted Mr. Dunlop in getting him aft. During the time, a billet of wood was thrown from forward, which struck me on the leg. Connor came aft. I did not know his intentions and pushed him forward. Kaif was put in irons with difficulty. I was last in coming upon deck, and turning around, I saw the people assembling abreast the main mast. Ladson, Barry, and Connor laying down terms to Mr. Dunlop and insisting on having Keefe out of irons. Barry said, Don't let us stand about it. Let us take him out. A long altercation ensued till one in the morning. They then began to disperse. An officer was then ordered to keep the watch through the night, during which in my watch they were quiet. At twelve o'clock the next day, Sunday the 20th of December, the people came up Ahmed, Barry in particular. With a Marlene spiker, they rushed aft, with Barry at their head, and took the prisoner forcibly out of irons. They then began to make a great disturbance, threatening Mr. Dunlop and calling him a number of abusive names, saying that the ship was now their own and that no man should be punished without they thought he deserved it. They barricaded the ship and swore that no boats should come alongside, all the prisoners and most of the people making use of these or like expressions. They handed up shot upon deck and got everything necessary to keep the boats off in case they were boarded. Destin. Berry and Lily said they would die upon deck rather than give the ship up. Court. Did Berry strike the sixth mate to the deck and at what time? Answer. I cannot say. Court. Did you see anybody attempt to push Mr. Dunlop overboard, or did you see him nearly in that situation? Answer. I saw him nearly in that situation, but saw no man do it. Court. In what state was the ship's company as to sobriety during the Saturday night and Sunday? Answer. Kelly was the only drunken man I saw amongst them. William Connor, did you hear me threaten your life? Answer. Only my ears. Court to the prisoners. Have you any more questions to put to the witness? Prisoners. Answer. No. Mr. James McCulloch, sixth officer of the ship Belvedere, called in and desiring to inform the court of what he knew of the prisoners and the mutiny. Upon the 1st of December at night, I, as usual, put the lights out at nine o'clock and immediately went to bed. But before I was long asleep, I was awakened by a noise I heard upon deck. I then got up and without putting any other clothes on but my breeches went upon deck and there saw all the foremastmen together in the waist. But the man who was then spokesman was William Connor, who then said they were all determined to have James Keefe out of irons that night and Henry Ladson, who declared there should nothing prevent them from having him to sleep on the gun deck that night and in his own hammock. And John Berry said, What signifies talking? Let us one and all go and take him and see who dares hinder us. Robert Skinner and Samuel Walker likewise were resolved upon relieving the prisoner. As for the rest of the people, they stood behind their backs, declaring and signifying their approbation of everything the ringleaders proposed. However, seeing the officers and petty officers were determined to guard the prisoner all night, Sooner than suffer him to be relieved by them, they wisely went to bed. However, Mr. Dunlop thought it proper to make one officer keep watch with two midshipmen and two quartermasters. The rest turned in, 
but were ready upon a moment's warning to be upon deck. But we had the satisfaction to remain quiet for the rest of the night. Next morning the people got up and washed the main deck without making any noise, and for my own part, I thought the men had reflected deliberately on their behaviour, but at twelve o'clock, when the boat in and his mates had piped to dinner, they all of course went below, and the ship's steward as usual served out their grog. But I do not think they had time to eat their dinner when they came upon deck with their champion ring leaders. At their heed armoured with axes, marlin spikes, pump bolts, hand spikes, crows, decanters, and belaying pins, with John Berry first encouraging them by saying, we will murder the first booger that offers to oppose us. Mr. Dunlop just then came out of the cuddy, and I myself, not having time to get either pistols or any defensive arms, ran in between the mutineers and the prisoners. What with the force of them all running upon me, and the blow I received from John Berry's marlin spike, I fell down amongst their feet, and was hustled forward to the waist before I could recover myself. But upon my getting up, I saw the mutineers breaking the lock. They then, by order of John Berry, gave three cheers he saying they had got the day. They then went below, unshipped the ladders, let down all the ports, pointed the two foremost guns aft, and handed up the shot, and declared, if any violent measures were proposed, they would break open the magazine. At that time, Mr. Craig came on board when Mr. Dunlop and the rest of the officers agreed to let them alone until such time as we had it in our power to get between them and the magazine, as they seemed to be then quiet. Mr. Dunlop then called a passage boat and took leave of us, as I imagined, to go to Canton. At this time, the people were quiet and said they would go to their duty. At half past three o'clock, the Commodore's boat came alongside, but before this, the ringleaders came aft, in a daring manner insisting upon terms, and John Berry, Abraham Lilly, and Anthony Garland insisted upon having Mr. Clayton, a midshipman, ejected before the mast, that they might have him to murder. But upon Abraham Lilly's saying so, John Berry said, I am not to take his life, I will break one leg and one arm, and as for Mr. Law, I will cut one of his ears off. When the Commodore's boat came, Mr. Rate, as chief officer, read a letter, the contents insisting upon the ringleaders being given up, upon which the mutineers put themselves in a posture of defence and swore no boat should come alongside. Immediately, some of them went to break open the magazine and began throwing at the boats alongside and upon the quarterdeck, but the officers and petty officers being armed, we made a sally from the quarterdeck and cut several down with cutlasses. When they went to the magazine, they found a warm reception from the third mate, who was then guarding it with five quartermasters. The pinnaces all got alongside. We then took all that were on the main deck prisoners, went down upon the gun deck, hauled up the ports. But before we had that done, several were hurt by shot, hove by the mutineers. However, by five o'clock we had all our foremast men prisoners in the cuddy. John Berry, Abraham Lilly, Anthony Garland, William Connor, Robert Skinner, John Hastings, Thomas Langford, Henry Ladson, Timothy Kelly and James Keefe were sent prisoners on board the Commodore. Samuel Walker, Thomas Patterson, Oliver Butler and James Brown were the only men not concerned. Questions asked Mr. M. Kulloch. Court, what terms were demanded by the prisoners? Answer, Anthony Garland insisted upon grog that day and liberty. He likewise demanded Mr. Clayton, midshipman, to be turned before the mast because he had on that day nearly got him a flogging. Abraham Lilly threatened to murder the said midshipman. John Berry said he would break one leg and one arm. Court. Do you know who knocked the irons off Keefe? Answer. I do not know who knocked the lock off the irons, but I saw Berry and Patterson throw them overboard. Court. Did you hear any of the people threaten to blow the ship up? Answer, yes, but cannot say who. Court. Were there any locks broken open to enter the lazaretta? Answer, the lock of the fore scuttle, but cannot tell who did it. Abraham Lilly. Question. Did you hear me threaten Mr. Clayton's life? Answer, yes, I did. You and Garland. Court to the prisoners. Court. Have you any more questions to put to the witness? Prisoners answer. No. Mr. Christopher Spencer, gunner of the ship Belvedere, called in and desired to inform the court of what he knew of the prisoners and the mutiny. Questions by the court. Court. 
Where were you when you heard of the chief mate's light being taken from him? Answer. In the gun room. Court. Were you upon deck when Keefe was put in irons? Answer. Yes, court. Was there any abusive language made use of, and from whom? Answer. Ladson and Connor said that the man should not be put in irons without their going with him. Court. Were you sent by Mr. Dunlop to secure the gun room, and did anybody attempt to break in, and who? Answer. None. Court. Were the ship's company drunk or sober? Or what sort of state were they in on Saturday and Sunday? Answer. A little drunken on Saturday, all sober on Sunday, except Kelly. Court. Did you receive any orders from Mr. Craig when Mr. Dunlop left the ship? And what were they? Answer. To go down and see the magazine secured. Court. What situation were the guns in? Answer. They were in their places. Court. When Mr. Dunlop left the ship, were the ports secured down? Answer. No, they were up. Court to the prisoners and court. Have you any questions to put to the witness? Prisoners. None. Mr. William Frost, boatswain of the Belvedere, called in and ordered to inform the court of what he knew of the prisoners and the mutiny. Questions by the court. Question. Did you see the guns pointed aft on Sunday? Answer. Yes, the two foremost. Question. Were the ports ever lashed in? Answer. I do not know, but they were lowered down and hauled up several times. Question. What state were the ship's company in on Saturday and Sunday? Answer. On Saturday, only Keefe and Payne were drunk. On Sunday, between 12 and 2, only Kelly appeared to be drunk to me. Question. Did you hear any of the people say they would blow the ship up? Answer. I heard it, but cannot tell who. Question. Who appeared to you to be the leading men, and who was most active in the mutiny on Saturday and Sunday? Answer. On Saturday night, Connor and Ladson on Sunday, Berry and Lily. Court to the prisoners. Have you any questions to put to the witness? Prisoners answer no. Court to Mr. Dunlop, chief mate. Question. Did the ship's company at any time on Sunday ask any terms of you? Answer. They asked if I had released Keefe. I answered, no, that they had done it themselves. They also demanded Mr. Clayton, midshipman, to be turned before the mast. Mr. Charles Raitt, Chief Officer of the Earl Fitzwilliam called in and desired to inform the court of what he knew of the prisoners and the mutiny. Questions by the court to Mr. Raitt. Question. What state did you find the Belvedere in when you went on board with Mr. Dunlop? Answer. In a very mutinous state, and the first thing that made me believe they were was their ordering my boat to put off instantly from alongside. Question. Did you see them armed to keep any boats off? Answer. Yes, but not at first. Question. Did they refuse to give the ringleaders up when you told them you came with the Commodore's orders? Answer. They refused to a man and said they would sooner die. Berry in particular said he would fight the ship as long as her sides stuck together, took off his cap, and gave three cheers. When I was telling him the consequence, Ladson replied, he could only be hanged, as to flogging. He did not mind it. Question. Did the people seem drunk or sober? Answer. Perfectly sober and very deliberate. I did not see one drunk. Question by Henry Ladson to the witness. Question. I wish to know where I was when I made that answer. Answer. On the upper deck on the chock starboard side of the deck. When they found the boats coming, they armed themselves with round shot and double headed shot. Called. Stand by and divide yourselves. The boats are coming on both sides. The prisoners upon their defence. John Berry. Have you any person to call on your defence or to speak to your character? Answer. No. Abraham Lilly. Have you any person to call on your defence or to speak to your case? Answer. No. Henry Ladson. Have you any person to call on your defence or to speak to your character? Answer. I was not on the fore hatchway when Mr. Dunlop spoke from the upper deck. James Keefe. Have you any person to call on your defence or to speak to your character? Answer. I deny taking the candle from Mr. Dunlop but to hold it. Prince Garland. Have you any person to call on your defence or to speak to your character? Answer. I am not guilty of going on the fore hatches nor with the shot nor with taking the man out of irons. Mr. Donaldson, Mr. Young and Mr. Perry will speak to my character. Those gentlemen are not present. Robert Skinner. Have you any person to call on your defence or to speak to your character? Answer. No. Thomas Langford, 
Have you any person to call on your defence or to speak to your character? Answer. Can get a character in the fleet, William Connor. Have you any person to call in your defence or to speak to your character? Answer. Says he was in liquor as an excuse for his conduct. Timothy Kelly. Have you any person to call in your defence or to speak to your character? Answer. Pleads drunkenness. John Hastings. Have you any person to call in your defence or to speak to your character? Answer. They were running forward with cutlasses. I took up a shot to defend myself. Captain Greer gives him a good character till this mutiny. Adjourned to Saturday the 15th instant at 11 o'clock in the forenoon. Saturday 15th of December 1787. The court being resumed, President Captain James Dundas. Members, Alexander Montgomery, Joseph Huppar, J. H. Dempster, James Monroe, Henry Churchill, George Blackford, William Harcastle, David Tome, George Millett, Richard Pennell, William Storey, Priscilla Dundas, John Dennis, John Patna, Charles Lindegren. The court, having gone through the evidence and asked the prisoners what they had to say for themselves, as it has not appeared that there has been the least cause for murmurs among the ship's company, either for ill usage from any one officer or petty officer in the ship, that this daring mutiny has arisen from a spirit that prevailed, that they were on board of a merchantman, where, according to their own expressions, they would not meet with due punishment. That it also appears that on Sunday, the second day of the mutiny, the prisoners were all sober and deliberate but one man, Kelly, who pleaded drunkenness, the others never attempting any defence of that sort, or saying anything in their own vindication. We, therefore, are of the opinion that this daring mutiny, had it not been immediately suppressed by about 18 boats manned and armed from the company's ships, the consequence might have been dreadful, not only to that ship, but this spirit spreading to the fleet in general, where there are above 3,000 of His Majesty's subjects, the greater number of which might have, by joining the mutineers, committed depredations against the inhabitants and put a stop to the company's trade with the loss of many lives. We, therefore, are of opinion that severe and immediate corporal punishment be inflicted upon the ringleaders, and that Berry and Lily at different ships of the fleet receive Berry 100 and Lily 70 lashes, that the rest be punished on board the Belvedere, and that Ladson and Keefe receive 60 lashes, Garland, Skinner and Connor 48 lashes, Hastings and Langford 24 lashes, that Kelly, as least culpable, receive 12 lashes. The latter recommended to mercy by the court. Signed. J. Dundas, A. Montgomery, J. Huppar, J. H. Dempster, James Monroe, H. Churchill, George Blackford, W. Harcastle, D. Tome, George Millett, Richard Pennell, W. Storey, Pra Dundas, John Dennis, John Patna, Charles Lindegren, John Berry and Abraham Lilly, after having the last of their punishment alongside the Belvedere, were liberated and taken on board. However, when they went down to the gun deck, they were inciting the seamen to mutiny again. Upon being insolent to Captain Greer on the quarter-deck, he ordered them ashore at Jones Island, with their clothes, etc. This island is where the English are permitted to walk, within a cable's length of the ships. On the Belvedere's arrival in England, they brought an action against their captain in the Court of Common Pleas, which was tried on the 15th of December 1788, before Lord Loughborough and a special jury. The case was about alleged misconduct of Captain Greer. I have been an old messmate in the Navy, and on board the East India Man, Ship John, and soon after my arrival at Guangzhou, I took the liberty of paying a visit to Mr. Cox, an English gentleman resident there, and I was much surprised to see my old friend Tiana, whom the reader may recall I met with at Atui on my second visit to the Sandwich Islands. Tiana immediately recollected me, and so sensibly was he affected with the interview that he clasped his arms about me in the most affecting manner, reclined his head on my shoulder, Tears ran unheeded down his cheeks, and it was some time before he became calm and composed enough to utter the name of his old acquaintance Popote. But when the first transports of joy, which so unexpected a meeting excited, had a little subsided, he seemed happy in making every inquiry that could please or afford satisfaction regarding his friends at the Sandwich Islands. And on my inquiring how he came to China, I found that Captain Mears had touched at a Tui in his passage from the coast of America to China, and Tia Anna, expressing a wish to see the world, he had taken him along. On board, he brought him to Macau, where he left Tiana in the care of Mr. Ross, his chief mate, of whom Tiana was remarkably fond. 
They remained some time at Macau, and Tiana was generally indulged in walking about wherever his inclination led him. On these occasions, he constantly wore a beautiful feathered cap and cloak and carried a spear in his hand to denote himself as a person of grandeur and distinction. He preferred wearing the maru, which is always worn by the sandwich Islanders around the waist. However, such an appearance was scarcely modest in a civilized country. Therefore, a Mr. Ross got a light satin waistcoat and a pair of trousers made for him, which he was persuaded to wear, albeit with great seeming reluctance at first. Yet, he became better pleased with them after they became familiar and habitual to him. Although not a professed papist, Tiana would frequently go to the places of divine worship at Macau. He always observed the manner, motions and attitudes of the congregation, standing or kneeling, and mimicked their actions, gestures and behaviour very studiously, appearing keen to imitate them by exact conformity to all their actions. His noble and generous spirit visibly manifested on various occasions. Once, he went up to an orange stall, picked out half a dozen oranges, and gave the woman who sold them a couple of nails as payment, which he considered a very ample and indeed a superabundant compensation for her oranges. Nails were highly valued in his country. He observed that he had paid her for the oranges and made her a present beside. But the good woman was by no means satisfied with such payment and was about to raise a disturbance by a loud, rude, offensive clamour of her not being paid. When some gentleman luckily happening to be with Tiana at the time, they readily pacified her complaint by paying her to her satisfaction. When the Queen Charlotte arrived in Macau Roads, Mr. Ross and Tiana often went with Captain Dixon to Wampua. During this short passage, Tiana often expressed his dislike of the Chinese, particularly that custom of shutting up and excluding the women from the sight of all strangers. And he seemed likewise to have contracted a prejudice, as well against the form, shape and manner of their persons, as against their practices and customs, and carried it even to hatred and antipathy, insomuch that he was once going to throw the pilot overboard for some trivial matter of offence. When he arrived at Canton, he was particularly noticed by the gentlemen of the English factory, from whom he received invitations and every mark of civility which could testify their respect and regard to his rank and dignity. Nor was he less caressed and admired by all classes of people at Canton. Captain Tasker of the Milford, from Bombay, gave a sumptuous entertainment to a number of English gentlemen, and of course Tiana was among the rest. After dinner, being upon deck, a number of poor Tartars in small sampans were about the ship asking arms, as is customary there on such occasions of entertainment. Festivity. Tiana immediately inquired what they wanted, and being told that they were beggars who came to supplicate the refuse of the table, he expressed great concern, saying that he was very sorry to see any persons in want of food, and that it was quite a new scene to him, for that they had no people of that description at Atui. He seemed to be under great impatience to procure them relief and became a very importunate solicitor on their behalf. The captain's generous disposition readily cooperated with his importunities, and he ordered all the broken victuals, being a large quantity, to be brought upon deck, and Tiana had the distribution of it among the poor Tartars, which he did, observing the most equal impartial division he was able to make of it, and his pleasure and satisfaction in the performance of that task were not less visible in his countenance than his actions. I asked him if he was willing to go to Britain, but he told me that he expected to have been there in twelve moons, but that now he would be glad to return to Atui. It seems Captain Mears had engaged in a Portuguese expedition to the coast of America, and promised to leave Tiana at Atui in his passage thither. The gentlemen at Canton, desirous to give him lasting proofs of their friendship and esteem, furnished him with whatever could be useful or acceptable, such as bulls, cows, sheep, goats, rabbits, turkeys, etc., with oranges, mangoes, and various kinds of plants, so that his safe arrival with his cargo would prove of the utmost value to his country and an honourable testimony to his countrymen of the distinguished esteem and regard with which he had been treated and his very name revered by all ranks and conditions of people in Canton. Tiana is tall, being six feet two inches in height, and so exceedingly well made that a more perfect symmetry and just proportion of shape is rarely to be met with. But he is rather inclined to corpulency, has a pleasing animated countenance, a fine piercing eye, 
But the annexed engraving, which is taken from a painting for which he sat at Canton, and which was deemed a striking likeness, will give a more perfect idea of him than can possibly be conveyed by verbal description. A voyage round the world, but more particularly to the northwest coast of America, by Captain Nathaniel Portlock. Chapter 16. Leave Macau. Proceed through the Straits of Banker and Sunda. Anchor at North Island. The vessel's part company. Arrival at St. Helena. Departure from thence. Five of the people nearly poisoned by eating fish. Arrival in England. On the morning of the 6th of February, a fresh breeze with open cloudy weather. Latter part moderate breezes and hazy. At seven in the morning, weighed and came to sail with an intention of taking a berth below the shipping, to be in readiness for going down the river immediately, on the pilots coming on board. At eight, a rope getting into the tiller rope block in stays occasioned the ships touching the ground. It was very near the pitch of low water, and by the time we had run out a kedge and hove taut on the hawser, she floated off. At nine, the pilot came on board, employed sailing and warping down the river with a light breeze from the northeast. About noon, had got down nearly to the lower parts of the shipping, where we anchored for a few minutes and gave the ship's company an opportunity of getting some dinner. And I have to remark that Robert Spencer, John Harrison, and Thomas Pott stole a boat from alongside the ship at about eight or nine in the evening and absented themselves for some time, and on my sending Mr. Hayward with another boat on Thursday the 7th, very light winds from the east-northeast with close hazy weather, employed sailing and towing down the river. At six in the evening, the ebb tide being done and not enough wind to stem the flood, we anchored with the small bower anchor in five fathoms of muddy bottom, about three or four miles below the shipping at Wampoa, Queen Charlotte in company. At midnight, the wind was light and variable between the north and west. At five in the morning, we weighed and came to sail with the ebb, with a light breeze from the north-northwest and fine weather, Queen Charlotte in company. Soon after getting underway, the wind chopped around to the east-southeast, employed turning down the river until ten in the morning, at which time we anchored in about five fathoms of muddy bottom with the small bower. At this morning we had light winds from the southeast with fine weather. At three in the afternoon, the ebb tide having made strong, we weighed and came to sail, Queen Charlotte in company. At eight in the evening, we came to with the small bower in five fathoms of water, muddy bottom. At six, a breeze at north-northeast, weighed and came to sail. At eight, passed through the Boca Tigris with a fine breeze at northwest, with which we were standing towards Macau. At noon, a breeze at west-northwest, with fine pleasant weather, a number of Chinese boats alongside, with vast quantities of oysters, which we bought very cheaply. At nine in the morning, sent the whaleboat on board a ship at anchor. She proved to be the Diana, a country ship from India for Wampoa, who had been missing for some time. Moderate breeze from the west with fine clear weather. At two in the afternoon, the wind hauled around to the southward. At seven in the evening, the ebb being down, we anchored with the small bower in eight fathoms of water, muddy bottom. At midnight, a moderate breeze at east-southeast. At two in the morning, a breeze at northeast, and the ebb having made, we weighed and came to sail. At eight, very light airs and variable. At half past eight came to with the small bower in five fathoms of water. At ten, a moderate breeze at south. At half past eleven, weighed and came to sail, calm with fair weather. At two in the afternoon, a light breeze from the west by south, standing down towards Macau. At five, Macau bore northwest by west, distant about four leagues, and the westernmost part of the Grand Ladrone south by east one quarter east, distant about eight leagues, the island of Patoy, which is a small island lying just to the westward of the Grand Ladrone, bearing south three quarters east distant about seven leagues, a moderate breeze from the southeast by east with which we were standing through between the Patoe and the islands lying to the westward. At half past five, hoisted in the whale boat and secured her and placed the Sandwich Island canoes on the quarter in room of the whale boat. At this time, the pilot left us. I sent by him a letter for Henry Brown, Eskimni, 
President of the Council at Canton, signifying the situation and good condition of the King George and Queen Charlotte. Also a letter of advice for Mr. John Etches, or the commander of the Prince of Wales or Princess Royal, to be delivered on either of their arrivals. At half past seven, the breeze having failed and the tide setting to the westward, we came to with the small bower in six fathoms of water, Queen Charlotte in company, the Grand Ladrone bearing from southeast half east to southeast half south, distant about five leagues, the island of Pato southeast by east three leagues. At midnight, calm and very hazy. At three in the morning, a light breeze sprung up at north northeast, weighed and made sail, Queen Charlotte in company. At half an hour after nine in the forenoon, the southeast point of the Grand Ladrone bore northeast half north, distant about 25 miles, from whence I took my departure. Grand Ladrone latitude 22 degrees north, longitude 246 degrees 4 force. The 11th, 12th and 13th of February, for the most part, fair weather. A number of the ship's company ill with fluxes and others with fevers, owing, in the opinion of the surgeon, chiefly to their hard drinking whilst at Wampua. On the 12th saw many dark-coloured gulls and some boobies, all white except the tips of their wings, which were black. At half-past seven in the morning of the 13th saw a sail in the northeast quarter standing to the southward. At nine, the strange sail being near enough to see our colours, we hoisted them. The stranger answered us by showing hers, which we took to be Prussian. Latitude observed 18 to Grand North, Latitude by account 18 degrees au nine north, course south 3 degrees west, distance from the Grand Island 54 miles, longitude by account 246 degrees au four west, longitude observation 246 degrees 35, 15 west, variation 0 degrees. On the 14th instant, spoke with the ship which we had been within sight of all day, which proved to be a vessel formerly called the Loudoun, British built, and about 15 months ago fitted out in the River Thames from whence she sailed under imperial colours to King George's Sound on the northwest coast of America and from thence to Macau in China. She is now called the Imperial Eagle, commanded by Captain Berkeley and manned by British subjects. She at this time sailed under Portuguese colours and was bound for the Mauritius. Our people were now all upon the recovery, the Queen Charlotte in company. On Friday the 15th, light winds from east by south. On the 16th, a moderate breeze with the wind at northeast. At 11, judging myself pretty near the Macclesfield Shoal, hove to and sounded with 60 fathoms line. No ground. At midnight, sounded again with 60 fathoms line. No ground. At one in the morning, a vast number of porpoises about. Between midnight and seven, sounded every hour without getting ground, sometimes with a hundred fathoms of line. At seven o'clock, judging myself far enough to the southward, I altered my course to southwest by south, with a view of making Pulo Sapata, the wind at northeast, a two-knot breeze supposed, from our not striking soundings on the Macclesfield, that it does not extend so far to the westward as laid down in the charts, and that we pass just to the westward of the bank. I supposed this, from our being pretty certain of our longitude, having at 2.30 past midday got some very good observations of the sun and moon the sun west of the moon, which gave the longitude at that time 245 de Gaulle 52s west of Greenwich, saw many birds of the booby kind. At eight in the morning hailed the Queen Charlotte. Captain Dixon informed me that his vessel made some water when she lay along, three inches per hour. His surgeon and Cooper's mate very ill, our people all on the recovery. On the 17th, I took my surgeon on board to give his advice or assistance, and took with me about 10 or 12 gallons of port wine for the use of the Queen Charlotte's sick, saw a few birds of the turn kind, a number of flying fish and some dolphins. About the 18th I found, by comparing our compasses with the Queen Charlotte's azimuth compass, half a point difference, ours showing half a point more to the southward than hers did. I believe the azimuth compass to be the most exact and allowed accordingly. At half past three in the afternoon, I returned on board hoisted the whaleboat in, and made sail. Our surgeon was of the opinion that the people on board the Queen Charlotte were in a fair way of recovery, and that there was no necessity of removing them into this ship, as I intended, for the purpose of having the surgeon's assistance. Captain Dixon informed me that the Queen Charlotte made about three inches of water an hour. 
She soon after leaving the Ladrone made one and two inches, and as her leak increased, I thought it right to stay by her until we saw how it turned out. Pulo Zapata, at noon, bore south 50 Ferdinand west, distant 285 miles. On the 20th, we had fresh gales with cloudy weather, and the wind being north by east, I steered southwest half west to avoid the Vigia rock. At a quarter past ten, saw the island of Zapata, bearing south northeast. We steered southwest half west, four knots west, one quarter south, distant about eleven miles. Hauled to the south, southwest to go to the eastward of the island. A small hummock rock in one with Zapata, bearing from Zapata northwest by west, three quarters west and distant from Zapata about three or four miles. This island is perfectly bold on the north and east sides, the south and west not so safe, owing to the small hummock rock and a few breakers. It is well named, for it is exactly shaped like a shoe, and no person can be deceived in it, for it seems to bear the same likeness on all sides, not a tree or bush to be seen on it. But there were boobies in great abundance, the island being made white by their dung. On the 21st, we shaped our course about southwest by west, thinking to make Pulo Condore at about five or six leagues to the eastward of the island. From thence, we steered for Pulo Timoan and Pulo Clos. About two in the afternoon, saw another small island bearing about northwest by north and distant about four or five leagues. I imagined this to be one of the small islands laid down by Dalrymple, lying to the westward of Pulo Zapata. He also lays several down to the eastward of Zapata, none of which I found to be there. At three in the afternoon, Pulo Zapata bore northeast, distant 11 miles. With a fine, steady gale at per hour, this southwest half west by our compass being nearly southwest by west true. On the 22nd, our people continued very ill, several of them in fluxes. On the 25th, saw the islands of Aramba bearing from northeast by east to east by north. Our distance from the north end about eight leagues. At six, Pulo Doma bore southeast. On the 26th, a light breeze from north northeast with close hazy weather steering to the south half west, two knots and a half per hour, soundings from zero to 28 fathoms, over a bottom of dark muddy sand and some small shells. At Captain Dixon's request, I sent my surgeon on board to give his assistance to Mr. Lowther, surgeon of the Queen Charlotte, who continued very ill. The Queen Charlotte's Peruvian bark being very indifferent, I sent them a supply of ours, which was much better. Captain Dixon returned with the boat and was also much indisposed with the flux, which was very prevalent among us. We saw the land making in separate small islands, extending from south southwest to southwest by west half west, the southernmost land, the island of Pulo Panfang, and distant about eight leagues. Queen Charlotte in company. Latitude observed, first in Isle 11, north. Light breezes from northeast, with exceeding hot, sultry weather. On the 27th, the peak of Linging made its appearance through the haze, bearing west northwest half west. I suppose 12 or 14 leagues distant. This peak, or rather two peaks, are very perpendicular, making very much like two glasshouse chimneys, quite high and close together. The northeastern, most of the two appearing rather rounder at the top than the other, and of nearly an equal height, at the at the same time the largest and I think the most easterly of them bore northwest by west half west, distant about eight or nine leagues. The island of Tyre South, west three quarters. West, distant eight or nine leagues, depth of water 18 to 15 fathoms dark grey sand, saw the cluster of islands, called the Three Islands, bearing south, distant about five leagues. Instead of three islands, we found islands and rocks, upwards of a dozen the largest of the cluster of islands and rocks, and which is nearly the northern and western extreme of them, bear from south southeast, half east to south by east half east, distant three leagues. Some small rocks above water lying a little to the northward and westward of this island south by west. Pulotaya, northwest, three quarters west, seven or eight leagues distant. We ran along the west side of the cluster three islands, at the distance of three or four miles from them, in fifteen or sixteen fathoms water, over a dark, grey, sandy bottom. These islands are a moderate height, very woody, and appear to be safe and bold, too. There are some sandy beaches which I dare say afford plenty of turtle, 
and no appearance of any breakers anywhere about the isles, except at a little distance from the points of the small rocky isles. At half past eleven, the Queen Charlotte hoisted her colours half-mast high. On this we shortened sail, spoke her, and found her surgeon dead. At noon cluster three, islands bore from northeast by east, half-east to southeast, by east half-east, distant from the nearest island about three leagues. The small islands lying off the north end of Banka, bearing south-southwest, distant ten or twelve leagues, and Pulotaya about north-northwest, distant ten or twelve leagues. I make the northern and western extreme of the cluster three islands to lie in. The latitude is Ferndega four forks south, and longitude from lunar observation, 25p Fordagun 30 forks west, and latitude of the south extreme of said cluster Wanding 17 south, and longitude 200 feet four dig 28 30 to west. Those islands seem to stretch in a south by east and north by west direction of the same small rocky islands, but may lie a little out of that direction to the eastward and westward. Tue 29th, we had a fine steady breeze at north northeast and steered to south by west, four knots and a half per hour, the depth of water varying as we increased our distance from the cluster three islands from 12 to 21 fathoms at four the southernmost of the cluster. Three islands bore north-northeast three quarters east, distant about eight leagues. This bearing and distance, and Mount Monopin south half east, distant about twelve leagues. This bearing and distance by me places the mount almost exactly in the same situation that Captain King places it in. We now altered the course to south-southwest and southwest by south, thinking before dark to get the mount to bear about southeast by east, or east-southeast, distant six or seven leagues, as, according to Captain King's account, with that bearing and distance, we should have been clear to the westward of the shoal called Frederick Hendrick, and then we could have hauled up for Banker. Straits, but we could not accomplish this point before dark, therefore I thought it most prudent to stand off and on during the night and to enter the straits in the morning. At six in the evening, Monopin bore south-southeast, distant about eight or nine leagues, and the point of Banker that forms the eastern entrance into the strait south, three quarters east, ten or eleven leagues, the islands lying off the north end of Banker east half north, six or seven leagues. We had soundings in twenty-one for Tom's dark grey sand. Saw a strange sail to the northward standing to the southward. Suddenly shoaled our water to thirteen fathoms, standing to the northwest and at half past nine suddenly shoaled the water to seven and a half, soft muddy bottom. This shoal water I suppose to be the Frederick Hendrick shoal, or a shoal laid down in Hamilton Moore's account, lying near the Sumatra shore. A fine breeze from the northwest with rather squally weather and some showers of rain, steering from east by south to east by north, four knots per hour along the banker coast, at the distance of about four miles from the shore. At half past twelve we shoaled our water to seven fathoms, and there being an appearance of a bank lying to the southward of us, hauled up east by north and just ran along its edge in six and a half and seven fathoms water, this appearance of a bank on our starboard hand and the shore of banker on our larboard, the banker shore distant about four miles and the bank distant a quarter of a mile. Soon after hauling nearer the banker shore, we deepened our water to fifteen fathoms and then edged away again to the south by east. About one I got sight of some rocks and a dry white sandbank, bearing about east by south half south. We hauled to the east by north and passed between Banker and this shoal, in never less than seven fathoms water over a sandy bottom. At half past one, Mount Monopin bore northwest by north and near about the middle of the shoal, southeast by south, our distance from the mount about five leagues I judged, and from the seashore under the mount about nine or ten miles, the shoal distant about a mile or a mile and a half, our depth of water at this time fifteen fathoms, sandy bottom. The dry part of the shoal appears to be about a quarter of a mile long, trending east and west. It seems narrow, but the deep water appeared two or three miles to run from the east and west ends in an east and west direction. The shoal I suppose to be entirely covered at high water, I think a perfectly safe passage may be made into those straits by keeping the banker shore on board and passing between it and this shoal. Indeed I would prefer it rather than run down on the Sumatra shore, where should the winds hang easterly it may prevent a ship for some time in entering the straits.
when we had Monopin Hill bearing north-northeast half-north, saw a large town on Banka in the same direction, close down to the seaside, at the same time saw four large proas coming towards this town from towards the Straits of Malacca, and one going towards the Straits. At two in the afternoon, the tide began to run to the southeast, through the Straits at south, a light breeze from the northeast with small rain, and Mount Monopin bore northwest half west, seven or eight leagues distance, and the northernmost part of Banker in sight, northwest by west half north, five leagues, and the northernmost part of Sumatra in sight, southwest half west. The third point on the Sumatra shore bore south southeast half east, three or four leagues distant. Our distance from the nearest part of Banker three leagues, the Queen Charlotte in company, saw a strange sail to the northwest standing to the southward. At noon, we had light winds from west by north, with constant rain, steering south by east, two miles per hour. At the same time, the second point on the Sumatra shore west, three quarters north, distance about five miles. And Mount Permifang, on the head of Banka, northeast half raft, distance about four or five leagues. On the 2nd March, we passed by a Dutch ship lying at anchor. She appeared to be a man of war of 20 guns. At four in the afternoon, the first point on the Sumatra shore, southeast half south, five or six miles, and the southernmost point of Banka east half south, four or five leagues, Mount Permifang, on the island of Banka, north, west six or seven leagues, hove to for the ship that was standing after us, and at a quarter past four we spoke her, and found her to be the ship Lansdowne, Captain Story Commander, from China, bound to Bantam. On 3rd March, light winds and very variable with close, sultry weather. At half past one, weighed and stood over to the Sumatra shore, the wind very faint, and a strong tide setting to the southeast, which drove us very near the other shoal, that lies between the island of Luspura and the first point of Sumatra, at the same time anchored in five fathoms, a little to the southeast. The lands down anchored in three fathoms and a quarter. Soon after a breeze springing up from the northeast, we weighed and stood to the north northwest, as did the Queen Charlotte and lands down, to clear the north point of the above mentioned shoal, and at five we passed over it in three fathoms water, as did the Queen Charlotte. The lands down in going over struck and stuck fast and made a signal of distress. We immediately anchored in five fathoms water, muddy bottom, as did the Charlotte and sent our boats with kedge anchors and hawsers to their assistance. When at anchor, the first point on the Sumatra shore bore north-northwest about two or three leagues, the southernmost point on the island of Sumatra in sight. At half-past nine, the Lansdowne made the signal for more assistance, hoisted out our yawl and sent four hands and an officer to their assistance. At half-past ten, the yawl returned, having got her off without receiving any damage. From this time to the eighth, nothing particular occurred, when the land's down almost out of sight. Latitude observed 4 degrees and 50 degrees south, latitude per bearing and distance of the sisters, 4 degrees formed 54 degrees south, longitude per ditto 253 degrees and 44 from Greenwich. 7%. On the 9th, strong gales and squally weather with thunder and sharp lightning, down top gallant yards and struck the top gallant masts. At midnight, fresh gales at west northwest lost sight of the Queen Charlotte. Suppose she was driven off. At daylight saw the Queen Charlotte to the eastward. She had driven during the gale about two leagues, got under way to join us. The tenth a light breeze from the northward, with cloudy weather. The Queen Charlotte in company, the lands down barely in sight. Several of our people ill with fluxes. On this day at one o'clock in the morning Thomas Pastord, armourer's mate, departed this life, and at six o'clock in the evening was buried, after having read the usual funeral service over the body, hoisted out the whale boat, and sent her with an officer and six hands on shore to look about the reef by which these islands are surrounded for turtle. Latitude observed 57 south, latitude per bearing, and distance of the sisters 57 south, longitude per ditto 253 west. On the eleventh light winds and clear, at three o'clock in the morning, the boat returned without any success. Having seen no signs of any turtle, nor any kind of fruit on shore, but saw great flocks of wild pigeons. On the twelfth light winds and cloudy. Saw lying in the road two Dutch ships and three Dutch ketches. Came to anchor. 
soon after an English cutter came alongside, in which was Mr. Wood, late commander of the Charlotte Sloop Packet from the Presidency of Bombay, with intelligence for any English company's ships from China. This gentleman had unfortunately lost his packet on a small and near Krakatoo, and after getting on shore, was attacked and beat off by a country pirate, who, after plundering her, burnt the vessel down to the water's edge. Notwithstanding this gentleman's misfortunes, he has been lucky enough in executing his commission so far, with a boat spared him from the Lascelles, Captain Ballantyne, as no one ship has passed without being spoken with and receiving the intelligence. Before he met with, and got this cutter from the Lascelles, he did his business with a small canoe that he found on the island, on which his vessel was lost. At noon, standing on towards the roads with a gentle breeze from the northward, came to anchor Queen Charlotte in company. On the 14th, the island of Java, extending from southeast by east to south, distant from the nearest part of it five or six leagues. On the 15th, the Lansdowne anchored in these roads for the purpose of filling water, sent a boat with a party of men to the North Isle to cut wood, also sent our sick people on shore to take a walk, served turtle to the ship's company. On the 16th completed our wooding and watering, having filled 37 puncheons, five butts and one hogshead, and got on board one boatload of wood. This evening hoisted in the boats, lashed all our water casks, and in every respect got the ship ready for sea. At eight weighed and came to sail, the Queen Charlotte in company. From this time to the 26th nothing particular. This day died John Copperthwaite, peace after experiencing near two months' illness of the flux. From this to the 30th, we had fresh northerly breezes. This day I brought to for the Queen Charlotte to come up. About nine I sent the whale boat on board the t Queen Charlotte for Captain Dixon, and sent our surgeon to look at their sick, and to make up any medicine he thought necessary, and leave directions with them in case of Captain Dixon's coming on board. We agreed to part, and each of us to go our way for St. Helena. At four, the wind at northeast altered our course to southwest. Captain Dixon took leave of me and returned to the Queen Charlotte, and our surgeon returned on board, hoisted in the boat and made sail. From this time to the 12th of June we had a great deal of bad weather, frequently attended with heavy rains and thunder and lightning. This day saw the island of St. Helena bearing west by north, distant six or seven leagues. On the 13th a brisk breeze at southeast with heavy weather. At half past noon shortened sail and brought to hoisted out the whaleboat and sent her ashore with an officer to acquaint the governor of our arrival off the island. At three o'clock the boat returned, with directions from the governor to come in, bore away and made sail for the bay, and at five anchored with the small bower in thirteen fathoms, hand away and moored with the best bower to the northwest in nineteen fathoms over a bottom of fine black muddy sand the points of the bay bearing northeast by east half east and southwest by west half west the town southeast by east our distance from the shore about half a mile from this time to the 18th the carpenter with his party employed in repairing the sheathing cleaning the bottom and other necessary repairs others employed in receiving fresh provisions on board likewise pitch and tar the people had leave given them to go on shore Abundance of fine mackerel and bonito to be always caught alongside the ship, completed our water, having got on board thirteen tons and a half. On the 18th arrived here the Queen Charlotte, all well, received the governor's dispatches, and at eleven unmoored and hove short on the best bower, waiting for a breeze. On the 19th a light breeze from the southeast with fine weather, weighed and came to sail, saluted the garrison with nine guns, which was returned with an equal number hoisted in the whaleboat and made sail. At four o'clock in the afternoon, St. Helena bore east-southeast and south-southeast half-east and the valley town southeast, our distance from the shore about twelve or thirteen miles. From this time to the twenty-fifth moderate breezes from the southeast. This day five of my people, after eating a hearty dinner of bonito, which had been caught while at St. Helena and salted and hung up for use, were in about an hour afterwards taken very ill of a violent pain in the head, an eruption on the skin, and every part considerably swollen and inflamed. These alarming appearances in a great measure subsided after their drinking a little sweet oil, and towards the evening they were all nearly recovered. In consequence of those fish having such a poisonous effect, 
I ordered all that remained to be thrown overboard. From this time to the 22nd August afforded little variety when we made the Isle of Wight, and on the 24th came to anchor in Margate Roads, the people all in high spirits and rejoiced to see their native shore again. I cannot take leave of my readers without doing justice to the tradesmen that fitted us out with provisions, particularly Mr. Stevens, who supplied us with the very best of every kind, and Messrs. Seal and Waters, a puncheon of whose bread I opened in the river and found it equally good as when first put on board. The grand object of the voyage, of which an account is given in the preceding sheets, being to trade for furs, with an expectation, no doubt, of gaining more than common profits, by an undertaking which at once was new, hazardous and uncertain. The world will naturally inquire whether such expectation has been answered, and more particularly, as reports have been industriously propagated to the contrary. That the King George's Sound Company have not accumulated immense fortunes may perhaps be true, but it is no less certain that they are gainers to the amount of some thousands of pounds, and that the voyage did not answer the utmost extent of their wishes undoubtedly was owing to their own inexperience. For when the King George and Queen Charlotte arrived at Canton, and even a month after that period, prime sea otter skins sold from eighty to ninety dollars each. Of this quantity, these ships had at least two thousand on board, besides a large quantity of furs of inferior value, but though we could have sold our cargo with ease, we were not at liberty to dispose of one material article, the sole management of it being vested in the hands of the East India Company's supercargoes, and at length the skins just mentioned were sold for less than twenty dollars each. From this plain statement of facts, the public may at once perceive that this branch of commerce, so far from being a losing one, is perhaps the most profitable and lucrative employ that the enterprising merchant can possibly engage in. End of a voyage round the world, but more particularly to the northwest coast of America, performed in 1785, 1786, 1787 and 1788, in the King George and Queen Charlotte, Captains Portlock and Dixon, by Captain Nathaniel Portlock, 1789. Thank you for listening.